The Butcher, Anatomy of a Mafia Psychopath by Philip Carlo. Narrated by Dick Hill. Copyright 2009 by Philip Carlo. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with William Morrow, an imprint of HarperCollins Publishers, and was produced in the year 2009 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. This book is dedicated to ASAC Jim Hunt and the members of the Patera Task Force out of Group 33 in the Drug Enforcement Administration's New York office. Ken Feldman, Tom Geisel, Bruce Travers, Mike Agrafolio, John McKenna, John Welch, Eric Stangeby, Rob Barber, Mike Grabowski, John Wilson, Tim McDonald, Dave Torresinta, and Violet Selecki. Every day these brave men and women put their lives on the line fighting the scourge that drugs are, warring with extremely wealthy, diabolical, highly motivated drug lords from all over the world. In respectful memory of the DEA agents brought down in the war on drugs, Everett Hatcher, Frank DeMillo, Thomas Devine, Enrique Camarena, Charles A. Wood, Stafford Beckett, Joseph Floyd, James T. Williams, James E. Brown, James R. Kerrigan, Spencer Stafford, Anchor M. Bangs, Wilson M. Shee, Mansell R. Burrell, Hector Jordan, Gene A. Clifton, Richard Heath, Jr., Emir Benitez, Gerald Sawyer, Leslie S. Grosso, Larry D. Wallace, Octavio Gonzalez, Thomas J. Devine, Marcellus Ward, William Ramos, Raymond J. Statsney, Terry W. McNett, George M. Montoya, and Paul S. Sema. Right now the federal government is fighting a war on drug abuse under a distinct handicap, for its efforts are those of a loosely confederated alliance facing a resourceful, elusive, worldwide enemy. Richard Nixon, July 1973, upon creation of the Drug Enforcement Administration. There's never been anyone like him. He was like a vampire. We believe he killed over sixty people. We followed him for three years. He always wore black. His face was very white. One night we saw him doing chins on a fire escape in a dark alley at four o'clock in the morning. It was an unsettling sight. Agent David Torcinta. If anyone deserved the death penalty, it was Tommy Patera, Federal Prosecutor David Shapiro. Greed was the engine that fueled his criminal enterprise, Assistant U.S. Attorney Elisa Liang. After what he did to Phyllis, I hated the fucker, Frank Ganji. When he talked, he sounded just like a girl, Lenny the pizza guy. Three men could keep a secret, if two of them are dead. Santo Traficante, Tampa, Florida Mafia boss. Just say no, Nancy Reagan. Prologue Gravesend, Brooklyn, is a 7,000-acre swath of land sandwiched between Bensonhurst and Coney Island. The area initially drew its name from a small graveyard located at McDonald Avenue and Neck Road. Beaten and battered and worn down now, the graveyard is still there today. Gravesend was settled by the Dutch in 1640. Between the years 1641 and 1645, before the area was an English settlement, the Dutch had a campaign to rid the area of its indigenous peoples. The Dutch remorselessly murdered them, beheaded them, dismembered them, and gleefully burned them alive at the stake. Gravesend was strategically close to estuaries fed by the nearby Atlantic Ocean. It was well located for importing and exporting various goods and commodities. The forests of Gravesend were abundant in all manner of game, moose, deer, and beaver, wild pig, and huge numbers of rabbits. Nearby Coney Island is Dutch for Rabbit Island. The waters of the Atlantic were teeming with many varieties of fish. During the summer months, the pristine, unpolluted Atlantic literally boiled with huge schools of anchovy, cod, mackerel, bluefish, bass, fluke, and flounder. Tons of succulent lobster and blue claw crabs were there for the taking. Mountains of oysters, mussels, and clams were easily accessible. The vast blue skies of 17th-century Brooklyn were filled with edible fowl, quail, duck, and geese. The dark, fertile soil was ideal for bountiful crops. With the exception of the brutal and unforgiving winters, Gravesend was a place of sweet abundance. As Brooklyn grew to be a large, bustling metropolis, so did Gravesend. 
In the early 20th century, the New York Mafia began using the more desolate areas of Gravesend as a convenient dumping ground for bodies. Joe, the boss, Masseria, Salvatore Maranzano, Lucky Luciano, Murder Incorporated, the five New York crime families, Genovese, Profaci, Bonanno, Lucchese, and Anastasia, all gladly used Gravesend as a convenient place to leave their victims, stabbed, ice-picked, butchered, beaten, battered, and shot to death. Up to the day of his arrest, Sammy the Bull Gravano had his office smack in the heart of Gravesend at Highland and Stillwell Avenues. The Lucchese, Genovese, Gambino, Colombo, and Bonanno crime families all had secretive, black-windowed social clubs in Gravesend and Bensonhurst. Here, mafiosi played cards, drank strong espresso, planned new crimes, murders, and hijacks, settled disputes. Thus, Gravesend, Brooklyn, took on a more sinister, morbid connotation to its inhabitants and to the people in nearby Bensonhurst and Coney Island. Here, people minded their own business. Here, no one saw anything. The citizenry could readily be likened to the three wise monkeys. They saw no evil, spoke no evil, heard no evil. Because Gravesend and its neighbor Bensonhurst had larger populations of made men than anywhere else in the world, including Sicily, one of the byproducts of their work, bodies, was always a concern. Where to hide them? How to get rid of them permanently? Whether or not to blatantly leave them out in the open? These were decisions that either had to be made quickly, on the spot, or planned in advance. As vacant lots all across Brooklyn were filled with two- and three-story red-brick homes, the impromptu burial grounds of the area systematically disappeared. The mob, as a collective whole, had to look for new places to hide their victims. Thus it was logical that nearby Staten Island came into play. On Staten Island there were still huge tracts of uninhabited land, blackened swamps, fields covered with tall green grass in the summer that turned a golden wheat-like hue in the winter. Here, too, were thousands of acres of thick forests of oak, hickory, maple, and beech trees. More important, though, were the state wildlife sanctuaries, which were protected by the government from any kind of development. No construction was allowed, no utility lines would be laid. Surrounded by hundreds of acres of empty land, there was little threat someone idling by would stumble across a body or members of the mob burying one. Inadvertently, the government had invented the perfect place to get rid of bodies for the mafia, and it didn't take long for particularly cunning members of La Cosa Nostra to take advantage of this convenience. Always wily, always quick to exploit a situation, the mafia turned Staten Island's wildlife sanctuaries into its private burial grounds. Interestingly, all five New York crime families used the sanctuaries. One would think members of the mob would keep secret cemeteries private, not tell anyone about them, but just the opposite proved true. They actually shared the sanctuaries with one another. Members of all the five families came to Staten Island with bodies in the trunks of their cars. They drove Cadillacs and Lincolns, Mercedes and Jaguars, and arrogantly made their way to private burial grounds scattered all over Staten Island, in the south, the north, the east, and the west. They were so sure and confident that they often came across the Verrazano Bridge in broad daylight with bodies and long-handled shovels in the trunks of their cars, as Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Dean Martin, and Golden Oldies came from their radios. Never speeding, always carefully abiding by traffic rules and regulations, signs and lights, they made their way to these prearranged burial sites, sometimes singing along with Sinatra. Occasionally there were graves already prepared. Most often, however, shallow graves would be quickly dug in the secret holding sanctuaries. One such place was the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge, some eight miles as the crow flies from the great grand Verrazano Bridge. A capo regime in the Bonanno crime family out of Gravesend, Brooklyn, had made this sanctuary his private burial ground. Here were bodies that had suffered tremendous trauma while the person was still alive. Here were bodies that had been neatly cut into six pieces, the legs, arms, head, and torso, all separated by skillful cuts that showed no tears. Whoever dismembered these bodies was experienced, methodical, as cold and efficient as a butcher in the meatpacking district of Lower Manhattan. Here there were no tombstones, no reminders of the many who had lost their lives. Part 1. Seeds. Chapter 1. 
sanctuary. It was June 6th, 1990. The skies over Staten Island were clear and unblemished, as blue as the eye of a dove. An unusual caravan of police slowly made their way off the Staten Island Expressway and toward the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. It was a task force composed of crack, hard-faced DEA, FBI, and ATF agents, as well as hardcore NYPD organized crime detectives. Prosecutors from the Brooklyn DA's office were also present. Each of these prosecutors, agents, and detectives was tense and uptight. What they were doing today, the reason they were approaching the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge on Staten Island, was the culmination of three and a half years of hard work, blood and sweat and tears, literally. In the second vehicle of this solemn caravan sat DEA agent Jim Hunt, the lead investigator of a DEA task force that had been pursuing a notorious Venano capo by the name of Tommy Karate Patera. Hunt was a five-foot-ten, thickly-muscled Irishman. He had a pale, handsome countenance and large, all-seeing, Paul Newman blue eyes. A stoic, exceedingly dedicated third-generation cop, Jim took his work very seriously, was highly motivated, tenacious, though he was quick to laugh and quick to smile, with no strings attached. He would gladly help a colleague or friend in need. Hunt had an unusual sense of fair play for a cop. As much as he hated drug dealers, drug abusers, and bad guys, he empathized and sympathized with some of their plights. Hunt viewed drug abuse more as a medical problem. He well understood that while some people can have a social drink or two, others become alcoholics, the dregs of society. What Jim Hunt was after, what he had his sights on, were the drug lords, those in faraway places, distant lands, who had learned to manipulate the system in such a way that they had become some of the wealthiest people in the world. The drug lords not only usurped the rule of law, but gleefully defecated all over it. This foe, this enemy, was not only in distant lands, it was here also, homegrown. The mafia, the bosses and capos of each of the families, was dealing in drugs, Jim knew. What was particularly unusual about this group of law enforcement agents serpentining through Staten Island that June day was that they were all cooperating with each other. Most often there is a fierce, bare-knuckled competition between the FBI and the DAA, the NYPD and the ATF. They were competitors in perpetual pissing contests, not colleagues. But this case was so unusual, the stakes so dire that each of the agencies had made peace and were truly cooperating with one another on a large scale, a rare thing. Sitting alongside Hunt was his fellow DEA agent and partner, Tommy Geisel. Geisel and Hunt were so close that they were more like brothers than partners in the war against drugs. For years they'd been trusting one another with their lives. Geisel was a large, broad-shouldered, strapping individual. He had, in the parlance of the DEA, brains, balls, and brawn a phrase commonly used within the agency to describe the type of men they were looking for. Geisel was the kind of guy that Jim wanted in his foxhole, and there was no one else he wanted watching his back. Accompanying this variegated army of police was a bad guy, someone who wore a black hat, who would ultimately draw the curtains back and reveal the true horrors that even this group of law enforcement would soon be shocked and stunned by. He was tall and thin. His nose resembled a toucan's beak. This bad guy was nervous and unsettled to the core of his being. Over the last four years he had become, quite literally, unhinged, pushed to his limits by mind-numbing violence and unspeakable barbaric acts as people around him were tortured, cut up, summarily discarded. Some thirteen months before, ASAC Hunt had heard that a Bonanno family capo, Tommy Patera, was leaving bodies on Staten Island. An Israeli drug dealer named Shlomo Mendelssohn had gotten himself in trouble and offered to give up the whereabouts of Patera's cemetery. The only problem was, Shlomo couldn't remember exactly where the cemetery was located. He had only been there once, and it was at night. He had never been to Staten Island before the time he went with Patera to dispose of a body. At one point during their quest to find Patera's cemetery, Shlomo had even said, scratching his head, I'm thinking maybe it was New Jersey, not Staten Island. Shlomo was deeply immersed in selling huge amounts of cocaine in Manhattan, but Staten Island and New Jersey were completely foreign to him. Though Shlomo had seemed sincere and truthful, 
he had stepped up to bat and struck out. Now Jim Hunt was back with another man who said he knew where Patera's victims were. Hopeful, though wary, Jim's keen blue eyes moved left and right as the caravan slowly crept forward. As they approached a desolate street, the bad guy said, Here, here, this is it. I'm almost sure. The problem was that, like Shlomo, this bad guy had only been there in the dead of night. Daylight cast the stage of horrors that existed here in warm, welcoming light. That June day was cloudless and the sun shone with such unharnessed brilliance most all the agents donned sunglasses. Because of the fierce sunshine, it looked more like the south of France or a Mediterranean island than a mafia burial ground. The caravan moved right. Like a giant anaconda coming to a sudden stop, all the vehicles became immobile. Serious-faced and curious, each of the law enforcement professionals stepped from an air-conditioned car. The hot, humid air struck them like a wet towel. As though on cue, an unruly gang of crows, noisily caught in different trees, spread throughout the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. Concerned about contaminating the area, losing potential evidence, all the agents and NYPD cops began to put on white jumpsuits made of thin, malleable paper. Having a good, easy rapport with the informer, Jim Hunt asked, Where? His eyebrows raised skeptically. Oh, man, the informer said his brow creasing, the weight of the world suddenly on his shoulders. Sweating, licking his lips, smoking a cigarette, the bad guy moved into the thicket of poplar and elm and pine trees spread out before them. He had a worried look about his face. He seemed confused, lost. He took about thirty cautious steps into the sanctuary, stopped, looked around as some twenty-five pairs of cynical, wary cop's eyes regarded him with a mix of trepidation and curiosity. He began moving north, stopped, turned around and moved south. He looked down, he scratched his head, he regarded Jim Hunt. He liked Hunt, he wanted to please him. Hunt was a straight shooter, and the bad guy knew that whatever Hunt promised him, he would get. It was already agreed that the federal government, because of his cooperation, would put him and his family into the witness protection program. He had no reason to lie. If he had any future, he had to cooperate with the feds. He knew he had to give them what they wanted. The problem, the informer apologized, is that I was here at night. It's very hard to tell one spot from another. You know, it's like really the same. He looked down at the ground. It was covered with a carpet of dead leaves and foliage. The thick smell of wet soil and mildew hung in the humid air. There was nothing to indicate that humans had been buried here. No bold spots. No sudden bursts of greenery, no telltale sign of human death. The crows continued to caw. Their ruckus was distracting. A chain smoker, the informer lit one cigarette after another. Beads of sweat ran down his face. Jim called an impromptu brainstorming session among all the law enforcement there that day. They, as a collective body, believed what the informer had said. They knew Patera was murdering people as though he had a God-given right as though he had a license to kill, and that the informer had no reason to lie. They decided that until proven otherwise, they'd believe him and move full out until they found Patera's victims. Hunt and Geisel believed that Patera had killed over sixty people. The NYPD set up a command center. Uniformed cops were posted all around the bird sanctuary, roughly twenty-five acres in size. They knew that once the news media got wind of a mafia burial ground, They'd have reporters sniffing around like hungry hounds within hours. Finding bodies buried months and years ago here, without coordinates, without landmarks, would be no easy task, like looking for the proverbial needle in the haystack, though none of that was going to dissuade any of the hardcore law enforcement professionals there that fateful day. They continued looking, without luck. The fierce June sun reluctantly dropped below the line of trees. Long shadows appeared, silently, dusk descended onto the sanctuary. The sounds of crickets and frogs came from every direction at once. Large flocks of sparrows chattered rapidly. The birds, troubled and nervous by the cop's sudden presence, knew the secrets that their sanctuary held. Foul flesh, silent screams, and nightmares. As dark continued to envelop the sanctuary, agents and police there decided they would again start up the search the following morning. Chapter 2. Dark Secrets 
Mechanized, organized, as succinct as a well-run military operation, the Patera task force gathered at 8 a.m. the following morning. Again, the skies were clear. The birds that dwelt in the sanctuary made a racket. They were used to peace and quiet. They did not like the hurly-burly gathering around their homes. Above, a pair of red-tailed hawks circled over the sanctuary, hunting for prey, hunting the abundance of food they knew lived below. It was decided that the first thing the strike force would do was bring in cadaver dogs. Given the circumstances, this seemed logical. When the dogs arrived, unremarkable mutts, anxious to please, anxious to find the rotting bodies they would receive rewards for, they made their way into the sanctuary. They moved north and south and east and west in prearranged grids. This went on all that day to no avail. Everyone there was sure that if there were bodies, these dogs would find them. They had proven themselves in the past. Nothing. Not willing to accept defeat, the task force brought the dogs in a second day. They worked slower, but still found nothing. How, the task force members wondered, could the dogs miss the scent? Some of the victims here were buried several months ago, some of the victims one year, some two, or even three years ago. Surely the stench of death, the stench of putrid meat, organs, should still have been real and tangible, outright offensive, but the cadaver dogs seemed oblivious. Later, at a meeting back in Manhattan at the DEA's office on West 57th Street, the task force members sat down and brainstormed some more. They questioned the informer's validity. They discussed the probability of his being mistaken about the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. They consulted maps to see if there were other bird sanctuaries nearby, to see if there was another logical explanation. There wasn't. One of the task force members talked about a machine a man in California had developed that could find bodies. His name was George Reynolds. They kicked the idea around of bringing him out and then contacted Reynolds. He assured them seven ways from Sunday that the machine worked. It had proven itself over and over again, he said. Colleagues attested to the machine's working. At great expense, Reynolds and his machine were brought to New York and driven out to the bird sanctuary. There was excitement in the air. Finally, they'd have the proof. Finally, they'd have the sorrowful remnants of Patera's handiwork. As some thirty members of the Patera task force looked on, the man and his machine searched for bodies. It was hot and humid. Everyone was sweating. The crows were back, and they made an awful racket. All that day, the man diligently searched, and he, too, found nothing. Jim Hunt soon gave him the boot and sent him back to California. This, combined with the heat, combined with the failure of the informer and the dogs, was discouraging. Was the informer pulling their legs? Would he try to cut himself a deal for crimes he committed that they, at this point, knew nothing about? These were not, however, the type of people who gave up easily. They were all alpha males and females, tenacious investigators, the type that would not let go. They were experienced, the best of the best. Often, with police work, it's more than facts and figures, names and places, the who, what, when, where, and why. Often it's just a gut feeling, something deep inside that points the way, that has voice and direction of its own. And almost all of them there, working the sanctuary, the Patera case, felt in their gut that they were on the right trail, felt in their gut that they had discovered the Jeffrey Dahmer of the Mafia, that they had discovered a serial killer who was a capo in a mafia family, and they would work this case tirelessly to the very end, wherever it took them. The following day, each of the task force members, wearing a white jumpsuit, was back at the sanctuary. They were now doing it the old-fashioned way, the way their fathers and grandfathers had looked for bodies. They secured four-foot-long metal probes pointed at one end, and with a five-inch handle at the other that would enable the task force to literally probe the ground. Again, going back to basics, they drew precise, neat grids on different sections of the sanctuary, and working two and a half feet from one another's shoulders, they began to walk in a straight line, every foot or so jabbing the probes into the ground. Luckily for them, the dirt was soft and readily accepted the probes. For all that day, Back and forth, quiet and solemn, a joke now and then, mostly macabre ones, the strike force moved. 
Toward the end of the day, as the fiery June sun began to set, the strike force prepared to break for the night. They had come across rabbits and raccoons, skunks and weasels, but no bodies. An NYPD detective out of the Brooklyn Racket Squad named Bobby Pavone made his way away from the group, sat down on a rock and lit up a cigarette. He, like most of the law enforcement there that day, believed that there were bodies buried here. He had been hearing for years rumors about the mafia burying victims out on Staten Island. Why not here? It seemed the perfect place. There wasn't a house or human being anywhere nearby. It struck him as ironic that the federal government had created, in a very real sense, a place where the mafia was able to hide bodies, bodies that would never be found because the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, wouldn't allow the birds to be disturbed. Slowly, reservedly, Bobby moved back toward the group, a tall, wiry, resolute individual. He kind of haphazardly, though pensively, probed as he went, pushed down, found nothing, withdrew the probe. He moved some twenty feet when the probe suddenly struck something hard but giving. He pulled out the probe, pushed it back down, pulled it out, pushed it back in still again. Something was there, something not indigenous to the ground. Hey! Hey, over here! He signaled to the others. They moved toward him. Yo! I think I got one! Chapter 3 it's good to know karate. Thomas Patero was born in Gravesend, Brooklyn, on December 2, 1954. His parents, Joseph and Catherine, were hard-working people of modest means. He had an older sister named Teresa and a large, close-knit, extended family. Joseph Patero was a candy salesman. With samples of his wares secreted in the trunk of his car, he drove throughout the five boroughs selling Mary Janes, Pixie Sticks, Red Hots, Lemon Drops, and Bazooka Gum. The Pateras hailed from southern Italy, the Campania region. They were good Catholics, and Mrs. Patera attended church on a regular basis. Tommy Patera was an unusual child. He had thick, jet-black hair, piercing blue-gray eyes, a strong jawline, and high cheekbones. Without wanting to, without meaning to, his intense stare and black hair drew attention to him, attention that he didn't want, attention he would grow to disdain. As a boy, he was thin and pale, shy and withdrawn. Tommy had a particularly high-pitched voice that sounded more like a girl's than a boy's. It could readily be likened to Michael Jackson's voice, though it was even more falsetto. Given his frailty, combined with his small stature and cartoonish voice, Tommy was an ideal target for Gravesend bullies, food for hungry carnivores. This was an extremely rough and tumble neighborhood, one of the toughest in all of America, filled with thickly muscled laborers and blue-collar workers. The young Tommy Patera couldn't have been in a worse place. Here, people did not turn the other cheek. Here, if you were abused, you struck back hard with bad intentions. Here, he who struck first was victorious. He who was left standing was the winner. Gravesend, Bensonhurst, and Coney Island were all particularly tough neighborhoods. You could liken these areas to concrete jungles filled with predatory creatures, those who readily fed on the weak, those who took advantage of the lame, those who took advantage of the unaware. On a daily basis, often several times a day, neighborhood bullies picked on Tommy. They made fun of his voice, his clothes, his walk, he was slapped or kicked for no reason. He was mocked and spit on for no reason. In short, the young Patera had no peace, had no solace, had no way to strike back, had no friends. Not wanting to appear like a crybaby, a sissy, he said nothing to his mother and father about the abuse he suffered on a daily basis. Frequently, when he came home from school, he was on the verge of tears. In fact, he often cried alone in his room because of the grave injustices he regularly suffered at the hands of the neighborhood miscreants. Like most who are mistreated, Tommy fantasized about striking back, hurting those who abused him, getting even. As he got older, those fantasies became tangible realities, and, unbridled, they grew to monstrous proportions. The abuse and ostracism caused in the young Patera an antisocial mindset, a feeling of being alone in the world, cornered a feeling he could not shake. It was him against them. He felt as though he was on an island, alone and unloved. 
Whenever possible, he would readily express his feelings of anger via the only way he could, striking back and taking revenge in diabolical ways. He stole, as an example, Little League baseball equipment and sold it on the street. He did this not only for the money he was able to make, but more importantly, it was his way of getting back at the establishment. It was his way of undermining, setting fire to what he could not become a part of. In a very real sense, it was Patera's way of saying, Fuck you, world. Tommy attended Booty Junior High School on Avenue S. When recently queried, teachers there had very little recollection of him. He was so quiet, so shy, so put upon, that he seemed to disappear into the woodwork. It wasn't unusual for Tommy to sit at his desk and stare out the windows, imagining himself a valiant, badass fighter, a champion of the downtrodden. Because of his unusually high-pitched voice, it was difficult for him to make friends. In this rough-and-tumble, macho world, boys who spoke like girls didn't have a chance. Even girls in his classes made fun of him, mocked him, imitated his voice. As days melted into weeks and weeks into months, the young Tommy's inner turmoil, animosity, and hatred grew and grew. What was in him could readily be likened to a bubbling cauldron a witch's brew getting hotter and hotter still. The young Patera particularly liked a popular television show that would end up playing a large part in his life. It was called The Green Hornet and featured the brilliant martial artist Bruce Lee as Cato, the Green Hornet's sidekick. Fascinated, fixated, Tommy watched Bruce Lee fly through the air, slide down poles, beat bad guys into submission before they knew what hit them. He threw amazing kicks. His punches were lightning speed, yet he was always respectful, particularly toward women. He was a gentleman. This, too, appealed to the young Patera's sense of fair play. Naturally enough, Tommy became interested in martial arts. He viewed it as a way for him to be left alone and, if need be, strike back with great force. It was no secret now to Tommy's parents that he was regularly bullied. And when Tommy told his mother and father he'd like to take karate classes, they acquiesced. They thought it would be a good thing for the boy. They understood the obvious. If the bullying continued, it might have a long-term negative effect on their son. With great enthusiasm, Tommy began going to karate school in Sheepshead Bay, practicing kicks and punches, turns and jumps with the dedication of a cloistered monk. He quickly moved to the head of his class, what was motivating the boy, what was driving him, was that karate gave him strength, an almost religious calling. When, in 1969, Bruce Lee's first major feature film, Marlowe, came out, Tommy Patera was hooked on martial arts for life. He became a zealous devotee of throwing accurate punches and kicks. He accepted all the constraints placed around martial arts. You were never to pick a fight. You were always supposed to avoid trouble. To turn the other cheek was the righteous thing to do. However, when Tommy watched Bruce Lee beat sneering bad guys to a pulp, he felt justice had been done. Street justice. Inevitably, Tommy's muscles began to grow, become more defined. His skinny arms were replaced by strong sinew and muscle tissue. His fists flattened out and widened from constantly hitting heavy bags. His knuckles grew to disproportionate size. His stomach became cut up. The leg muscles between his hips and knees thickened and became defined from endless practice kicks. As Tommy entered high school and moved through the classes, he was a very different individual. He walked with his head high and his shoulders back, defiant and arrogant. He feared no one. In his feet and hands, he felt he had weapons that he could use quickly, discreetly or indiscreetly as he chose. He began to think of himself as a human weapon. He knew, as an example, that professional boxers were not allowed to fight outside of the ring, that the hands of professional boxers were thought of as weapons. Now, when neighborhood bullies started with him, made fun of him, they were confronted by a completely new person. Suddenly, the Tommy they used to abuse without response was kicking and punching them from three directions at the same time. He was tough. He was fearless. It didn't take long for neighborhood punks to walk around Tommy when they saw him coming. Despite the disapproval of his parents, who didn't want their son looking like a hippie, Tommy also let his thick, straight black hair grow down past his ears and to his jawline. 
His father and mother didn't like the long hair. They wanted him to get it cut. For the most part, Tommy was a good son, an obedient boy, but in this he would not listen to them. Bruce Lee had long hair, and so Tommy wanted it, too. Still, Tommy Patera had that awkwardly high falsetto voice. Previously, when in a new classroom, when a question was posed by a teacher, the whole class would look in his direction. Now, though, no one made fun of him. No one mimicked him. This voice would be a curse Tommy had to live with all his life, an imperfection that no amount of martial arts training could alter. What he did do, almost as a way to balance this feminine voice he had been cursed with, was train harder and harder. He approached martial arts as though it would be his life's work. Tommy's karate teachers were proud of him. They saw in the boy a ferocious appetite to fight. They saw in the boy a particular acumen when it came to throwing punches and kicks. He was not only very fast, he was hard to hit. Some of his teachers, who were ten, fifteen years Tommy's senior and had a hundred pounds on him, were astonished by how ferocious he was when he fought. His punches stung as though you'd been hit by a hammer, one of his teachers recently explained. The resentment and pain that had been a daily part of Tommy's life had been replaced by animus and anger. As well as training for hours every day, Tommy lifted weights. His body took on the look of a laborer, of a man who worked carrying heavy crates all day every day. Tommy stood in front of a mirror in his parents' home and marveled at his muscles, moving slowly this way and that, admiring so how his body had changed. Inevitably, Tommy began fighting in martial arts competitions. Here he was pitted against boys his own age and weight, and he ate them up. It seemed that there was a full-blown, ferocious man inside the teenage boy. He had a pent-up anger, hostility that, when expressed, was a very difficult obstacle to overcome. It wasn't just a matter of physical strength. It wasn't a matter of larger biceps or thigh muscles, calf muscles— it was something inside the boy's head that would inexorably grow and become a fearsome entity. The endless taunts, abuse, and beatings he had endured had planted a kind of dragon seed in him that would grow into something horrifying and unspeakable. Not only did Tommy bury himself in martial arts, but he began to read voraciously about war in all of its shapes, strategies, and tactics. He learned how to torture how to take apart bodies, where to strike for the maximum effect, where to strike to cause death, how to kill. When Tommy read these words, written carefully by learned men from all over the world, he felt that he was becoming part of an underground culture, a sophisticated society that was wiser and more in touch with the truths of life. His daily martial arts workout, his lifting weights, reading, and the watching of violent movies, particularly martial arts films, was filling the boy with a combustible, dangerous recipe for disaster. Chaos. The fact that the young Patera was growing up on the streets of Gravesend and Bensonhurst added jet fuel to the fire inside him, teeth to the dragon. Here was the largest concentration of Mafia members in the world. This was ground zero for the American La Cosa Nostra. Here was a culture in which the killing of human beings was the norm, here was a culture in which murder was as inevitable as the changing of the seasons. A young boy in this environment could not help but see and know and feel the tangible elements of the mafia that were as much a part of the place as pizzerias and espresso cafes. Tommy Patera came to admire the mafiosi he was surrounded by. They were on every other street corner. They drove fancy cars, they sported silk suits and expensive Italian shoes, and were always well-barbered, cared for. They were a kind of aristocracy for that place and that time, exuding power and a feeling of danger, things Patero was drawn to. For the most part, Patero was a loner. He was ideally suited for what they wanted. Tommy inevitably began fantasizing about going that way, becoming a respected mafioso. He knew that even with his Mickey Mouse voice, nobody would make fun of him any more, that people would speak to him respectfully, look the other way when they saw him coming, that if you fucked with Tommy Patera, you would be dead. To some, this might seem like a fanciful stretch, but when you look at bullied young boys taking up firearms all over the country and attacking their schoolmates and teachers, 
killing them, killing them without guilt or remorse, killing them in the light of day, you can begin to understand the hateful seed that had been planted and was growing in Tommy Patera. They say the soul of a man is in his eyes. Well, when you now looked at Tommy Patera, you saw hooded, bright blue eyes that had the cold, flat depth of ice. One could readily liken his eyes to those of a predatory animal that knows no fear, an animal that would readily tear open your throat. That is its nature. Martial arts gave Tommy Patera a calling. They gave him a belief system that would, he was sure, serve him well for life. Naturally competitive, he became so adept at throwing punches and kicks and avoiding being hit that he won contest after contest. When a large martial arts bout was held in Brooklyn's Sheepshead Bay, Patera competed. In order to win his weight class, he had to fight seven different opponents and ultimately beat them all. This was no small task. There was not only a substantial cash prize, but a large amount of prestige went along with the win. Tommy was also offered a scholarship to go live in Japan and study under one of the country's most revered martial arts masters. For the young Patera, this was an exciting, monumental event. Initially, Tommy's parents didn't like the idea, but they changed their minds and gave him their blessing. They felt it would be good for the boy. He would further learn discipline and strengthen his character. The trip would give him a rare opportunity to see the world outside of Brooklyn, an opportunity that few boys in that neighborhood were afforded. His winning the tournament and the prospect of traveling to Japan further bolstered Tommy's commitment to martial arts. He not only surrounded himself with, immersed himself in, martial arts, but he embraced the Eastern culture's way of thinking, eating, and behaving. Interestingly, he also embraced Eastern cuisine. He began eating sushi before it was fashionable. He shied away from Italian food with its emphasis on dairy products and pasta. When finally the day came for his trip, the Pateras drove their only son to Kennedy Airport and tearfully said goodbye to him. He was not only going to a foreign country, but he was going to a country where they didn't speak English, a country far removed from anything he had known. They were worried for him. However, as Tommy made his way to the gate, there was joy, a quiet rejoicing in his every step. He was not sure where this trip would lead, but he viewed it as an exciting adventure that would bring him in touch with the best martial artists in the world. He felt blessed. All the bullying, all the barbed, vicious taunts, slaps and punches and kicks he regularly suffered were now a thing of the past. The plane taxied and took off, and Tommy Patera was soon high above Jamaica Bay. The sun was setting, and it laid a flaming blanket on the wide expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. Tommy Patera, a Gravesend Brooklyn, was soon speeding toward Japan and his violent destiny at five hundred miles per hour. The dormant, fire-breathing dragon in him slowly awakening. Chapter 4 The Making of a Dragon Slayer as Tommy Patera made his way to Japan to learn the finer points of martial arts, DEA agent Jim Hunt was seventeen years old. Though he didn't know it yet, Hunt had being a cop in his blood. Of course he knew his father and grandfather were both dedicated to law enforcement, but he had no personal connection to their careers, to their morality, their sense of right and wrong, to their dogged adherence to the rule of law. His grandfather, Joe Hunt, emigrated to America from County Roscommon, Ireland, in 1913. Joe heard that there were jobs that paid well in the mines of Montana. After arriving in New York, traveling with fellow Irishmen, he made his way to Montana by way of trains. The work in the mines was back-breaking and bone-twisting, under the worst, most dire of circumstances. But Joe Hunt did not complain. Joe Hunt did what was required of him. He was a genuinely tough man, nearly six feet tall. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, and chiseled cheekbones. In his mind, calluses and sweat went hand in hand with making a living, getting somewhere in life. News of World War I hit Montana like a bomb. Though Joe Hunt hadn't been living in the States long, had only been exposed to backbreaking, menial labor, he felt it was his inherent duty obligation to go fight in the war to end all wars. 
He traveled by a rail back to New York and without hesitation joined the army. As it happened, Joe Hunt was wounded in Hedgegrove country in France, both shot and gassed. Because of the gassing, he would have respiratory problems his whole life. He was given several medals and an honorable discharge. He heard, through family and friends, that there were civil servant jobs available in New York, specifically openings for policemen. This, in a large way, appealed to Joe Hunt, so he found his way back to the cobblestone streets of New York and joined New York's finest. A large, tough man, Joe was ideally suited to work the rough streets of New York. He readily passed the physical and psychological tests, and he began walking a beat, carrying a club and wearing a shiny, brand-new thirty-eight on his hip. Joe quickly took to the job. He liked putting bad guys behind bars. He felt he was not only protecting society, but the weaker members of society, children and women. He felt he was the difference between chaos and order. It was the Roaring Twenties, and drinking and living in excess were the norm, making Joe Hunt a very busy man. Despite the realities of the age, Joe dealt with the curveballs life threw without regret, attributes he would instill in his sons. A dedicated family man, Joe returned home after work every day, and the weekends found him with his family. The murders, the violence, the amazing brutality men showed one another were all left at the door. Joe never brought the job back home to his wife and children, one of whom was named James. When Joe Hunt retired, he was a happy, content man. He had found his niche in life, and he felt he had served society well. Since he was only fifty-two years old, he opened Joe's Stroll Inn Bar on Crescent Street in Queens. The bar was frequented by many in law enforcement, and Joe's Stroll Inn prospered. The problems in Joe Hunt's lungs by way of gassing during the war gave him a severe case of emphysema, which ultimately stole his life away. Like his father before him, James Hunt I, known as Jim, was born to be a cop. But as it turned out, he was a natural-born fighter as well. Not barroom brawls, not with strangers over supposed or real insults. He was not an argumentative individual who was easily offended. Jim was a boxer, a very tough middleweight. As a boy, he began boxing in the Golden Gloves and knocked out numerous opponents. He was fast and agile and had a wicked left and right, both capable of knocking out an opponent. He was thickly muscled, with no fat on his body. If he'd had his choice in life, he would have chosen to be a professional fighter, and he had been moving in that direction. Jim liked the discipline and regimentation of boxing. He liked being the best at what he did, a quality that he would have for the rest of his life. This was an attribute that would make him one of the most successful and famous law enforcement individuals in the annals of American crime history. Gladly, Jim joined the Army and went to war when World War II broke out. He had come to love America, the freedom and equality it readily afforded its citizens. He would gladly lay down his life for America. America's enemies were Jim Hunt's enemies. Inevitably, Jim began boxing in the Army. He quickly rose up the ranks and became an Army middleweight champion. This was no small feat. Given that there were nearly one and a half million men in the army, he had tremendous competition. To be a boxing champion in the United States Army back then immediately elevated the boxer to rock star status, though star status and adulation did not at all interest Jim Hunt. He was a true sportsman, loved boxing, and was in it for the sport and competition. The army was filled with men who not only wanted to fight, but wanted to kill. When there were boxing matches, held in England before the invasion, it was always standing room only. Boxing was by far the most popular pastime for fighting men. The stringent competition only furthered Jim's aspirations to box professionally, to make boxing his life's calling. Jim knocked out most everyone he was pitted against. As it occurred, the reality of war, the reality of fighting an enemy as consistently tough and resistant and belligerent as the Germans were, struck home during the Battle of the Bulge. This was close, hands-on fighting that took place over a period of some thirty-two days, mostly in the Ardennes forests between Belgium and France. These lush, thick, 
fertile forests were a terrible place to make war. The American forces were up against highly motivated, deeply entrenched German soldiers whose ferocious fighting acumen took a terrible toll on the American soldiers. There were some 80,000 Americans killed, maimed, or captured during the campaign. 19,000 were confirmed dead. It was on this bloody stage, man killing man, that James Hunt was severely wounded. As he made his way across an open field, he was brought down by machine gun fire. All around him men lay dead and dying, their blood being quickly absorbed by the fertile soil. James looked up to the sky and cursed in anger. He didn't want to go down like this, lying there, injured, helpless as his buddies continued toward the enemy. At first there was no pain. The natural endorphins of the body kicked in. But soon a hot, angry pain bit into his legs, and all James could do was grit his teeth and wait for help. After a long, torturous convalescence in hospitals both in Europe and stateside, James Hunt was confronted with a life-changing reality. Because of the injuries to his legs, his knees, he could no longer box, his doctors told him. This was a hard blow for a man who had been in superb physical condition all his life, who was endowed with the natural athleticism of an Olympian. Yes, with therapy he could walk all right, but running full out was impossible. With boxing no longer an option, Jim turned toward the only occupation that interested him, law enforcement. When he heard about a new federal agency whose job it was to stop the sale and use of illegal narcotics, his interest was piqued. He saw an opportunity to get in with a meaningful, well-funded federal agency and begin from the bottom up. He saw a way to contribute positively to society. Jim Hunt viewed drugs as the scourge of society. He knew women prostituted not only themselves but their children for drugs. He knew men robbed and stole and even murdered without conscience or remorse for drugs. The name of this new agency was the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, FBN. He joined the FBN, and through diligence, hard work, and a keen, fair sense of what was right and what was wrong, James made a lot of arrests. As well as being physically superior, James was a particularly bright man, a deep thinker, an intellectual who was a voracious reader. He also had a photographic memory, could remember the names and dates and places of most all his arrests. It was uncanny. He was the sharpest knife in a drawer filled with sharp knives. In the FBN, James Hunt was able to put all these talents to use. He quickly rose up the ranks. He was admired and respected by not only his colleagues, but his bosses as well. They saw in Hunt a rare individual who had both street savvy and an abstract intellectual approach to bringing down bad guys, drug dealers, mafiosi. Gangsters had learned, during Prohibition, that providing goods and services outlawed by the government could be very lucrative. They began to think of narcotics as they had once thought of illegal alcohol. There was a huge demand for substances that took away pain, for substances that made you feel good for substances that added lust and fuel to sex. Cocaine became known as an aphrodisiac. Heroin took away all ills, pains, discomforts, failures in life. Men and women, America's youth, were dying all over the country because of drugs. It didn't take long for organized crime, for the mafia, to see the great money-making potential in illegal narcotics. In that the Mafia was already deeply immersed in all things illegal, it wasn't a far throw for them to not only pick up the ball but carry it and run far. Through the American Mafia's connection with mafiosi in Sicily, contacts were made to get heroin from Turkey to Sicily and, ultimately, to the United States for distribution. These Italians developed amazingly ingenious ways to bring heroin into the States, disguising it in cans of olive oil crucifixes, and tall religious statues. They turned pure heroin into molds of candied fruit, painted and colored and sculpted perfectly. Suddenly, the United States government was facing a heroin epidemic coming out of not only Sicily, but all of Italy. In 1956, 
the Mafia realized that Canada would be an ideal place through which to get heroin into the country. There were thousands of miles of unpoliced border, desolate forests, slow-moving rivers. As the Mafia's tactics for narcotics trafficking evolved and became more sophisticated, James Hunt found himself at the epicenter of the war on drugs. He made arrests of major men in the Mafia, personally putting the cuffs on Carmine Galante, a very dangerous war captain in the Bonanno family, a bona fide psychopath, and Big John Ormento, a Lucchese family capo and one of the biggest heroin traffickers of all time. Along with his partner, Frank Waters, Jim arrested the head of the Genovese family, Vito Genovese. Genovese, a tall, gaunt, dead-eyed man with high cheekbones and a wrinkled, hard face, was fond of a particular steak restaurant in Germantown on East 86th Street. He often ate at this restaurant. James Hunt and Frank Waters managed to have a Puerto Rican informer by the name of Nelson Cantalupes convince a Genovese captain that he was on the up-and-up, one of them cut from the same cloth. In turn, the captain brought Cantalupes to meet Genovese at the restaurant. Genovese gave Cantalupes his blessing to sell drugs, as Frank Waters and James Hunt sat at the bar watching them, the restaurant crowded. The two government men blended in as well as the bottles behind the bar. With this observation, Genovese was arrested and sentenced to ten years' hard time, though his heart gave out before his time was up and he died in prison, forlorn and forgotten, a very angry man. As a part of this same case, Hunt and Waters also arrested an up-and-coming mafia star, a former boxer named Vincente the Chin Gigante, who in years to come would be made the infamous head of the Genovese family. Early in his career, James Hunt hooked up with a partner. His name was Arthur Mendelssohn, a quiet, unassuming man, but as tough as rusted barbed wire. Together, Hunt and Mendelssohn were an extremely effective combination. Both World War II veterans who had been wounded in battle, the pair became known as Death and Destruction throughout the agency. James Hunt was also known as Jim Hurt, for when perps tangled with Hunt, defied him, got tough with him, they were inevitably hurt. Jim's reputation grew by leaps and bounds. He became one of the most respected and revered men in the history of the FBN, which by that point had been renamed the BNDD, Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. As the battle to keep illegal drugs out of the country, out of the hands of the weak and needy, out of the hands of the addicts, intensified, the BNDD was expanded by Richard Nixon in 1973 and renamed yet again the Drug Enforcement Administration, better known as the DEA. The DEA was well-funded, focused, and had the support of both parties. Any politician who wasn't supportive of the war on drugs would be committing political suicide. Both liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans lined up behind and supported the DEA. Here, for the first time, was an agency whose sole purpose was stopping the importation of drugs, the sale of drugs, the distribution of drugs. This was no easy task, and the amounts of money at stake were colossal. For the most part, the men and women of the DEA were straight shooters, but the temptation to steal was great. There would be sometimes millions of dollars in crates and paper bags there for the taking. There, too, would be hundreds of pounds of cocaine, heroin, tons of marijuana, all tempting agents who had mortgages, often struggling to pay the bills, feed their families. However, compared to police departments in large cities across the country and other federal agencies, the DEA garnered a very good reputation. It was their job to extinguish the firestorm of drug abuse that had spread across the country over the last several years. It was no longer a disenfranchised group of society that delved into drugs, musicians, blacks, those on the down and out. Now drugs were becoming popular, indeed fashionable. As the appeal of drugs increased, so did the demand for them. Bold men with bold plans, unafraid of the punishment, unafraid of being arrested, saw the opportunity to get rich and went for it. One of the more notorious of these individuals was one Frank Superfly Lucas, 
a large, strapping black man from the South, by far the most successful, dangerous drug dealer in New York, indeed, in America. He was cagey and surrounded himself with killers and good attorneys. He also killed anyone he thought might be an informer before they ever had a chance to talk. He managed to develop a trusted relationship with the Gambino crime family. They supplied him with all the heroin he could sell. The Gambinos, in turn, secured the heroin from the Bonanno crime family. In January of 1975, Frank Lucas finally went down. James Hunt helped orchestrate and put together the extensive investigation against Lucas and was there the blistering cold night Lucas was arrested at his home in Teaneck, New Jersey. Busts like those of Lucas and Gigante helped Hunt rise to be second in command of the DEA's office in New York, but there was always more work to do, more dealers to catch, more people who belonged behind bars. For every Frank Lucas who had been caught, there were a dozen others waiting in the shadows to take his place. Chapter 5 The Apple Doesn't Fall Far From the Tree Though he had become one of the most talented lawmen in the country, Jim Hunt Sr. always remembered a valuable lesson he had learned from his father, to not bring his work home to his wife and three kids in Cambria Heights, Queens. James was a family man, and he kept his home life and his work life as separate as possible. Still, he did let his children know about the perils of drugs. He did let them know the difference between right and wrong. He was not overly strict, but he kept a close eye on his two sons, Jim Jr. and Brian. The Hunts also had a daughter, Colleen. She had strawberry blonde hair, was attractive, and people readily warmed to her. She would later become a very popular on-air reporter in the New York metropolitan area. She was tenacious and always seemed to ask the right questions. There was one time, Jim Hunt Jr. remembers, when he and some friends had gotten very drunk on cheap wine called Boone's Farm. When Jim stumbled in that evening, his father was there. All he did was make sure his son got to bed and stayed put. The following day, however, Jim Sr. bought a whole case of Boone's Farm and put it in the basement. He told his sixteen-year-old son he could go in the basement with his friends and drink all the wine he wanted to. Drink until his heart's content, he said. If you've got a drink like that, do it at home. I don't want you drinking and getting drunk on the street like some forgotten bum. You get your friends, and you drink here. He learned a good lesson about drinking excessively. Like his father, Jim Hunt Jr. excelled at sports. He was a natural-born athlete, particularly well-coordinated, had a thin, muscular physique that responded well to all types of sports, including boxing. James Sr. had taught his son the rudiments of fighting early on. He told him where to place his feet, how to throw a left, and how to throw a right, with maximum effect. He also, perhaps more importantly, taught him how to avoid a punch by moving his head. Several times, at a local nightclub Jim hung out at, Dizzy Duncan's in New Jersey, there were fights and brawls. Inevitably, Jim got involved in these altercations and broke them up, pulled combatants apart. Before he knew it, he was offered a job as a bouncer. The money was good, his friends were there, and he had access to girls. Lots of girls. What made Jim stand out was that he was always cool under pressure, that his head seemed to rise above the fray. He was particularly good at talking guys out of fighting one another, though if need be, he was just as adept at knocking out people who wouldn't listen to reason. Jim Hunt was about reasoning, not brawling. As weeks and months went by, still living at home, Jim began to think seriously about a career other than as a bouncer. He couldn't help but think of law enforcement. After all, his grandfather and father, as well as uncles and cousins, were all cops who were highly respected and honored by their friends and colleagues. The more Jim thought about law enforcement, his getting between the bad guys and the innocents, the more the job appealed to him. He thought about what branch of law enforcement he would join, and like his grandfather, cousins, brother, and uncles, he decided on the NYPD. He knew, too, in the NYPD he would have good health benefits and an excellent pension plan. 
It was no secret that Jim was particularly bright and knew the ways of the street well. He felt that in due time he'd be giving orders instead of taking them, that he'd make sergeant, lieutenant, and captain. At that juncture in his life, Jim had no desire to get married or have a family. He saw married life as something that was not, at that point, for him. Jim Hunt went and spoke to his father, and his dad thought Jim's turning to law enforcement was an excellent idea. Jim applied to the New York Police Department, took the physical, and began the six-month course at the New York Police Academy on East 20th Street, looking forward to the prospect of serious police work in the great city of New York. To Jim, New York was the heart and soul of the world, and he looked forward to protecting society from its degenerates, miscreants, and criminals. On his way to the academy, as Jim read about different crimes in the newspapers, he was appalled at how women and children were put upon, beaten and battered and raped. This was during the height of the drug epidemic plaguing the United States, and street crimes were off the charts. Jim excelled at the firing range. He became a crack shot. He knew the thirty-eight revolver the police department issued was a tool of his trade, a tool that could save his life, his partner's life, an innocent's life. Every week he spent extra hours at the pistol range, perfecting his shooting prowess. When, toward the end of the course, Jim was asked where he'd like to be placed, he purposely picked one of the toughest known precincts in all of New York City, the 34th Precinct in Washington Heights. Jim was not about to go through the motions. He wanted to be in the epicenter of where crime was happening on a large scale, to be in the action. When he started at the 34th precinct, he was assigned to walk a beat, precisely what he had wanted. With his fair skin and red hair, Jim Hunt stuck out in Harlem like a carrot in a cabbage patch. He had a pleasant baby face, a warm, beguiling smile, and he quickly made acquaintances and friends with shop owners and residents on his beat. Jim knew good police work was, to a large degree, about having your ear to the ground, both eyes wide open, having informants. He let the word be passed all along his beat that he would welcome information about crimes and keep the source a secret. Like this, little by little, Jim heard about robberies, assaults, drug deals, murders, and unspeakable sex crimes. He began to shine. As well as being clever, easy to talk to, easy to warm to, Jim Hunt was fearless. Often he'd make an arrest by himself without a second thought. He had a gun, he knew how to use it well, and he was very good with his hands. Yet if he needed backup, he'd call for it. He knew a good partner was worth his weight in gold. As much as Jim liked police work at the NYPD, he came to realize that his opportunities for promotion were inherently limited at the NYPD. Jim began thinking of leaving the force for federal law enforcement. He heard through family that there were positions open in the Secret Service. He went to their offices at One World Trade Center, took the exams, and passed with flying colors. Next, he had to be interviewed by a senior Secret Service agent. These interviews were to establish if any given individual was adequately qualified to be in the Secret Service, that is, capable of protecting the President and other political luminaries of the United States. A senior agent named Jack Sullivan interviewed him and said, Jim, I like everything about you. You did great on the test. You're the kind of guy we're looking for, but I don't know if you'll like the job. I don't know if we are what you're looking for. This caught Jim off guard. Why is that? he asked. Jim, what we do is not hands-on. I'm telling you this as a friend, as though you were family. What we do is all about waiting, watching. What I think you're used to, what I think you want, is to be in the action, to be out there making arrests, chasing down bad guys running over rooftops. Jim Hunt smiled. Well, he said, yeah, right. Well, Jim, that's not what we do, Jack repeated. Jim Hunt thanked him, and the two men soon parted. As Jim made his way down the elevators, his mind went toward the DEA, his father's home turf. Jim Hunt, Jr. was soon enrolled in the four-month course given by the Drug Enforcement Administration at Quantico, Virginia. His class trained alongside the new class of the FBI. The DEA and the FBI were sister agencies. 
Though they were supposed to be working harmoniously, hand in hand, they were often at odds with one another, competing to see who could piss the farthest. Though Jim was only twenty-six years old, he was serious beyond his years. Jim knew the job was about life and death, but that did not distract or dismay him in the least. He concerned himself with doing the job well. At the DEA Academy at Quantico, there were plaques to commemorate agents killed in the line of duty. These men were thought of as heroes, but to Jim they were heroes and more. They were good, decent family men who had been struck down and killed before their time, for all the wrong reasons. Jim was a natural loner. He had come to rely on himself, his own resources. He was brought up that way. His father had taught him to deal with life's twists and turns with his own two hands. He taught him to think on his feet. Jim was anxious to get out of the academy and hit the streets. He had no idea where he'd be assigned, for the DEA had offices in pretty much every major city in the world, but he hoped to be assigned to New York. He still viewed the Big Apple as the heartbeat of the world, its tarnished soul. After Jim had finished his classwork, his wish was granted when he was assigned to New York. He immediately began working out of the DEA's office at 555 West 57th Street, just off 11th Avenue. It was a large, white office building with a car dealership on the ground floor, innocuous. The DEA occupied just three floors in the mostly commercial office building, but from these three floors they were fighting a multitude of battles in the war on drugs. Here strategies were put together. Here groups were assigned to fight on different fronts. Jim Hunt took to the DEA like a duck to water. When he first arrived, he was assigned to Group 33, composed of hand-picked, serious, seasoned DEA agents. Group 33 had seen and done it all. It was the place to be. They were on the front lines, in the trenches, in the war on drugs, the best of the best that the DEA had. These were dedicated, highly motivated men and women who believed in their hearts that drugs were the undoing of society, an evil tantamount to the plague. Of all the different groups in all the different DEA offices in all the world, Group 33 was by far the most successful. They moved at two hundred miles an hour, ran on octane fuel. They had a single purpose in mind, and they had become particularly good at carrying it out. It was no secret who Jim's father was, and Jim was greeted warmly. At this juncture, his father was literally a hero in the DEA, a legend within the agency. Jim had some big shoes to fill, but that never entered his mind. He was not the kind of man who would compete with his own father. He would do his best and let the chips fall where they may. Jim Hunt was particularly suited, however, to be in the DEA. He was street smart, quick-witted, personable, and genuinely tough. He was also a consummate actor. One of Jim Hunt's first cases was an outgrowth of the infamous Pizza Connection case. The original case involved hundreds of players, all of whom were mafiosi, the majority of them hailing from Sicily. From the years 1975 to 1984, the Sicilians cleverly, diabolically, brought some $1.6 billion worth of heroin into the United States. Always shrewd, always audacious and deadly, taking advantage of whatever situation presented itself, they began selling heroin across the length and breadth of the United States. Many of the players, coincidentally, owned pizza places. Thus the operation became known as the Pizza Connection Case. One of the busiest locations was Aldente's Pizza in Forest Hills, Queens. Here you could get a slice or a Sicilian piece of pizza, veal parmigiana and meatball heroes, calzones and zeppolis, and amazingly pure Turkish heroin. Through the ingenious, clever use of wiretaps, surveillance, infiltration, and informants, the DEA, with the help of local police jurisdictions and the FBI, put together a monumental, airtight case that would end up with 18 out of the 22 defendants convicted. These were no small, would-be mafiosi. 
there were major players involved, cunning mafia superstars, including family heads Gaetano Badalamente and Domenico Lagalbo. One of the reasons the prosecutors managed to get so many convictions was that they turned the boss of bosses, the Caruso of the mafia, Tommaso Buschetta. He was by far the most important mafioso to ever become an informer. He knew more about the intimate workings of the mafia than most five bosses put together. Having someone of his stature and importance, with the amount of knowledge regarding the inner workings of the mafia, was a groundbreaking event. It would teach prosecutors a very good lesson. They came to know that if they could manage to get the heads and bosses of any given family to talk, they, the prosecutors, could bring down the whole house of cards. The case that grew from this, the Pizza 2 case, opened Jim's eyes to the workings of the Mafia and how dedicated and diabolical his adversaries were. He came away from it with a sense of satisfaction that he had accomplished something important. Had the heroine the DEA intercepted made it to the street, thousands of lives would have been marginalized, squandered, lost. Little did Jim Hunt know that he would soon be up against an adversary a monster of the night, far more evil than any of the mafiosi associated with the Pizza Connection case. There were dark skies, thunder, and lightning just over the horizon, swiftly moving toward Jim Hunt. Chapter 6 Cherry Blossoms and Samurai Tommy Patera loved Japan. He especially liked how polite the people were to one another, their thoughtful approach to food and art, particularly their mindset regarding martial arts. Here was a society, a culture, a way of life that had been founded on the samurai, the ultimate machismo culture. Though the samurai were long gone and forgotten, their way of life was still very much a part of modern Japanese thinking. In a very real sense, the Japanese's success in business, their world domination of business, had to do with a samurai approach to life, to work. The Japanese thought of themselves as a superior people. They thought of themselves as smarter, wiser, and more resilient. Through the consistent application of intellectual pursuits, higher education, and the samurai way of thinking, they believed they could conquer the world. The world as such got a foul, bitter taste of the samurai warlike thinking when the Japanese attacked China's Manchurian province in 1931. We witnessed a barbarism on an unprecedented scale, unspeakable torture and rape and murder, the norm. Arrogantly, in broad daylight in squares all over Manchuria, shaking, quivering Chinese were beheaded. This was not done in secret, forgotten places or prisons. It was done defiantly, openly, for all the world to see and know. Chinese women were systematically turned into prostitutes to satisfy the Japanese soldiers' cravings for sex. However, there was no quid pro quo. The women received nothing but brutal rape after brutal rape after brutal rape. The Japanese soldiers felt they had an inherent right that they were samurai, and they could take and do whatever they wanted with whomever they pleased. It became a known fact that the Japanese soldiers turned their libidos on the young, the raping of prepubescent girls and boys, the sodomizing of them, was the norm, brutally real. The great expatriate writer Pearl S. Buck documented in her unforgettable novel Dragon Seed the destruction of a Chinese family at the hands of Japanese soldiers, and how a seven-year-old boy in the family was repeatedly raped by a group of soldiers. This young boy grew up to be a fierce, partisan fighter. There was no rule of law. No country interceded, stepped in, and tried to stop the daily brutality. Year after year it went on, fueled by the twisted interpretation of the samurai way of thinking. In 1937, Japan attacked China on a full scale all-out war. Unchecked, unchallenged, now the Japanese conquered the whole of China, a huge country with an enormous population. 
The Japanese gleefully raped and stole and pilfered as they went. They were like a plague of locusts that left nothing alive in its wake. All was dead. The Japanese began to believe that they were invincible, that they were above the laws of men. This, fused with the samurai belief system, made a very dangerous foe. They were without conscience, remorseless, took great pride in their brutality, in their indifference to life. When, on December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, they did so truly believing that they could, surely would, beat America at war. Again, because of the samurai way of thinking, they believed that the Americans were soft, that they would not fight, that they would quickly give up, and Japan would control North America. The Japanese obviously underestimated not only America's resources, but America's willingness to fight. In reality, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they awakened a sleeping giant. They awakened a fighting machine the likes of which the world had never known. As the two countries fought horrific battles all over the South Pacific, it became obvious that because of the samurai code, the Japanese would never give up, that they would fight to the death. An outgrowth of the samurai culture was the kamikazes, fighter pilots who gladly steered their planes into enemies' ships. They were able to do devastating damage to Americans. The damage did not come about so much because of the bomb-laden planes the Japanese flew as because of the mindset of the kamikaze pilots who gleefully gave up their lives. Fighting an enemy only too happy to die was a difficult adversary. In Washington, it was decided that the only way to end the war would be to drop atomic bombs, for it was commonly believed, understood, that the Japanese would never give up unless they absolutely had to. The warlike mindset, the obsession the Japanese had, would not allow them to give up. Thus, Americans dropped two atomic bombs, one on Nagasaki and one on Hiroshima, quite literally blowing the samurai belief system into oblivion. Faced with this overwhelming, devastating power, the Japanese finally surrendered, unconditionally. After World War II, a new way of thinking swept over Japan. The Japanese became a society of pacifists. They had no army. They wanted no army. They became a world power again, not through military prowess, but through financial genius. However, the samurai culture again reared its head. Now it was applied more toward business rather than war. For many Japanese, it was still something to be revered and proud of. The direction of this belief system now took a new path. It became more part of individuals and corporations' mantra rather than an army's. Martial arts schools opened and flourished across Japan. Japanese martial artists became world famous, held in high esteem, and thought of as rock stars. It was into this modern take on the samurai culture, into this world, that Tommy Patera entered when he landed in Japan. What drew Patera to this place, to this mindset and culture, was the steely, stoic, warlike approach to life the samurai not only lived but embraced with all their being. In a sense, the samurai warrior was a mirror reflection of old-school mafiosi. Respect, honor, bravery were all intricately woven between these two Spartan, warrior-like mentalities. Patera thought little about what the Japanese did to the Chinese in World War II. What drew him to Japan, what drew him to the samurai way of life, was the Japan of old, the Japan where men lived and died by the sword. He was here to study martial arts. He was here to make the world of the samurai warrior his. He would become a samurai warrior. He would be fearless and remorseless and unbeatable, invincible. The killer in Tommy Patera had flown halfway around the world to find a comfortable place to develop, grow, learn. Here the dragon would find nourishment and sustenance, become a dangerous creature of the night. Wide-eyed and innocent, though with war on his mind, Patera showed up at the martial arts school in Tokyo, Japan. He studied under Japan's revered sensei, Hiroshi Masumi. Every day Tommy showed up at class and worked out with a fervor and dedication that was religious. 
Seven days a week he fought with his hands, his feet, and various Japanese weapons, tonfa, nunchucks, bows, and katanas. His muscles, which had been toned already from his years of training, became rock-hard. His facial features changed, too. His cheekbones became higher. The teenage fat melted off his face. His face became more angular and defined. His stick-straight black hair grew even longer and contrasted with his blue-gray eyes, making him an unsettling sight. Though his effeminate voice stayed with him, here, however, nobody made fun of him. Here, Patera was respected and thought of as a champion athlete, fighter. Patera ate mostly fish and rice and seaweed, and there was little fat on his body. For entertainment he read voraciously, books about war, martial arts, how to kill. He read about where to stab and slash and cut for the maximum effect. He studied killing people the way a dedicated student involved in physics studies numbers. He became obsessed with not only winning every fight he fought, but winning decisively, irreversibly, killing his enemies. For the first time in his life, it seemed like he had discovered a place in the world where he fit in. When it was time to go, he wasn't ready to leave, and instead went to work in a chopsticks factory to help underwrite his stay and make ends meet. His mother and her sister, Angelina Bogowski, came over to visit him. They were both impressed by the change in his physical appearance, how he had matured, how much he had grown, and how much he thought of the Japanese culture and people, his grounded sensibility. Now, when Patera fought in tournaments, he always won. Even his sensei shied away from him in fights. When he hit people, he broke bones, traumatized flesh and muscle and sinew. He left his opponents covered in black and blues, contusions. Like all championship fighters, Patera inevitably began to think of himself as invincible. He no longer walked, he strutted, head high, shoulders back, his chest out, defiant. Now it was he who looked down on people. Now he was an alpha male, a predator, a burgeoning dragon. Tommy Patera became so absorbed in his life in martial arts, in the culture of Japan, that the days went by unusually fast. In no time the young man had been there some twenty-seven months. He had learned everything he could, developed himself into a fighting machine. His muscles were much like those of a thoroughbred horse. It looked as though steel cables were alive under his flesh. Still, he was not sure what he wanted to do with his life. Could he make a living at martial arts? Perhaps he could open a martial arts school— though he was not the type that had either the patience or inclination to teach. He was, by nature, self-centered, and was not apt to teach what he had learned through hard work, blood, and sweat. Tommy Patera knew it was time to go home, time for him to return to Brooklyn. Even he, back then there in Japan, had no idea he would end up one of the most feared assassins the Mafia had ever known, a capo in the Bonanno crime family, a killer who would take a place of honor, infamy, in the Mafia's infamous Hall of Fame. Chapter 7 The Bananos. The history of the Bonanno crime family goes back several hundred years, beginning in Castellamare del Golfo, in Sicily. Back then, the Bonanos were men of respect, educated, wealthy landowners not a ruthless gang of killers and thugs. They were a family that comported itself with their heads high, with pride. In 1903, Joseph Bonanno emigrated with his family to Brooklyn, New York. A particularly bright, ambitious young man, hard-working and not afraid to take chances, Joseph Bonanno quickly made a go of it in his new country. He was a tall, good-looking, affable individual, though tough when necessary. Through family connections, he met the higher-ups in La Cosa Nostra. The organization was then thought of as a group of Italians who banded together to prosper, to make a living, to benefit their families in what they viewed as a hostile, unwelcoming society. It was no secret that Italians were not allowed in unions, that Italians were thought of as an ignorant, backward people who ate too much spaghetti, drank too much wine, were oversexed and gruff. 
There was such open animus toward the Italian immigrants that the Statue of Liberty became known as the Statue of Spaghetti, because steamboats coming from Italy had to pass the statue on their way to Ellis Island. Even the venerable Herald Tribune regularly referred to the Statue of Liberty by this slanderous nickname. Through these connections, Giovanano became involved with Salvatore Maranzano, a seasoned, scheming, extremely tough mafioso. In the young Giovanano, Maranzano saw a particular brilliance, a ready willingness to follow orders, a willingness to do whatever he was told, a willingness to put La Cosa Nostra before all things, no questions asked. He was, Maranzano knew, a rising star with tremendous potential. In 1929, a bloody war broke out between Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. The conflict, which became known as the Castella Marese War, claimed many lives. Giovanano fought diligently and well on Maranzano's side. Ultimately, Masseria was murdered with the help of Lucky Luciano and Tommy Lucchese. With the guidance and good business sense of Lucky Luciano and Salvatore Maranzano, the New York Mafia was divided into five families, Mangano, Maranzano, Luciano, Profaci, and Anastasia. Luciano and Maranzano devised a clever plan in which the different crime families would be given different territories and rackets that they would run autonomously, as though successful corporations. The Italians were inspired by men like Henry Ford, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Joe Kennedy, who they thought took hold and manipulated circumstances to their advantage. Luciano, however, was not happy with the way Maranzano had divvied up different rackets, and, moving with the lethal speed of a rattlesnake, struck and killed Maranzano. To people in the know, it seemed inevitable that one of these two men would kill the other. There could be only one boss of bosses, there could only be one alpha male in a wolf pack, and so Maranzano went down. The fact that Joe Bonanno was able to work well with Luciano after he killed his mentor spoke volumes about him. Bonanno was not about revenge, was not about getting even. Though revenge was surely in his Sicilian blood, he saw the wisdom of peace. He saw the wisdom of looking the other way and forgetting what Luciano had done. Peace reigned, everyone prospered. The outlawing of liquor, prohibition, enabled all the five families to make staggering amounts of money. Joe Bonanno quickly managed to develop a large network of stills and distributors. In a short period of time, Bonanno became a very wealthy man. To him, the selling of alcohol was no big deal. He believed if men wanted to have a drink, they had every right in the world. That was their business. The fact that it was an illegal substance meant little to Joe Bonanno. Narcotics, cocaine, heroin, and marijuana were outlawed very much like alcohol had been. La Cosa Nostra, initially, saw nothing wrong with supplying society's need for narcotics. For them, it was just an extension of bootleg alcohol. After all, Joe Bonanno was quick to point out, Joe Kennedy, a pillar of the community, was a bootlegger, Yet no one pointed a finger at him, or called him names, or prevented him from becoming an ambassador to England. Indeed, years later, when Joe Bonanno wrote his memoir, he used a picture of Joe Kennedy in the book, likening himself to what Kennedy had been, a bon vivant, a man of the world. More than any other mafia group, the Bonanno crime family dealt in drugs, and they did it more openly and defiantly than any other Borgata. With his deep roots going back to Sicily, Joe Bonanno had little difficulty finding sources for high-grade heroin in nearby Turkey. With the help of Sicilian counterparts and, later, French gangsters out of Corsica and Marseille, Bonanno and his contemporaries discovered clever new ways to bring heroin into the United States. In 1956, Joe Bonanno traveled to Italy. He had with him his top capos, including Carmine Lilo Galante, Bonanno was received in Rome as though he was a highly respected ambassador from the United States. Red carpets were laid out for him. Bonanno and his entourage then traveled to Sicily, and there they were embraced as though he were Italian royalty. Dressed to the nines, 
He posed for the local media as though he were a movie star. He and his entourage stayed at the Grand Hotel et des Palmes, where they wined and dined like kings. Nothing was too good for them. The best food, wine, grappas, and champagnes. The Black Prince of the Mafia himself, preternatural Lucky Luciano, joined Bonanno and company, and over a four-day period, working day and night, the logistics of exactly how heroin would be brought to the States were perfected. Bonanno put feared, psychotic street couple Carmine Galante in charge of bringing heroin into the States via Canada. After their trip to Italy, Galante went to Canada and set up a network based in Montreal that enabled the Bonanos to get their hands on all the pure heroin they wanted. They made a fortune. Let the good times roll. Heroin spread across the country like some insidious disease that showed no mercy, that destroyed everything in its wake. In all walks of society, heroin users became mere shells of who they had been. Women and children were sold for the drug. Desperate junkies would sell everything that wasn't nailed down. They robbed their own mothers without a second thought or pang of conscience. People were found dead on New York's Park Avenue, as well as in tenements and on tobacco roads throughout the country. Washington lawmakers could not help but see and know and feel the problems in their district, in every town and city and state. There was a clamor for change. Newspaper editorials from California to New York demanded more stringent laws. The public outcry was such that politicians could not ignore their constituents, and much stricter laws governing the importation and sale of heroin were quickly and with little debate enacted. Initially, the Mafia had thought of heroin as they had thought of alcohol. The Mafia misunderstood the way the law, the courts, Washington, would respond to the selling of heroin. The penalties for selling narcotics were far stiffer than they were for bootlegging. The penalties for selling narcotics were now as harsh as, or even harsher than, those for murder. With the change in laws, La Cosa Nostra was forced to re-examine, take a closer look at, the issue. The full Mafia Commission, comprised of the head of each family, had a meeting to decide whether or not they should deal in drugs as a group. Ultimately, it was decided that they would not deal in drugs, because the penalties were so stiff, the punishments so severe, that sooner or later their kind would turn on one another, cannibalize each other, they knew. In theory, this was a wise decision. However, many men in La Cosa Nostra did not adhere to this mandate. Vito Genovese, Carmine Galante, and Vincente the Chin Gigante were all arrested for dealing in heroin, and sent away with stiff sentences. Genovese got ten years, Carmine Galante received twenty years, and Vincente the Chin ten years. None of these mafia superstars ratted anyone out. They stayed stoic and silent and did their time. Even though La Cosa Nostra members faced serious time behind bars and retribution from their contemporaries, they continued to deal drugs. The profit was enormous. It was nearly impossible for them to look the other way, especially when they saw other ethnic groups throughout the tri-state area selling drugs and becoming filthy rich. Too tempting to ignore, selling drugs became something La Cosa Nostra did off the books. Any given individual who was made, who was a mafioso, could sell drugs, but had to do it covertly, secretly, off the record. Captains and consigliers, underbosses and bosses, all took the money and looked the other way, acting as though they were deaf and dumb and blind. They saw nothing wrong with what they were doing. The Bonanno Borgata was the only family that openly defied the commission, the other families. The Bonanos were a large family and had many tough soldiers and war captains, the baddest of the bad. None of the other four families would challenge the Bonanos because they knew it would result in a long, bloody war. It became a kind of laissez-faire situation. The Bonanos sold drugs. Everyone acted as though they weren't. In reality, the Bonanos were doing, more or less, what everyone else in La Cosa Nostra was doing, just more openly, defiantly, brazenly. The Bonanos feared 
prosperous and powerful, were always looking for good men. Such was the state of affairs in 1976 when Tommy Patera boarded a 747 in Tokyo, Japan, and returned to the United States, returned to Brooklyn's Gravesend Bensonhurst, his home, his roots. Here the Bananos were deeply entrenched. Here they had social clubs. Here their soldiers, lieutenants, couples, and bosses lived, brought up their children, bonded, married, celebrated holidays, and prospered. Here is where they lived out the American dream. Part 2. Killers Fear Him. Chapter 8. The Green Hornet and the Bananos. In the twenty-seven months Patera had been living in Japan, he had matured considerably beyond his years. This was no longer a frail boy trying to overcome various inferiority complexes. He was now a confident man, opinionated, well-read in the history of war, well-read in the destruction of human beings. While in Japan he had not only studied martial arts using fists and feet of fury, but he had mastered all the different accoutrements. Tommy Patera's hands were now weapons. His feet were weapons. However, more important than anything was his mindset. He was, he had become, he had molded himself into a killer. He had come to view killing, the martial arts, as a literal art form. There was no room in this art form for conscience, sympathy, or remorse. Consistent with the samurai way of thinking of old, Tommy Patera had become a remorseless killer of men. Oddly enough, he showed tremendous deference and respect to women, his mother, his sister, girlfriends. They were all treated well by Patera. He was no longer shy, quiet, and withdrawn. He no longer blended in with the furniture. Now he looked people directly in the eye and walked with his head high, stoic, hard-jawed, dragon-eyed. He thought about what exactly he would do in life, how he would make his living. Patera wanted the good things life had to offer, a fancy home in a nice neighborhood. He wanted his parents to be proud of his achievements. He wanted his friends to look up to him. With no family connections, trade, or particular business training or acumen under his black belt, Tommy Patera's prospects were minimal. Again, he thought about teaching martial arts, thought about opening his own school, but this did not excite or interest him beyond an occasional fleeting daydream. Inevitably, Tommy Patera came to a crossroads. One road led to the dry, mundane destiny his father had reached. The other road, red with blood, led to power and riches, respect and adulation. Born and raised in Gravesend, Tommy Patero was known and readily accepted by the mafiosi who saturated the neighborhood. The respect and trappings mafiosi had as a matter of course were things Patero wanted. How could he not? The straight life was not for him. A nine-to-five gig for him was anathema. The thought of taking the subway to work every day was nauseating. Naturally enough, given who he'd become, what he was about— the fire-breathing dragon within, he began hanging out in mob bars, social clubs, and restaurants in Gravesend and Bensonhurst, and there rubbed shoulders on a regular basis with mafia soldiers, lieutenants, captains, underbosses, and even bosses. They warmed to him. He warmed to them. It was no secret that he was a martial arts expert, and soon Tommy Patera became known as Tommy Karate. Mafiosi have an amazing penchant for giving one another nicknames. Some of these names were amusing. Sally Socks, Vinny the Nose, Vincente the Chin Gigante, Anthony Gaspipe Casso, Vinny Bean, Sammy the Bull, Vinny Gorgeous, Anthony Bruno Whack Whack, Carmine the Snake, the Mad Hatter, Kid Blast Gallo, Crazy Joe Gallo, Lilo Gigante, Sonny Red in Delicato, and on and on. These names were also a good way to hide the true identity of any given mafioso. They confused the cops, they confused the FBI, but among themselves they all knew who they were. 
In order to become a made man in any of the New York crime families, you must take an oath on a saint, swearing allegiance to the crime family above all other things, even one's own family, parents, wives, children. There is also a knife and a gun on the table at which the oath is made. In addition to the made men, there is an outer core of men known as associates who actively work with the mafia. Associates are protected by the family they are involved with. They are, in a sense, surrogate members of the family. If any given associate does particularly well, exhibits loyalty, dedication, willingness to follow orders blindly, that associate could very well be nominated to become a full-fledged made man. One of the made men that Tommy Karate Patera began hanging out with was a deadly, erratic, psychotic killer, one Anthony Bruno in Delicato. It would be in Delicato who would open the door into La Cosa Nostra for Tommy Patera. Bruno was one of the premier killers in the Bonanno family. He killed so readily with such a plum and such ease that he actually became known as Whack Whack. Bruno was tall and thin and muscular, had a dark complexion and a large beguiling smile that seemed to stretch from ear to ear. Women were readily drawn to him. Contrary to Bruno's good looks, he began balding prematurely when he was in his mid-twenties and had difficulty coping with the loss of his hair. This stone-cold killer who shot stabbed and beat people to death, was more concerned with his hair loss than with the terrible destruction he wrought upon his many victims. He had an abundance of vanity, but no conscience, morality. Hair, for him, represented masculinity and virility. In fact, he was so preoccupied with his hair loss, so put out by it, that his constant complaints to fellow mafiosi drove them nuts. Bruno was one of the first people in the New York tri-state area to get a hair transplant, but it didn't work. As well as having developed an inferiority complex regarding his hair, regarding his appearance, Bruno was a dedicated cokehead. This was a very dangerous thing for a made man to be. The Mafia, as a whole, viewed drug users as unreliable, potential trouble, weak links in a carefully put together very strong chain. Bruno came from a family with close mafia ties. His father, Sonny Red in Delicato, was a respected capo in the Bonanno family, while his uncle Joseph was also a capo in the Bonanno family. As a result, people looked out for Bruno and constantly warned him to stay away from drugs. He kept promising he would. He dutifully went to rehab. Upon release from rehab, he was as handsome as a movie star and as charming as a seasoned car salesman. However, Bruno would go back to his old ways, snorting and smoking cocaine while acting completely out of control. Bruno's drug use did not deter Patera from pursuing a friendship with this erratic killer. Bruno and Patera were tight and fond of each other. Together, they made for a volatile mixture. One could readily liken it to mixing arsenic and cyanide. Bruno and Tommy were cultural contemporaries, both of them blindly dedicated to the rules and laws and mandates of La Cosa Nostra, not society. Fuck society. Fuck its rules and regulations. These two lived by a different beat. Rhythm they heard only in their heads. With Bruno's assistance, blessings, and encouragement, Patera became a Bonanno associate. Patera was eager to please, and others in the family quickly took a shine to him. He had all the right moves, comported himself perfectly, said all the right things. With Bruno's support, Tommy Patera earned his bones, committed a murder, and killed for the Bonanno family. Dismemberment, the taking apart of bodies for easier disposal, was one of Bruno's specialties. Inspired by Bruno, Fused with the innate knowledge that Patera had of bodies, of taking them apart, of where to cut and where to saw and where to separate trunk from limb, victims of the Bonanno crime family were soon being cut into six pieces and buried in desolate places around Brooklyn. Chapter 9 The Bonanno Vampire 
Through Bruno's friendship and affection for Tommy Patera, Tommy met all the luminaries in the Bonanno crime family, Joe Messino, Anthony Spiro, and all its capos. Spending time with these men and learning from their ways, Patera began to fuse the samurai mentality that he had developed in Japan with the mafia mindset. The mafia's amazingly violent, unique forms of machismo and the samurai's deadly precision created a highly lethal and dangerous combination, setting the stage well for a tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. As much as Patera liked Bruno, he saw in him a potential for trouble on a monumental scale. Bruno's drug abuse had become legendary. Patera, at all costs, would avoid the trappings that Bruno and Delicato had gotten himself into. He would never, he vowed, become a drug addict. He would never, he vowed, let a chemical steal him away from his goal, becoming a highly respected capo in the Bonanno family. At this point, Patera had come to believe that his future would be with the Bonanos, and he warmed to the idea. He viewed them as a lean, mean fighting machine. He was particularly fond of Bonanno bosses Joe Messino and Anthony Spiro, thinking of them as omnipotent, protective, surrogate fathers. Unlike his own father, who was an easy-going man who was willing to accept his lot in life, they were men who took life by the throat and made it what they wanted it to be. They were bold, they were forthright, they were a success. They were both feared and respected, in that Patera had been born and raised in Gravesend, was a true neighborhood boy, he had been readily accepted, trusted by the Bananos. He was one of them, coming from the same mindset, gene pool. Now, when people crossed the Bananos, when murder was necessary, Patera was dispatched, and he made people disappear with incredible precision, acumen, and expertise. People died. Patera embraced his role as assassin, the way a great actor would embrace playing King Lear or Macbeth, even dressing the part when necessary. To fool his adversaries, to blend in, Patera took to dressing as an orthodox rabbi. Disguised like this, he was able to get near his marks and strike them dead before they knew it. When the guise of a rabbi wasn't appropriate, he would dress as a woman and kill men who were looking for romance, but instead got a bullet to the head cut up, and buried in forgotten places. Throughout the Mafia, Patero was garnering a reputation as an assassin extraordinaire. Now, when he entered a room, people looked and pointed, and spoke in respectful, hushed whispers. In that the Bananos were deeply immersed in the selling of drugs, it didn't take long for Patera to become a sleek, swift, dangerous vessel for the distribution and sale of heroin and cocaine. Chapter 10. The Perfect Storm Jim Hunt's boss, Fred Sandler, asked him if he would go talk to a new entering class. Tell them what to expect. Tell them what we're about. Don't pull any punches. Tell it like it is, Sandler said. As ordered, Jim went and spoke to the rookies. He explained how the agency's modus operandi was based on infiltration and surveillance. The best thing you can do is find people who want to cooperate. You bust Joe on Monday, he offers to help. The following Monday, you're arresting two other guys. You can compare it to a spider's web. It starts in the center, and it goes around and around and around, and the wider it gets, the more people we bring down. The wider it gets, the more tentacles we have. The more tentacles we have, the more arrests. We are about major investigations and arrests. We are about bringing down the bad guys. We have one job and that's arresting drug dealers. There were a few questions, and the meeting was over. As Jim was about to leave, one of the men approached him, and glancing up at the large smile on his face, Jim instantly recognized him. It was Tommy Geisel, a bouncer Jim had worked with years ago at Dizzy Duncan's nightclub in New Jersey. Geisel was a large, strapping man, fast-moving and nimble on his feet, muscular and strong as a Brahma bull. Like Jim Hunt, Geisel wanted to be a federal agent, wanted to help in the war on drugs. Together they had fought with patrons who drank too much, who wouldn't listen to reason, who were intent upon being violent. When these patrons came up against Jim and Tom, they inevitably ended up being knocked out. Jim! 
Tommy said, smiling. Remember me? They shook hands and embraced. Jim wished Tom luck at the academy, said that when he graduated he'd recommend him to his group, Group 33, if he liked. Even Tommy, who wasn't yet an agent, knew what Group 33 was about, knew he wanted to be a part of what they were, the action, the real deal. When, after the four-month-long academy program, Tommy Geisel was ready to be assigned, he reached out to Jim Hunt, reminded him of their conversation. Jim immediately went to his boss and told him about Geisel, told him that he thought he'd make a very good agent. The guy's got it all, Jim said, brains, balls, and brawn. Trust him with your back? Sandler asked. Absolutely. With that, Tommy Geisel was soon assigned to Group 33 and wound up as Jim Hunt's partner. And like this, the perfect storm was formed. In preparation to work the streets, work cases, both Tommy and Jim Hunt radically altered their appearances. They were all about blending in, getting bad guys to trust them. Jim grew his hair long and sported a funky, rust-colored Fu Manchu mustache. He wore jeans and cowboy boots and could pretty much blend in anywhere. Tommy, likewise, grew his hair long with a scruffy beard. Like this, Jim and Tom went out into the world, its streets and avenues, and made arrests. They were soon the most successful team in Group 33. Chapter 11 Armed, Dangerous, and Aggressive The esteemed, controversial head of the Bonanno crime family, Joe Bonanno, was in retirement. He had bought a particularly comfortable, spacious home in Arizona and lived there with his family, staying out of the daily, hands-on running of the crime family. His old street capo, Carmine Galante, who had been arrested by Jim Hunt's father, was nearly finished with twelve years of his twenty-year sentence and was soon to be released. From prison he had been insistently ranting and raving, threatening and demanding, saying that he was going to kill Carlo Gambino. Gambino had become the boss of bosses, a very powerful man. Galante had no fear of him. Galante sent word from prison, I'm going to make him suck my dick in Times Square. Carmine Galante was an out-of-control, bona fide psychopath. He had no conscience, scruples, or reservations about blowing the brains out of either a real or an imagined foe. When his old nemesis, Frank Costello, died, Galante, from jail, ordered his mausoleum blown up. While in prison, Galante was examined by a psychiatrist who diagnosed him with psychopathic personality disorder, an understatement. The network of dedicated thugs that Galante had put together had no compunction about selling heroin and was still viable. The foundation he laid, at the behest of Joe Bonanno and Lucky Luciano, was so strong and well put together that it was still up and running. These were men who, at another time, might have been strike-breakers, bootleggers, killers. Interestingly, it was not only they who were at Carmine Galante's beck and call, but it was their brothers, their cousins, relatives through marriage. In other words, in order to belong to this fraternity, you had to be a relative or go back many years. From jail, with a vengeance that bordered on obsession, Galante planned his comeback, the engine of which was heroin. He planned his becoming the boss of bosses. He was going to sell heroin, openly, boldly, and without reservation. Fuck the other families. Fuck the DEA. He was willing, indeed he was happy, to go against the dictates of the full Mafia Commission. He didn't respect them. He thought they were soft. In time he planned to kill them all. As he paced his cell in Lewisburg, as he finished his last days in prison, he plotted in his mind the deaths of all the Mafia bosses. Philip Rostelli, cockeyed Philip Lombardo, Tony Dux Corallo, and Carmine Persico. Fuck, he'd kill them all. Like this, the stage was set for a monumental, bloody war that would rock the foundations of the Mafia from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, to Castellamare del Golfo, Sicily. True to his word, when Carmine Galante was released from prison in 1974, he immediately went about putting together his plan. Within weeks, 
pure heroin was coming into the United States because of his connections in Sicily and Montreal, and because of his fearless, audacious belief that he could do whatever the hell he wanted. Not only did he and his faction of the Bonanno family start openly selling drugs, but they openly defied the mandates of the commission. Fuck him, Galante told anyone who would listen, his words echoing throughout Brooklyn like some kind of religious mantra. Additionally, Galante began having members of the Gambino family murdered. Leaving no clues as to who was committing the killings, he brazenly brought down Gambino's soldiers and captains. Meanwhile, Carlo Gambino died of natural causes in his sleep, disappointing Galante to no end. The cocksucker wouldn't even give me the pleasure of killing him, Galante told confidants. Galante's intention was to eliminate the competition. It was no secret in La Cosa Nostra that the Gambinos were selling drugs. Carlo's brother, Paolo, was suspected of running the operation, that the Gambinos were bringing high-grade Turkish heroin from Sicily. This was, of course, all off the record. The acting head of the Bonanno crime family, Philip Rostelli, was not up to the task of fighting Carmine Galante. Galante was as tough as a junkyard dog. He had come up the hard way. Born in East Harlem in 1910, he had first worked for Vito Genovese as his chauffeur and private assassin. Eventually, Galante began driving around Joe Bonanno and ultimately was made a capo de facto of the Bonanno crime family, a street boss. He acquired the name Lilo because of his penchant for smoking Italian cigars known as Guinea Stinkers. People in the nose said that Galante killed over fifty individuals. People in the nose said that Galante even murdered a cop. He kept his hair short and wore glasses. He weighed 155 pounds. Always on guard, always expecting trouble, he went about the business of building a large heroin enterprise while plotting and planning the deaths of his enemies. He murdered as though he had a state-issued permit to kill. Galante was so out of control, causing police and press scrutiny, that there was a sit-down of the Mafia Commission at which it was decided that he had to go. This would be the second time in the history of the American Mafia that the head of a family would be ordered killed. The first was Albert Anastasia. People sent from the Mafia Commission approached Bonanno Captain Alphonse Sonny Red in Delicato and told him that he was either with them or he was dead. They informed him of the Commission's decision that Carmine Galante had to go that Galante was causing problems for them all, that if he, Sonny Red, didn't help, he would be taken out within twenty-four hours. Sonny Red had been expecting this. The handwriting was on the wall. He was surprised it hadn't happened sooner. He knew which way the tide was moving. He did not have to be threatened or cajoled any further. He readily agreed to cooperate however he could with the killing of Carmine Galante. One of the men chosen to be a part of the lethal hit team put together to kill Galante was Anthony Bruno in Delicato, Sonny Red's son and Tommy Patera's inspiration, mentor, and friend. A seasoned killer himself, Carmine Galante was not an easy man to bring down. He knew the dance of death. He knew how to protect not only his back, but how not to be put in a position where gunmen could readily reach him, hit him. He always traveled with several men who were armed and, he thought, loyal to him. As most megalomaniacs, Galante did not realize his bullying and threatening and killing was coming back to haunt him. Not only was the full Mafia commission behind his murder, but all members of the Mafia in all places wanted him dead. July 12, 1979 was a particularly warm day. There were no clouds above Bushwick, Brooklyn. Galante chose to have his lunch that day in a trusted cousin's restaurant, Joe and Mary's. This was a good example of how Galante insulated and protected himself from would-be assassins. He was always wary. Bushwick, Brooklyn, was an Italian enclave. Most of the stores catered to the Italian community. There were Italian bakeries, pork stores, pizza places, and restaurants all along Knickerbocker Avenue. The smell of fresh espresso Fresh baked bread and pizza seductively wafted through the air. In the pork stores, huge wheels of cheese, provolone and parmigiano, enticingly hung in the windows. 
Galante arrived for lunch with two of his men in tow, Baldo Amato and Cesare Bonventre. Bonventre was a traitor, a would-be assassin. He would make sure the hit went smoothly, on time. When Galante and his party entered the restaurant, waiters bowed and scraped and treated him reverently. This was a thing Galante had become used to and relished, the deference he received as an elite mafioso. The garden was in the back of the restaurant. It was some seventy feet through the long, narrow room. Though the garden was not air-conditioned, it was shaded by large umbrellas. As is the Italian custom, Galante would eat his meal in courses. Toward the end of the meal, Cesare got up to make a phone call. Galante lit up a cigar. Word was soon passed to the hit team that Galante was in place. With the quick, lethal expediency of a military operation, they were on the move. Soon, a light blue Mercury sedan, a stolen car, pulled up in front of the restaurant. There were three men in the car. They were Bruno, Wack Wack, and Delicato, Dominic, Sunny Black, Napolitano, and Russell Mauro, all large, broad-shouldered men. Here is where Bruno Wackwack and Delicato showed his true colors, showed his amazing balls and audacious moxie, for when he stepped from the automobile, pulling down a ski mask as he went, he was carrying a full-length blue-black shotgun. It was a little after twelve noon. Shoppers crowded the sidewalk. Rubbery waves of heat rose from the ground. Cars and buses drove by. Bruno was the lead man. He acted as though he were invisible. Without reservation, he and the hit team moved to the restaurant, grabbed the front door's handle, and arrogantly walked in. They knew Galante was sitting in the back. They walked straight toward him, moving swiftly, as one, as though a robotic killing machine. Nothing could stop them now. They were invincible. Bruno was able to quickly discern Galante sitting in the yard. Patrons saw Bruno and the hit team, the guns they carried, and desperately scrambled to get away. It should be noted here that Richard Kuklinski, a.k.a. the Iceman, would later claim to be involved in the Galante murder, which turned out to be untrue. Bruno was as tight as a coiled spring. This man was a professional killer. He did not feel nervous or frightened or scared. He knew this murder would resonate throughout mafiadom. He knew, too, that this killing would bolster his reputation as a man of respect. He also knew he would be made a capo for what he was about to do. Galante saw them coming. His eyes widened. Guns were drawn, raised, pointed. With a thunderous roar, Wack Wack and Delicato cut loose with the 12-gauge shotgun. The other members of the hit team also fired shot after shot after shot. Wack Wack fired again. Carmine Galante went down in a heap of torn flesh and broken bones, never to rise again. Also killed was his cousin Giuseppe Tirano and his zip bodyguard Lenny Coppola. The attack was so sudden and violent, Coppola never had a chance to draw his weapon. As Galante lay there, his glasses askew, he still had the cigar he was smoking clenched in his teeth, clenched in a death grip that would be memorialized in the most famous photograph of a mafia hit ever taken. Bruno and the hit team turned and, calmly, not running, made for the front door. Bruno carried his shotgun straight down. He let his right leg block it as he walked. It seemed a natural extension of his lithe body. They hit the sidewalk, took the seven steps to the street, and arrived back at the car. Bruno opened the door, put the shotgun inside, grabbed the roof of the car, and got in. Slowly the car pulled away. Bruno and the hit team abandoned it in Gravesend, where it would later be found by police. The jungle drums of the Mafia echoed loudly and insistently all that day and night. Word of Galante's murder spread far and wide with the speed of a bullet. Mob guys all over the United States, all over Italy, quickly learned what happened. Toasts and cheers were made. For La Cosa Nostra this was a good day. A proverbial thorn in all their sides had been removed, irrevocably and irreversibly. Again, La Cosa Nostra showed their killing prowess, showed that they kept a clean house, that they would even kill their own if need be. Wide-eyed, though not surprised, Tommy Patera heard about the murder, 
heard that his friend and mentor had been part of the hit team. But Terra was proud, proud to know Bruno, proud to be his friend. Later that afternoon, Bruno, Whack Whack, and Delicato showed up at the Ravenite Social Club in Manhattan's Little Italy. He had obviously been sweating and looked disheveled, like he'd been through the mix. Boldly and with great audacity, he had been sent to kill, to wreak havoc, and kill he did. FBI agents watched surreptitiously from rooftops and vans as Bruno was greeted not only by fellow Bonanno crime family members, but by half a dozen Gambino members. This was an oddity. This immediately proved to law enforcement that the hit on Galante was a collective effort, a cooperative killing. The bad guys all smiled. They openly kissed and hugged Bruno and Delicato. Even Agnello Della Croce, the second-in-command, underboss of the Gambino family, was there, and he hugged and kissed Bruno Wackwack Whack with obvious respect and admiration. Wackwack Whack was the man of the hour. Wackwack Whack was a hero. Wackwack Whack had lived up to his name in a large way. His father could not have been more proud of him. All the mistakes Bruno had made with drugs and his erratic behavior were forgotten. With this one deed, the slate was wiped clean. He was the Mick Jagger of the Mafia. With good cheer, laughing, patting one another's backs, they all went inside, disappearing into the black hole that was then the Ravenite Social Club. Salud! 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 could be heard over and over again as passers-by moved in front of the club. The following morning, on the front page of every newspaper was the shocking, black-and-white, amazingly graphic image of Carmine Galante lying dead with half a cigar clenched in his teeth and his glasses crooked. The big, badass Carmine Galante was no more. The Wicked Witch was dead. Contrary to popular belief, Mafiosi are open and candid about murder, bragging about who killed whom, when and where and why. They could be likened to old women talking over the backyard fence. They seem to take it for granted that if they talk among themselves, it will go no further. Patera marveled at the newspaper reportage of the very dead Galante. He marveled at the audacious aspects of the murder. This was so foreign so unlike what he had been exposed to in the Far East, in Japan. There was nothing subtle or delicate or discreet about the murder of Galante. The murder brought home just how brutal, though effective, the way of La Cosa Nostra was. This murder, the secretive, violent underground society of La Cosa Nostra, drew Patera further toward them, their culture, mindset, walk and talk. More than ever, he wanted to be not only a part of it, but an important part, a central part. He knew if he comported himself with pride and dignity, acted as though he were a man of respect, they would be drawn to him. You cannot go knock on the door of any given couple and say, Let me in. They must see you and like what they see. You have to prove yourself. It didn't take long for Patera to get a chance to do just that. Murder is the only way to become a made man. Murder is the one thing all mob guys have in common, a secret bond. There is no statute of limitations on murder, and at any given time anyone who kills can be culpable in the eyes of the law, no matter how long after the crime. Taking that into consideration, it was easy to understand why La Cosa Nostra demanded blood on the hands of anyone who took the oath of Omerta. If they broke their oath, if they betrayed their colleagues, they were vulnerable and culpable, more than likely dead. When it had ultimately become time for Patera to earn his bones, he was given a name, address, and photograph of the mark. Without reservation, he had shot to death a man on a residential Brooklyn street. He didn't know who the man was. He didn't care. He had been told to commit the murder, and he did it, coldly and efficiently. He felt no remorse, no guilt. It was business, a way of life. After Patera committed this murder, he was one of them. Until, however, he was sworn in, he was not officially a made man. He could now work with the Bonanno crime family, was an extended part of it, though was not an official member yet. He was an official associate. 
If there were disputes involving him, the family would back him. If there were sit-downs involving him, the family would back him. But Terra was no longer a lone alpha wolf trying to satiate himself. He was now part of a clan, part of a pack of wolves that would protect him, watch his flank and watch his back. That is, if he behaved, if he towed the line. Bruno, Wack Wack, and Delicato would hasten Patera's career considerably. After Wack Wack had committed the Galante killing, he was given his own borgata and made a capo. This was a reward for a job well done. Wack Wack was now, throughout La Cosa Nostra, a superstar. He had audaciously killed Carmine Galante in broad daylight. As stone-faced Brooklyn homicide detectives questioned all the patrons of Joe and Mary's, questioned the people on the streets, bus drivers, shop owners, cab drivers, they kept coming up with blank stares, as though all the people of Bushwick were deaf and dumb and blind. The people of Bushwick all knew who had been killed, and the last thing any of them wanted was to be involved in this murder on any level. Many had seen who had gotten out of the Mercury sedan, but none would say who it was. The killing of Galante seemed, at first, like the perfect hit, but its brazen attitude rubbed the men and women of the NYPD, in high and low positions, the wrong way. The murder had been committed with such hubris, was so in your face, that they felt personally affronted and offended. How dare these guinea cocksuckers think they can do something like this and get away with it, was the utterance heard throughout station houses in New York. With an unusual vigor, the NYPD went looking for Galante's killers. They didn't have to look far. They soon learned that Bruno and Delicato, Russell Morrow, Dominic, Sonny, Black Napolitano were part of the hit team, and Galante's associates Cesare, C.J. Bonventra, and Baldo Amato were in on the plan but proving their involvement was another matter. Initially, the police believed that Sonny Red had paid to have Galante killed. This would turn out to be false. As the cops were trying to solve the murder, the rest of the Bonanno family was preparing for war. Galante was barely in the ground before people began vying to fill the void his murder had left in the organization. Sonny Red was part of one of the factions that would soon be at war for control of the Bonanno family. Philip Rostelli, temporary head of the family, was on the other side. Lines were drawn in the sand. Everyone had hoped the transition would be smooth, but Rostelli, then being kept in the Federal House of Detention, was intent upon keeping control of his position in the family and would not acquiesce to the Mafia Commission's mandates. Born on January 31, 1918, Philip Rostelli was a stubborn man who refused to see the reasoning of not only the Mafia Commission, but most all of the Bonanno Capos. Having said that, it wasn't long before they were shooting at each other, killing one another loudly and openly, and in the middle of the street. The last thing anyone wanted now was a protracted, bloody war between different Bonanno factions. There were numerous sit-downs between Bonanno captains and other families all over Bensonhurst, Try as they might, the collective effort of La Cosa Nostra seemed to be failing, and still more dark clouds filled with lightning and thunder gathered over Brooklyn, gathered over Gravesend, Bensonhurst, and Diker Heights. One of the more powerful men in the Bonanno family, Joe Messino, more than anyone, some say, tried to avoid war, tried to work hard for peace. But each of the Bonanno captains was strong-willed and obstinate, and refused to walk the path of diplomacy, refused to listen to reason, even though there was more than enough to go around. Massino, with the help of the Gambinos, John Gotti's crew, resorted to war, and hit teams brought in from Canada set up and murdered Alphonse Sonny Red Indelicato, Philip Phil Lucky Giacone, and Dominic Big Trin Trincara. They were buried, somewhat haphazardly, in empty lots in an undeveloped area of East New York, near Queens. This was unprecedented in the history of La Cosa Nostra. Captains were akin to generals, and three noted, talented generals all struck down at the same time was news, an event. What happened after the killings was an interesting anecdote showing just how cooperative Mafia families are with each other. When it was time to get rid of these three captains, 
A van was driven by Joe Messino and associates to Howard Beach. There they met Gambino members Gene Gotti, John's brother, Fat Angelo Ruggiero, and John Carnelia. Carnelia was a gorilla of a man, and no doubt was brought along for his digging talents. Soon impromptu graves were dug in lots between Ozone Park and East New York, and the three Bonanno captains were unceremoniously laid to rest. One of the bodies, that of Sonny Red in Delicato, was found a mere nineteen days later in a lot at One Ruby Street in South Ozone Park. He had on a $5,000 Cartier watch. The bodies of Dominic Trinquera and Philip Giacone were not found until 2004. It didn't take long for Bruno Whack Whack in Delicato to learn that his father had been taken out. Bruno had been very close with his dad. They were, in a sense, more like best friends than father and son. For Bruno, the loss, the methodical, treacherous murder of his father, was the most traumatic experience in his life. He was a pressure cooker about to explode, but even he, a stone-cold killer, knew he could do nothing to avenge his father's death. If he so much as lifted a finger toward retribution, he'd be dead in a New York minute. The news of his father's death brought home the hardcore, bloody reality that Bruno himself was in danger as well. He had no doubt that hit teams were actively searching for him as well. Bruno, along with his good friend Tommy Patera, hightailed it out of Brooklyn and barricaded himself in a secluded house way out on the edge of Long Island. Patera had brought with him an army duffel bag filled with guns. He was dedicated and he was loyal to Bruno, and he would fight to the death on Bruno's behalf. Meanwhile, word was sent out that if Bruno was willing to let go of what happened, he could continue running his borgata and do his business without trouble from the new regime. As a secretive, surreptitious dialogue went back and forth between Bruno and Joe Messino, Patera methodically cleaned and oiled his guns over and over again. Ultimately, an agreement was worked out, and Bruno and Patera were welcomed back into the fold. Cocaine Bruno, whack-whack in delicato, wound up finding solace and comfort in cocaine. It wrapped him in a warmth of numb indifference, and took him to another place far removed from the mean streets of Gravesend and Bensonhurst. He traveled to Miami, and there, with different girlfriends, stayed holed up in his house for days on end, on long, protracted cocaine binges. While Tommy Patera empathized and sympathized with his friend's loss, he ultimately lost respect for Bruno because of his drug addiction. In the world of La Cosa Nostra, the excessive abuse of drugs and or alcohol was tantamount to a cardinal sin, a potential death sentence. Though most all mafiosi in their thirties, forties, and early fifties dabbled in drugs, Few, if any of them, were serious drug abusers. Once more, those around Bruno began to view his drug habit as a serious problem, a liability that was a one-way ticket to the grave. Theirs was a world where men had to be sharp, at the top of their games, lean and mean and ready to strike at the bat of an eye. Drugs, everyone knew, made you stupid and unreliable. With the changing of the guard and the new faction taking over the Bonanno family, Tommy Patera rearranged his alliances. He came to the attention of powerful underboss Anthony Spiro. Spiro was a large man with dark hair, a dark complexion, good-looking in a rough way. He was respected by most everybody. It was hard not to like Spiro. He was fair, smart, and exceedingly well-versed in the ways of the street. Surprisingly, one of his more lucrative enterprises was fireworks. He had huge warehouses of fireworks and made four to five million dollars annually just from their sales. On Bath Avenue every Fourth of July, Spiro would put on amazing firework displays. He spent several hundred thousand dollars on fireworks to be blown up there in the streets. The cops looked the other way. Not only did he supply the fireworks for free, but he gladly provided enough food to feed all of Bensonhurst, and feed all of Bensonhurst he did. Later, John Gotti would try to co-opt and copy what Spiro had done, but his firework shows paled in comparison to Anthony Spiro's displays of generosity and patriotism. Not only was Anthony Spiro liked by the people within the confines of the Bonanno clan, 
but all the captains of all the families knew him and liked him, respected him. He was particularly close to war couple Greg Scarpa of the Colombo family. He was also close to Anthony Gaspipe Casso, superstar of the Lucchese family. Spiro was about diplomacy, building bridges, though when murder was called for, he would readily and quickly push the button. With the death of Sonny Red Indelicato and the loss of Bruno into a storm of cocaine, Tommy Patera became closer to Anthony Spiro. It was ultimately Anthony Spiro who would cause Tommy Patera's dream to come true. The thing that Patera wanted more than anything in life was to be made, to get a button to be a bona fide member of the Mafia. Everyone liked him, respected him. The murders he had been assigned were carried out quickly and efficiently, and he kept his mouth shut about them. He was exactly what La Cosa Nostra was looking for. With the blessing of Anthony Spiro, the books were opened, and Tommy Patera was nominated to be inducted into the Bonanno family. Word was sent out to all of the five families in the New York tri-state area. Word was sent out to mafiosi across the country. Does anyone have any reason why Tommy Patera shouldn't be made? was the question asked. No one objected. Patera had created a good reputation for himself. The ceremony was held in a two-story red brick house in Bensonhurst, off Bath Avenue. Anthony Spiro decided that he would place Patera in the borgata of Bonanno couple Frankie Lino. Frankie Lino had mafia in his blood. His cousin, Eddie Lino, was one of the most feared men in all the mafia, both in Sicily and in New York. He, too, was close to John Gotti, was in the Gambino family. It was said that Eddie Lino had personally killed more people than most ten mob guys put together. Frankie Lino was a pudgy individual with a high, broad forehead, his eyes, nose, and mouth too close to one another, as though they were rudely pushed together while he was still in his mother's womb. His marriage had been arranged for him by his parents and Vito Genovese. He attended Lafayette High School in the heart of Gravesend, Brooklyn. By the day that Patera was made, Frankie Lino had become all gray, his hair so naturally curly that his nickname was, appropriately enough, Curly. Consigliere Anthony Spiro was there. Several men who were to be made were also present, all dressed to the nines. For them, this was being baptized, receiving communion and confirmation. This is what they had all wanted all their lives, and it was about to happen. The ceremony, created in Sicily and brought over by immigrants at the turn of the twentieth century, was simple and to the point. Tommy Patera, repeating the Sicilian Pledge of Omerta, swore that the Bonanno crime family would come before his own family. He swore, too, that if he violated this oath, he'd burn in hell, as the portrait of a saint now burned in his cupped hands. Patera stood ramrod straight, his chest puffed out, his head high. He knew when he left that room, no one would ever make fun of him again. No one would ever knock his high-pitched voice. Even now, standing there reciting Omerta, he was speaking in this distinct falsetto voice. If it weren't so solemn and serious, it would have been outright comical to hear him talking like that, more Saturday Night Live than La Cosa Nostra. With the ceremony completed, they shook hands heartily and kissed on the cheek, embracing one another. Afterward, they all went out to dinner at a popular La Cosa Nostra hangout, Tommaso's on 86th Street. There was no laughter, no patting on the back. It was a quiet, solemn dinner in which respectful toasts were made in hushed tones. Salud, Jindon. Salud, Jindon. Thus the dragon was born. Chapter 12 Gravesend the cemetery. Inevitably, when dealing narcotics, some people don't pay. They get caught up in the trials and tribulations of life and don't realize that the non-payment of drugs could very well lead to a death sentence. If, it was common knowledge, you fronted an amount of drugs that were not paid for, soon everyone would be doing it. Soon the dealer would be out of business. To stay in that business, people had to keep their word People had to own up to the agreements they made. No one believed this more than Tommy Patera. He came to view the selling of drugs as though he was selling his own respect. For him it became a very personal enterprise. 
If he gave you drugs and you didn't pay him back, you were stealing away his livelihood. You were stealing away the reputation he had worked hard and diligently to acquire. He took his place in the family very seriously. For him, his position in the family was something to be revered, not merely respected and spoken about in whispers. According to those in the know, Thomas Salerno had taken several ounces of cocaine on consignment from Patera. He paid a little late, though he paid. Patera gave him more cocaine, and, again, he paid a little later, but still paid. Patera warned him about paying on time. Apparently what Patera said fell on deaf ears, for the third amount of drugs Patera fronted Salerno were not paid for. Patera sent word for Salerno to come see him. He didn't come. When Patera finally met up with Salerno, he managed to convince him to go for a car ride, which ended up with Salerno being shot in the head. Patera thought it would be funny to leave the dead Salerno in his car right next to Gravesend Cemetery. When the body was found by police, there was no connection to Patera, but soon word spread on the street of exactly what had occurred and why, and people in La Cosa Nostra nodded knowingly as the police scratched their heads and wondered who committed the murder. Like this, Tommy Patera began killing people who were not paying for drugs on time. He not only killed those he personally had fronted drugs to, but he murdered four associates of his in the Bonanno clan. He soon became the go-to guy for murder, not only within that family, but other families as well. With each murder, Patera's reputation grew. Patera became adept at murder, comfortable in that guise. Now, for the most part, Patera wore all black. He shunned daylight, came out mostly at night, and his face grew pale and waxy. His light skin, juxtaposed against his black clothing, gave him a vampire-like appearance. He was quiet, sullen. This further fueled the fear people had for him. This further fueled the rumors that were being passed all over Brooklyn, that Patera was a remorseless killer, that Patera was dismembering his victims, neatly cutting them up into six pieces and disposing of them at various burial sites. It was said that he had cleverly discovered that land on bird sanctuaries could not be disturbed, that building and construction would not be allowed. It wouldn't take long for him to put two and two together and realize that burying a body in such a place would just about guarantee the body would not be discovered. It was also said, people in the know recently confided, that Patera had an autopsy table in the basement of a building he controlled. Patera married a Brooklyn woman named Carol Boguski and had a male child with her. They named the boy Charles. This, however, was an ill-fated union, and soon the couple separated. With the proceeds Patera made from dealing drugs, he opened two bars, one in Cypress Gardens called Cypress Bar and Grill, and another on Avenue S and West 8th Street called the Just Us Bar. It was a residential street with few stores. More than being a money-making enterprise, it was a place for Patera and his people to meet and arrange for drug sales. In reality, more a place to sell drugs than alcohol. That's not to say they sold drugs over the bar or out of the bathroom. Deals were consummated here. Agreements and handshakes were made here. The physical passing of drugs happened elsewhere. Now, when Patera walked into a Brooklyn restaurant frequented by mafiosi, conversation slowed. People stared and pointed. Tommy Patera had become what he always had wanted to be, feared and respected, a man not to be taken lightly. Patera still practiced martial arts, but now it was more to keep in shape, to keep well coordinated. He was a vain man and did not want to develop a stomach or jowls. Patera continued to read voraciously about killing human beings, war, and destruction. He acquired books on how to dismember bodies and diligently studied where to cut and slice, deepening his knowledge of how to neatly take apart a body. Chapter 13 Buy and Bust The war on drugs had not only heated up, but was now being fought at a feverish pitch. The Drug Enforcement Administration's Group 33 had never been so busy. They were up against some of the most devious criminals of all time, who hailed from Italy, 
Colombia, Mexico, Jamaica, Afghanistan, the Near and Far East, Turkey, and France. These were highly educated, highly motivated, particularly bright men who had ready, well-trained armies of cutthroats at their disposal. Modern business practices were perfected and scaled down to fit the drug lord's needs. They had scores of boats and planes and even submarines. They were busy constructing tunnels that ran from Mexico for several miles into the United States. The men and women of the DEA fought a heroic battle with teeth and nails, hearts and souls. But no matter what efforts they made, how many sacrifices they were willing to make, it was never enough. Drug lords were like mushrooms after a heavy rain. They popped up everywhere, all shapes, sizes, and colors, and you could not stop them. They were so effective that they literally created new words for the English language. As an example, the term Colombian necktie referred to a killing method in which the throat was cut and the tongue pulled out through the slit. It was a horrible, unsettling sight, and would last with whomever saw it for the rest of their lives. All the drug cartels, in their own ways, were particularly dangerous. However, the most dangerous were the Mexicans, the Colombians, and the Dominicans. For them, life was cheap. Most all these individuals, these drug lords, came up the hard way, were from the streets, were ruthless in the extreme, and they'd kill you as soon as say hello to you. Murder for them was arbitration, conciliation. Reasoning for them was a bullet to the head. Might was right. When the Colombians wanted to kill one man, they would not only kill him, but murder his entire family, men and women and children, the very old as well as the very young. Because they were able to use phony passports and various forms of identification, these were particularly hard adversaries to bring to justice, for they were mobile, in and out of the country as readily as a turtle's head was in and out of its shell. Once the blood was washed from their hands, they could casually go through customs. For Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel, the war on drugs was a daily part of their lives, an intricate part of who they were. For them, it was not a newspaper article or a blurb on television. They, far more than the public or press, knew the true, anus nature of the fire-breathing beasts they were fighting. They saw the bodies, the crime scene photos. They heard the stories in great detail about what occurred how, and when. Several times a month, the DEA would make huge busts. One would think, considering the amount of drugs they confiscated, that they'd slow, put a dent in the flow of narcotics. Just the opposite occurred. No matter how many busts they made, there seemed to be a never-ending supply, mountains of drugs in faraway places that were cleverly brought into the United States using unsettling amounts of imagination and creativity. Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel worked so well together they could readily be likened to a bow and a fiddle in a maestro's hands. They were not only fearless, but they were, more importantly, street smart. From studying how colleagues were shot and murdered, they had learned well what not to do. Any bad guy who went up against Jim and Tommy was the one in danger. In Group 33 and all throughout the DEA, Jim and Tommy became famous, respected, they were moving at 200 miles an hour. They were the best, a former colleague by the name of Bruce Travers recently said. On a regular basis, they made busts using professional informers and snitches, drug users and street people. Every night they were out on the street looking to collar bad guys all over the tri-state area, looking to win a battle in the war on drugs. Still, no matter how careful they were with all the resources of the DEA behind them, People were hurt, killed. A good example of just how dangerous their job was, how they were truly putting their lives on the line, happened at 133rd Street and Amsterdam Avenue. This was an area known as a Dominican enclave. Of the three worst groups, the Colombians, Mexicans, and Dominicans, the most violent at the time, the most apt to pull the trigger of a gun, was surely the Dominicans. They were less about business and more about overt brutality as a matter of course. They were thought of by the DEA as the most dangerous of all the bad guys they chased. Jim recently explained that he had busted Colombians with kilos on them and no guns, but Dominicans with two ounces and three guns. 
Group 33 received word through a Colombian informer that some Dominicans he knew had kilos of cocaine to sell. This was a classic ploy the DEA used to catch drug dealers. It was called buy and bust. Through negotiations that often went back and forth for days or even weeks, a buy was set up in which the DEA would provide money and bust the dealer, most often through an intermediary, an informer. The Dominicans had rented a stash house in a tenement on 133rd Street. The drugs were supposed to be in the apartment. It was a little after midnight. The informer told Jim and his team, all told eight agents, that the cocaine was in the apartment. Are you sure? Jim asked, always wary. They say he's there, the informer said. Jim well knew that they could be running into a situation where the Dominicans were looking to rob them that there were no drugs, that this was, in fact, a rip-off. It had happened before. DEA agents were killed in situations in which they thought they were buying drugs, only to have the dealers turn on them, shoot them dead, and steal the money. This was a risk they would have to take this night. Would they be facing a compliant dealer or a dangerous predator? There was only one way to know for sure. The Colombian informer, Jim and Tommy, and the rest of them knew, had proven himself reliable in the past. With that, Jim and his team headed into the tenement and started going upstairs cautiously, guns drawn. They were in plain clothes but had badges on chains around their necks. Unfortunately, just as they were moving up the stairs, the Dominicans were coming down. They were startled by the agents and hightailed it back up into the stash apartment. Hearing this, Jim and his people ran full out, got to the landing, and burst into the apartment. As they went, Jim grabbed one of the Dominicans and brought him to the ground, cuffed him, and handed him off in fluid, amazingly fast movements, almost as though it were a magic trick, all the while the agents yelling, Policia! Policia! Jim and Tommy Geisel now ran to the back of the apartment, looking to get the other two. In the far rear room there was a window open and a fire escape. The agents could see a bad guy making for the window. Jim bolted forward and dove on the bad guy. Tall, wiry, very strong, every sinew and muscle in the man's body fought Jim as Jim continued to shout, Policia! Policia! Wanting to end this quickly, Jim struck him in the head with his pistol, but the dealer furiously fought back, and their life and death struggle continued. The bad guy didn't acquiesce. Jim was forced to strike him over and over. The bad guy knew there was a hidden assassin in the closet whose job it was to kill, to kill indifferently, to kill efficiently, and the bad guy wanted nothing to do with the murder of a cop. As Jim was grappling with the man, Geisel had been searching the kitchen. Now he moved back toward the bad guy. As Geisel went to help Jim, some ten steps away, DEA agent Bruce Travers, a dark-haired Irishman with a muscular build, opened the closet door Tom and Jim had passed. At first glance, he saw nothing. He was about to close the door when he thought he discerned, in the weak light of the stash apartment, a human form and, suddenly, the outline of a gun pointing at him. As he raised his own firearm, there was a deafening explosion. The bad guy was low in the closet, pointing the gun up when he fired. He had in his hand a three fifty seven Magnum. The Magnum's slug tore into the bottom of Bruce's jaw, drilled through his face, and came out right below his eye. Bruce went down. He didn't quite look human anymore. In the darkness and in the life-and-death havoc, Jim Hunt did not know who was firing. "'That us or is it them?' he called out. The assassin in the closet now stood straight up. Though he had just shot a cop in the face, he was not finished. He could see, from where he stood, the doorway, and outlined in the whole light was the informer and Group 33 boss Ken Feldman and Agent John Wilson. Without hesitation, he raised the three fifty seven, took a bead on the informer, and fired. The informer went down, muscles torn and shredded, bones broken. Tommy Geisel now aimed at the closet and opened fire with equal ferocity. Hunt was still fighting furiously with the perp on the floor. Feldman and Wilson also began firing at the closet. Between Geisel, Feldman, and Wilson, they fired twenty-one rounds. In the small, hard confines of the tenement, the shots were loud and resonating. The small, empty apartment reeked of gunpowder. The assassin was hit. 
three times. Neither Tommy nor Jim knew that a steel support pillar for the building had stopped most of the rounds. Had the pillar not been there, the assassin would surely have been dead. As it was, he survived. Jim Hunt was very fond of Bruce. Jim viewed him as a younger brother, an eager, trusted protégé. He was one of the nicest, most giving men Jim had ever met, and here he was now, lying on the floor, a remnant of who he had been, his face destroyed, a large pool of blood surrounding him. Knowing that seconds mattered, knowing that Bruce's life was hanging by a thread, Jim and Tom picked Bruce up and seemed to fly down the stairs. An ambulance was summoned, but they could not wait. They knew in that time they could lose their brother. They put Bruce in the back seat of an unmarked DEA vehicle and sped over to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital some thirty blocks away, at points in time hitting 110 miles an hour. As they went, they called DEA headquarters, who in turn called the hospital, and word was sent that a cop had been shot, shot in the face. When they pulled up at the emergency ward at Columbia Presbyterian, there was a team of a dozen nurses and doctors waiting for Bruce. He was slipping in and out of consciousness. He wanted so badly to tell them that he had another gun strapped to his ankle, that he didn't want to get shot while the orderly was taking it off, but he could not talk. His tongue was destroyed. His situation was so dire, his life precariously hanging by a thread, that doctors were forced to cut open his trachea, giving him a tracheotomy right there in the street. A plastic tube was forced down his throat, and his lungs were given desperately needed oxygen. He drifted off into a deep, coma-like sleep. In no time, some fifty anxious, worried DEA agents had gathered at the hospital. They were as close as brothers and sisters, and they stayed there all night long. Because of the brilliant efforts of the surgeons and nurses, Bruce's life was saved. Higher-ups in the New York office of the DEA arranged for a plane to pick up Bruce Travers' parents in Boston, where he was born and raised, and fly them and his brothers and sisters and fiancé to Teterboro Airport, where they were placed in an SUV with a souped-up engine and were sped, sirens screaming, lights flashing, to Columbia Presbyterian. When, later that day, Bruce woke up, he was in a fog, though he could make out his whole family gathered around the bed. His father took his hand. He said, You're going to be all right, son. You're going to be all right. Bruce had no idea how his family had so quickly been summoned and were there, but he was grateful, deeply and profoundly grateful. He tried to talk, but could not. When, in Washington, D.C., President Reagan heard what had happened, he insisted on placing a call to Bruce. He wanted to talk to him. The phone at his bedside rang. Bruce's father answered. He was shocked to hear President Reagan on the other end. He explained that Bruce couldn't talk. President Reagan told Bruce's dad that he was extremely grateful for what he had done, that he and Nancy sent their support and love and prayers. Everyone was very touched, very moved. Mr. Travers thanked the president and hung up. It's a hell of a thing, Mr. Travers said to his son, a hell of a thing. Jim Hunt was deeply touched by what happened to Bruce Travers. He had become close to Bruce. Bruce had a wide-eyed enthusiasm. He was not a cynical, hard man who was a product of the streets like many with years in law enforcement. He was a gentleman, though a particularly tough, resilient individual. The doctors told Jim and all his colleagues that Bruce was still in danger, that Bruce could still die. If he survived, he would have to undergo many operations to regain a face similar to the one he had once had. Many in Group 33 went to church and lit candles and prayed for their colleague, prayed for their friend. Bruce was liked by everybody. Just how truly heroic Bruce Travers was would not be made clear for some months, for the pain and the discomfort was just beginning. He still had fourteen major operations ahead. When police ballistic experts recreated the shooting using triangulations of trajectory, they came to know that the shooter had been crouched down, and when he fired the three fifty seven Magnum, the bullet went up into Bruce's lower jaw and burst out of his face, just beneath his eye. As it happened, the assassin in the closet had been paid to do exactly what he did. His job was to shoot and kill anyone who tried to impede the selling of the cocaine. He, Jim knew, all the agents knew, was from another culture, 
another mindset. From where he hailed, from the place he came, life was cheap, life was worth nothing. What struck them all as odd, though, was that he had to know Bruce and all the rest of them were cops. They were yelling, Cops! Cops! Policia! Policia! over and over. Yet still, he pulled the trigger without a second thought. Chapter 14 Pizza 2 The perfect storm was out hunting again. Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel were about infiltration, surveillance, and arrests. Disguised as street thugs, they were ideal partners. At any given time, Tommy Geisel and Jim Hunt were juggling numerous cases, different bad guys, different scenarios involving various drugs and ethnic groups. Any of these cases could be deadly, and they took necessary precautions, the best of which was to strike first. Neither Jim nor Tommy would allow a bad guy to get the drop on them. Jim and Tom, however, were not about confrontation, not about being quick-draw cowboys. They were consummate con artists. They could talk the stripes off a running zebra. They, the perfect storm, were about gaining trust and getting bad guys to believe that they were all outlaws. Interestingly, most bad guys who dealt with Jim and Tom took a shine to them, they never bullied anyone, never called anyone names. They were always professional and polite, and would go out of their way to do what they could. They knew, in the long run, they would create a network of individuals much more inclined to help them. It wasn't so much that Jim and Tom were nice guys. They were interested in developing informers and people who would assist rather than resist, as Jim put it. One of the largest, most important cases the DEA ever had was created as a result of Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel convincing a bad guy to cooperate. This case was called the Pizza 2. It involved the importation of heroin by Sicilians into America. It was called the Pizza 2 because some of the players were the same individuals involved in the original Pizza Connection case. Jim and Tommy's involvement in the case was spurred by one Vinny DeMarco, who would become a direct link to Tommy Patera. Vinny was a maitre d' at the Embassy Terrace Catering Hall in Brooklyn, a place where mafiosi tearfully married off their sons and daughters. Vinny was fifty-five years old, though appeared older, the skin on his face loose and sagging. Vinny DeMarco's son, Benny, had been fronted one pound of pure heroin by one of these Sicilians. His name was Salvatore Canavo. He was a cold-blooded mafioso, cut from the hard stone of Sicily, a large heroin dealer. Canavo hung out on Bensonhurst, Brooklyn's 18th Avenue. He was one of the individuals who supplied heroin to the Gambino family. Vinnie DeMarco's son, Benny, was not a professional dealer. He was not a hardcore bad guy, and when he tried to sell the heroin, make a few bucks on the side, he was ripped off. He now owed some seventy-five thousand dollars to Canavo. In sheer desperation, Benny turned to his father for help. Though his father was basically a working stiff, he still knew the way of the street. He loved his son dearly, knew his son had fucked up, and was intent upon getting him out of trouble. He told Benny he would go to Canavo and tell him that he'd pay it off a little at a time, maybe two thousand dollars a month. Grateful, his son cried and held his father. With that, Vinny DeMarco went and saw Canavo. He pled his case, said he would pay off his son's debt, swore on his dead parents' graves that he would make sure the money was paid. Canavo, cold, aloof, and reptilian, said, Oh, yeah? How about this? You owe me the money now. Your son's off the hook, but you, I want the money from you. Boxed into a corner, Vinny DeMarco agreed to pay him off as soon as possible. Little by little, every week, DeMarco brought Canavo money. Canavo kept a ledger book, and every dime he got from DeMarco he'd deduct from the original amount. Problem was that DeMarco earned so little working at Embassy Terrace that Canavo became impatient. To help expedite paying off the debt, Canavo suggested to Vinnie DeMarco that he sell drugs. Reluctantly, DeMarco agreed. The sooner he got Canavo off his back, the better. Initially, Canavo fronted DeMarco several ounces of heroin. Not knowing anything about the business, not knowing who wanted heroin, not knowing that the DEA had plants all over the New York tri-state area, 
DeMarco ended up selling the drugs to a DEA informer. Before he knew it, he was under arrest. DeMarco had never been in trouble in his entire life. He was shocked and distraught and seemed to have aged ten years overnight. He cried uncontrollably in front of Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel. When they checked his record, they realized he was a civilian, that he was a hard-working man. When they heard his story of woe, how his son had gotten him into this, how he had tried to protect Benny from Sicilian vipers, they felt bad for him. They offered him a deal. Jim said, All right, look, we know you aren't a bad guy. We're going to give you the opportunity to help yourself. We want you to set up Canaveral. Keep buying drugs from him. We'll provide you with the money. Record him, and whatever you do to help us, we'll help you in a big way. This was a golden opportunity for Vinnie DeMarco. He went about the business of setting up Sicilian heroin dealer Salvatore Canavo with enthusiasm. Canavo, in turn, said he would have someone who worked for him, Paolo Rizzuto, contact him and that he would provide all the heroin Vinnie needed. With that, Vinnie called Jim Hunt and Tom Geisel and told them what happened, told them about Paolo. This is what Hunt and Geisel were always looking to do. Parlay one person against another and another and another, working their way up the food chain. Paolo came to the embassy terrace to meet with DeMarco. He had a heavy Italian accent, was a greaseball, as DeMarco would later refer to him. Without preamble or hesitation, Paolo assured DeMarco he could get all the heroin he wanted. That same week, Jim arranged for DeMarco, Canavo, and Paolo to meet at the My Way Lounge in Brooklyn. Jim wanted to see who this Paolo character was. Jim managed to have DEA photographers take clandestine photographs of both Paolo and Canavo. Now, for the first time, they realized who Paolo Rizzuto was. He was one of the original Pizza Connection participants who had managed to get away. This added a whole new element and sense of importance to what DeMarco had initiated. Now, Paolo began to supply DeMarco with pure heroin that DEA labs told them was high-grade Sicilian dope. It seemed Paolo had an unlimited supply. One night, Paolo showed up at the restaurant with still another Sicilian, a guy named Manny. Again, DEA photographers captured his likeness, and within two days they knew his real name and identity and criminal background. They were shocked to learn that this was none other than Emmanuel Adamita. He, too, had been a major player in the Pizza One case. He had been arrested both in the United States and Sicily, and miraculously had escaped from both a Sicilian prison and an immigration prison hospital in Florida. This was a big fish, a giant white shark. This also was a classic example of how the DEA fought the war on drugs. They went from a small fry to a white shark. Interestingly, Manny Adamita was directly related to Carlo Gambino's family, cousins of brothers John, Joseph, and Rosario Gambino. Adamita had also once been a driver and bodyguard for Carlo Gambino. Now, suddenly, the DEA again had a major player in their sights. Rather than jump on him, collar him, and haul him off to jail, it was decided that they'd keep working him and see where he led them. Vinny DeMarco continued to buy heroin from Paolo and Manny, and the case became more solid with every purchase, more solid with every day. DEA surveillance photographed Manny going into the garage sale cafe in Brooklyn, which was owned by Tony Spuvento, a member of the Calabrian Mafia known as the Nadrangheta. Here, Manny said that the Gambinos were looking to buy large amounts of marijuana, and they had people, good people, all over the country looking to cop. Vinny immediately saw an opportunity to further ingratiate himself to the DEA, to the government. I've got friends who've got all the grass you want, said Vinny. They bring it up from Florida and the Carolinas. Manny was interested, and Vinny said he would set it up. When Vinny told Jim and Tom about this latest development, they were all ready with a plan that would further ensnare Manny and company. The well-lubricated workings of the DEA kicked in, and DeMarco was told by Jim and Tom to arrange for Manny to be brought to a hotel in Hilton Head, South Carolina, where he, Tommy, and a third DEA agent by the name of George Ellen, the 
head of the DEA in Charleston at the time, would be waiting for them disguised as major players in the pop business. George Ellen was a tough-looking government agent with dark hair. He was a specialist, and his specialty was endearing himself to drug dealers. He knew the walk, the talk, the culture, and he was often brought into cases in different parts of the country to convince bad guys that they could deal with him, and ultimately they would end up being brought down and sent to prison. If the DEA had a De Niro, George Ellen was he. The DEA always has props ready for just such a case. They would use a confiscated speedboat that could go up to 110 miles an hour on the water and cost half a million dollars. They would use a warehouse filled with 20,000 pounds of high-grade marijuana. These were props that could convince the most cynical of drug dealers that Tom and Jim and George were major players. The real thing. Trustworthy. Manny readily agreed to go to South Carolina. They checked into the Intercontinental Hotel. The room had a large terrace where they had drinks. Both Jim and Tom were lounging around the pool, drinking, and making it seem as though they were having fun, flirting with women at the pool. They took on the demeanor of carefree, wealthy pot dealers. Up on the terrace, George Ellen began his shtick, first talking about sports, the weather, fishing. It was good, he knew, to slowly work his way to the reason why everyone was there. While he was building a rapport with the Sicilian, he suddenly noticed, all an act, Jim and Tom down by the pool. Hey! he called to them before turning to Vinnie and Manny. Here's my nephew Tom and his pal Jim. Good guys, really good guys. Come on, let's go down and have a drink with them. Before Vinnie and Manny knew it, they were being shepherded downstairs by Ellen and were by the pool having drinks. Between Jim, Tom, and George Ellen, Manny didn't have a chance. It would be just a matter of time. But the game had to be played out until the last inning, at which point the DEA would hit a home run. At the pool, they drank, cracked jokes, talked about women and sports, how nice the hotel was, ogling women around the pool. Later that night, they had dinner together. Of course, they took Manny and Vinnie to the finest restaurant in the area. Manny drank so much he got sick. The following morning, they talked about going fishing, but Manny had a horrific hangover. Still, he wanted to take a look at their boat. He was very impressed by it. He reluctantly agreed to go fishing. This boat was certainly not cut out for fishing, but it would be a way for the agents to get Manny to drop his guard further, for them to become closer to him. There were fishing poles, bait, and lures, and in fact they did catch fish that day. George Ellen offhandedly mentioned that they used this boat not for fishing, but they used it to transport marijuana from the outer islands to the Florida and Carolina coasts. Manny was, again, impressed. Jim, Tom, and George Ellen were so convincing that he bought what they were laying down, hook, line, and sinker. Later that night, at dinner, the conversation turned toward marijuana. Manny said he needed a taste. They told him that would be no problem, that they understood. The following day, Manny and Vinny headed back to New York. The trap was baited and set. Back in New York, Vinny continued to buy heroin from Manny as Manny sent queries to his counterparts throughout the country about marijuana. He was now assuring his colleagues that he could get everybody all the high-grade grass they wanted. Tom, Jim, and George wound up again meeting with Manny and DeMarco in New York. This time, Manny wined and dined them in a restaurant in Little Italy, and ultimately he said that he'd like Paulo to check out the grass. The agents had been expecting this. They were waiting for it. They, the Italians, were taking the bait. Several days later, Paolo, in fact, came down to Tampa, Florida, and was met by Jim and Tom and taken to the secret stash house. However, before they took him there, they blindfolded him, to which he readily agreed. I understand. No problem. Inside the warehouse, on a quiet industrial street which reeked with the sweet, pungent odor of Sensimilla, Paolo's eyes grew wide at the sight of so much high-grade marijuana in one place. He was impressed. It was hard not to be. The screw was tightening. They talked about samples being delivered to New York. Jim readily agreed that they would give him all the samples he needed. Whatever you need, no problem, Jim said. They shook hands, 
hugged and kissed, as is the Italian way. Paolo was again blindfolded and soon was on his way back to New York, where he assured Manny that these guys were on the up and up. It was now time for the government agents to get a sample to New York. Jim spoke to his boss, Ken Feldman, who petitioned the upper echelons of the DEA to give Jim permission, because of an ongoing investigation, to bring fifty pounds of the marijuana, a bale of it, up to New York. Two first-class seats were arranged for Jim and the fifty-pound bale on a commercial airline. With the necessary papers in hand, Jim approached the plane carrying the grass, asked for the captain, and told him what was up. The captain looked at the papers and welcomed him and the marijuana aboard. Jim placed the bale in the seat next to him. So it wouldn't be bouncing all over, he strapped it in and then strapped himself in. Passengers' eyes widened at the sight of him sitting there next to this huge bale of high-grade marijuana. People seemed to notice it because of the smell. It filled the first-class cabin. The plane landed without a mishap. Tommy Geisel met him at the airport, and soon Sicilians and Calabrians were smoking and sampling the marijuana. It was the best pot available, and everybody wanted some. Everything was going smoothly. Jim and Tommy had their sights on a bullseye. Then, out of nowhere, there was a conference call in Miami between the FBI and the higher-ups in the DEA, and it was decided that they were going to rush the closure of the case, shut the operation down in two weeks. Manny Adamita was far too important. They were afraid he'd get away. They felt that at this juncture, if he did disappear, it wouldn't bode well for anyone. They already had plenty on him, and they wanted him brought down now. Jim and Tom were not happy about this. They knew this decision was politically motivated, that the FBI wanted to get it over with more quickly. Jim and Tom felt that Manny would be able to bring them still bigger, more dangerous fish if they just give it some time, if they just let it play out. Be that as it may, the order was irreversible, and both the FBI and DEA mechanized as swiftly as they could to bring down as many bad guys as possible. There were numerous wiretaps up because of Vinnie DeMarco bringing Manny Adamita to Jim and Tom's attention, and the potential for a substantial number of arrests was great if they played their cards right. They were ready to pounce, all coiled muscle. It was decided they should get as much bang for their buck as possible, and Jim passed word to Manny via Vinnie that Jim and Tommy wanted to buy a kilo of heroin. At this point, Manny was so at ease with Tom and Jim that he readily came to meet them, carrying the kilo of nearly pure heroin. Jim and Tom had checked into a fancy suite at the Parker Meridian Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. Manny was all hugs and kisses. He kept kissing them over and over again, as is the Sicilian way, told them it was great that they had met, that it was great to have friends you could trust, that the world was a rotten place and that they could all make money without worry. He kissed them again and again, often using the word paisan. So, Tom said after a drink and far too many kisses, do you have a package for us? Sure, sure, yeah, I do. I got it in the car. Well, you want to bring it up? Sure, yeah, Manny said, and left to go get the package from the car, having no idea that he was about to walk into a lion's den. Agents followed him to his car and watched him get a package from his trunk, then re-enter the hotel, get on the elevator, and make his way to Jim and Tom's room where he knocked on the door. Jim opened the door, and Manny walked in. Like I promised, Manny said. Jim opened the package to make sure it was heroin, and then came the moment when reality hit Manny Adamita like a lightning bolt. Jim Hunt turned to him, suddenly dour, and said, Manny? We're DEA agents. You're under arrest. Stern and strong and deadly serious. Manny went from his original ruddy dark color to chalk white. Inside, his stomach twisted into a knot. His hands trembled. Yeah, kidding, he barely managed to say in a weak voice. No, we aren't kidding, Tom replied. Over the next several days, two hundred men were arrested, both here in the United States and across the globe, all because Vinnie DeMarco agreed to help Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel. Chapter 15 Street Monkey 
Because of the excellent work of Vinnie DeMarco in helping with the arrests of Manny Adamita, Paolo Rizzuto, and a trainload of drug dealers stateside and abroad, he was allowed to plead guilty and received probation. Got a sweetheart deal. Vinnie had become very fond of Jim Hunt and Tom Geisel. He thought of them more as trusted friends and confidants than as cops. Therefore, it wasn't surprising that several months later, when a friend of DeMarco's needed help, he reached out to Jim and Tommy and asked for a meeting. Only this time, it involved one of the most infamous murderers La Cosa Nostra ever produced, opening a door into a mafia cemetery the likes of which the world had never known. Jim and Tom arranged to meet Vinnie in a luncheonette in Brooklyn. Vinnie told them a friend of his was in real bad trouble. I wouldn't come to you guys, bother you with this, but he's a good kid, said DeMarco. He's gotten into something bad over his head. He's gotten involved in... with a real bad dude. He's scared shitless. He owes him money for some drugs. This guy not only kills people for the bananas, but he kills for other families as well. He enjoys killing. He cuts them up. He's known as Wacko. They looked at each other. There was a heavy silence. What DeMarco was saying, both Jim and Tommy felt had the ring of truth. There was a fear and apprehension about his face and in his eyes, in his every gesture. They had come to know him well through working on the Pizza 2 case. What Vinnie was trying to do here was use Jim and Tommy to protect his friend, Angelo Favara, not only from Wacko, but from Angelo himself. How can we help? Jim asked. Well, it's a touchy situation. I don't want to see the kid get killed. See, see, the problem is, the kid wants to take out the guy before he strikes. He wants to hire a killer. What I'm saying is, the kid needs help. He's looking for... Well, to be honest with you, he wants to kill this killer before the killer kills him. <laughs> I know it sounds nuts, but it's what's happening. Does he have money? Jim asked. I don't think so much. Who's this guy? Who's this killer you're talking about? Tommy Patera, Vinnie said. He's got a bar over in Avenue S, and he's big into drugs. He's with the Bananos. Is he made? Tommy asked. I'm pretty sure he is, DeMarco said, his voice taking on a serious tone like that of a doctor bringing bad news. This was interesting to the two agents. An observant onlooker would have seen a hint of excitement in both their eyes. Jim Hunt asked, What's your friend's name? Angelo Favara. Jim and Tom were thinking this might lead to something big. They knew for a fact that the Bananos were heavy into drugs. They knew for a fact that the Bananos were responsible for more heroin and cocaine being brought into the United States than all of the other families put together. They were the go-to guys for drugs. The fact that DeMarco said this Patera guy was with the Bananos was what further piqued both Jim and Tommy's interest. Maybe, Jim reasoned, the door could slowly be opening on another very large case. Even after the French Connection case, and after the Pizza Connection case, Jim knew damn well that the Italians were still bringing huge amounts of drugs into the country, that the Italians were beginning to work with other ethnic groups, particularly Colombians. The Colombians, he also knew, had raised the level of their business acumen to such a high degree that the Italians saw them as viable business partners, not out-of-control cowboys like the Dominicans, the Mexicans. Vinnie now, for the first time, sheepishly confessed to Jim and Tom that he had told Angelo that they were hitmen, that they had killed a witness in a murder case against his son. Some months earlier, Vinnie's son had been in jail for murder and was released because a witness backed out of testifying. Vinnie, wanting to keep Angelo Favara out of trouble, wanting to protect him from himself, had lied to Angelo and told him Tom and Jim had killed a witness against his son in the murder rap. Okay, Jim told Vinnie. Set up a meet. Looking forward to where this would lead, though wary and on guard. Rota's was on East Tremont and Castle Hill Avenue in Parkchester, the Bronx. It was a nondescript bar with a thirsty, blue-collar, middle-class clientele. The lights were low. There was a mirror behind the bar. 
When Jim and Tommy arrived, they were in disguise, dressed in faded jeans, beat-up boots, their hair long and raggedy. They sported beards. These two had an uncanny ability to alter their appearance. They spotted Angelo Favara at the bar. He was in his late thirties, slovenly, ill-kempt, pale with dark circles under his eyes. He had messy black hair. He was five-seven. He was what Jim called a street monkey. Drinks were ordered. Tommy and Jim had beers. Angelo drank hard alcohol. Angelo was tense and uptight. He was a worried man. His eyes moved back and forth like two small, nervous fish. During Jim's professional career, he had met dozens of men like this. They had the world on their shoulders, were about to make a life change, were about to put their lives in the hands of others. There was no doubt in his mind that Angelo Favara was a scared man. After making some small talk, Angelo got right down to it. He had a lot on his mind and was anxious to express it. You guys come out. I highly recommend it. I trust DeMarco. He knows what he's talking about. I got myself in bad trouble. I'm the first to admit I've made mistakes. There's this guy in Brooklyn named Tommy Karate. He's a killer. I mean, a stone-cold killer. He enjoys killing people. For him, it's not a job. It's a pleasure. Everybody in Brooklyn knows it. He not, he not only kills people, but he cuts them up. Here, Angelo looked at Tom and Jim's reaction. He saw nothing. He waited for a response. And what do you want from us? Tom asked. I don't want to die. I want this guy dead. I want him killed. I'll pay. I can pay. Chuckling, Jim leaned forward as though he was afraid of being recorded and said, Look, we don't know you, and you don't know us. We are very good at what we do. We are professionals. We don't come cheap. You got money to pay us? Well, uh, uh, Angelo began, unsure of himself. No, I, I don't have the money right now, but I get it. How much do you owe him? Jim asked. Oh, about 8000 That's not much, Jim said. No, it's not, but when you don't have it, it's a lot. Well, what do you want from us? Jim said bluntly. Angelo said, Well, I, I thought because of your relationship with Vinny, you, you might do this for free. Both Jim and Tommy laughed at Angelo's audacity. He obviously wasn't the brightest bulb in the box, they both knew. That was irrelevant. What was relevant was that he could bring them to something bigger. Why don't you work it off? It's not that much. Get some stuff from him, off it, do it a couple of times and you'll be free of him, Jim said. Angelo looked at them. The problem with that is it's easier said than done. I get the coke and I end up doing it. And then I end up owing them more money. I swear, I have every intention of giving them what's due, but then one thing happens and another thing happens. I lost the child. I don't know why I'm talking about this now, but I lost the child because of SIDS. It's a hard thing to get over, but when I do coke, I don't feel anything. I feel numb. This, of course, was the age-old problem of drug abusers. They could not control what they did and how much they did it. An addict put not only his or her life on the line, but also the lives of his or her children, spouses, parents, and on and on. It was for these reasons that, for the most part, the DEA stayed away from addicts. Here, now, what Jim and Tom were looking at was a drug-using lowlife who had gotten himself in trouble and was trying to weasel his way out of it. Jim said, We're always looking for something good. Good dope. If this guy has good stuff, we'll take some off his hands. We'll buy it directly from you. Really? Angelo said, brightening up. Sure. We'll take all you can get. O okay, uh, I can do that. No problem. As Angelo talked, they drank. He finished his drink and had another. The more alcohol he consumed, the looser he became with his mouth. He kept going back to Patera. He kept talking about what a dangerous, bad, stone-cold killer he was. Nearly every other word out of his mouth was killer. He described him as a martial arts expert who loved to murder people. He's pale, like a vampire, 
he said. Ultimately, arrangements were made for Jim and Tommy to meet with Angelo in Brooklyn. They would meet a woman named Judy Hamowitz, who, according to Angelo, was one of Patera's dealers. Chapter 16 The Vampire of Avenue S When Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel finished with Angelo, they discussed what they heard on their way back home. They believed they were on to something. Both Jim and Tommy, however, were naturally skeptical. Often street people embellished and exaggerated to such a degree that they were living in a fantasy land. But there was something about what this Angelo character said about Patera that not only had the ring of truth, but had an innate sense of dread, a sense of foreboding about it. Whether or not that was all in his own head or was reality, they'd soon find out. The following day, Jim and Tommy reported to DEA headquarters on 57th Street, they repeated what they had learned to their boss, Ken Feldman, and their colleagues in Group 33. Everyone agreed it was certainly worth pursuing, and pursuing in a large, serious way. They ran a search for Patera's file and checked his record. Interestingly, he had no police record, but they found out he was a highly trained black belt in karate who had studied martial arts in Japan for some two and a half years. He was also known to hang out with members of the Bonanno crime family. When Tommy and Jim next went to meet Angelo in Brooklyn's Gravesend, they were not alone. They had backup with them. Excited by the prospect, by the potential enormity of this case, they made their way to Brooklyn via its Belt Parkway. They went under the grand expanse of the Verrazano Bridge, the narrow straits on their right, Bensonhurst on their left. They got off at the Cropsey Avenue Coney Island exit, took a left, and made their way into Gravesend. There were two vehicles, the one that Tommy and Jim were in, and a van with four other agents. They were each heavily armed. Never knowing what they would face, they were on guard. Even if a small part of what Angelo said about Patero was true, this could very well turn into a dangerous situation. They all realized you never knew what you were walking into. What seemed like an innocuous situation could turn deadly at a moment's notice. More than anything else, Patera's association with the Bananos caught and held their interest in a huge way. This could very well be the chink in the armor of the Bonanno family that they, the DEA, had been looking for. This might very well bring down the whole family if they could get the goods on Patera, if they could turn Patera and make him spill the beans, tell all he knew. It stood to reason that if Bonanno underlings were selling drugs, Everyone in the family from the boss on down not only knew about it, but had given their blessings, their advice, their protection. In other words, it was not two or ten or several dozen members of the Bonanno crime family hustling drugs. What was happening here, the reality of what was going on, was that the whole family was a well-lubricated machine whose byproduct was a huge amount of heroin and cocaine. Jim and Tom well knew that the pipeline that Carmine Galante had constructed at the behest of Joseph Bonanno in the 1950s was still running. They met Angelo in the basement of his house on West 8th Street. It was unkempt, dirty, a mess. It didn't take long for Judy Hamowitz to show up. She was short and overweight and had a full head of hair that went every which way at once. Angelo introduced her to the agents. She was nervous. It was immediately apparent to Jim and Tom that she was not a professional, hardcore dealer as such, that, more than likely, she was somebody who got caught up in drugs because of her abuse of drugs, the world of drugs, the milieu of drug abuse. Without speaking to one another, Jim and Tom knew that their job would be to relax her and set her up, use her to get bigger fish. They sat down. Pleasantries were exchanged. I've got the stuff. Judy offered before going to her pocketbook. She riffled through her bag, and as she fumbled for the heroin, a gun suddenly fell out of her pocketbook. The gun hit the ground. It was a twenty-five automatic. Tommy and Jim and Angelo looked at one another. This was more comical than dangerous, the agents thought. Oh, I'm so sorry, Judy said before picking up the auto and putting it back in her bag. Don't worry, Angelo put in. She's good people. Frank Ganji is her boyfriend, real stand-up guy. Glad the gun was away, they all laughed somewhat nervously. 
Judy handed the heroin to Jim. He looked at it with great intensity, as though he was an expert geologist studying an uncut diamond. Looks real good, he said. Judy Hamowitz was paid. Though she was a small player in a life-and-death game, because of Agents Hunt and Geisel, she would ultimately play a significant role in the story of Tommy Patera. They now discussed Jim and Tommy meeting Patera. It was Patera they wanted. Angelo explained to them that Patera was paranoid, suspicious, very wary of meeting strangers. He was very fond of saying, Angelo said, If I don't know the cunt they came out of, I don't want to know them. Still, Angelo said, he'd do what he could to set up a meeting between Patera and Jim and Tom. The deed done, Jim and Tommy made for the sidewalk, walking along a driveway that separated Angelo's place from the house next door. It was quiet, the night clear, stars shining in the black sky. The smell of Italian cooking, tomato sauce and basil and garlic, wafted seductively through the air. As they reached the sidewalk, they ran into a tall, dark-haired, attractive woman. Is Judy in sight? she asked the agents. Yeah, she is, Jim said. She thanked them, smiled, and walked toward the house. She had, Jim was sure, a Canadian accent. One way or another, Jim and Tom thought, they would manage to get the goods on Patera, if possible, get him holding drugs. At that point, they had no idea just how cagey, cunning, and treacherous Patera was. They headed back to DEA headquarters, where they handed in the dope they had bought, which would be tested for content and purity. As it happened, it was particularly good heroin, with a twenty percent cut on it. They already had Judy Hamowitz. She had sold them both drugs. They had each seen her carrying a gun. However, rather than bust her now, they would diligently and slowly work her. The game was afoot. Later that evening, Judy Hamowitz went to the Just Us bar, where she found Frank Ganji. Ganji was a tall, thin, muscular man with particularly broad shoulders. His hair was thick and jet black. Judy told him about the sale and the two guys from the Bronx she met. She then told Ganji that Angelo had used his name, said his name to these two guys, that he, Ganji, was a stand-up guy. This was bad form, Ganji knew. You don't go throwing around people's names. He immediately called Angelo and told him to come to the bar. When Angelo arrived there, Ganji berated him for using his name and suddenly gave him a hard smack across the face. Don't ever fucking use my fucking name. You understand, you little fuck? Angelo was not only hurt by the slap, but angered and incensed and embarrassed. He was soon heard telling people that he was going to go get a bat and break Frank Ganji's head open. Angelo Favara was all about bluster and hot air. He was not a tough guy. He was a drug abuser who got caught up in the world of drugs. They, Jim and Tom, would use him, make him a stepping stone. Chapter 17 Surveillance It didn't take long for Jim and Tommy Geisel to again cop from Judy Hamowitz. Angelo was with them. Angelo again could not set up a meeting with Patera. Still, Jim and Tommy felt that what they were doing was now slowly and methodically building a case that would ultimately end in the arrest of not only Patera, but the people he worked with, his minions, and the people he worked for, his bosses. This time, Judy Hamowitz was more relaxed. She readily handed over the drugs. She asked them if they'd like to do it, Toot. They declined. Here now was a very slippery road. Dealers liked to see their customers get high in front of them. Cops, for the most part, would not use drugs. Jim and Tommy had been in this position before. They had a pat answer, viable and ready. We got serious business later, and can't party right now, Jim said. Okay, next time, Judy said. With that, Jim and Angelo and Tommy were soon back outside. Angelo promised he would arrange for them to meet Tommy. He seemed sincere though his words did not ring true to the seasoned agents. Jim and Tommy and backup agents from Group 33 began surveillance of Tommy Karate Patera's bar, the Just Us bar. They quickly noticed that it wasn't a crowded, loud place. It was a quiet neighborhood bar on a residential street in the heart of Gravesend, Brooklyn, 
more like a social club than a public bar. Curious, wanting to know themselves what was going on inside the Just Us bar, Jim and Tom made it their business to learn as much about the bar and Tommy Patera as possible. What Patera had done, somewhat comically, when a civilian came into the bar, was charge exorbitant prices for a drink or beer. Patera really meant this place was just for them, thus his calling the bar the Just Us. What the bar was all about was creating a hangout for Patera and his crew, his customer base, anybody in La Cosa Nostra. It was the squares, the civvies, as they called them, they wanted to keep out. The patrons who did enter the bar were rough and talked like they were right out of central casting for a mob movie. Interestingly, it wasn't only men who hung out there. So-called guidos, Cadillac driving, pinky ring and gold chain with medallion wearing, blow dryer using, Sergio Tacchini sweatsuit clad men hung out here. But there were also women who came into the bar women who belonged, women who were part of the culture of Bensonhurst and Gravesend, Guidettes. These women spoke the same vernacular as the men. For them, made men were very appealing. They had money and were oversexed. The women unapologetically teased their hair and wore five-inch heels with pants so tight it looked as though the seams would burst at any moment. Their makeup was overt and in your face. Their eyeliner caked on, their lip liner mismatched to their lipstick. Their nails were fake, airbrushed, and ridiculously long. For these women to date or even marry a made man, a lieutenant, a captain, was a goal in life. No matter how you cut it, mob guys, mafiosi, had money to burn. One of the places they most liked to spend money was on women, lavishly and without reservation. As Jim and Tommy observed the bar, learned about its rhythm and pace, they saw these women, heard them talk, and were amused. They appreciated them for who they were. They didn't necessarily judge them or make fun of them, but they thought they were comical and harmless, which, for the most part, was true. However, tragedy, sudden and amazingly violent, could strike these women at any time. By becoming involved with mafiosi, they were entering a world where, at a moment's notice, they, their boyfriend or husband, could be murdered. Murder was as intricate a part of that life as silk socks and diamond pinky rings. If any woman was in the wrong place at the wrong time, she could get killed. If she did something excessively disrespectful, she could get killed. For the most part, the mob did not kill women, but still, when tempers flared and bullets flew, anyone could die. One weekday evening, while Jim and Tom observed from a car across the street, Patera walked into the bar. Jim and Tommy had seen photos of him, and he was very easy to discern. His face was white like chalk, stern and stoic. He had receding, straight black hair. Even in the dim light of Avenue S they could see his eyes, a piercing blue. They stood out on his face like headlights. It was obvious he was an athletic man, wide-shouldered and muscular, well-coordinated and comfortable in his own skin. Tommy and Jim viewed Patera only as part of something larger. It was the something larger they were after, not only the heads of the Bonanno crime family, but the other heads as well. They knew, for instance, that many of the captains in the Gambino family were moving drugs. They knew, too, that John Gotti's brother Gene was a drug dealer. They knew that Gambino captain Eddie Lino was a drug dealer. They knew that they all worked together, hand in hand, that they were all part of a large, tightly woven cabal. What Tom and Jim were after, the reason they were sitting there, was to gather irrefutable evidence that would hold up in a court of law against the blistering scrutiny of mean-spirited defense attorneys. They, Jim and Tom, were consummate professionals. They were not in a hurry. They would put in as much time as necessary, unlike the case in most law enforcement outfits where everyone was in a hurry. Everyone was looking for headlines. Everyone was looking for the positive publicity that goes along with a big bust. Crime fighting was political. The more accolades any given agency received, the more funding they were given, the more respect they received. The DEA, however, was more about working cases patiently and professionally until they came to a true fruition. Not only did this work well as a matter of policy, but when they did move, 
when they did make arrests, the arrests stuck. Bad guys went to jail. That's what they were after, getting bad guys off the street once and for all. Both Jim and Tommy could sense in their bones that something substantial was happening here. Yet still they had no idea just how diabolical and dangerous and what a menace Tommy Patera really was. Patera and a few other men exited the bar and hung out in front of it. They smoked cigarettes, talked quietly among themselves. At one point, Patera seemed to stare across the street, stare at the Cadillac in which Jim and Tommy were sitting. It was as though he knew cops were in the car, though he did not know if it was the FBI, NYPD Organized Crime Unit, or the DEA. Whoever they were, he wanted to defy them, treat them as though he knew who they were and why they were there, and almost dare them to do something. Chapter 18 Phyllis Tommy Patera was married to his childhood sweetheart, Carol Boguski. Carol was somewhat typical of a Bensonhurst Gravesend girl. She had the walk, talk, dress. When Tommy first met her, he was a far different person than he was now. As often happens with couples, one of the pair, for a host of reasons, outgrows the other. Tommy considered himself now more sophisticated, worldly, a man of respect. He had a child with Carol, Charles. Though Tommy and Carol were not living together any more, did not see each other much, Tommy did everything he should for her and his son, provided what they needed in every way he could. He paid their rent, bought clothes, food, whatever else they needed. Generally speaking, Tommy showed tremendous deference toward women. Now it was the mid-eighties, and he was deeply involved with a Brooklyn girl named Celeste Lapari. Celeste was attractive. She had a triangular-shaped face, pronounced cheekbones, a narrow, delicate chin, and a high, broad forehead. She had large, dark eyes, full lips, a perfect figure, small waist, curved hips, full breasts. As attractive as she was, Celeste sounded like a rough, tough truck driver when she talked. She, perhaps more than even Tommy, wanted to be a gangster, comported herself like a gangster. Her Brooklyn accent was excessive. She talked out of the side of her pretty mouth. For Tommy Patera, Celeste was perfect. He worshipped the ground she walked on. Everything about her was right for him except one thing, her drug use. She was not an occasional weekend user. She was one of those people who had an addictive personality, and she regularly used both cocaine and heroin. It got so that the two of them fought over her drug abuse. He swore he would leave her. She promised she'd stop. It went on like this for month after month. Now he was getting fed up. Now he was getting desperate. The difficulty for him was that he loved the woman, and that was a big problem. It went beyond their relationship. He was a bona fide member of the Bonanno family. Having a girl like her, going around and snorting cocaine and partying, undermined his credibility as a man. If you can't control your woman, you can't control your business. He sat her down. He looked her in the eyes and explained the situation. He grabbed her by the shoulders and implored her to stop. She promised she would. The next week, it would be the same thing. Unless she towed the line, he was afraid that sooner or later this could end in tragedy. He was careful to keep his business away from her, but she knew things about what he did, about who he was, and she was becoming a liability. He came to realize that one of the problems was Phyllis Birdie. Phyllis was a Brooklyn girl, raised on its mean streets, and she too was a drug abuser who, like Celeste, used cocaine and heroin excessively. Phyllis came from a family of five who lived on Bay 35th Street in Bensonhurst. They were a large, loud clan, and most people on the block shunned them. Phyllis by far was the prettiest one. Like Celeste, she was strikingly attractive. She looked very much like a young Cindy Crawford, though a Cindy Crawford who had been up for a couple of nights on a drug binge. There were circles under her eyes, her skin was mealy, and her hair, for the most part, looked like she had just crawled out of bed. The most striking feature Phyllis had was her smile. It was a particularly beautiful smile that went from ear to ear 
and exposed large, square, white teeth. Her lower lip was full and curved into a natural pout. Phyllis had an abundance of street smarts and knew her way around Brooklyn as well as she knew her way around her small, dingy, one-bedroom apartment on West Fifth Street. Some say that Phyllis was a prostitute, that she sold her sex for clothes and for money and for drugs. There are people who say she prostituted herself on Coney Island when on a drug binge, a place where the disenfranchised of society go to party for sex and drugs. Here, the blue collar let their hair down. Phyllis was not a prostitute. What she was about was doing what needed to be done to make ends meet, whatever it was. She liked wise guys, and wise guys liked her right back. She had relationships, intimate, intense sexual relationships, with a long list of important mafiosi. One of her lovers was none other than Eddie Lino, the feared Gambino war captain, cousin of Frankie Lino, Tommy Patera's boss. It was no secret that Eddie Lino was deeply immersed in drugs. Phyllis told people that he gave her whatever she wanted, ounces at a time. Eddie Lino was only one of a dozen seriously connected men with whom Phyllis was having sex. She was that attractive. When good fellows were around Phyllis, it was like bees around spring flowers. When she was dressed and well put together, she looked like a striking model who had just stepped off the pages of the latest Vogue. Everything about her worked. Her small, perfectly round breasts, the perfect bubble that was her derriere. It didn't take long for Tommy Patera to learn that Phyllis was providing drugs to his beloved Celeste. When he first heard this, he knew he had to be careful. He was aware that Phyllis knew a lot of powerful men. He, like everyone else, knew she was having an affair with Eddie Lino. Eddie Lino and Patera were close. Patera knew that if he went to Eddie and asked for his help in this matter, he'd get it. But it was a very delicate situation. This was about Patera keeping his own house clean. He didn't want to hang his dirty laundry out for public consumption. Plus, he had endless respect for Eddie Lino. He viewed Eddie as the Dark Prince of Dark Princes. He aspired to be like Eddie. Taking that into consideration, Patera wondered how he could go to Eddie and ask for his help in this matter. He would, he decided, be diplomatic. Patera looked for Phyllis for several days and then finally ran into her at an after-hours club. By now, all throughout Mafiadom, Patera was known as a killer. It was rumored that he was butchering people, cutting them up after murdering them. He was notorious in the world of the notorious. Though Phyllis knew she had friends in high places, she also knew she had to take Patera very seriously. He took her outside, and leaning against a red brick wall, Speaking in his high-pitched voice, he said, Phyllis, I have a problem and I need your help. Celeste is out of control. I don't want her using drugs, but I... Listen to me. I'm not blaming you for anything. I'm not saying you did anything. What I'm saying is that she can't control herself, and I'd really appreciate it if you made sure not to give her any drugs. Ever. She has a couple of toots. She starts drinking, and next she's using heroin. I'd really appreciate this. Phyllis was somewhat surprised that Patera was being so nice. That was the only word to describe his tone and pitch. I've never given her any drugs. We've gotten high together, but I'll make sure to never turn her on, she replied. He stared at her. Having Tommy Patera stare at you with those ice-blue eyes of his was unsettling, to say the least. He nodded. They shook hands. With that handshake and with his eyes, he warned her that it could become dangerous, that he absolutely, positively, did not want Celeste using drugs, did not want Phyllis to give her any drugs. Chapter 19 Three-Time Loser Frank Ganji was six foot three, thin and wiry. When he walked around Brooklyn, he looked like a scarecrow that had stepped off his pedestal and was moving about. He had a large, oval-shaped face. He was a chain smoker, and when he laughed, phlegm readily bubbled in his lungs and he coughed. He did not have the demeanor, the features, or the carriage of a predatory animal. When you looked at Ganji, you thought more of a cook 
working in a busy kitchen, a friendly grocery store clerk, or perhaps the local pizza man. Not a killer. Certainly not a mafia associate. However, Frank Ganji was a dedicated drug dealer, had been charged with murder, though he was acquitted. He was associated with the Bonanno crime family, and he came from a culture of mafiosi. His father, uncles, and cousins were associates in the Bonanno and Genovese families. His uncle was Angelo Prezzanzano, a respected capo in the Bonanno family. His father, Frank Ganji Sr., was also an associate of the Bonanno family and had dealt in drugs. His cousin, Rosario Ross Ganji, was a highly respected captain in the Genovese family. Frank Ganji was one of those individuals who existed on the periphery of mafiadom. He was the proverbial three-time loser. Whether it was a combination of bad luck, bad timing, being ill-informed, or abusing drugs was all up for debate. Suffice it to say, Frank Ganji would become one of the most important players in the life and times and crimes of Tommy Karate Patera. Certainly a large part of Frank's difficulties in life stemmed from the fact that his father had spent three years in prison, from when Frank was five until he was eight. Without his father, the boy's feeling of isolation from his family and from society at large was amplified. His mother, Margaret, had a male child from a previous marriage, and she openly and without question preferred her first boy to Frank. To further muddy the waters of his turbulent life, Frank's father was murdered when Frank was nine years old. He was killed in a mob-related incident that involved Sicilian hitmen being brought down from Canada to kill Frankie Tuminaro and the senior Ganji. With the loss of his father, Frank Ganji withdrew further and further into himself. Whatever problems the young boy had were magnified. He was destined for trouble with the law, society, and especially those of his own kind. He would become a pariah from not only the Mafia, but his own family as well. He would become a man with no country. Though Frank Ganji was an average-looking man, women were drawn to him in a big way. He was tall and well put together. He had the golden gift of gab and was easy to warm to. He was not threatening. He seemed sincere and would readily offer to help if he could. Unlike many of the connected men that come from Bensonhurst and Gravesend, Frank Ganji was not a natural-born killer. It seemed that he was born in the wrong place at the wrong time. When he was in his early twenties, Ganji had a marijuana business. With his two partners, Billy Bright and Arthur Guvenero, he sold hundreds of pounds of pot every week, happily filling the need for marijuana in Brooklyn and the tri-state area. Arthur Guvenero was a freebase head and began stealing from Bright and Ganji. They realized what he was doing and made up their minds to kill him. The night of the murder, April 27, 1985, Bright and Ganji lured Gavanero to their stash house near Stillwell Avenue in Gravesend and began freebasing with him. When Bright and Ganji finally pulled out guns, they were so stoned they were inefficient and their minds so fogged by the drugs that they bungled the murder. Still, the two aimed and shot Gavanero. After Guvenero was shot several times, he dove through a large bay window, rolled onto the street, and miraculously took off with incredible speed. Bullets lodged in his upper back as well as the back of his head. When he reached the corner, he dropped. A police car rolled up to him. His dying words were, Frank Ganji and Billy Bright did this to me. Ganji and Billy Bright were quickly arrested. Shockingly, when the case went to trial, they were acquitted. Their lawyer convinced the jury that Guvenero was the bad guy, that he pulled out a gun and had started shooting at them and they were just defending themselves. Because there was no one to contradict them on the stand, the jury found them not guilty. They were, however, found guilty of possession of a gun. For the gun charge, they were each sentenced to a year in prison. In the spring of 1986, Frank Ganji emerged from jail. He had little money, little resources, and was looking for something to do. He was a friend of Judy Hamowitz's, and she suggested he go see Tommy Patera. She said that Patera had a lot going on and could, perhaps, help set him up. When Frank Ganji first met Tommy Patera in the Just Us bar in 1986, Ganji was taken aback by Patera's voice. 
Those who knew Patera knew the sound his voice made coming out of his mouth and readily accepted it. However, Frank Ganji was hearing it for the first time and couldn't help but think of Mickey Mouse, or worse yet, Minnie Mouse. Here was this ruthless killer with a reputation that far preceded him talking like a cartoon character. The comedy of it was not lost on Ganji. In that Ganji had this outgoing, gregarious personality, it was easy for him to get Tommy to warm to him. After the two of them had talked a while, Tommy said, What can I do for you? What are you here for? In a vague sense, Ganji talked about borrowing money. Hold on a second, I'm not a Shylock. That's not what I do, Patera said. I'm sorry, I thought maybe you could help me tie things over until I can get something going. No, Patera said. I don't want money, but maybe there are other things we can do together. Patera already knew who Frank Ganji was. He knew his family was all mobbed up, that Frank had previously sold large amounts of marijuana, that he had murdered Arthur Guvenero with Billy Bright. These were the best credentials Ganji could have had. Patera knew he was an amiable guy who had come up the hard way, who came from the nearby streets, and he immediately viewed Ganji as a potential member of his world. Likewise, Frank Ganji had heard all about Patera and was open to becoming involved with him and working with him. Patera arranged for Ganji to be fronted weight in cocaine and heroin and even marijuana. With his reputation and former connections and outgoing personality, Ganji was able to quickly make money for not only himself, but Tommy Patera, too. Like this, little by little, over the weeks and months, Frank Ganji became a trusted confidant of Tommy Patera's. Patera also hooked Ganji up with an Israeli coke dealer who was one of several sources Patera had outside the Bonanno family. His name was Shlomo Mendelssohn. A rough-around-the-edges, military-trained Israeli, Shlomo was part of a drug-dealing cartel that consisted of all Israelis. They were arrogant, tough, independent, and well-connected. Because Patera liked to stay as far away from the drugs as possible, it was not unusual for him to have underlings meet people, pick up the drugs, and distribute them appropriately. Knowing that Ganji was working for Patera, Shlomo pretty much gave him whatever he asked for on consignment. Suddenly, Ganji was no longer a mafia wannabe. Thanks to Patera, he was up and running and in the game again, though Frank Ganji still had a problem that would come back and shake the very foundation of the Bonanno crime family. Chapter 20, Group 33 With Patera's bar under surveillance and the DEA aware of his links to the Bonanno's, Hunt's boss Ken Feldman saw the potential for a big bust that would get some serious bad guys off the street. This, combined with Jim Hunt's impeccable reputation, pretty much guaranteed Hunt would get whatever he asked for. One of the first things he requested was a nimble, quick-moving strike force made up of agents from Group 33 to bring down Patera. His boss gave him the green light, and soon he was using rotating shifts divided between sharp highly experienced agents who would eventually monitor all of Patera's moves, who was going in and out of the Just Us bar. The strike force also managed to get warrants to listen in on Patera's phone conversations. The team of DEA agents, each of whom Hunt had given a nickname, was made up of Tom El Gordo Geisel, Eric, Eric the Red, Stangeby, Bruce Spike Travers, Mike Nunzio Agrifolio, John Big John McKenna, Mike Big Mike Grabowski, John Little John Welch, John Jethro Wilson, and Violet Selechki. They quickly noticed Frank Ganji show up on the scene. Frank was hard not to notice. At 6'3", with his long beak of a nose and black fedora, he was easy to spot in the crowd. Always suspicious and paranoid, Patera was indeed a hard man to pin something on. As it turned out, he very rarely talked on the phone, let alone said anything incriminating. He drove many different cars, so at that point it would have been exceedingly difficult to install a listening device. In that Patera had been born and raised in Gravesend, he knew its streets, avenues and alleyways, lots and dead ends like the back of his hand. 
Patera, as most made guys, could smell a cop a mile away. He noted the DEA agents, but he didn't know who exactly they were. FBI, NYPD organized crime, DEA, or ATF. To continue going about his business, Patera again took to donning disguises. He was a natural-born actor and could bend and twist his body any which way he wanted to. Like this, he often managed to slip away from his pursuers. On several occasions, while agents were sitting in front of his house, he'd leave the building dressed in his Hasidic disguise, moving slowly, bent over like a pretzel, and they did not know it was him. He also dressed as a woman, and, so disguised, would boldly strut out of his house, take a left or right, and soon disappear. At this juncture, Patera was not under surveillance twenty-four-seven, though as the case unfolded, as facts and names and details became known to the government, the DEA would become like white on rice to Tommy Patera. Because Group 33 was the most active, aggressive of all DEA groups in the entire country, they were all always very busy, were working numerous cases with different ethnic groups at any given time. Cases at different stages of development had to be nurtured. Witnesses and snitches, new evidence and new leads would fall out of the sky and have to be tended to immediately. For Jim Hunt, however, the Patera case was important. Chapter 21 The Gouverneros There were four Gouvernero brothers, Vinnie, Mook, Louis, Bop, Frankie, and Arthur. It seemed, for all intents and purposes, that the murder of Arthur Gouvernero was a thing of the past, over and done with. That might very well have been the case, had Arthur Gouvernero not had a brother named Louis Bop. Louis was a tough, street-smart guy who was born and raised on Bath Avenue. As a youth, he had hung out with a group called the Bath Avenue Boys, all stand-up, two-fisted Italian-Americans. Louis Bop was a naturally gifted athlete. Anything he tried in terms of athletics, he did very well. He was a particularly adept street fighter. He had unusually large hands and was amazingly fast and knocked out most of his opponents before they even threw a punch. Coincidentally, sadly, Louis's older brother, Vinny Mook Gouvernero, was murdered by Gambino Capo Nino Gaggi with the help of the notorious Roy DeMeo for whistling at Gaggi's sister-in-law on 86th Street as she came out of the High Tulip Jewish Deli. Louis Bopp made his living on the outside of the law. Though he was not a made man, he was most definitely connected. He had been born and raised in the Mafia culture, was a part of it, was thought of well, a rough-and-ready guy who often had a smile on his face. Arthur Gouvernero was Louis's youngest brother. Louis had always watched over Arthur. He knew Arthur was troublesome, that he was using drugs excessively, and he warned his kid brother. But Arthur, like all the brothers, was strong-willed and stubborn, headstrong, tough, and he wouldn't listen to his older, wiser brother. Inevitably, inexorably, Arthur's freebasing caused problems that resulted in his murder. When Louis Bopp heard about his brother's killing, he was incensed, distraught, and wanted revenge. Revenge in that neighborhood was the norm, as much a part of it as the 86th Street elevated train. The fact that Frank Ganji and Billy Bright only received a year after murdering Arthur compounded Louis Bopp's anger and frustration many times over. When Louis Bopp learned that Ganji and Billy Bright were out of jail, he decided to kill them, to take a contract out on their lives. Ganji and Bright had been childhood friends, two rogues cut from the same cloth. Bright had been doing business with Patera before he went to jail, and now that he was out of jail, their business relationship resumed. It didn't take long for Ganji and Billy Bright to hear about the contract Louis Bopp had taken out on their lives, and they ran to Tommy Patera. Patera was ideally suited to act as an intermediary on behalf of Ganji and Bright. He knew Mafia protocol exceedingly well. He knew its rules and regulations as well as the street on which he was born. Since both Frank Ganji and Billy Bright were working for him now, it was his responsibility to step up for them. Diplomatically, he suggested to Frank that he go to his cousin, Ross Ganji, a highly respected Genovese captain, and that he— 
Patera would speak up for Billy Bright. This way, Patera said. You'll have two families speaking up for you. Your position will be much stronger. Patera was, of course, absolutely right. A sit-down is a classic way the Mafia developed to iron out problems. It was easy to have a beef with anyone over a hundred different things, grab a gun, and put a bullet in someone's head. Though a bullet to the head certainly ended arguments, finalized all debates, there was a better way to settle disputes, differences of opinions, the divvying up of various multifamily schemes without spilling blood. Unbeknownst to the police and, by extension, the public, the Mafia often had meetings to resolve disputes without rancor, yelling or cursing or pointing of fingers. Again, this was a custom that was brought over from Sicily, but refined and perfected by the American La Cosa Nostra. In a sense, sit-downs had become an art form. The modulation of voice had to be just so. The motions of hands had to be subdued. Even the look from the eyes had to be neutral, not filled with fire, hatred. Because the Bonanno crime family was deeply involved in this problem, Anthony Spiro, the underboss, a highly respected individual in the family, agreed to host the sit-down. He would be the final arbitrator. Whatever he decided would be law, indisputable. The meeting was held in a quiet restaurant in Bensonhurst. The attendees were Louis Bopp, Billy Bright, Frank Ganji, Ganji's cousin Ross, Tommy Patera, and Anthony Spiro. Louis Bopp was seething with anger. Regardless of how neutral he tried to appear, the anger boiled over and came from his eyes, his every movement, though he was respectful, shook hands, and kissed. Louis first laid out his case, said that his brother had been murdered by Ganji and Bright, and he wanted revenge, was entitled to revenge. Conversely, Billy Bright told how Arthur had been stealing from them, that Arthur was an out-of-control drug addict, that he brought it all on himself. Everyone there that day, sitting at the table, knew exactly what Arthur Guvenero had been doing. He had been ripping off corner dealers. One day he was rich and driving fancy cars, and the next day he was broke because of illogical bad behavior. Spiro listened calmly to both sides and weighed the options. Ganji and Bright were both earners for the Bonanno family. As if that weren't enough, Ganji had his cousin in his corner, while Bright had Patera speaking for him. Spiro ruled that the matter was to be forgotten, that no one was going to be killed. It's over and done, he said in little more than a whisper. And it was over and done. Had Louis Bopp done anything more, tried to get his revenge, killed Ganji and Bright, he would have quickly and summarily been shot to death, no questions asked, no quarter given. Chapter 22 The Grave Digger On February 11, 1987, Patera managed to lose the DEA. Murder on his mind. He had Vincent Kojak Jatino in tow. He was headed to a desolate warehouse out in Queens for the purpose of filling a revenge contract. This was a particularly important killing for Patera because he had been tapped by Joe Massino himself. Joe Massino was a rotund, particularly tough, though dapper mafioso, a close friend of John Gotti's. The two came up the ranks together. They socialized with each other. They were made from the same mold. Joe's nickname could very well have been Joe the Gentleman, for he was fastidious about his appearance and was always well-groomed. He had a beautiful wife whom he loved very much. Through guile, brutality, street acumen, and shooting first and accurately, Joe Massino made himself the head of the Bonanno crime family. Philip Rostelli, the acting head of the family, had neither the balls nor the street smarts to go up against him. Whoever challenged Massino's rule was quickly eliminated. One such person was Cesare Bonventre. He had been present the day Carmine Galante was shot to death. He had participated in the murder. A tall, hulking blonde man who wore his hair slicked back and his shirts open. He was a mercurial mafioso who seemed to be bipolar. One minute he would be sitting there laughing, and the next minute he was tearing your throat out. As per Joe Massino's order, 
Bonanno family members Sal Vitale and Louis Ha Ha Atanasio picked up Bonventura to take him to a meeting with acting Bonanno boss Philip Rostelli. As is the way of made men, treachery virtuosos all, Bonventura was shot numerous times and killed on the way to the meeting. Specific orders had been given to make sure Bonventura was buried deep. This task was given to Gabe Infante. Massino did not ever want Bonventura found. Apparently, however, Massino's orders were not heeded. Bonventra was not only not buried deep, but was placed in fifty-gallon oil drums and left in New Jersey. When Bonventra was found, law enforcement immediately came snooping around Massino's camp. Plus, it was obvious to everyone in Mafiadom that Massino had ordered this killing. With that, Massino, not surprisingly, decided to kill Gabe Infante. Again, this was typical Mafia protocol. When the boss gives an order, it must be followed to the letter. In their world, in the world of crime, in the fiery netherworld of La Cosa Nostra, death can come from the smallest of infractions. Theirs is a constant life-and-death opera. Lie, you're dead. Steal from your boss, you're dead. Covet another made man's wife, you're dead. Not come when you are cold, you're dead. Not give the boss his due, you're dead. Openly deal drugs, you're dead. Practice homosexual activities, you're dead. Break the vow of omerta, you're dead. Don't bury a body deep enough, you're dead. For Tommy Patera, the reason for this killing was irrelevant. All that mattered was that Messino wanted this individual dead. Tommy would do it, no questions asked. He would do it well. He would, via this murder, garner the respect of Messino and earn brownie points with him as well. Sal Vitale brought Gabe Infante to the warehouse under the guise of going to see a load of marijuana. When Patera and Kojak joined them, Infante was not frightened because Patera was a known drug dealer. Because Frankie Lino was Patera's immediate boss, he too was dispatched to the Queen's warehouse. By the time he arrived at the warehouse, however, Gabe Infante was already dead. Patera had shot him in the head several times with an automatic. Frankie Lino did not like dealing with Patera. The fact is that he kept Patera at arm's length. He didn't like being around him. He felt he was spooky, ghoulish. He had heard how Patera adroitly butchered bodies. The job done, few words said, Patera now did what he did best. They loaded Infante up in the trunk of his car, and he, Vitale, and Kojak drove to the Arthur Kills landfill on Staten Island. Here, quickly, Infante was buried. Another notch in his belt, a favor done for Joe Messino, they headed back to Brooklyn, again going over the majestic expanse of the Verrazano Bridge. On Patera's right, as he went, he could see Bensonhurst and Gravesend just beyond, the place where his roots were, the place that had spawned him. Chapter 23 The Art of Walk and Talks Doggedly, Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel continued buying drugs from Judy Hamowitz, both heroin and cocaine, slowly building a case against Patera. The heroin was pure and potent, and the agents were able to have the DEA labs test it and determine from where it came. It was high-grade heroin from Turkey, no doubt brought to the United States via Sicily, Montreal, and Brooklyn, New York. The agents constantly tried to get Angelo to arrange to have them meet Patera. Tell him, Hunt said, we want a kilo of heroin, whatever he can provide. Angelo said, he's paranoid, he's crazy paranoid, he don't trust nobody. He says to me, he don't do business with anyone he don't know. Still, Hunt and Geisel followed Angelo when he went to Patera to drop off money he, Patera, had supplied to Angelo. Additionally, government money received by Favara was given to Patera. However, Jim Hunt and Tom Geisel came to believe that the case could go only so far with Angelo's help alone. It had to be broadened with the help of surveillance, wiretaps, and more informers. Still, both Jim and Tommy grew fond of Angelo and his wife, Ethel. Life had thrown the Favaras numerous curveballs, and they were black and blue. Almost as a matter of course, the DEA was compelled to use people like Angelo Favara. 
Regardless of what his status was in life, in society, they'd make the best out of him. They, everyone in the DEA, had come to know that in order to catch a shifty rat, you needed cheese. By the same token, they believed it was only a matter of time before they would nail Patera to the proverbial cross. They were out for blood. They were not out to make an arrest that could be beat. They already knew that Patera had access to the best criminal attorneys in New York. Though as days and weeks slipped by, the Patera task force came to realize that getting the goods on Tommy Patera would be difficult. It was patently obvious that everyone around Patera was deathly afraid of him. It was very hard to find somebody willing to cooperate with bringing him down. Using the tapped phones and Angelo, they searched for a weak link, an Achilles heel, some place they could exploit. Normally, everyone has an Achilles heel, but they came to realize that Patera was unusual, exceptional. They noticed, too, that people around him seemed to disappear. There'd be a guy at the Just Us bar on a regular basis, and then suddenly he'd be gone. The Mother Cabrini Educational Center was located at 246 Avenue U. This was the social club for the all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing Bonanno Capo Frank Lino. The club, as all of La Cosa Nostra's social clubs, was on the ground floor, its windows covered in thick curtains, and inside there were card tables along with the ubiquitous espresso maker. The walls were adorned with photos of Frank Sinatra, Caruso, Dean Martin, and Joe DiMaggio. It was somewhat ironic that Lino would name a meeting place for the Bonanno crime family after Mother Cabrini. It showed that he had not only a sense of humor, but audacity. Inevitably, the mob guys noticed the agents watching them from different vans and cars, but they did not give a flying fuck. This was an intricate part of their world, and no one was going to disturb the solidarity that the club afforded them. Often the DEA agents watched Patera enter the club, come out a little while later with another mafioso, and go for a walk and talk. Walk and talks were a uniquely clever invention of La Cosa Nostra. They had become so wary and paranoid of FBI monitors, taps, eavesdropping, that the only way they felt safe to talk to one another was to walk the streets in no particular direction, going left, right, stopping, and turning around, figuring the FBI couldn't record their conversations. They, the New York Mafia, created walk and talks and took them to such a degree of finesse that they became, in a sense, an art form. In that those who had the most to lose were the higher-ups, the most paranoid were the capos and bosses, it was they who most often went on these sojourns. They'd walk, usually two people, sometimes three, shoulder to shoulder, in stride, whispering as they went, trying to look natural, like they belonged. Often one or both of them at the same time would cup their hands around their mouths as they spoke, for fear of high-powered audio recording equipment. The DEA agents' long-lensed motorized Nikon cameras took pictures as Tommy Patera went on walk-and-talks with a host of Bonanno people like Frankie Lino and Anthony Spiro. To the government, this was a revelation. It proved that they were on the right trail. It was no secret to any of them exactly who Anthony Spiro was. On other days, they photographed Patera walking with Frankie Lino. The Mother Cabrini Educational Center acted like a sweet beehive and all the different mafiosi from Brooklyn made their way there sooner or later. The DEA noted Eddie Lino come and go. They noted Gene Gotti, John Gotti's younger brother, come and go. They noted Anthony Gaspipe Casso arrive, go inside, and then leave. With the long-distance lens and the determination and talent of DEA photographers, little went unnoticed or unrecorded. They noted that day and night Tommy Patera most often wore black like he was in mourning. At any given moment he could go to a funeral and fit right in. With that pale skin of his and those ice-blue eyes, he was a sight to behold, walking up and down Avenue U with various mafiosi. Of all the mafiosi, it was obvious to the DEA that Patera was the most paranoid, wary of being recorded, 
He always had his hand over his mouth as if he were taking the last bites of a Nathan's hot dog from nearby Coney Island. They, the DEA, also trailed Patera to Anthony Spiro's club on Bath Avenue at Bay 16th Street. It was called West End. Spiro had large flocks of pigeons up on the roof, and often his pigeons could be seen flying large circles over Bath Avenue. Here, too, Spiro and Patera would go for walks around the block, talking quietly, surreptitiously, as they made their way up and down quiet, tree-lined streets. These blocks were lined with one- and two-story homes. Italian-Americans lived in many of these homes. A lot of the front yards were adorned with statues of saints and the Virgin Mary. In the year or so since Ganji had hooked up with Patera, he had come to know intimately the remorseless killer Tommy Patera truly was. Everyone in the Just Us, indeed, throughout the underworld, was always talking about this person he killed and that person he killed, and what a badass killer he was. Ganji, too, heard that he not only murdered people, but he cut them up, butchered them with amazing acumen. At face value, Frank didn't think this particularly bad or ghoulish. He saw it more as part and parcel of what had to be done, a necessary part of the job. However, as time went by and he actually saw for himself what Patera was capable of, he came to know that Patera was a living, breathing monster, that he killed the way a werewolf would kill, that he killed the way a highly trained ninja warrior would kill. Murder for Patera was as easy as combing his thinning black hair. By now the summer of 1987 was just around the corner. One evening in early June, Ganji got up from a nap, showered, dressed, and went to be just us. Now Ganji was making money. He was always on the prowl, always looking for women. He considered himself quite the ladies' man. Females liked Ganji. One of the many women he dated was Phyllis Birdie. Phyllis was the woman who hung out with Celeste Lipari, Patera's girlfriend. She was the woman who Patera thought was supplying Celeste with drugs. Ganji knew that Celeste was a heavy drug user. Often she was at the Just Us when Patero wasn't around, going to and from the ladies' room, back and forth like the Energizer Bunny. He well knew that Patera really did not want her using drugs, but far be it from him to tell tales about anyone. He himself was a big drug user. He'd snort cocaine and snort cocaine, get all wired up, and drink half a bottle of whiskey to come down. Like this, quite stoned, he'd get in his car and drive about as though he were sober. Several times he had to pay off Brooklyn cops who pulled him over for drunk driving when his car weaved all over the road. One time he hit a stop sign on Cropsey Avenue and Bay 34th Street. He had to pay $500 to get away with that one. The combination of excessive coke use and excessive alcohol consumption destined Ganji for trouble. Big trouble. When he was really stoned, for the most part, Ganji stayed away from the just us and people in the life. What he would do is find a girl and take her home. He always had all the coke anybody could want, and he'd party with the girl and the coke, drinking heavily. Sometimes Frank Ganji woke up with such a headache he thought he'd been shot. It seemed deep inside he was trying to numb himself. It seemed as though he had some great pain that he couldn't deal with when sober. What he was doing was not partying. What he was doing was killing himself, little by little, digging his own grave. For these reasons, his family, knowing of his drinking and drugging problems, kept him at arm's length. They didn't trust him. They viewed him as what he was, an out-of-control addict, volatile and untrustworthy. Since Tommy Patera used drugs very sparingly, drank lightly, Ganji was rarely stoned around him. For Ganji, it wasn't a matter of getting high or buzzed. He would readily drink a bottle of Jack Daniels and snort an eighth of coke in one evening. He knew if Patera saw him that way, their days together would be numbered. Not only that, but Ganji had come to believe that if Patera thought Ganji was a liability, he'd kill him. He'd kill him as easily as passing gas. On this night, as Ganji took a left and entered the Just Us bar, he ran smack into Patera. Patera said, Come on, take a ride with me, Frankie. Sure, Ganji said. 
having no idea what was about to happen. They went outside and got in the car. Patera did his usual thing, made a U-turn, went a couple blocks, made another U-turn, drove into a shopping center, and went in a big circle to make sure they weren't being followed. Patera was a hard man to tail. He knew the moves. He had carefully studied surveillance. He had carefully studied exactly what cops do to follow people, and he readily managed to slip away from the government. He knew these streets far better than any of the DEA agents. As was Patera's habit, strategy, he turned on the radio. He purposely tuned into an AM frequency with loud static. He turned the volume up high enough so that the sound became hurtful to the ears. He leaned toward Ganji and whispered, This way no one can listen. What's up? We gotta go kill Talal. You want me to do it? Ganji asked, seeing an opportunity to get close to Patera to prove himself. Ganji didn't want to kill anybody, but he wanted to impress Patera. He felt the closer he got to Patera, the more Patera trusted him, the more money he'd make. No, no, I'll take care of it. We're going over to Richie David's house. He's got a briefcase for us. You'll go in and get it. Okay, Frank said, the static bothering him, stirring up his hangover from the night before. Patera kept looking in the rearview mirror as he drove, making sure they were alone. They made their way to Richie David's house. Richie was expecting them. When Ganji got to the door, Richie handed him a briefcase. Ganji, with his long, stilted gait, walked back to the car and got in. Patera opened the case. There were guns inside. He took out an automatic, cocked it, and put a bullet in the chamber. He then carefully screwed a custom-fitted silencer on the front of the gun. It was obvious that he knew guns exceedingly well. Seeing him handle a gun was like seeing a doctor handle a stethoscope. The gun was part of Patera's stock and trade, and he had made it his business to make any gun he held, any weapon he held, a natural extension of his body. He put the gun back in the briefcase and closed it. He placed the case on the back seat. Patera put the car in gear, and they started out. He made his way to Coney Island Avenue, and they took a right. The victim, Talal Siksik, was being held at his apartment, number 1A, at 2807 Kings Highway and East 28th Street. The mark was dying because Tommy had been told by one of his crew that he was an informer. Patera hated rats with an obsessive fervor. They had some difficulty parking. Kings Highway was a shopping mecca for all Brooklynites, and finding a parking spot was a pain in the ass. When they finally parked, Patera stuck the 9 millimeter auto in the small of his back, and they made their way to 6 home. When the door opened, they found Shlomo Mendelssohn, also known as Sammy, and Billy Bright there. Talal Siksik was handcuffed. His mouth was taped shut. It was obvious he was scared beyond words, petrified to the core of his being, and his eyes nearly popped out of his head when he saw Tommy. It was obvious, too, that he had been severely beaten. Tommy was angry about him being not only beaten, but tortured. He yelled at Shlomo and Billy. Billy sheepishly said it was a misunderstanding. It was now that Patera showed his true colors. Drawing the gun from his waistband, he quickly walked over to the distraught Siksik, raised the gun, and shot him in the head twice, just above the ear. Frank Ganji was shocked by the quiet, lethal ferocity of Patera's attack. He had never seen anybody kill with such ease. A plum. It was like watching a professional fighter in his prime effortlessly knock out a man with a left hook. Patera was sure of himself, confident. Every step he took was filled with resolve and purpose. It was obvious that to Patera, killing a human being meant nothing. On the one hand, Ganji had to admire how lethal and deadly he was. On the other hand, he was appalled by how indifferently Patera claimed the life of Talal Siksik. Ganji hadn't seen anything yet. It would get far worse. Patera turned to Ganji and said in his high-pitched voice, Help me get him in the tub. Both Patera and Ganji were strong men, and carrying Talal to the tub was easy. For the most part, Talal had stopped bleeding. They placed him in the tub face down. Patera now produced the kind of hacksaw used for autopsies. He took it and turned to Ganji. I want you to get undressed, get in the tub with him, 
and cut him into six pieces. Ganji felt like he'd been hit by a bat. Never in his life had he done such a thing. Never in his life had he even thought of such a thing. This was, he thought, right out of a fucking horror movie. He looked to Billy Bright. Billy remained mute, emotionless, stone-like. Billy knew he had to accept what was happening, that if he wanted to work with Patera he could show no emotion one way or the other. Go ahead, Tommy prodded Frank, offering up the hacksaw. I can't. I, I don't do that. If I knew you would ask me to do that, I... 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 You what? Patera said. Ganji just stared at him and shook his head. It was obvious to Patera that hell would have to freeze over before Ganji would get naked and cut up to lol. Patera was asking him to do this, encouraging him to do it, because he wanted to test him, see what he was made of. If Patera reasoned, Ganji cut the body up as he ordered. He could be trusted. He was one of them, cut from the same blood-stained cloth. Now, rather than debate the pros and cons of Ganji's actions, Patera did what he did best. He took the bull by the horns and took care of business. He walked to the bathroom, got undressed, neatly folding his clothes as he did so. Then, without a second thought, he got in the tub with the body. He now turned on the water so it ran in a steady flow, though not too strong. He did this so the blood would be immediately washed away, washed down the drain. Ganji watched this through the door. He didn't quite believe his eyes. Without hesitation or inhibition, Patera proceeded to remove Talal's head, arms, and legs. He did this with the expertise of a professional butcher. When the body was in six pieces, Shlomo brought the trunk into the bathroom, and Tommy calmly proceeded to put what was left of Talal inside. The trunk was closed. With that, Patera turned up the force of the water, washing down the remnants of the blood. He then took a long, careful shower, got out of the bathtub, and casually began to dry himself. He now turned the water hot and let it clean the last of the blood. With Patera freshly showered and dressed, they were ready to go. With some disdain in his odd voice, Patera told Ganji and Sammy to go get the car. They left and made their way toward a liquor store on King's Highway. I need a drink, Frank said, and entered the store. He bought a bottle of whiskey. Outside, he took long, slow pulls on the bottle. He handed it to Shlomo. He also took long gulps. My God, Ganji said. Jesus H. Christ. They walked on. The warmth of the whiskey spread from Ganji's stomach outward. Ganji had not eaten, and the effect was strong. He immediately felt better. He took several more long slugs on the bottle. They returned to the apartment and double-parked in front, went back upstairs and inside. They were going to use Shlomo's car to transport the trunk, but Shlomo's registration was expired, and they decided not to use it. Tommy decided that the body would be put in his car. The men picked up the trunk and made their way downstairs. It just about fit in the trunk of Patera's car. Shlomo went and got a shovel from his car and put it in Patera's car. With that, they all got in the car, Ganji driving. Patera told Frank to make his way over to the Belt Parkway. Ganji knew the neighborhood well, drove to Ocean Parkway, took a left, got onto the Belt, and headed west. For the most part, they stayed quiet and solemn and did not talk about what had just happened. Traffic was light. Tommy put on music. He said, Get on the bridge. We're going to Staten Island. They crossed the Verrazano Bridge. Ganji quietly stared out the window and enjoyed the view of the Narrows and the grandeur of Manhattan beyond. After going through the toll, unstopped and unchecked, they made their way to the South Avenue exit, got off, and headed toward the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. It was a desolate place. There were no cars, houses, or people about. It was as quiet as a long-forgotten crypt. But Tara told Ganji to take the car and come back in forty-five minutes. He didn't want the car there, for it might draw police suspicion. Patera, Sammy, and Billy got out of the car. They retrieved the trunk from the back. Using a flashlight, Patera, Shlomo, and Billy Bright made their way into the bird sanctuary. Here, there were trees and shrubs, and walking was difficult. Ganji slowly turned the car around and drove back over the bridge to Brooklyn. 
he pulled up in front of the just us, went inside, and drank some more. While Frank drank, Tommy and the others, using a flashlight, found a spot some thirty steps from the road that looked good. Here they began digging. There was a half-moon low in the sky, and it laid an ominous silver light, as if cake-frosting, on the still bird sanctuary. Planes on the approach to Kennedy Airport were low overhead, and you could intermittently hear the roar of their powerful engines. The ground was soft. Digging was not difficult. They took turns, there in the pale light of the moon. Soon they dug a hole deep enough to accommodate the trunk. Patera kicked the trunk into the hole. It landed with a meaty thud. With that, they filled the hole, stomped the dirt down, carefully covered it with leaves and brambles, and walked back toward the road. As they reached the desolate street, Ganji was just driving up. The air was stuffy. Still, Shlomo and Billy and Tommy got in the car. Frank pulled away. You been drinking? Tommy asked Frank accusingly. Uh, yeah, Ganji said. Had a shed at the bar. Patera had heard that Ganji had a drinking problem, that he had a drug problem, yet he was willing to accept him and make him part of his crew, mainly because Ganji came from a family filled with mafiosi, men of respect, both soldiers and capos. But what happened that night put a distance between the two, an irreversible rift that would only continue to grow. Later that night, after Patera showered and dressed, he went back to the Just Us. Ganji was there, at the bar, drinking whiskey. Since he had arrived at the bar, he had done a couple of lines of coke, and he was coke lucid and didn't seem drunk at all. Cocaine can make a drunken person seem sober. It removes the drunkenness, the slurs, the walking crooked. Droopy eyes are suddenly bright and alive and all-seeing. A friend of Tommy's came in and told him that he had seen Phyllis Birdie and his girlfriend Celeste at the Esplanade. This obviously pissed him off, and he, with Ganji in tow, quickly went over there. He learned that Celeste had been at the Esplanade earlier. Tommy drove over to Phyllis's house, but nobody was home. He began looking for them in different bars and after-hours clubs scattered around Brooklyn without luck. Several times he was told he had just missed them. Somehow, in Patera's mind, all of this was because of Phyllis Birdie. If it weren't for Phyllis, his girlfriend wouldn't be out and about, using drugs, causing him grief. Patera was a true creature of the night. He disdained the day. People who worked nine to five. People who were forced to do everything in life but what they wanted to do. Because he slept most of the day, Patera took on a gray-white pallor that was reminiscent of Bela Lugosi's countenance in the original Dracula. The DEA task force assigned to following Patera, assigned to bringing Patera down, readily adapted to his hours. They, like Patera, were not nine-to-five people. They would do whatever the job called for. Often, during surveillance, they were up twenty-four or even forty-eight hours, living on coffee and fast food, eating on the go. They were flexible, malleable, ready, willing, and able to do the job at any hour. They well knew that bad guys worked at night. They well knew, more specifically, that mafiosi came out at ten or eleven p.m. and did their business throughout the wee morning hours. This was coupled with the fact that many mob guys these days were using drugs, powerful stimulants that made it easy for them to stay up all night long. Because Patera was so difficult to get evidence on, the DEA expanded the program to record him. They put bugs in his cars. The problem was that he never spoke in cars. When he did, he would put static on the radio or blast music. Everyone knew, both the good guys and the bad guys, that bugging cars had become very popular with law enforcement. The good guys had gotten Tony Ducks Corallo, head of the Lucchese family, talking endlessly while in his Jaguar being driven around Manhattan. Making things more difficult was the fact that Patera drove not only his own cars, but those of his crew as well. Patera would suddenly be at the Just Us, at this corner or that corner, the DEA having no idea how he got there. At times, it seemed like he had some kind of diabolical, supernatural powers, and the task force started calling him the Vampire. 
they still did not know that Patera donned disguises. A week late, they, Jim, Tommy, and the task force, looked for the weak link. They didn't know when and where they'd find it, but they knew sooner or later they would. Meanwhile, it was obvious that Patera believed he was being tailed. It was obvious that he knew he was under some kind of police scrutiny, yet still he was not going to stop. Still, the DEA bought drugs from Angelo Favara and Judy Hamowitz that were ultimately supplied by Patera, and in a larger sense the Bonanno crime family. Judy Hamowitz was a small fry, but still they knew sooner or later they'd be able to turn her. But that time had not yet come. They wanted a stronger case with witnesses who would be far more harmful than Judy Hamowitz. Hunt and Geisel and Group 33 became more and more motivated, more and more driven, more and more sure that something big was just over the horizon. Chapter 24 Happenstance Frank Ganji, tall, thin, and broad-shouldered, was having nightmares. As he slept, the horror of what he'd seen Patera do plagued him. While he was awake, during the day and the early evening, before he went to sleep at night, he still thought about what he'd seen, the methodical, cold dismemberment of a human being. There was a diabolical, macabre finality, not only to what Patera had done, but the way he had done it. Ganji had heard, over and over again, that Patera had killed a lot of people. He started asking questions, and he came to believe that Patera had murdered dozens of people. When he thought back and saw in his mind what Patera had done, he readily thought that Patera could have indeed killed a hundred people. Not only did he shoot Talal Sik Sik in the head in front of three people, but he had a burial ground already. He had a private cemetery. It was scary, unsettling. Who the fuck could do such a thing, he wondered. What was he made of? He didn't seem human. He wondered if he got some kind of sexual excitement, some kind of diabolical, sadistic charge. Kick. These were disconcerting questions he could not pose to anyone. He was supposed to be part of the ultimate machismo society, the mafia. His father, cousins, uncles were dedicated mafiosi. The answer, for Frank Ganji, became more drinking and more drugs. He also chain-smoked and coughed incessantly. At the rate he was going, the way in which he treated himself, it didn't seem as if he had too much time left on the planet. Be that as it may, Ganji continued to work for and associate with Tommy Patera. However, the fact that Ganji would not cut up the body, would not do what he was told, did not sit well with Patera. He wanted submissive loyalty, given blindly and without question. What he asked of Ganji was unusual, he knew. However, with time, he hoped, Ganji would come around and do what he was told when he was told. Marek Kucharski was a piece of work. He had been a professional boxer, was tough and irrationally fearless. He came from the mean streets of Poland, a place where might was always right. Because he was a boxer, because he was tough, he could knock out anyone who faced him, anyone who challenged him. Still, as tough as he was, as stand-up as he was, he was struggling to make ends meet. He was, essentially, another nobody wanting to be a somebody. Kucharski had managed to steal sixty valuable oriental rugs. The problem was, he had no contacts for selling the rugs and turning them into cash. Marek knew Musa Alian well. Musa was an Israeli drug dealer, part of an Israeli cabal of dealers. He was a former member of, a lieutenant in, the Israeli army. He was fearless, highly motivated, arrogant to a fault, lived in a large, spacious loft on West 38th Street in Manhattan. He and Patera had a reasonably good working relationship. Patera sold heroin to him. He in turn provided Patera with large quantities of high-grade cocaine. Mosa and Ganji sometimes hung out together. They got high together. Marek did not know that Musa was having sex with his girlfriend. Musa had lots of coke, and Marek's girlfriend was a coke whore. It seemed that in the eighties every other woman you met was a coke whore. If you had coke, regardless of how you looked, you got pussy. Musa agreed to see what he could do with the rugs. 
Mosso was not really planning on paying for the rugs. He knew they were valuable. He knew that sooner or later they could very well be cash money in his pocket. Meanwhile, he'd stall Mark and hopefully never pay him. In that Frank Ganji had become more and more friendly with Musa as he sold more and more drugs for Patera, Musa ended up giving Ganji a dozen of the rugs. If you can sell them, sell them. If you want to keep them, keep them, he said. Not knowing anything about Persian carpets, Frank took them back to Brooklyn. He put them on the floors of his house. He liked the way they looked. He had no idea they were worth so much money. Subsequently, Marek kept showing up at Musa's house looking for money, asking for money. Musa stalled him, wouldn't answer the door. He figured sooner or later the Polish boxer would go away. Musa had grown fond of the rugs. He wanted to keep them. He had already sent some back to Israel so his mother and father could enjoy them. This all came to a boil with a brutal murder. It was unplanned and happenstance. Patera, Musa, and Ganji were at Musa's apartment on the evening of October 6, 1987, drinking and talking. It was a warm night, though fall was in the air. Both Musa and Ganji were doing lines of coke. Patera did not do coke like that. When he did coke, he did it in the privacy of his own moment, and he did very little. He was fond of saying, I control it. It doesn't control me. Suddenly, Mark showed up. By now, he had become aggressive and demanding. He wanted the rugs back, or he wanted his money. He was yelling, pointing, and being disrespectful. Inevitably, Patera and he started arguing. Ganji got up and tried to throw him out. That was a mistake. Ganji was suddenly fighting with a professional boxer. Though he had an unusual, wiry strength about him, he could not hold his own against a professional fighter. It was obvious that Ganji not only was losing the fight, but was going to get his ass kicked. This was something Patera would never allow. Had he had a gun on him, he would have shot Kacharsky in the head. What he did have on him was a knife, a razor-sharp folding knife. He opened the knife and stabbed Marek in the side with tremendous force. The knife bit into the boxer like a rabid dog. Marek managed to get the knife out and close the blade on Tommy Patera's finger. The cut was so deep his finger was almost severed. With that, the three of them got the boxer down onto the floor. Ganji got hold of the knife. Patera demanded, yelled, that he cut the boxer's throat. Without hesitation, Frank Ganji drew the blade across Marek's throat. Blood squirted all over the place. He not only cut his throat, but he cut one of the major arteries. As Marek lay in the throes of death, Musa, Ganji, and Patera stood over him. Patera kicked the prostrate boxer several times. He was soon dead. Immediately, Patera started talking about dismembering the body. Again, Frank Ganji was confronted with this scenario, being told to cut up a body. This time, he would not punk out. This time, he thought, he would show Patera exactly what he was made of, that he was tough, that he had what it took. The bleeding from Patera's cut had become so bad that he left to go get it stitched. Musa and Ganji carried the boxer to the hot tub. They undressed him. Musa produced a hacksaw. Leaning over, in an odd position, Ganji proceeded to cut off one of Marek's legs. He had no knowledge of the joints, major muscles, and tendons, and it was difficult. Not only that, but he just wasn't up to the task. He thought it barbaric and cannibalistic. It was disgusting, he would later tell a confidant. Musa finished the job. It was obvious that Musa had cut up bodies before. He did it quickly and efficiently, with a savage vengeance that left Ganji somewhat speechless. Ganji wondered if he was a pussy. Ganji wondered if he was weak. They finished, took what was left of the boxer, wrapped him in the rugs about which he had come, and placed his remains in large suitcases. Not only did he not get the money for his rugs, but they ended up becoming his death shroud. Again, Frank Ganji found solace in coke and whiskey. Whiskey and coke. They were the answer to all problems. Patera returned with a large white bandage on his hand. He also had Joey Balzano in tow. Joey was another Brooklyn guy rough around the edges, loyal to Patera, a wannabe mafioso. He had not been made. Without preamble, they took the suitcases containing the remains of Marek and placed him in the trunk of the car that Marek had arrived in, his girlfriend's car. The four men returned to Brooklyn and went to Joey's house, where he grabbed shovels. They then proceeded to go back to the Belt Parkway and over the Barazano Bridge. Ganji could not help but marvel at the efficient, ghastly ingenuity of Patera's little burying ritual. 
You had a body to get rid of? No problem. They quickly arrived at the bird sanctuary. Tommy told Musa and Ganji to bury the suitcases. They followed him to the spot where he wanted Marek placed. Leaving them with two flashlights, he returned to Marek's girlfriend's car and left. He wanted Ganji to be part and parcel of all that was done. He felt that if Ganji buried the body, he would always be as culpable and responsible as he, Patera, was. The bird sanctuary at night was shockingly quiet. There were no sounds. They began to dig the hole. Musa, then Ganji, would dig. They made some ghoulish jokes. When they had gone down about three feet, they kicked and pushed the remains of Marek, the Polish boxer, into the hole. They closed the grave with excess dirt. A pair of banded-eyed raccoons skulked about in the darkness. Ganji and Musa made a half-assed effort to cover the spot. They both knew, however, no one would find his body, no one would find this place. Though it was smack dab in the middle of New York, this sanctuary on Staten Island was a dark, secretive place with no human beings anywhere in sight. How many bodies you think he has buried here? Ganji asked Musa. A lot, he responded, raising his eyebrows. Within several minutes, Patera pulled up, as if on cue. Chapter 25 Party Girl One would think, considering how quickly Patera killed, that he was invincible, that all his troubles could be solved with murder. Murder was like a coat of armor that Patera constantly wore. Surely nothing could hurt him. If Patera had a weakness, though, it was Celeste Lepari. No matter how many times he confronted her, she continued to do drugs. No matter how many fights they had, she did drugs. Still, he did not believe in hitting women. She caused him pain. She caused him turmoil. He felt, sooner or later, that her drug use would cause her to get involved with other men, other women, scenarios that would embarrass him. After all, he had an image, a profile to maintain. He was a man of respect. What kind of man of respect had a girlfriend who was abusing drugs in after-hours clubs and being put upon and hit on by every coked-up, horny Tom, Dick, and Harry, every Guido in Brooklyn? He knew for a fact that Phyllis Bertie was a loose woman, a whore. He knew she was having sexual relations with half the New York Mafia. He knew, too, that one of her lovers was Eddie Lino. Eddie and Tommy were friends. They genuinely liked each other. They did business together, and here was Phyllis Birdie, the biggest putana in all of Brooklyn, hanging out with his beloved Celeste. By way of Frank Ganji, Tommy sent word to Phyllis over and over, Stay away from Celeste. Stop hanging out with Celeste. Stop getting high with Celeste. It did no good. He kept hearing that the two were seen here and there and everywhere. Murder, Patera's remedy for all problems, became a possible solution. Patera had a meeting with Ganji in the Just Us bar. Look, Patera said, you have to try to understand this situation. I do not, do not want Phyllis hanging out with Celeste. It's bad. I'm hearing things. Everyone knows. He shook his head from side to side, dismayed, disgusted. Frank wanted to tell him he should be talking to Celeste, not him. It was Celeste who was doing the drugs. It was Celeste, he knew, who often asked him if he had some coke on him. He'd run into her at different bars and after-hours clubs, and the first thing out of Celeste's mouth was, You got any blow? Ganji knew that Phyllis Birdie was promiscuous, but she was also a coke whore. She not only did coke, she did heroin, too. What Ganji would have liked to say to Patera, and what he did say, were two radically different things. He had come to believe that Patera was an out-of-control psychopath. The last thing he wanted to do was insult him, to get him angry. I'll find her, Frank said. I'll talk to her again. With that, Ganji called Phyllis and met her at a bar near her house. They sat on stools at the bar and ordered drinks. Phyllis, how do I say this? I've said this so many times to you already. You have to stop hanging out with Celeste. Tommy knows. He's got people all over Brooklyn telling him things. He's got spies everywhere. Phyllis raised her eyes. She had heard this before. Look, she said, I don't force Celeste to do anything. She calls me. She wants to come by. She wants to go out. She's my girlfriend. What am I supposed to do? Say, I can't hang out with you because your boyfriend doesn't like me? She knows a lot of guys. They give her drugs. Ganji shook his head back and forth. 
He saw no good coming from this. He tried another tactic. Look, Patera is a dangerous dude. You get this guy mad at you, it'll be very bad. There's no telling what he'll do. I'm talking to you as a friend now. I care about you. I don't want to see you get hurt. Get hurt for what? I haven't done anything. Celeste is a strong-willed woman. Nobody can make this girl do anything. She laughed. If he can't make her stop getting high, how am I supposed to stop her from getting high? The problem is with her. It's not with me. Ganji knew she was right, but that didn't necessarily matter. If Patera got it in his head that she was corrupting the woman he loved, it would be catastrophic for her. This he knew. This everyone in Brooklyn knew. Brooklyn, as large a borough as it was, was really a cluster of small communities and neighborhoods in which everyone knew one another. People from different hoods, many of whom were La Cosa Nostra associated, were mobile and traveled to clubs all across the borough. Not only legitimate clubs, but after-hours ones as well. All the after-hours clubs were mob-run. The cops knew about them. They were paid off to look the other way. In all the after-hours clubs, the use of cocaine and other drugs was the norm, not the exception. After all, who would be up at four or five in the morning, dancing and partying up a storm other than those on various stimulants? There were after-hours clubs in Coney Island, Bensonhurst, South Brooklyn, Flatbush, Gravesend, and they were all frequented by LCN, La Cosa Nostra. After several drinks that night, Ganji and Phyllis did a few lines of cocaine, went back to his apartment, and had sex. In some strange way, in the back of his mind, Ganji felt guilty for being intimate with her. He felt in his bones, somewhere deep inside, that something horrible could happen, something he, if he knew better, could stop. He saw the dark skies. He remembered Patera's burial grounds, the macabre solitude, the crypt-like silence, the eerie stillness of the sanctuary in the middle of the night. He heard the sound of the shovels cutting the earth. He heard the meaty thump of the bodies being thrown into the holes. No matter how hard he tried to forget about it, he couldn't. Unlike Patera, Frank Ganji was not made of stone. Chapter 26 Speedballs Whatever demons were plaguing Celeste Lepari inside could not be frightened off by even Tommy Patera. Celeste knew what Patera was capable of. She heard the rumors. She saw blood on his clothes. She heard the things that came out of his mouth that told her, in no uncertain terms, that he would kill with ease and indifference. Celeste also saw the genuine fear that lived in people's faces when Patera walked in a room, a restaurant or a bar. Even made men, she knew, averted their gazes when Patera entered a room, a restaurant, a wedding, a funeral parlor. She knew, too, that he had gone to Japan to learn how to fight, to learn how to kill, and that he read voraciously about violence, war, killing, dismemberment, and anarchy. Knowing all this, Celeste continued to use drugs. Celeste continued to party indiscreetly. True, Phyllis Bertie could not make Celeste use drugs, but Phyllis was surely a negative influence. The two of them, in a sense, were like two peas in a pod. They were attractive, sexual, and addicted to drugs. On September 10, 1987, Phyllis and Celeste, all dressed up, makeup on their faces, their nails painted bright red, five-inch heels on their shoes, went out to have a good time. They went from club to club, people's homes, back to club hopping. They ended up at an after-hours joint called The Wrong Number on Avenue T, not knowing the Grim Reaper had joined them. They repelled the entreaties of various men. They snorted coke in the bathroom. Fearful that Tommy might show up, the two women left and went back to Phyllis's house at 2022 West 5th Street. They were not alone. Several men and two more women came with them. They would have a party. What would fuel the party would be high-grade cocaine and heroin. Heroin had become popular again. Wired cokeheads all over the country were using it to come down, to calm themselves. It was also popular to mix heroin and cocaine together and shoot them up at the same time. This was known as a speedball. John Belushi and a long list of others died by shooting speedballs. Both Phyllis and Celeste mainlined heroin. 
Of the three ways to use heroin, snort it, skin pop it, and mainline it, mainlining was the most dangerous. The drug was injected directly into a main artery and quickly, in the bat of an eye, moved throughout the body. Phyllis's apartment was small and unkempt, a mess. Because she was off and up all night and all day, she had its dirty windows covered with shades and dust-laden curtains. The curtains drawn and the shades down, one could barely discern night from day. In that, when on drugs, one's perception of time is completely turned upside down, Phyllis and her friends had no idea what time it was and didn't give a flying fuck. Fueled by the cocaine, they rapidly discussed nonsense. There was a couple there, and they began to have sex. Celeste wanted to come down and would do it with heroin. At any given time, it is difficult to discern the purity of heroin on the street. It could be as high as 85% or as low as 5%. Heroin that is 85% pure is lethal. One could readily liken it to cyanide. Celeste had no idea what the exact purity of the heroin she was using that morning was. All she knew was that she wanted to come down, and she mainlined the drug. She, like the others there, lay back, her eyes hung at half-mast. Her facial muscles became lax, her mouth slowly opened, spittle ran from her lower lip. She soon drifted away on a silky, opium-laden cloud. It was warm and soothing, and took her away from all her problems. Whatever pain, whatever turmoil Celeste had suffered was soon forgotten, left behind. As she drifted further and further into the fatal embrace of opium, her heart slowed, her breathing became shallow. Oblivious to those around her, to Brooklyn, to the world, Celeste soon stopped breathing. The weak beat of her heart became fainter and fainter, and soon it stopped. Quickly, surprisingly so, her face took on a waxy, pale hue. Those there that morning, all high on heroin, had no idea what had just happened, knew nothing of their friend's death. By the time it was discovered that Celeste had OD'd, that Celeste had died, that the grim reaper had stolen her away, it was hours later. With friends throughout Gravesend and Bensonhurst and Coney Island, both within organized crime and within the police department, it didn't take long for Tommy Patera to hear that Celeste had died, that Celeste had died at Phyllis Birdie's house. He'd been home sleeping when there was a knock on the door. Frank Ganji and another Patera associate, Joey Tacove, known as Joey Pizza, were standing there all gloom and doom, obviously something deeply troubling them both. Earlier, when Phyllis found Celeste, she called up Judy Hamowitz in a panic, hysterical, wanting to know what to do. Joey had been at Judy Hamowitz's house and advised her to call the cops. Joey then phoned around looking for Ganji and found him at Musa's apartment. When Ganji heard the news, he sped back to Brooklyn and picked up Joey Pizza at the Just Us. They both knew Patero would take this very badly. They both knew that Celeste was probably the only person in the world Tommy loved. This would not be good. They didn't want to be the ones to tell Patera about Celeste's death, but they knew if they didn't give him the information and he found out, he'd be fit to be tied. Now they were standing at Patera's door, and he was looking at them with questions, his brow furrowed. Frank Ganji told him what they'd heard, that Celeste had died at Phyllis Birdie's house. Tommy reacted to these words like he'd been hit by a bolt of electricity. He cursed Phyllis, paced the room, the thin lips of his mouth twisting into an angry snarl. He quickly got dressed, and they made their way over to Phyllis's apartment on Avenue T. When they arrived, there were police cars and an ambulance out front. Stoic and angry, seething, Tommy Patera got out of the car and quickly walked inside. When they arrived at the apartment, the door was ajar. A rookie cop Patera knew was there. Celeste's body hadn't been removed yet, and when Tommy saw it, he broke down, began crying into his cupped hands, distraught. It was an odd, unsettling sight to see a man like him, so cold, so indifferent, break down and cry like a baby. Phyllis came out of the bedroom. She looked worn and haggard, worried and frightened. "'I told you to stay the fuck away from her,' Tommy said moving toward her quickly, looking as if he would kill her, take her neck in his hands and throttle her to death, take her head in his hands and break it off her shoulders. 
bend her over his knee and break her back. Surely, if the cop hadn't been there, he would have killed her on the spot. The pain and hurt he felt was replaced by a fiery anger that bordered on insanity. Patera slapped her hard across the face. The rookie cop got between Phyllis and Tommy. Please, Tommy, you can't do that. You gotta leave. Tommy, please, the cop said. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, he told Phyllis as he made his way toward the door and was suddenly gone. His anger, his hatred, his words seemed to hang in the air behind him. Already Celeste's body had begun to rot, and the smell of her corpse filled the air. Downstairs, Ganji, Patera, and Joey Pizza walked around the block. Over and over again, Tommy said he wanted her dead. He wanted Frank to kill her. He knew Frank had a relationship with her, and he felt Frank could get close to her and do the job. It was a wonder that he didn't want to kill her himself, torture her, exact his own revenge in his own way. Be that as it may, he told Frank he wanted her dead, and he wanted him to carry out the contract. This was a dilemma for Frank Ganji. He wasn't the killer that Patera was. He could never kill a woman. He certainly didn't want to kill Phyllis Birdie. She was his friend, and she was his lover. Just the day before, she had been over at his house along with Celeste and another woman named Michelle. They had cleaned his apartment, and he had paid them with cocaine. Frank often had more cocaine than he had cash money. Now he was confronted with this life-altering, life-changing dilemma. Rather than debate this killing with Patera now, knowing Patera was upset beyond words, Frank said nothing. He listened to Tommy's pain. He listened to Tommy rant and rage about Phyllis Birdie. Chapter 27 Shoulda, Coulda, Woulda For several days Phyllis lay low, knowing there was danger in the air. Had she had more sense, if she wasn't so attached to that neighborhood, she might have left town, gone to Florida, perhaps out to the West Coast, and let things cool down. Yes, Phyllis Birdie was street savvy, but because her whole life revolved around the mean streets of Brooklyn, she did not have the wherewithal, the worldliness, to go to another place and make a life for herself. She stayed in Gravesend, looking over her shoulder as she went. She still got high, but she was more on guard. More on guard, but still there, still in the jungle, a jungle prowled by Patera. Over the coming days and weeks, Patera badgered Ganji about Phyllis. When are you going to take her for that ride? Ganji did what he could to stall him. He hoped that with time Patera's anger would abate, but just the opposite happened. It seemed that every hour that went by, Patera became angrier and angrier. He was like some wrathful god who would not have peace, who would not rest until he had revenge. Still, Patero was Frank's boss, and as much as it pained him to think about it, he knew he'd eventually have to do what Patera said. In the meantime, he stayed away from Phyllis. Ganji figured if he didn't see her, Patera couldn't get mad at him for not setting her up, killing her. He purposely avoided clubs she went to, bars she hung out in. In the back of his mind somewhere, he hoped Patera would get caught up in something else, but that didn't occur. And every time Patera saw Ganji, the first thing he asked was, What about Bertie? I haven't seen her, he said. I call her, she doesn't call me back. With that, Patera stared at Ganji in the faint light of the Just Us bar. You lying to me? Patera asked Ganji. No, why would I lie to you? I know what Bertie is, she's a whore. Find her, toast her. Patera whispered in that strange voice. Then, when Ganji next saw Patera at the Just Us, he gave him an ice pick. Ganji said he couldn't kill Phyllis that way. This didn't please Patera, though he seemed to accept it. He took the ice pick back and, in turn, gave Ganji an automatic with a silencer. Use this. You understand? I understand. By pure happenstance, Frank Ganji ran into Phyllis Birdie early that morning at an after-hours club. She told him she missed him. She kissed him and hugged him. The familiar, though foreign, smell of her aroused him. 
She was one of the hottest women he had ever known. She had taken sex to new heights for him. She had done things to him that he had never heard of before. No doubt fueled by cocaine, Phyllis Birdie knew much about the perverse, dark world of sex in its more macabre, kinky forms. Though she had an angelic face, she demanded and needed more than simple intercourse or oral sex. She liked to have sex with more than one man at a time. It was also rumored that Celeste and Phyllis had been lovers. As Frank looked at Phyllis that night, he felt a heavy heart, for he knew her days were numbered, though he wouldn't be her killer. He just couldn't do it. He warned her, told her to leave town, to go away. He said he'd be willing to give her money to get out of town for a while. She didn't seem to be interested in any of that, and before he knew it they were heading back to his place, kissing in the car as they went, groping each other, snorting coke. The thought of killing her, calling Tommy Patera, and giving her up was as distant to him as the moon. Ganji could not, he decided, kill her or give her up. He'd get her out of town. He'd make sure she left. But first, he wanted her. He had to have her. At his apartment, they had hot, lustful sex. It was raw and nasty. On tables, the couch, the floor, in chairs, near the windows. Spurred on by the octane fuel that cocaine is to the human libido, it went on for hours. Suddenly the coke was gone. So was his erection. They both wanted more. It was five in the morning, slowly getting light outside. Ganji began making phone calls, looking to cop. After several attempts, he got lucky, and Musa Alian said that he had coke and they could come over. Yes! With alacrity, they got dressed, donned sunglasses, were quickly out the door and speeding toward Manhattan on Brooklyn's Belt Parkway. There was little traffic. As they made their way through the Wall Street area, they watched the stiffs in suits heading to work. They were like two creatures from another planet. Cocaine aliens. The Bonnie and Clyde of the after-hours set, up all night on drugs and hurrying for a new supply. They arrived at the desolate west side street. The sun was still low in the sky. Long shadows skulked along the quiet cobblestone street. Like two fugitives, they got out of the car and quickly made their way up to the loft building, rang the bell, and were let in cocaine, the devil's dandruff, to people who had been up all night on the drug and suddenly run out of it, is like food to a starving man, water to someone who is dying of thirst. Quickly, Ganji copped an eight ball, 3.5 grams. It was high-grade cocaine, a glistening pink pearly white color commonly known as bubblegum. Using a bank card, Ganji crushed up one of the rocks. He took a long, satisfying toot. He passed it to Phyllis, and she, in turn, took an even longer line of the pearly pinkish powder. Ah, the nervous anxiety they both felt from the sudden coming down was quickly replaced by a euphoric warmth. They took more, and more, and still more. They stayed up that whole day snorting coke and intermittently having sex. Finally, with the help of alcohol and heroin, Sleep enveloped them and took them to another place. Back in Gravesend, Brooklyn, Tommy Patera was up and about, prowling. As was widely known, Patera only used cocaine on occasion, and very little even then. His motto was, I use the drug, the drug does not use me. He never binged for days on end on cocaine. He took a toot here and there, and that was it. Patera was very concerned with staying physically fit, and he worked out every day without fail. He did not smoke cigarettes. His biceps were well-defined, his shoulders were round, and the size of two perfectly symmetrical grapefruits. His hands, from many years of hitting heavy bags, were like two steel sledgehammers. His trapezoid muscles were overly developed. He had honed himself into a well-lubricated killing machine. Often, as Patera plied the Gravesend streets, he thought of Phyllis Birdie. His reptilian blue eyes would see girls walking the street, and he'd pull over, ready to grab Phyllis, but it wasn't her. When, he wondered, would he get his hands on her, have his revenge? He tried to find Frank Ganji that night, left the message for him, but didn't hear back. Then, coincidentally, 
he called Musa. Ganji answered the phone as Musa had gone out on a run. What's up? Where you been? asked Patera, angry, almost seeming to know the answer, Ganji thought. Paranoid that he knew he'd been with Phyllis, that he'd been seen leaving the club with Phyllis, Ganji told the truth. I'm with Phyllis. She's here. You are with Phyllis? Yeah. Where is she? Inside, sleeping. Why didn't you call me? I was going to call you, I swear. No matter what, you keep her there. You understand? Keep her there. Before heading to the city, Batera went back home and he grabbed his dismembering kit. It was carefully wrapped up in a chamois. There were scalpels, razor-sharp knives, small two-finger saws for cutting joints, bone, and sinew. He then picked up Vincent Kojak Giatino and Richie David and two oversized cheap suitcases. Patera calmly drove into the city, alongside the narrows that separates Brooklyn from Staten Island under the Verrazano Bridge. The sun reflected off the fast-moving water, making it appear like a sea of glistening silver coins. Silent, his mind playing over and over what he'd do, Patera made his way to Lower Manhattan via the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and went straight to the drug dealer's loft. He rang the bell. The buzzer sounded. He quickly made his way upstairs. He fitted a silencer on a nine-millimeter automatic. The elevator opened directly into the apartment. Patera walked in, carrying the gun. Ominously, Kojak was carrying two suitcases. Wanting to get on Patera's good side, Ganji was standing there at attention, eager to please. He seemed older, paler, his face more lined. There were puffy circles under each eye the color of eggplants. He knew what was about to happen, was saddened by its realities. He knew, too, that he had no say in the matter. He wanted to sit down with Patera, explain that it wasn't Phyllis's fault that Celeste took the drugs all on her own, that Celeste wanted the drugs, that Celeste craved the drugs. The problem, he wanted to say, was not Phyllis, but Celeste. It was a bona fide argument, but one Ganji would never make, one Patera would never hear. Where is she? Patera growled. Ganji pointed to the bedroom. There, he said. She's sleeping? Yeah, Ganji answered. Patera crossed the room, his steps quiet like the turning of a page. With a practiced hand, he chambered a bullet and opened the door. Naked, Phyllis Birdie lay there, as vulnerable as the day she was born. With no hesitation or reservation, Patera raised the gun and pumped three shots into her thin, though shapely body. Without ever knowing it, Phyllis Birdie was suddenly dead. There was no pain, there was no surprise. Patera ordered Kojak and David to pick up the lifeless Phyllis Birdie by her ankles and wrists and carry her to the bathroom. He told them to place her in the oversized jacuzzi tub. He turned on both the hot and cold faucets and let the water run just so. When it was the right temperature, the right amount coming out of the faucet, he went back outside and retrieved his dismembering kit. Without preamble, Patera slowly, methodically, completely undressed himself. When he was shockingly naked, he stepped into the tub with her, both of them naked now. He began making deep, expert cuts on her shoulder blades, at the top of her spine, where her hip joints met the pelvic bone just to the left and right of her pubic hairline. As the body bled, he used a razor-sharp, serrated hunting knife, and he expertly severed her head, knowing exactly where to cut the spine, trachea, and neck muscles. He picked up the severed head and put it on the edge of the tub. It faced the entrance. He then went to work on removing her left and right arms. Within minutes, her arms and her head were detached from her body. At this point, Frank Ganji walked to the threshold of the bathroom. Come in! Come in here! Patera demanded. Appalled, Ganji slowly walked into the bathroom. The smell of blood and death filled the air. His stomach turned at the sight of Phyllis's head at the edge of the tub, facing him. One eye was half-closed, and the other eye, wide open, looked off to the left. He had just been making love to her. She had just been giving him oral sex. Now her lifeless head was just there like some errant piece of soap. 
He remained speechless, mute, as quiet as stone. What could he say? Wanting to show Ganji the effect Glazer rounds had on the body, Patera shot Phyllis in the chest three more times and explained how the many pellets encased in each shell caused massive internal damage. Patera now grabbed Phyllis by the legs, wrapped his hands around her Achilles tendon, pushed the leg forward, and, using the hunting knife, cut the large muscles that connect the legs to the torso and soon made his way through the socket joints that hold the hips and legs together, expertly severing one, then the other. He told Ganji to bring him the plastic bags. Deftly, indifferently, he placed the legs, torso, and arms in three different bags, knowing the weight of the torso would not rip through the bag. He put her head in a separate bag. When he was finished, four plastic bags were neatly lined up in the bathroom, holding the remains of Phyllis Birdie. He had Kojak put the bags into the two cheap suitcases. Carefully and scrupulously, Patera washed the tub, then meticulously washed himself, moving slowly, as though he had just come back from a workout. When he was sure he was thoroughly clean, he dried himself, got dressed, and ordered Kojak and Richie to take the remains out to the bird sanctuary and bury Phyllis there. They left and headed out to Staten Island. Distraught, Frank Ganji went back to Gravesend, Brooklyn, in his car. Tommy Patera took Phyllis Birdie's head home. There, people in the know say he did something unspeakable with it. Satisfied, he placed the head in the freezer of his refrigerator. It would remain there until Patera decided to get rid of it by dumping it in the nearby Atlantic Ocean, where crabs and fish would eat the flesh and brains. Chapter 28 No Remorse, No Conscience, No Scruples Killing Phyllis Birdie did not bring Patera much solace. He had loved Celeste more than he had loved anyone in his entire life. They were soulmates. He had shared things with her he had never told anyone. She had gotten to know him deep inside, and she loved what she had seen and come to know. The two of them were very much alike. If ever there was a female gangster, it was Celeste Lepari. Patera wished he could kill Phyllis over and over again. Be that as it may, it didn't take long for word to slowly spread throughout Bensonhurst and Gravesend and Coney Island and Diker Heights, mafiadom, that Tommy Patera was burying people, killing them at will, chopping them up and burying them as though he had been issued a permit by Lucifer himself. At first, these things were said in guarded whispers. Now they were part of normal conversation in that world. His reputation as a killer grew to monumental proportions. The people he worked for, his bosses Anthony Spiro and Frankie Lino, the upper echelon of the Bonanno family, had also heard what was happening, but they did nothing to rein him in. It was also no secret that he had killed Phyllis Birdie. They knew exactly the kind of woman she had been. They knew that she had been warned to stay away from Celeste many times over. As far as all of them were concerned, she was where she belonged. Yet the murder of Phyllis, the concept of a mafioso having his own burial ground, his own boot hill, as it were, was unsettling. It was unsettling to civilians as well as to people in the life, that world. Chapter 29 fire-breathing dragon. More than ever, the DEA was working the Patera case. Little by little, they heard things through the grapevine that they had set up all throughout Brooklyn. They now had both the Just Us and the Cypress bar and grill bugged, as well as a nightclub Patera owned called Overstreets. They knew Patera personally spent little time in the Cypress, but still they hoped to garner something they could use against him. He had bought overstreets with the proceeds from his drug-dealing enterprises, showing good business acumen. Overstreets was a hot discotheque on the second floor of a building on 86th Street and 4th Avenue. Cash in hand, young people lined up there every night to party. It was popular, a moneymaker. Drugs were also sold at the club. By now the government also had listening devices in Patera's car and in his associates' cars, the government had come to know, however, that Patera was wily in the extreme. When he said something incriminating in any of the cars, he always had, as a matter of course, 
either static on the radio, or the radio was so loud his words were lost. Rather than be disappointed, the task force was more motivated, more driven. They felt he was challenging them, daring them. When they had him under surveillance, and he met with different members of the Bonanno crime family, they constantly saw him covering his mouth as he talked. Mind you, this was in the street, with cars and cabs and buses passing by, but still there was Tommy Patera, concerned about surveillance, concerned about being bugged, concerned about having his words pulled out of thin air. There was equipment that could do that, but not on the scale that Patera seemed to think possible. The more the DEA watched him, the surer they became of everything they had heard about him. Conversely, Patera sensed the presence of the cops, in that there were approximately nine people from Group 33 observing him, it didn't take long for a street-savvy mafioso like Patera to know which way the wind was blowing. He didn't, however, know specifically what branch of law enforcement was sniffing around, but he knew he was being observed, watched, and scrutinized. They could have been NYPD organized crime, the FBI, or the DEA, he knew. Whoever they were really didn't matter to him. They all wanted one thing, and that was to put him away, to garner large headlines in the papers. That's what they were after. Press, not justice, he believed. Whenever there was a mafia bust, it was always front-page news, the lead-off story on all the news channels. The government waved around mafiosi as though they were flags. It helped bolster their careers, everyone knew, and it helped bolster their budgets when it came time to divvy up money in Washington. They were, Patera believed, selfish and self-serving, dictatorial and one-sided. It was not about the rule of law, Patera believed. It was about headlines. It was about hanging the scalps of mafiosi out in the light of day for all to see and know and smell. Contrary to what Patera believed, for Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel it was all about the rule of law. It was about protecting society from career criminals. It was about getting killers off the streets. It was about keeping chaos at bay and the streets safe. Back to basics. Jim and Tommy continued to cop cocaine and heroin from Angelo Favara. Angelo sometimes bought the coke from Judy Hamowitz and sometimes bought the drugs directly from Patera. Thus, little by little, as though putting together a complicated puzzle, they were building a case against Judy Hamowitz and against Patera. The government knew that Judy would readily turn when confronted with serious jail time. However, she was not the kind of witness who could make or break the case against Patera. They needed substantially more. Patera had never been there when they'd bought drugs from Judy or Angelo, nor had he personally sold the agents drugs. They encouraged Angelo Favara to arrange a large buy with Patera, but Patera had come to view Angelo as trouble. He kept Angelo at bay, at arm's length. He didn't trust him. When Patera looked at him, he saw a weasel, or, worse still, a rat. Nevertheless, the DEA agents encouraged Angelo to talk to Tommy about arranging a big buy, if not from Tommy, from any of the people who worked for Tommy. If Angelo managed, as he did, ultimately, to cop drugs from people who worked for Patera, conspiracy laws would kick in, and they'd have Patera by the proverbial balls. Any angle they, the DEA, could exploit, they would. If Jim Hunt had learned anything over the years, if Jim Hunt had garnered any insights from being the son of the revered Jim Hurt, it was to work as many venues, leads, and opportunities as possible, not to discount anything. The more hot pokers you had in the fire, the better. One of the people who worked for Patera was Andrew Michiata. Andrew was an intricate part of the drug-dealing constellation that Patera had created. Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel managed to, initially, buy heroin from Andrew via Angelo. Eventually, Andrew, a short, stocky, balding man, agreed to meet with the two agents and sell them heroin directly. They were not interested in Andrew as such. They wanted his boss. They wanted Patera. For Jim Hunt, bringing down Patera was not about press or promotion or a feather in his cap. 
He genuinely hated bad guys, especially drug-dealing mafiosi. He felt that Patera was contributing to the downfall of the community in which he lived. He felt that all the Pateras of the world were about chaos and disorder and the breaking of the rules and regulations that governed a well-run civilized society. The fact that Patera was definitely connected to the Bonanno crime family amplified their efforts one hundredfold. This was not some renegade tough guy willing to take chances and sell drugs. This was a member of an organized, mechanized, international underground society that would rape and pillage, steal and rob, suck the life blood from everything it got its hands on. This was a fire-breathing dragon, and Jim Hunt was intent upon lopping its head off. Chapter 30 The Loss of a Tentacle Tommy Patera was open to doing business with any ethnic group that could help him prosper. He knew that to have only one source of product was not good. He readily dealt with Russian mafiosi and Israeli gangs. The Israelis in particular were tough, extremely well-trained men, all of them had been in the Israeli military, and they were remorseless killers. Pound for pound, they were by far the toughest of all the gangs in New York City. They took what the Israeli armed forces had taught them about killing and used it on the street. They were like a paramilitary group. They knew how to use explosives, all types of firearms, poisons, etc. They had an overt arrogance about them as though they felt they were better than anyone else, as though they were above the laws of the United States, as though they had an absolute right to break the law, to sell drugs, to steal and kill whenever they wished. Patera and Frank Ganji had done a lot of business with the Israelis, in particular with Musa Alian, who had long been a member of an Israeli gang in good standing. But all that changed on New Year's Eve, 1987. What occurred exactly to bring their wrath down upon Musa's head has never been established. Suffice it to say, on this particular blistery cold night, when Musa arrived home after partying at the nearby Nirvana Club, he was met not only by the cold winds whipping off the Hudson River, but by a fuselage of bullets fired by guns in the hands of his former gang members, led by one Johnny Atias. He went down and died on the street in front of his apartment building. It was as though this was some kind of payback, for what happened to Phyllis Birdie in his home, a supernatural retribution. Revenge had occurred. Some five hours after Musa's body was picked up and taken to the morgue by the New York City Medical Examiner's Office at 30th Street and 1st Avenue, his body was on an autopsy table. He, like Phyllis, was soon cut up into pieces. Later, when Frank Ganji found out about Musa's murder, he was certain that Patera had something to do with it. When Ganji asked Patera about this, he vehemently denied it. Chapter 31 The Body in the Alley Joey Balzano was a very good-looking Italian-American with black hair and blue eyes. People in Bensonhurst often compared him to John Travolta. He had big white teeth and an ingratiating sexy smile that warmed pretty much any woman with whom he came into contact. He was a ladies' man not so much because he put tremendous effort into courting women, into betting them, but because he was so naturally attractive that women courted him. He was also a member of the constellation of characters that rotated around Patera. Unlike most of the characters in Patera's circle, Joey was not doer or introverted. He was extremely outgoing. His regular girlfriend was Renee Lombardozzi. She was the stepdaughter of Carmine Lombardozzi. Carmine was an old-school mafioso. He was one of the attendees of the famous Appalachian Conference in 1957. Many in the know likened Carmine to Meyer Lansky. That is to say, he was brilliant with numbers. He single-handedly ran all the Gambino's Shylocking operations and their multifaceted, insidious infiltration of Wall Street. Carmine could very well have been a professor of economics at a prestigious college. Rene was brought up in the world of La Cosa Nostra. She knew the walk and the talk. She was an intricate part of its culture. As the stepdaughter of Carmine Lombardosi, she attended all the mafia weddings, mafia birthday parties, mafia deaths and celebrations. Rene was streetwise. 
Joey Balzano and Renee Lombardosi lived in a nice one-bedroom apartment at Cropsey Avenue and Bay 50th Street. The apartment had a terrace and was furnished well. There was an expensive Japanese silk partition that divided the living room. There was also a nice view of the Gravesend Bay from their terrace. Beyond the Gravesend Bay could be seen the horizon of Coney Island, the parachute and the wonder wheel seeming to grow out of the ground. Although Joey Balzano was gifted by nature with good looks, he was also cursed by nature, for he was a bona fide drug addict. Whatever successes his looks and charms would have gotten him went up in a puff of smoke as readily as crack from a freebase pipe. Joey was addicted to the pipe. When freebasing, he, like all freebase heads, would go through an astronomical amount of cocaine in a 24-hour period. When Joey first started working for Patera, he moved large quantities of drugs without problem or mishap. He was a moneymaker. All that inevitably changed when instead of giving Patera money due on drugs taken, he gave excuses. He didn't give the right amounts. He was short. Patera had no patience for people who did not keep their word. Slackers. He warned Joey. You gotta give me what's due when it's due, not when it's convenient for you. Of course, sure, I understand. No problem, Joey said. I just... I fronted a bunch of people and they're stalling me. Stalling you, Patera repeated. Stop them from stalling and get the money. His blue-gray eyes menacing and reptilian. Frank Ganji had met Joey Balzano through Patera. He immediately took a liking to him. Joey, Ganji would later say, was a very easy guy to like. Apparently, Ganji liked Joey so much that he fronted him more drugs than he should have. Without Patera knowing it, Ganji had fronted him a quarter pound of cocaine, cocaine that was quickly cooked up in Joey and Renee's house and smoked. Easy come, easy go. Not surprisingly to Ganji, Patera began bad-mouthing Joey. He said he didn't trust him. He said he was an out-of-control cokehead. Don't front him any more. Until he gets caught up, no more, Patera said. Okay, Ganji said, seeing the wisdom in Patera's words. Three days later, Patera called Ganji and told him to meet him at the bar. That's what Patera's phone conversations were all about. Meet me here, meet me there. When Ganji arrived at the bar, Patera was there. This fucking Joey. I hear he's telling people about burying bodies. I hear he's talking about people being cut up and buried. Has he gotten straight with you? No, Ganji replied. Like I've been saying, I don't trust this guy. He's got to go, Patera said, looking for Ganji's reaction. Patera, to a degree, was a good judge of human nature. He well knew that Ganji and Joey were friends. This, in Patera's mind, was another way to test Ganji, test his loyalty his moxie. Whatever you think is right, Ganji said. Since Ganji had seen Patera kill Phyllis, cut her up, cut her head off, get naked and into the tub with her, he had viewed Patera in a far different way. He came to think of him as an insidious creature from another planet, a monster from another dimension. He knew well that if Patera was talking about killing Joey Balzano, Joey's days were numbered. Not only had Ganji not forgotten the murder of Phyllis Birdie, but he had not been the same person since the killing. He was drinking excessively. He was using far more cocaine than he should. He was smoking four to five packs of cigarettes a day. Now his voice was rough and scratchy. When he laughed, he'd inevitably break into a coughing fit, his eyes tearing, his face bunching up. Unlike Patera, Ganji was not about to kill someone over money. That evening, Ganji went to visit Joey at his home on Bay 50th. They talked in whispers about the money Joey owed Ganji and, more importantly, Patera. Joey, Tommy is a real, real serious guy. You can't fuck with him in any way. He has no sense of humor. Can you fix it? Joey said. I just need a little time. I can get caught up. Joey, it's not a matter of getting caught up. He heard you've been saying things about people getting buried. His mind's made up. You can't fix it? Joey asked, 
hopeful, his eyes wide, pleading. Look, Joey, listen to me. I'm not that close to him. No one is that close to him. I think the person who was the closest to him was Celeste. Take my advice. As a friend, get out of town. Go make a life somewhere else. Where? Joey asked. Where am I going to go? Wherever you go, you'll live. If you stay here, you're dead, Ganji whispered. All this Ganji had said in a very low voice, not wanting Rene to know. One way or another, he didn't trust Rene. He felt that if something happened to Joey, sooner or later she'd turn on him. Joey now looked at Ganji beseechingly. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. Tell me the best way to deal with him. Ganji heard Rene move about behind the partition. Rather than say anything with her in close earshot, he wet his finger, leaned over, and wrote on the black lacquer table, L-E-A-V-E. -E. A few days later, Ganji called Joey and said that Tommy was willing to talk. Joey was pleased to hear this, but he was wary, on guard. By the same token, he was hopeful that with Ganji's help he could regain his honor. Still, when he left the house, he told Rene, If I don't come back, Frankie and Tommy killed me. When Joey got outside, he only had to wait a few minutes before Ganji pulled up in one of Patera's many cars. Ganji had given Joey every chance to leave, save himself. What was happening now was his own doing. They drove over to the Just Us to pick up Patera. Ganji knew that Patera's intentions were not good. He knew, too, that Patera had come to view Joey as a slacker and a rat, a liability. Whatever was going to happen— Ganji could do nothing to stop it one way or another. His association with Patera had put him in a position in which he had to toe the line. He had to listen to Patera, or he was dead. It was that simple. Yes, he had uncles in high places, but nobody could help him with Patera. They were dealing drugs, which was a no-no. Ganji was not made, and Patera was. What Ganji had in his head was to make enough money and to take off, Start another life in another place, maybe Florida or California, somewhere warm. When they pulled up in front of the Just Us, Patera saw them through the window and came outside. Respectfully, Joey got out of the car and offered the front seat to Patera. Now you take it. I'll get in the back, Patera said, sliding onto the leather seats. Ganji had no idea how this would happen. He did have an ice pick with him in the inside pocket of his jacket, as Patera had ordered. Being from the street, knowing they might be observed by the police, Ganji took U-turns, lefts and rights, more U-turns, and parked in a parking lot to make sure they weren't being followed. Joey, being a drug dealer, understood the moves. Often he himself had done such things. Tommy talked about a good restaurant, the top of the sixes, said that there were a lot of girls there, when they were out with Joey, he was what they called a cunt magnet. This, however, was all a ruse, a way to relax Joey, get him to drop his guard. There would be no fancy dinner at Top of the Sixes this evening. They next headed to the Green Lantern Bar on New Utrecht Avenue and 71st Street. Patera said he had to pick something up. He got out of the car, went inside the bar, and came out a few minutes later. He had met Richie David inside and gotten a gun from him. Now, back in the car, he said to Ganji, Go to the corner and take a left. Patera knew what he would do, and where he would do it. He had mapped it all out in his head. It was a dance of death, the steps of which he knew well. Without warning, he raised the handgun, put it to the back of Joey Balzano's head, and pulled the trigger twice. The gun was fitted with a silencer, and the noise was minimal. The damage done to Joey Balzano, however, was not minimal. The bullets had ripped through his hair, skin, and skull with ease, and made gray pudding out of his brain. This wasn't enough for Patera. He took out a six-inch hunting knife, razor sharp and shiny, and drew it quickly across Joey Balzano's throat. He cut not only the throat, but both the carotid arteries. Patera now told Ganji to stick him with the ice pick, wanting to make Ganji part of the murder. Obeying, Ganji took out the ice pick and rammed it into Joey's chest, though at this point it was a lifeless one, containing a heart that had stopped beating. The job done, Joey Balzano dead, Patera 
directed Ganji to drive to an abandoned alleyway close to New Utrecht Avenue. As they arrived there, the B train came barreling down the elevated tracks. It made a lot of noise, and sparks fell from the two-story high tracks. They dragged Joey from the car and placed him on the ground. Joey Belzano was fond of nice jewelry and diamonds, and they took his Rolex watch and gold chain. He had a huge diamond pinky ring on. Try as they might, they couldn't pull the ring off. Tommy used his hunting knife to cut the finger off, grabbed the ring, and put it in his pocket. Ganji, unsettled by the whole event, unsettled by leaving the body there like that, kept saying, We gotta go! We gotta go! Patera remained as cold as ice. A more appropriate nickname for Tommy Patera, rather than Tommy Karate, would have been Iceman. They got in the car and pulled away. This, the taking of a victim's jewelry, was an interesting, telling phenomenon. It is classically what conventional serial killers do, take belongings and body parts from their victims, a phenomenon known as totems. Whenever Patera had the opportunity, he took victims' jewelry. Later, a treasure trove of jewelry would be found in his safe. Normally, a mafioso would never take the belongings of a victim. This directly ties the murder to the person holding the victim's belongings. It is a good way to link the murder with the killer. It is obvious that Tommy Patera knew this, yet he still took their jewelry. Those in the know say Patera took the jewelry not for its monetary worth, but to prove his prowess, to prove that he killed when and where and how he wanted to, his omnipotence. Yet it was tangible evidence that could hold up in any court anywhere in the world. Somehow it seemed that Patera was thinking with a warped aspect of his ego rather than with the street sense that he was so well endowed with. Chapter 32. The Cleaner. At any given time, Patera was driving between six and ten different cars. Some of these cars he owned, others he borrowed from Capo Frankie Lino, who had an executive car service in Brooklyn. Lino readily made cars available to Patera, making it very difficult for the DEA to bug any of these different rotating vehicles. For Patera, cars were as interchangeable as underwear. He often used them in crimes, and so they had to be cleaned up or gotten rid of. Toward that end, Patera tapped into La Cosa Nostra networking. Again, the five New York Mafia families all cooperate with one another, are bound together through customs, mean streets and avenues, tunnels and bridges. Through various contacts Patera had in La Cosa Nostra, he was able to take the car in which they had killed Joey Balzano to a body shop on Flatlands Avenue, where Manny Maya worked. Maya was a Cuban Jew with dark hair who did a lot of work at this shop. Maya also dealt drugs on the side for the Bonanno family. The car Patera brought in that day was heavily stained with blood, looked like something out of a horror movie. Patera told Maya to clean it up. Maya tore out the entire interior of the car, hot steam cleaned it thoroughly, let it dry, and reupholstered it. When he was finished, it had a brand new interior and not a trace of blood anywhere. A seasoned bloodhound couldn't find blood in that car. The old interior was summarily burned in a fifty-gallon drum. When Tommy picked up the car, it was as though it was brand new, and he could drive it without concern. Though Manny Mayo was associated with the Bonanno family, he would readily provide his unique cleaning service to any of the other four families, Genovese, Gambino, Lucchese, and Colombo. They all brought blood-stained cars to Manny Maya. Patera readily gave his blessings to Manny and put no restrictions on him. Patera was also particularly close to feared Gambino war couple Eddie Lino. Lino was John Gotti's right-hand man, assassin extraordinaire for the Gambino family. He had also once been Phyllis Birdie's lover. Lino had heard about Patera killing Phyllis, he accepted it as one would the changing of the seasons. He knew that Phyllis had been warned over and over again. He knew that she had ignored the warnings. He himself had told her to stay away from Celeste. He knew no good would come of their association. When Phyllis was murdered, cut up, disposed of, Lino did not come around looking for any type of revenge. Tommy Patera's reputation as a competent killer, as a man who kept his mouth shut, 
had grown to such proportions that he was a kind of Billy the Kid of the Cosa Nostra. As further proof of the intricate links binding the five families together, when John Gotti wanted a certain rat murdered, he gave the contract to Eddie Lino, who, in turn, invited Tommy Patera to help fill the contract. An honor. After numerous purchases of narcotics from Judy Hamowitz and Angelo Favara, the case around Patera building inexorably, Jim Hunt and Group 33 applied for a court order to wiretap Judy Hamowitz's home phone. The wiretap of Judy's house proved to be an interesting, rather bizarre, source of information. The DEA rented an apartment in Bensonhurst, and from this apartment they began to monitor the phones of all the players in Patera's circle. They would have gladly, indeed, gleefully, tapped Patera's phones, but Patera did not have a phone in any of the places in which he lived. At 3030 Emmons Avenue, Apartment 5A, 2355 East 12th Street, Apartment 4T, or the brownstone he owned and was renovating at 342 Ovington Avenue in Bay Ridge. He believed phones were nothing but potential problems, that the police could easily tap phones, and so he refused to have one in his home. When a phone is tapped by the DEA, it is electronically monitored 24 hours a day. Late at night, as Judy Hamowitz's phone was listened to, they realized she had an obsessive, addictive penchant for dialing sex lines, 900 numbers. The agents came to believe that what Judy Hamowitz was about, who she was, was, relatively speaking, comical, not diabolical. It was Patera who was diabolical. It was Patera they wanted. Still, Judy Hamowitz spoke freely about the selling of drugs on her phone and gave the government a treasure trove of information involving drug sales, who was buying them, when and where, and the amounts involved. What further strengthened the case against Patera was that Angelo Favara had sold large amounts of heroin to Hunt and Geisel that he had obtained directly from Patera, which they had quickly handed over to the government. Chapter 33 You're Not My Boss some people feel comfortable handling guns, some don't. Blindfolded, some can take apart a gun and put it back together again. Without blindfolds, some can't begin to take apart a gun. Frank Ganji was one of those people who didn't like guns, had no affinity for them. Though he knew them as an intricate part of his trade, a necessary tool, he did not handle them well. He wasn't a good shot, though he coveted the power a gun had, how readily and rapidly it could steal away a human life. Though Ganji didn't like them, he admired them from afar. Trying to overcome this impediment, he often held a gun while lounging around his house, watching television. Someone had told him, actually Tommy told him, that the gun should be an extension of his body. You should be as comfortable with your gun, handling it, as you should be comfortable with your own dick, handling it. The problem was that while doing this impromptu exercise one day at the house of one of his girlfriends, a tough, talking out of the sight of her mouth guidette named Patty Skifo, known as Patty Girl, Frank accidentally pulled the trigger of his pistol and inadvertently shot himself in the leg. He stood up and jumped around the room, bleeding. He called a friend by the name of Andy Jakakis, then called the Just Us, and asked Patera to come over. Andy Jakakis was an old-school tough guy who wasn't really tough at all. He was gray and balding, thin-shouldered, though he walked with a histrionic, defiant swagger, as if he were six foot five and the baddest badass in the jungle. Ganji had first met Andy while doing time for the shooting he and Billy Bright were involved in, the murder of Arthur Guvenero. Because Andy was in his late fifties, and Frank in his mid-twenties, Andy kind of became a father figure to the young Ganji. He watched over Ganji. He advised him as to the different protocols mandated in jail. They became friends. Ganji grew so fond of Andy that when he had an opportunity to help him by making a witness in the case against Jakakis change his testimony, Ganji pulled some mafia strings and made it so the witness never showed up in court. Upon Andy's release, he started hanging around Ganji, stayed at his house, and became a kind of gopher confidant. Andy was under the impression that Ganji was a big-time mafioso. He knew who Ganji's relatives were, 
He knew, too, that Ganji was now hooked up with Tommy Patera, and he felt an unusual, somewhat unhealthy closeness to Ganji. He did not like Patera. He was fond of saying, God put me on this earth to protect Frank Ganji. So the day Frank shot himself, Andy showed up all concerned, all worried, his brow knit. Ganji made up a story of being shot at by people who owed him money. With that, Patera knocked on the door. Being an expert on wounds and injuries, Patera looked at the bullet hole with a cold, clinical eye. He then called a gynecologist, the brother of a friend named Gerald Marino, who came over. Mafia members were often in contact with doctors who would tend to gunshot wounds and not report them as mandated by hospitals and the law. Marino said the bullet had not struck bone. The doctor, a small, nerdy, blond-haired man, cleaned and dressed the wound, collected some money, and left. Andy, disturbed by the incident, dismayed by the fact that someone would shoot his idol, was walking back and forth, threatening, cursing to himself. He got on Patera's nerves. This was an easy thing to do. Patera didn't like people, and most everyone annoyed him. He turned to Andy and said, Calm down. Be quiet. You're getting on my nerves. Sit down. He pointed to a chair. Defiance about his eyes, defiance in his body English, and he said, Hey, I don't have to listen to you. You're not my boss. I don't take orders from you, you understand? I only listen to Frank, understand? This galled Patera to no end. He demanded respect, and for the most part, people complied and acted cowed around him. Waiters fawned over him. Other wise guys gave Patera a wide berth, and here was this Andy guy defiantly pointing his unmanicured finger at him. As hard as this might be to believe for a civilian, for a layperson, Andy had just killed himself. There was no way that he, Patera, would allow Andy Jakakis to speak to him like that in front of other people. Over the coming days, Tommy Patera talked, somewhat insistently, about killing Andy Jakakis. He told Ganji that he had to go. He told Ganji that he wouldn't rest until he was dead. I'm not only going to kill him, he said in his Minnie Mouse voice. I'm going to torture him on the dance floor of Overstreets. This literally nauseated Ganji. He was fond of Andy. He was like a surrogate father to him. He knew Andy meant nothing by what he had said to Patera. He was just a foolish old man who had said something out of line. There was no reason in the world for him to die, for him to be tortured. Immediately, Ganji tried to talk Patera out of the killing, but Patera wouldn't hear it. He wouldn't rest until Andy was dead. More than ever, Ganji began thinking of Patera as an irrational, out-of-control, unhinged psychopath. He began thinking that Patera should be locked up in a mental institution. Be that as it may, Patera was free and in charge, and he wanted blood. He was like a vampire who had an insatiable need, an overwhelming desire for blood. This drew Frank Ganji further into the numbing world of alcohol and drug abuse. His mind, his soul, couldn't deal with the hardcore realities of what Tommy Patera was all about. Images of what he had done to Phyllis Birdie often filled the pink insides of his closed eyelids. The smell of her murder, the blood, the torn flesh came to him, whether he wanted it to or not. He was haunted by what he had seen. When the images became too much, he turned to a bottle of whiskey, long, glistening lines of cocaine, the magical mystery tour of numbed oblivion that is freebasing. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble loomed large and real on the near horizon. Ganji was stuck between a rock and a hard place. The way he saw it through his stoned eyes was like this. Either he killed Patera, or he killed Andy Jakakis. Killing Patera, he knew, would be no small task. Patera seemed to see all things at once at a 360-degree angle. He was as quick as a rattlesnake. He, Ganji believed, had a supernatural sixth sense that would make him not only hard to kill, but near impossible to kill. He didn't drink, Ganji knew. Ganji never saw him high, never saw him vulnerable. As he thought about killing him, he realized that Patera always sat with his back to the wall, that when in the car he sat in the back seat, 
that he never let anybody sit behind him. It was as though he was expecting someone to try to kill him, and he had built an invincible wall around himself. Just the thought of trying to bring a gun up to Patera's head gave Ganji the willies. His hands shook, his mouth got dry, his stomach turned to knots. The only way he could escape this conundrum was more drink, whiskey, coke. Frank Ganji was no longer getting high to have fun, to socialize, to party. He was getting high to escape the realities of life as he knew it. And he's got to die, he thought. When he accepted that reality, when he bought into the steps killing Andy involved, it devastated him. He never wanted to hurt Andy. He'd kill himself before he let Andy be tortured. He ultimately resolved in his heart, in his mind and in his soul, for what he felt were the right reasons to kill Andy, to kill his surrogate father, to kill one of the few friends he ever had. It was now mid-June 1988. The weather that June was unseasonably warm and humid. Though Gravesend was close to Coney Island, little breeze came from the ocean, and the air was thick and hot and unpleasant. A former boyfriend of Judy Hamowitz's, Toby Profetto, a close friend of Ganji's, accompanied Frank this night. Ganji had told Toby about his predicament. Toby agreed to help Frank with this most difficult of tasks— Toby was a medium-sized, muscular dude with curly hair, a typical Brooklyn wannabe. His idea of success in life was to be inducted into one of the five families. Toby was also a killer. He was one of those rare people who could take a human life as readily as step on an ant. That night, Profeto and Ganji went out on a mission, a mission that had little reward, a mission that would only result in the death of an old man who couldn't really hurt a fly. Okay, Ganji said. When the right time comes, I'll turn up the music real loud, and we'll do it. Okay, came the answer, cold and detached, as though it came from the mouth of a dummy on a ventriloquist's lap. This dynamic duo picked up Andy Jakakis at a popular pizzeria called Spumoni Gardens on 86th Street. Ganji was driving. Andy sat in the passenger seat. Toby was sitting directly behind him. Ganji took a right onto West 11th Street. This was a quiet, desolate street. On the right were homes, and on the left were train tracks. A song by the Rolling Stones came on, Start Me Up. I like this song, Frank said, turning up the volume louder and louder and louder still. Moving to the beat, Andy Jakakis had no idea the Grim Reaper was in the back seat. Without hesitation, Toby put the gun against Andy's head and fired. The bullet tore through his skull, hit his forehead, bounced back, and zigzagged around his brain. Ganji pulled over to the curb. He could see a massive wound on Andy's forehead. Blood came from it, but the bullet did not burst out of his flesh. Mind you, this was the middle of the day. There were few people about. Ganji took a right, a left, and made his way over to an empty lot on Bay 50th Street. This part of Bay 50th hadn't been fully developed yet, and Ganji got it in his head to leave the body right there, in a lot, in broad daylight. In his panic, in his adrenaline rush, he didn't realize that Capo Toto Morable lived just opposite this lot. Toto was a feared captain in the Bonanno family. As they hurried the body out of the car and into high grass in the lot, one of Andy's shoes came off and fell down by the passenger seat. When they got back to the car, Ganji saw the shoe and pushed it out onto the curb. No matter how you cut it, this would not sit well with Toto. This was a personal offense. It was like taking a dump on his front door. No mafioso anywhere in the world would stand for such a thing. His wife lived here. His children lived here. Trouble was in the air. In the stifling heat of that summer, it didn't take long for the body to emit a horrific odor that was soon noticed, and the body was discovered. The police were summoned. Big crowds gathered around the lot, pointing, staring, wondering, speculating who the hell would do such a thing. When Toto Morable found out a body had been left across the street from his home, that a shoe belonging to the body had been left on the curb, he wondered what it meant. Surely it was some kind of message. But a message of what? Who, he and all members of his Borgata wondered, would do such a thing? 
Why would they do such a thing? What did the shoe mean? They all wondered. Immediately the jungle drums of the mafia started resounding, and the question was, who left a body with one shoe near Toto's house? What did it mean? When Patera got the news that Andy was dead, he was pleased. He felt that for the first time Ganji had acted like a man, that he had stepped up to the bat and done what he was supposed to do. Inadvertently, this murder brought Patera closer to Ganji. He felt a warmth toward Ganji he hadn't felt for him before. Chapter 34 Dynamic Duo It was one of those pleasant summer nights when people sit on stoops and beach chairs in front of their houses all over Brooklyn, just before night falls, during those fifteen or so minutes called dusk, an abundance of ladybugs filling the air. It was such a lovely evening that the patrons of the Just Us came outside and were sitting on car fenders in front of the bar. There was Tommy Patera, the fierce war captain, Eddie Lino, and Frank Ruby Rubino. Frank Rubino was a burly, squat, tough Italian. He drove a brand-new gray Jaguar. Up until that date, he had a good relationship with Eddie Lino. They were partners in the heroin business. Now the good days were gone. As is often the way of the Mafia, when they are about to kill someone, they are all smiling and friendly and warm, offering drinks and sumptuous dinners. Between Tommy Patera and Eddie Lino, you'd be hard-pressed to find a meaner pair in all of La Cosa Nostra, either in the United States or in Sicily. Though they were from two different families, they often worked together, were good personal friends, had respect for each other. Eddie Lino was the go-to guy for heroin for the Gambino crime family. But, interestingly, all of what Eddie Lino did was, of course, off the record, off the books. His drug dealing was so blatant, so amazingly profitable, that for the longest time he could not get made, officially inducted into the Gambino family. Paul Castellano outright refused to have him made because of his immersion in the selling of heroin. It was only after John Gotti had Castellano murdered in front of Spark's Steakhouse that Eddie Lino was finally made, and soon thereafter given his own borgata, crew. Eddie Lino and John Gotti were close. They were more like brothers than friends. Though John Gotti never had anything to do with the actual selling of drugs, never touched drugs, never saw drugs, he well knew what Lino was doing, what Lino was about, and he gave his blessings. Gotti, like everyone else in La Cosa Nostra, quietly pocketed a fortune as he silently, discreetly looked the other way, north and south and east and west, as Lino went about the business of wholesaling large amounts of heroin. Lino and John Gotti's bond was so great that when, a little way down the road, Anthony Gaspipe Castle was given the assignment of killing John Gotti for murdering Paul Castellano without the killing being sanctioned, the first person he took out was Eddie Lino. On November 6, 1990, Anthony Castle sent crooked NYPD detectives Stephen Caracapa and Louis Eppolito to do the job. Lino was so feared, such an adept killer himself, that Castle used cops to take him out. Apparently Lino had gotten wind that Frank Rubino had turned bad. Lino wanted him dead, and he asked his pal Tommy to do the job. At this point, Tommy had garnered a reputation within La Cosa Nostra as an amazingly adept, efficient killer. His reputation had grown to such a degree that people were calling him, behind his back, Wacko. This had less to do with his outward appearance than with how readily he killed and the fact that he just as readily cut people up and buried them. He had private burial grounds on Long Island and Staten Island. Tall and gangly, buzzed on coke, Frank Ganji now turned the corner and began walking toward Lino, Patera, and Rubino. Outgoing and gregarious, Ganji was about to approach them when Patera waved him away with a curt movement of his icy blue-gray eyes. Nix it! Scram! Patera silently said with his eyes. Ganji got the message. He walked into the bar, ignoring the three. Ganji did not know what was happening, but considering that Rubino was standing between Patera and Lino, a lethal pair of bookends, 
it didn't look good for Ruby. Soon Lino, Patera, and Rubino got into Rubino's gray Jaguar and drove away. Rubino was driving. Lino was sitting in the passenger seat. They were some four blocks away from the bar when Lino told Rubino to pull over, which he readily did. The moment he put the car in park, Patera pulled out an automatic with a silencer on it and shot Rubino in the back of the head, killing him. Even though this was Gravesend, Brooklyn, ground zero for the Mafia, what Patera had just done was audacious. The fledgling dragon that had once been inside Patera had grown to monstrous proportions, now had long scales, was fire-breathing, invincible. In that Patera, somewhat obsessively, collected jewelry from his victims, he ripped a gold necklace with a fish medallion off of Rubino, and he and Lino got out of the car and left Rubino there like that for all to see, know, and be horrified by. This type of killing, so brazen and so public, would inevitably come back to haunt La Cosa Nostra. It caused intense police scrutiny, media attention, and horrified an innocent public. It was one of those times when it seemed as though these two men, Lino and Patera, felt that they had a holy mandate to kill whom they wanted when they wanted, and blatantly leave bodies wherever the hell they pleased. As a mafioso recently said, it was in bad taste. Murder, successfully killing people and breaking the law on a regular basis, as all La Cosa Nostra does as a matter of course, has to do with luck. No matter how well planned, no matter how thoroughly thought out any given crime is, any given murder, without luck it can fail, and fail miserably. Considering how often the DEA was following Patera, it's a wonder they didn't see him that night, hanging out in front of the bar, drive off and kill Frank Rubino. Luck, apparently, was with Patera and Eddie Lino that night. Interestingly, a short time later, Patera's luck slowly began to turn. He now had a new girlfriend. Her name was Barbara Lambrose. She bore a distinct resemblance to Celeste. She had a fourteen-year-old son, a good-looking, athletic teenager, but he was wired and destined for trouble. He didn't do well in school. He didn't listen to his mother. He was starting to use drugs. Patera took a liking to the boy, whose name was Joey. Today, Patera was driving his Oldsmobile. The feds had recently managed to bug this car. Presumably, because he had Joey in the car that day, neither the radio was on nor was there static. Apparently, Joey's behavior was giving his mother grief, and she was complaining to Patera, asking him to talk to her son. Joey, you know, Patera began, your mother's a very nice lady. She's had it hard. There's no reason for you to give her more grief. I'm from the street. I'm telling it like it is. You gotta shape up. You gotta be... You gotta stay away from drugs. Drugs will make you lose control. You never want to lose control. You see me? I never lose control. You have a mother that loves you and cares for you. You have to show her respect. And Patera went on to lecture the boy on staying out of trouble, on not using drugs, on doing well in school. Then the boy said something that was inaudible to the agents, and Patera's response shocked and stunned the listening agents. If you kill somebody, he said, you've got to cut the lungs and open the stomach. If you do that, the body can sink. If you don't do that, it will float and it will be found. Tommy Geisel and Jim Hunt looked at each other. This would be helpful, they knew, in a court of law, but it was not definitive evidence as such. It would bolster the contentions, the allegations, and the evidence they did have, but in reality, Patera could have just been making this up. It wasn't proof in and of itself, though it certainly cast Patera in a bad light. Chapter 35 Stick Ship Sharks. Patera's crew was like a bunch of reef sharks, constantly looking for prey, constantly on the move, always hungry. Always ruthless, Patera could be readily likened to a great white shark that dominated and frightened and controlled and even ate the reef sharks. Patera, like a great white shark, was slow-moving and methodical, though deadly when he made a move. 
He had morphed from a dragon into one of the most feared, efficient killers the Mafia has ever known, a white shark, Carcarodon Carcarius, the baddest of the bad. One of the reef sharks that was a member of Patera's crew was Lloyd Modell, another Mafia wannabe. He had dark hair and dark eyes and a large hook nose. He wanted to be in the Mafia with such dire need, had fantasies about it most of his adult life, loved movies about gangsters, that he actually changed his name to Lorenzo Medica, an Italian name that he hoped would get him inducted into one of the five crime families, though that was not about to happen. It was a rare thing for non-Italians to fool their way into being made. For the most part, in order to be made, people in La Cosa Nostra had to know you. Your history, or rather, as Patera put it, know the cunt you came from. Having said that, his not being Italian would not dissuade Lorenzo Medica from being a gangster. He was so intent upon proving his worth that he would kill quickly and readily, without remorse or conflict. Lorenzo Modica knew a Colombian by the name of Luis Mena, also an associate of Patera's, a coke dealer. Luis Mena said he could get them all the coke they wanted. Mena said he knew Colombians who had heavy weight, and that he'd be happy to set them up to be ripped off. The coke that the Colombians provided swiftly and without difficulty was top-notch. Lorenzo went and spoke to Tommy about ripping them off. Tommy readily agreed. Lorenzo mentioned killing them. Patera thought that a good idea. This was right up his alley. In July of 1988, Luis Mena called Lorenzo to tell him there was a load of coke in. The two soon met. How much you got? Whatever you want, Mena replied. We'll take twenty keys, Lorenzo said. You got it, Mena said, and arrangements were made for the deal to go down later that day. Lorenzo tried to find Patera, but wasn't able to. He knew he couldn't pull this off by himself. He went and found Frankie Jupiter Martini, a reef shark in Patera's gang, to work with him and help him facilitate the rip-off. Contrary to common belief, the Colombians were, for the most part, businessmen. They could be ruthless killers whose cruelty knew no bounds, but if you dealt with them straight, if you kept your word, they were good people with whom to do business. They were reliable, honest, on time, and their product was always superior to all others. When you bought coke from Colombians, you were getting it directly from the source. They did not cut their product. On a regular basis, the coke the Colombians sold, when in weight, packaged in neat hard bricks, was 98% pure. The two Colombian coke dealers Lorenzo and Frankie Jupiter would be meeting were Carlos Acosta and Fernando Aguilera. Both of them were in their early twenties, dark-skinned and thin, innocuous, would blend into any crowd anywhere. They sported short hair. Not in a million years would anyone make them as coke dealers. This was no accident. The fact that they could readily blend in so well was exactly why they were chosen in Colombia to do what they did here in Brooklyn. Unfortunately for them, they did not quite understand just how mean the mean streets of Brooklyn could truly be. They would soon learn a lesson that would be forever indelibly seared into their brains. Carlos and Fernando showed up on time at the rendezvous place, the shopping center at Shore Parkway and Bay Parkway. In that it was a hot day, they were both wearing T-shirts and shorts. They greeted Lorenzo, shook hands. Lorenzo assured them that he had the money. The Colombians assured him they had the drugs. He suggested they make the transfer in the garage of a nearby building. They agreed. Lorenzo got in the back seat. He had a revolver in his waistband, hidden by his shirt tails. Unobserved, not knowing what lay ahead, the Colombians dutifully followed Lorenzo's instructions to the garage in a new red-brick apartment building at 1445 Shore Parkway. Coincidentally, the building was only a block away from Patera, Billy Bright, and Frank Ganji's stash house, where hundreds of pounds of pot were stored, waiting to be sold. The cocaine was in the trunk of the Colombian's car. Cocky, wanting desperately to prove himself, Frankie Jupiter walked up to the Colombian's economy Ford. He was smiling. He was getting them, in his mind, to drop their guard. He said he wanted to see the coke. The Colombians said they wanted to see the money. 
Lorenzo knew it was time to act. He had been waiting for this moment for what seemed an eternity now. He had a clear shot of the back of both the Colombians' heads. With confidence and surety, lethal, he whipped out the gun, put it just behind the driver's head, and pulled the trigger. Without hesitation, he moved right, took a bead, and fired again. Before they knew it, both the Colombians were dead, their brains destroyed. In the garage, the gunshots were like deafening cannons, loud and resonating. Lorenzo and Frankie Jupiter wanted to get the hell out of there quickly. Now Lorenzo realized for the first time that the car was a stick shift. Fuck! It's a fucking stick shift! I can't drive a fucking stick shift! Can you? Lorenzo said. Fuck no! Frankie said. They stood around the car with the two dead Colombians wondering what to do, scratching their asses. If it wasn't so sad, it would have been funny. Ultimately, they took the drugs from the car and hurried out as though they were two miscreants stealing food from a Korean grocery. They had plans to drive the car out of the garage and set it on fire, but now that wasn't possible, so there the Colombians stayed. It didn't take long for a resident of the building to discover the bodies. The police were summoned. The garage was soon filled with forensic technicians, police photographers, and hard-eyed, stone-faced Brooklyn detectives from the 62nd Precinct on Bath Avenue. When Patera heard about what had gone down, he was pissed off. He thought that what happened was stupid and sloppy, amateurish, and he did not want his name or his reputation associated with it in any way. Angry, he and Ganji went looking for Lorenzo and found him at his apartment. What the fuck did you do? Patera wanted to know. In a rush of words, Lorenzo told Patera that they had no idea the Colombians drove a stick shift, that neither he nor Frankie knew how to drive a stick. It was just one of those things. It all happened so quickly, he said. Did you get the drugs? Patera asked. Yeah, yeah, I did, Lorenzo said, all proud, sure that this would get him to become an official member of the Mafia, his dream come true. What he had done was show that he was a buffoon and would never get made, Patera knew. Rather than the twenty kilos of cocaine that had been ordered, there were twelve kilos. Still, it was a big score. Patera, to punish them, took nearly half of what they had taken, five kilos of high-grade pure cocaine. Sold in grams, eight balls, and ounces, these five kilos would be worth a fortune. Satiated, Patera, the white shark of this particular part of the ocean, this reef, moved off and did what he had to do. Ripping off drug dealers was to career criminals like taking candy from a baby. They, the dealers, had nowhere to turn to for justice. They could not go to the cops. They could not seek help with the conventional modes of protection set up to enforce the rule of law. They therefore set up their own means of protecting themselves, their interests, their drugs, and their cash. Still, if a dealer was murdered, the trail usually ended right there. As an example, after the murder of the two Colombians, nobody came looking for Carlos Acosta or Fernando Aguilera. Their identities died when the two Colombians were murdered. Shortly after the rip-off of the two Colombians in the garage, Luis Mena went to Patera with another setup. He said he knew of a cash house in Howard Beach in which vast sums of money were counted, packed, and shipped off to Colombia. Two women worked just about all day, every day, counting money, using professional counting equipment you would find in a bank, and making sure the money was sent when it should be. Mena said, At any given time, there's a couple of million dollars cash there. Upon hearing this, Patera's eyes lit up. He decided to put together a lean, mean crew to facilitate this ripoff. It would include himself, Luis Mena, Joe Dish Senatore, and Richie Leone, a stocky, brash man, dark-haired, about 5'10", a dedicated Patera devotee who would do anything to turn a buck. Joe Dish was elderly, balding, gray-haired, and looked more like a cop than most cops. He had one talent— and that was posing as a policeman to give access to bad guys wanting to rob houses. Joe Dish not only looked a lot like a cop, he had the facial expressions, the voice, the physical demeanor down pat. He was proud of saying, There's no house I can't get somebody into. 
Initially, the four men discussed the score at the Just Us bar, got in Patera's car, and drove over to Howard Beach to actually scope out the house. It was an unremarkable two-family residence on a quiet block in a quiet neighborhood. From the outside, you'd never be able to tell what was going on inside. Images of the house, the block, and neighborhood fresh in their minds, the crew drove back to the Just Us, sat down, and started talking about the actual robbery. Here, now, Patera put something on the table that not only startled Mena and Joe Dish, but made them back off, at first slowly, and then quickly. Patera said that he did not want to leave any witnesses, that he wanted to kill the two women, cut them up in the tub, and bury them. Luis Mena said that he was all for robbing them, perhaps beating them over the head, but not killing them. Joe Dish parroted what Mena said. This really pissed Patera off. He felt he was doing the right thing, what was necessary. No matter how you cut it, he reasoned, if they were dead, it was over and done there and then. Both Joe Dish and Luis Mena refused. This caused an immediate gap, an animus to form between Patera, Dish, and Mena. Patera felt that they were punks. They could not be trusted. Anyone, he believed, not willing to get blood on his hands, did not deserve his respect, trust, confidence. Patera had worked with Joe Dish several times before, with Dish posing as an NYPD detective to give Patera and company access to rip off different drug dealers. These robberies had gone smoothly. No one had been murdered. All prospered. But that was then, and this was now. The comfort Patera had felt with Dish, with Mena, was now gone. He also felt that ripping off the cash house was no longer a good idea, that ultimately he'd make himself vulnerable, that people he didn't trust would know what had happened which could boomerang and inevitably come back to haunt him. Chapter 36 Willie Boy John Gotti was fit to be tied when he learned that one of his closest friends, compatriots, the man he trusted most, was a rat a stinking, fetid, beady-eyed rat. The guy's name was Willie Boy Johnson. He was a large, rugged-looking man with a big stomach. He combed his thick head of black hair straight back. He was kind of a beat-up version of Jackie Gleason, except that he had a broken nose that went off to the left, received in a fight he'd had in his teens. He walked with his shoulders back and his head high, with attitude. He was six feet tall and weighed over three hundred pounds, a big, burly man. Willie Boy Johnson was a genuine, two-fisted tough guy, half Italian and half American Indian. He had known John Gotti since they were both kids. Not only was he an adept street fighter, but he was a brutal, lethal man who danced to his own rhythm. He was known as Willie Boy because he had been hanging out with older boys since he was a kid. In that he was not fully Italian, he could not be made, though when you looked at him, he looked Italian. When John Gotti found out that he was an FBI informant, that he had been wearing a wire, that information he'd garnered would be used against him, Gotti, he nearly blew a gasket. He yelled, cursed, broke furniture. Dead! I want him dead! 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 You hear? He told his people. Oh, how John Gotti wished he could kill Willie Boy himself, take his throat in his hands and squeeze. But he knew that pleasure would not be his, that the first finger pointed would be at him. Gotti turned to his most trusted assassin, Eddie Leno. It cannot be emphasized enough here what a truly dangerous man Leno was. He was sly, calculating, lethal. There was never a murder contract he was given that wasn't fulfilled. He was feared throughout all of mafiadom. This is no exaggeration. Eddie Leno's partner in the drug business had been John Gotti's brother, Gene Gotti. In fact, the two were arrested at the same time, though they would be tried separately. At this point, free on bail, Eddie Leno was John Gotti's grim reaper. Now John told Leno that Willie Boy Johnson had to go. For Gotti, this was not only about business, this was personal. He had loved Willie Boy Johnson. When Gotti wanted to murder the man who had accidentally run over and killed his son Frank, he sent Willie Boy Johnson and others to go grab the guy, 
torture him, and kill him. For John Gotti, Willie Boyd Johnson had been family. Sitting opposite each other, Lino, dark-eyed and dark-haired, with the countenance of a dangerous, poisonous snake, stared at John Gotti and listened to the order. Nothing else had to be said. Eddie Lino got up and left. Willie Boy Johnson's days were numbered. As an indicator of just how highly Tommy Patero was thought of in the underground society that the Mafia is, Eddie Lino turned to Tommy Patera to help kill Willie Boy Johnson, according to U.S. Attorney David Shapiro and DEA agent Jim Hunt. Lino trusted very few people, but he trusted Patera. Lino, a natural-born killer, saw in Patera the same traits, the same attitude he, Lino, had. It was as though they had come from the same womb. This was an extremely important hit, and here, Eddie Lino was wholeheartedly involving Tommy Patera, making him an intricate part of the hit team. That's what Eddie Lino was good at, not necessarily doing the killing himself, but arranging the details, where and how it happened. Pleased, gleefully, Patera listened to Eddie giving him the job. For Patera, this was like receiving an Oscar. John Gotti, after all, was the capo di tutti capi, the boss of bosses, one of the most famous mob bosses in history. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He was the Teflon Don. He was Superman in that world. If Patera knew he did this well, it would help his career immeasurably. Everyone would look up to him, point at him. He would be an omnipotent presence in La Cosa Nostra. I'm honored, Patera said, and went about the business at hand, killing Willie Boy Johnson, a seasoned killer himself. Before, however, Patera could do the job, he had to get permission from his boss, Banano Capo Frankie Lino. Lino, in turn, went to the underboss of the family, Anthony Spiro. Both gave permission for Patera to fill the contract. This would, they both knew, bolster the relationship between the Bananos and the Gambinos. It was a good thing. At 6 a.m. on the morning of August 29, 1988, Willie Boy Johnson nonchalantly left his house, took a right, and began walking. He was wearing dungarees and a jean shirt. On his block, there was a two-story house being built, a construction site. As he walked, he saw... Tommy Patera suddenly stepped out from behind a mound of sand. He immediately knew what was up. Seemingly out of nowhere, Patera's trusted aide-de-camp, Kojak Giatino, and the premier assassin in the Gambino family, Eddie Lino, appeared with guns in hand. Seemingly as one, all three shot at the large, fleeing form of Willie Boy Johnson. Calmly, Patera knelt down and positioned himself, cupped his left hand in his right hand, took careful aim, and drilled Johnson with holes. Johnson went down, shot some ten times. Patera had used a special bullet on him, a glazer round, the one he had used on Phyllis Birdie. Each of the glazer rounds did horrific damage to the inside of Johnson's body. As Johnson's blood pooled on the hot August street, Patera and Kojak spread a link of spikes across the street, and they got in a stolen car and pulled away. The spikes would prevent anyone from following them and indicated the wide expanse of Patera's killing acumen. Thus, Willie Boy Johnson was killed, and Tommy Patera acquired a new 24-carat gold stature within the tight fraternity of La Cosa Nostra, an Oscar for murder. Later, when John Gotti learned that Willie Boy Johnson was dead, he was pleased. It would be just a matter of time before he rewarded Patera handsomely. It didn't take long for Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel to hear, by way of the Brooklyn jungle drums, that Tommy Patera had taken out Willie Boy Johnson, known on the street as the Indian. A rumor, Hunt knew, was one thing. Proof was another. Chapter 37 The Garage In that Group 33 was extremely busy and active 24-7, inevitably, Jim and Tommy were called away from Gravesend. They worked cases in the Bronx, Queens, Harlem, and even Staten Island. Group 33 was, by its very nature, mobile and fluid. 
able to deal with the huge amount of drug dealing in a large metropolis such as New York City. They also managed to get more wiretaps on the phones of Frankie Martini, a.k.a. Frankie Jupiter, and other people who worked for Patera. They, Jim and Tommy and Group 33, were careful to make certain that Patera didn't know that they had him under surveillance. They did everything they could to keep him from making them. It was obvious that Patera suspected police scrutiny, was wary of police surveillance, but they did everything they could not to substantiate his suspicions. They knew that once he realized he was being trailed, he'd change his modus operandi, change the way he did business, and make it that much harder to put together an airtight case against him. They were absolutely not interested in arresting him and having him beat the case. What they, Jim and Tom, wanted was for the case to be foolproof. On occasion, Jim discussed important cases with his father. For the most part, the job had not changed. It has always been about carefully putting together cases, developing informants. Interestingly, Jim Hunt Jr. was arresting the sons of bad guys his father had arrested for the same reasons under the same circumstances, the selling of drugs. In February of 1989, on a blistering cold day, Jim Hunt and his partner, sitting in Jim's black Cadillac with tinted windows, were parked near Patera's house on East 12th Street. The skies were low and thick and churning with angry gray clouds. Strong winds off the nearby Atlantic Ocean whipped through Gravesend. Patera left the house, got in a black Oldsmobile 98 he owned, drove over to the Belt Parkway and headed east. The agents followed him from a distance. Patera made his way to the garage where Manny Mayo worked on Flatlands Avenue. He left his Oldsmobile there for some work to be done, took another car, and headed back toward Gravesend. This was a very interesting turn of events for the government. They might have stumbled on something important, Jim immediately knew. They put the car under surveillance, began copying the license plates of cars entering and exiting the shop, and soon realized the garage was a virtual mecca for La Cosa Nostra. They matched plate numbers to capos in different families. Over the next several days, the garage was under DEA scrutiny, and the government agents watched car interiors being taken out, cleaned, and reupholstered. They also watched cars put up on lifts and apparently checked for listening devices. Very interesting. Chapter 38 B and E In Brooklyn, as in anywhere in the world where people walked on the outside of the law, there were always people on the lookout for scores. Often those involved were professional thieves, rip-off artists, cat burglars, or tradesmen who, on a regular basis, were welcomed inside of people's homes by unsuspecting innocents. If a tradesman came across something particularly valuable, he could very well pass the information on to a thief, to someone willing to do a rush break-in. B&E crews were made up of toughs with guns willing to knock on a door and pose as any of a dozen different people to get the homeowner to open the door. Once the door was cracked a quarter of an inch, they would hard-shoulder it and burst in, guns drawn, yelling, screaming, cursing, the object to scare. These crews usually consisted of two or three men, coarse, gruff, hard individuals. It was obvious they might confront women, mothers, grandmothers, young females, yet they were more than happy to break in. If there was a totem pole of crimes, B&E gangs of this nature were surely at the low end of it. Workmen were restoring fancy kitchen cabinets in the home of wealthy Russians who lived on East 104th Street in Canarsie, a nice residential neighborhood, solidly upper middle class. The head of the household was a successful jewelry dealer. As well as selling jewelry on the up and up, he sold stolen jewelry, precious stones, all types of extremely expensive watches. One of these cabinet makers was Larry Santoro, a larceny-hearted tradesman who would steal money from a blind man. Santoro went to Manny Mea, who in turn went to Frank Ganji and told him about the Russian jeweler. Ganji was always up for a score, though this kind of work was not something he liked, something he often did, something he was particularly adept at he'd still do it. No matter how much money Ganji made, it never seemed to be enough. That was, of course, 
due to the fact that he was abusing alcohol and cocaine to such a degree that money passed through his fingers like water. A man who had his act together might very well have passed on this opportunity, but Frank thought it was a good idea, and in turn went to his partner and friend, Billy Bright. Since their time in prison together, Bright had become a born-again Christian, though he was a paradoxical born-again. He believed in God, the Ten Commandments, the many dictates of the Bible, but he was also willing to sell drugs, rob, and steal. Bright had no reservations about robbing a woman in her home and readily agreed to do the job. Bright and Ganji soon sat down with Larry Santoro, and Larry explained that he would leave the back door of the house open, that they should get there early in the morning, that at that point there should only be the jeweler's young wife home. It'll be a piece of cake, Larry said. After the meeting, Billy said that he would use one of Patera's guns, that he was holding Patera's stash of weapons. This was an interesting anecdote. Patera always had a cache of guns being held by someone else. These guns Billy Bright was holding for him now were for killing. Patera, in fact, had a gun permit for target shooting. The gun he had the permit for, he actually did carry around with him, though he never used it in any crimes and never would. When Jim Hunt learned that Patera had a gun permit, he felt it was an infamy, a miscarriage of justice, a wrong that would soon be righted, he'd make sure. By now it was late February of 1989. Ganji and Billy Bright made their way to the Canarsie home of the Russian family, the Blumenkrantz. The house was on a quiet, residential street. The homes were set apart from one another. Frank and Billy parked their car down the block, got out, and walked back to the house, They had guns in their waistbands. The sun shone brightly. Sparrows and blackbirds chirped gaily in trees that lined the block. Self-absorbed, people were on their way to work. Though it was early, children were out playing on lawns. Unchallenged, unnoticed, Ganji and Bright made their way to the house. Calm on the outside, their faces relaxed, though nervous inside, they reached the home and, as though they owned it, walked to the backyard. As they had planned, they found the back door open. Without hesitation, they went in. Bright pulled out the gun. It was hot, and they were both sweating. They had been expecting to find the wife of the jeweler, but instead were confronted by an elderly lady, his mother. Be quiet, Bright ordered. We don't want to hurt you. We just want the jewelry. We don't want to hurt you. Her eyes were nearly popping out of her head. Bright's words, however, did seem to soothe her. She calmed down somewhat. They demanded the jewelry. They wanted to know where the safe was. They threatened her. She apparently knew little English, as she kept answering them in Russian, saying over and over again, I have a bad heart. I have a bad heart. I need my medicine. Not knowing what the hell she was saying, they threatened her, pointed guns at her, demanded the jewelry. In Russian, she kept begging for her medicine, desperately pointing to her bag. Bright finally retrieved the bag, found the medicine, and gave it to her. She immediately took a pill. They now went and found Larry's cousin, the other cabinet maker, handcuffed him, and took him and the elderly woman to the finished basement. It was there that they found the trove of jewelry. Neither one of these two was particularly informed about the worth of jewelry, different stones. They took everything they found. With the jewelry in a bag, Billy Bright and Ganji left the house, walked back to the car, and took off, overjoyed. Everything had gone as planned. They high-fived one another and slowly drove away, back to Gravesend. Unbeknownst to Larry Santoro, Manny Maya, Billy Bright, and Frank Ganji, the Russian jeweler was friends with a capo in the Gambino crime family, Joe Butch Corral. They could not have found a worse person to rip off. This capo was a particularly tough, jaded individual. He was not just a capo, he was a war capo. His wife had left a very expensive pair of diamond earrings with the Russian family. Joe Butch wanted the earrings back. He also wanted a part of what was taken. The Gambinos had heard that whoever did this had earned $250,000 from the ripoff. In that neither Ganji nor Bright was a professional thief, a professional B&E person, They did not have fences readily available, though it didn't take them long to find fences willing to take the jewelry off their hands. 
Ganji split up his part and sold pieces to the owner of the wrong number, a Genovese captain named Salvatore Lombardi, a.k.a. Sally Dogs, and to a jewelry store on 4th Avenue called Bianco Jewelers. In reality, La Cosa Nostra is one big fraternity. Except during times of war, they intermingle as freely as stockbrokers on the New York Stock Exchange. Even members from different families regularly have coffee, lunch, dinner. Part and parcel of why they're so successful is how they network. This custom was something that they had brought over from Italy. In any town across Sicily, people walk and talk after dinner. Families, friends, it's a built-in custom. The Italians in LCN kept this custom very much alive, and because they did not have nine-to-five jobs, they were free to meet as they pleased, walk and talk to their heart's content, until the cows came home. In that their business was crime, in that crime was their primary concern, what they talked about all the time were different aspects of different crimes. When Joe Butch Corral said he wanted to find the thieves who took the jewelry, word quickly spread throughout mafiadom, from block to block, neighborhood to neighborhood, all over Brooklyn. Capos heard it, lieutenants heard it, soldiers heard it. It didn't take long for the Bonanno family to hear what had happened. Tommy Karate quickly learned what went down, in that he was always interested in earning brownie points with the Gambinos, it didn't take long for him to find out that Billy Bright and Frank Ganji had been involved. This was a shocking revelation for Patera. What they had done could very well have caused problems between the Gambinos and the Bananos. Neither Bright nor Frank Ganji had come to Patera and asked his permission to do this score. They were way out of line. Patera was responsible for them, their actions. As it happened, there had to be an official sit-down over this incident. Ganji's cousin Ross, a capo in the Genovese crime family, sat down with Joe Butch and Tommy. Joe Butch was bent out of shape. He not only wanted his wife's diamond earrings back, but he demanded half the score. Ross Ganji explained the reality of the relationship he had with his cousin. Frank's his own man, he said. There's nothing I can do. I can't order him to do anything. He's been a problem all his life. He uses drugs, drinks too much. I'd do anything I can for you, Joe, you know that. But the kid's a wild card. By Ross Ganji saying what he just said, he was, essentially, giving Joe Butch the right to kill Frank Ganji. If it wasn't for Patera's intervention, if it wasn't for the respect and admiration the Gambinos had for Patera, the meeting might very well have ended there with the deaths of Billy Bright and Frank Ganji. Patera spoke up for them. He promised to get what jewelry he could back and give it to Joe Butch. Joe Butch seemed to accept that. The meeting broke up. They all went their separate ways. Watching, waiting patiently, agents were building a case against Patera, fastidiously noting who came to and left the Just Us, what was said on the tapes, the rumors spreading throughout the dangerous mafia jungle known as Gravesend. Chapter 39 Rats Rats. Patera hated them with such fervor that he wouldn't allow anyone in his crew to wear a mustache, for mustaches resembled whiskers and rats had whiskers. Richie Leone was a member of Patera's crew. Saul Stern was on the fringes of the Bonanno family. Through sources he found reliable, Patera came to believe, with his obsessive paranoia about rats, that Stern and Leone were informers talking to the FBI. He also believed that Richie Leone had stolen bearer bonds, some of which should have gone to Patera but did not. For them, this was a death sentence, immediate and without appeal. Patera devised a plan to kidnap both Leone and Stern. Initially, he was going to use Ganji as part of the kidnapping team, but he was still angry with him over the jewelry robbery. He had come to believe that Ganji was irresponsible because of drug and alcohol abuse. During the sit-down with Joe Butch, Ross Ganji, Frank's cousin, had even told Patera that Frank was irresponsible, out of control, unreliable. Patera sent word to Leone and Stern that he had a sweet score he wanted to involve them in. 
It involved ripping off a large amount of marijuana from a couple of hippies. Unaware and unsuspecting, Leone and Stern showed up at Patera's Club Overstreets at the prescribed time on the morning of March 15, 1989. Billy Bright and Richie David were already there, as well as Patera. Unwittingly, Leone and Stern were suddenly in shark-infested water. For Patera, this was not about questioning them, an inquisition, finding the truth. This was about retribution, revenge, pain, suffering, murder. On the left, as you came into the club, was a long bar. In front of the bar was a wood dance floor. On the far wall, there was a balcony with movie theater seats. Clubgoers could sit there, smoke pot, and discreetly take a snort of coke without being bothered. In that it was a mob-controlled club, people who went there felt safe. There were few fights. Known troublemakers were kept out. The bouncers were like attack-trained Doberman pinchers. Patera had an office there, and next to the office was a bathroom where there was a jacuzzi bathtub. Soon, the jacuzzi tub would be used in a most unspeakable way. Patera was in a particularly bad mood that night. Since the loss of Celeste, he had changed. He had become quiet, more introspective, and, in a word, meaner. He had little patience for anyone. He very rarely laughed. Both Stern and Leone were handcuffed. It was three o'clock in the morning. There was little traffic on the streets outside. In that the club's windows were tinted, people could not see in, though you could see out. Patera had Stern and Leone handcuffed to pipes bolted to the ceiling. Patera first uncuffed Leone shot him in the leg, and demanded he dance across the floor. Leone had no choice. He danced the best he could, blood seeping through the dime-sized hole in his leg. Patera shot him again, and again, and again. Bright uncuffed him. Leone lay on the floor, a heap of tortured muscle, bone, and flesh. Blood pooled around him. Please, Leone begged, please just kill me. Just fucking kill me! Bright did not want to see him suffer like this. Though Bright was a killer, he did not have the black heart, the lack of conscience, the lack of feelings Patera had. Bright moved closer to Leone and shot him in the head, killing him. Saul Stern was so horrified, so beside himself, that he shit in his pants, stinking the club up. Next, Patera turned his attention to a very distraught Saul Stern. He proceeded to shoot him numerous times. The man howled and screamed as though he'd been pierced with red-hot pokers. When Patera was finished with this sadistic game, he had the bodies taken down and brought to the tub. He undressed, grabbed his dismembering kit, got into the tub, and cut them each, one after the other, into six pieces. He, with Bright's help, then wrapped them in black plastic and stuffed them in large, cheap suitcases. Saul's valuable wedding ring was stuck on his sausage-thick finger. Patera wanted it. He couldn't get it off. He used a knife and cut the finger off at the joint and stole the ring. This ring would later come back to haunt Patera. Again, clearly, Patera was taking totems from his victims, a textbook serial killer phenomenon. Patera then made sure the dance floor and club were cleaned, thoroughly. Stern was very heavy, and they had difficulty fitting him into the suitcases. They had to wrap the two heads separately. After showering thoroughly, Patera slowly got dressed, and Bright and David grabbed the suitcases, and they headed toward Patera's car, put the four suitcases and the heads in the trunk, and made their way to Staten Island, made their way over the two-mile stretch of the Verrazano Bridge, Brooklyn on their left, the city on their right. They could see the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island from the middle of the bridge. The water in the Narrows was calm. After going through the toll booth, they made their way to the bird sanctuary, driving slowly, making certain to abide by all traffic laws. They reached the street, which abutted the bird sanctuary, parked the car, retrieved the suitcases and heads, and quickly made their way into the forest. They went about thirty steps, found a clearing, and put down the bodies. In that it was March, the soil was somewhat firm. Digging was harder. They took turns trying to make a hole large enough to accommodate both suitcases. 
It was arduous work. When the hole was deep enough, they dumped the two suitcases in. Patero wanted the heads buried separately, so he had a second hole dug some ten feet away and dumped the two heads there. They covered the holes up and left, a shy dawn slowly growing on the eastern sky, a chill wind blowing off the nearby Atlantic. Patera felt good about what he had done. He felt justice had been served. Street justice. Billy Bright showed up at the pot stash house in Gravesend that he, Ganji, and Patera kept. Ganji had slept there that night with a girl he was seeing named Sophia. When Billy Bright arrived, he was covered in dirt, and his face was long and sad. Ganji took one look at him and knew exactly what was wrong. The dirt told the story. Would you like to talk? Ganji offered. Bright immediately told him everything that had occurred. Ganji listened sympathetically. He was glad Patera had not chosen him to be a part of this. He's fucking out of control, Ganji said, wanting to distance himself from Patera, wanting to distance himself from it all. He was still plagued by what had happened to Phyllis Birdie. He couldn't get it out of his mind. He would later relate that this trauma caused him to drink and use drugs. He was now consuming a full bottle of whiskey every day, plus several grams of cocaine. If he hadn't been such a naturally strong, robust individual, no doubt he would have passed out one night and not woken up. Trouble, he felt in his bones, loomed large and foreboding. His answer was to snort a long line of glistening cocaine. Part 3. The Beat Goes On Chapter 40. The Cop Killer It was now early July of 1989. The temperature at noon that day was near 100 degrees. Jim Hunt was in an unmarked DEA car parked on Flatlands Avenue. He was watching the garage, body shop, and mob hangout where Manny Maya worked. Jim was certain the body shop was a front for cleaning cars used in murders and the distribution of large amounts of narcotics. Over the days, weeks, and months since the Patera case had begun, the DEA investigation into Patera and his crew had finally swung into full gear. Through what they heard on wiretaps, there were now taps in the Just Us Bar, Club Overstreets, the Cypress Lounge, Judy Hamowitz's house, and Frank Ganji's house, and there were also bugs in whatever cars Patera drove, the strike force had come to learn that not only was Patera regularly selling large amounts of both heroin and cocaine to a rotating, ever-changing network of different people who worked for him, but he was an assassin for the Bonanno family and other families as well. They had come to believe that he was responsible for killing Willie Boy Johnson, that Eddie Lino himself had made him part of the hit team that brought down Johnson. Now the task at hand was finding tangible, viable evidence that could be used in a court of law that would hold up under blistering scrutiny from the best criminal attorneys in the country. Jim Hunt was alone today, watching the garage. His partner, Tommy Geisel, had a wedding he needed to attend. Rather than lose a day, Jim had that itchy feeling in the nape of his neck and decided to go keep an eye on the garage and Patera hangout by himself. For Jim Hunt, a successful case often came about by pure happenstance, good luck, being in the right place at the right time, or even the wrong place at the right time. While he was sitting there sweating profusely, his beeper sounded. When he checked the number, he realized it was a DEA informant he'd been working with for several years who had successfully brought down major players in the cocaine and heroin business. Her name was Maria Polkowski. At this juncture, she had nothing to do with the Patera case, though Jim thought she might very well get involved with the case down the road. She was an obese Brazilian woman who had larger balls than most men. She was amazingly adept at getting people to believe bold-faced lies. She spoke not only English and Portuguese, but five other languages fluently. Maria was a stellar informer for the DEA. They paid her well for the services she provided. Not only was she an amazing actress, but she could readily think on her feet, adapt to any situation quickly, had the courage to go up against dangerous men with big guns, bad attitudes, and sharp knives. Jim called her. She said she was in Queens with one Hector Estrada and a very important mafia guy. Why do you think he's in the mafia, Maria? Jim asked. 
I know it. I'm sure he's in the mafia. He's very connected. Because he's Italian? No, don't be silly. This guy's really mobbed up. Come quickly, James. I don't feel safe. Hunt did not want to leave the stakeout. Had it not been Maria calling, he would not have left. But she had proved immensely reliable, well-informed, and had helped Jim make many cases. Reluctantly, he put his car in gear and sped over to Astoria Boulevard in Queens. Jim went to the Italian restaurant where Maria said she was. Neither she nor the Mafia characters were inside. Perplexed, he got back in his car. As he drove around the block, he spotted Maria in her amazingly colorful garb, walking with two men. One was a gruff, tough-looking dude, a South American with dark skin, no doubt, Hector Estrada. The other was like a blonde surfer. This surfer-looking dude soon separated from Maria and Hector, got in a small convertible and pulled away. Jim felt he could always find Maria, and so he decided to follow the surfer. He, the surfer, drove straight to a B-rated strip club on Astoria Boulevard. Jim sat outside, wondering what to do. He decided to go in and see what was up. Inside it was air-conditioned, and the cool air was a much welcome change. The place was empty. The surfer was sitting at a bar near the door. Jim audaciously walked over, sat down right next to him, and ordered a beer. How you doing? the surfer said. Good, good. Yourself? Jim said. They began to talk about the weather. The surfer introduced himself as Giles, and they shook hands. As Jim enjoyed the cold beer, the surfer ogled, somewhat excessively, the broken-down stripper up on stage. Out of the corner of his eye, Jim eyeballed the surfer. He was looking at a somewhat baby-faced, innocuous man who didn't seem capable of hurting a fly. Jim would soon find out that his appearance was a far cry from the truth. Jim soon finished his beer and left. In his gut, Jim felt for sure that something big was in the air. It was one of those things you could not learn in school. It was a gritty, gut-like sensation. Some would call it a sixth sense. Some would call it street sense. Jim wasn't sure where this would go, but he would take it seriously. He called headquarters, told his boss what he had seen, and asked for backup. Within minutes, two teams of DEA agents, Jim's colleagues, were speeding toward Queens with their sirens on and red lights flashing. While Jim sat in the car waiting for his people, his beeper again sounded. It was again Maria. He called her right back. Hector called and said he wanted to meet me, she said. Jim knew Hector to be a Colombian coke dealer. I met him in the restaurant. He was with two guys. One of them was mafia. I'm sure he's mafia. His name was Vincenzo. The other one was his blonde guy, Giles. I met him, Jim said, in a bar a couple of blocks away. Well, this Giles guy, he's a fugitive and a very dangerous man, and the thing of it is that he wants to buy cocaine, a lot of cocaine. They want, like, two hundred kilos. The problem is that Hector can't get what they want right now, so he lied. He lied and said he bought a lot of cocaine from me ten times. He lied, and now he wants me to come up with cocaine. All two hundred kilos. What should I do, James? I want you to play them. You're very good at what you do. Don't worry, I'll make sure nothing happens to you. Tell them you'll get the drugs. No problem. You understand? I understand, Maria said in her peculiar Brazilian accent. I'll get back to you, Jim said. Jim's people drove up. He quickly ran down what was happening. As he talked, Giles the surfer left the club, got into his car, and pulled away, not noticing the agents. Jim and his colleagues decided to follow him. He led them all the way to Secaucus, New Jersey, then went into a townhouse. They ran his plates. The car was a rental car registered out of Florida under the name Vincent Mancino. At that juncture, that meant nothing, one way or another. They eyeballed the house for several hours. A woman in her thirties left got in a car and drove away. Near midnight, they decided to wrap it up and begin early the next day. Still, Jim was not sure where this would go, but in his business, fortuitous situations could fall from the sky, and they had to be worked diligently. He did not like the idea of taking his attention away from the Patera case and its cast of characters, but Jim was in the business of responding quickly, being malleable when potential situations arose, 
and fighting fires whenever and wherever they burned. The day had been long, hot, arduous, and somewhat nerve-wracking. When Jim's head hit the pillow, he had no trouble falling asleep. The following day, Maria Pulkowski, big and round and colorful, wearing far too much makeup, clown-like, showed up at the DEA's office on 57th Street. Jim and Tom sat her down at a desk and listened to her story. She first talked about Vincenzo. She described him as a good-looking man with dark hair, definitely in the mafia, married to a Canadian woman. He was on the lam, she said, and lived in Canada. She said, too, that Hector was creating problems for her. She didn't have coke like that. She didn't want to be put into a position where she was asked for something she could not deliver. Jim combed her down, told her she was the best they'd ever had. If anyone can pull this off, you can. I know you can, he reassured her. I will make sure nothing happens to you. I promise. She looked at him long and hard. She liked Jim, trusted him, had a bit of a crush on him. Okay, she said. Jim told her to phone him the moment she heard anything further, that he'd be at her beck and call twenty-four hours a day. Bolstered by his kind words, she left, a newfound spring in her heavy step. Jim proceeded to call an old contact, good friend of his, Mike Spataro, a retired NYPD detective out of the organized crime unit who was now working for the DEA. Nobody knew more about organized crime characters than Mike. He had a memory like a steel bear trap. He had copious notes that included aliases, nicknames, tattoos, etc. Jim asked him about this Vincenzo. He said he was good-looking, in his forties, had dark hair, and was married to a Canadian woman. Spataro told Jim that he'd see what he could find out and then get back to him. With no new developments in the case Maria had just brought them, two days later Jim and Tommy were back in Brooklyn's Graves End, continuing their surveillance of Tommy Patera and the jaded constellation of bad guys that revolved around him. They were still working out of the house in Bensonhurst that monitored all the many taps they had on cars and homes relevant to the case. They had come to know that Patera was far more devious than he seemed on the surface. Over and over again, Patera had warned all his people about talking on phones or in their cars. They, the Patera Strike Force, noticed Frank Ganji, that he was a Patera regular as they started calling his people, and there seemed to be something unhinged about him. They already knew that Ganji was from a mafia family, that he had uncles in the mafia, and his father had been immersed in that world. They knew, too, that Frank had been involved in a murder, the killing of Arthur Gouvernero. Still, recorded conversations Judy Hamowitz had with triple X porno lines came in on a regular basis. They noted that the Canadian woman Jim and Tom had met outside of Angela's house that first day had suddenly gone missing. Her mother had been calling both Judy's house and the Just Us, looking for her daughter. The agents heard her pleading with Judy. Where is Janice? Have you seen her? Jim, Tommy, and the task force could not help but wonder if Patera had something to do with her disappearance. Some five days after Maria first contacted Jim, she called him again. Oh, my God, she said. The Colombian guy called, and they are coming to my house. They know where you live? Jim asked. Yes, I told them. You know that's how I got people's trust? Jim didn't like this. He shook his head. Rather than admonish her, he said he'd be right there. Jim and his boss, Ken Feldman, sped over to Queens. As they pulled up in front of the house, by pure happenstance, the yellow convertible pulled up, and Giles walked into the house with a green duffel bag. This piqued the agent's interest in a large way. What, they wondered out loud, was in that duffel bag? Within minutes, Giles exited the house, got back into his yellow convertible, and took off unconcerned, seemingly unaware. With that, Jim got out of his car and went upstairs to see what was up. He knocked on Maria's door. She opened it. Her eyes were all wide. My God, she said, look what he gave me. She opened the bag, and inside was 400,000 Canadian dollars. Jim looked. He was as shocked as she was. Maria continued. He gave me this as a down payment for the 200 kilos. This, Jim knew, changed the complexion of the case. 
These were serious players. If they were willing to just drop off almost half a million dollars as a good-faith deposit, they were the real deal. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Maria asked. Just relax, Jim said. I'll help you through it. I'll guide you through every step. You're the best. Just remember that. Okay, James. Okay, she said, seeming more relaxed. Jim had an uncanny way of getting people in his business to like him, warm to him, trust him. He now took the bag from Maria. He would take it to the office where it would be marked as evidence. As he made his way downstairs, shockingly, Giles, the blonde surfer, was coming up. They passed each other. Giles was so wrapped up in thought he didn't notice Jim or his back. Jim was shocked. Surely he thought he'd make him. Outside, back in his car, Jim put the duffel bag in Ken's lap and said, You're not going to fucking believe this. He brought up this bag, gave her 400,000 Canadian dollars as a deposit. Good faith. I took it from her, and as I'm walking down the stairs, he walks right past me. We walked right past each other. We touched shoulders. No, Ken said. Yes, Jim said. Four hundred thou, Ken asked, opening the bag, his eyes wide. Four hundred thou. Jim immediately called Maria. He wanted to know what was up. Is everything okay? he asked. Yes, there's no problem. Everything is okay. He came back to give me the phone number to call in Canada. In Canada? Where in Canada? Canada? Where in Canada? Toronto, I think. You think? You don't know? Toronto, I know. Are you sure, Maria? I'm sure. Toronto. As proficient as Maria was, Jim knew her to be, as he would later explain, crazy. He explained it like this. That is, she was somewhat spaced out, out to lunch. So let me get this straight, Jim said. He wants you to bring him the drugs in Canada, in Toronto, and call this number that he gave you when you get there. Right. Okay. We can do this. We can make this work. James, with your help, I'm sure we can. Jim hung up. He turned to Ken. It looks like we're going to Canada. Okay, Ken replied. Next, Jim called the Canadian authorities, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, he got the head of the Mounties, Sergeant MacDonald, on the phone and ran down the situation in quick copalese. That very day, Maria, Tom, and Jim boarded a plane for Toronto. The Patera case, for now, was out of sight, but not out of mind. As Tom and Jim sped to Canada, DEA agents were circling Patera, watching his minions, looking for that weak link, looking for his Achilles heel. When Tom and Jim and Maria arrived in Toronto, they went straight to meet Sergeant MacDonald at Mountie headquarters. Sergeant MacDonald had a feeling he knew about whom they were talking. The first thing the sergeant did when Jim and Tommy and Maria arrived at his office was show them a picture and ask, Do you know this guy? As if he already knew the answer, his tone somber and overtly serious. Jim took one look. The man in the photograph had a thick head of dark hair and a beard, but it was obvious that it was Giles, the surfer. That's him, Jim said, showing the picture to Maria. She took it. She agreed with Jim that it was this Giles character. Sergeant MacDonald shook his head as though he'd just been given some very bad news. Well, we have a serious problem here, he said. This man is one of the most wanted men in Canada. His real name is Yves LaSalle, and he is a cop killer. He killed a police officer during a robbery in Houston, Texas, and then three security guards during another robbery he committed after having escaped from a maximum security prison here in Canada where he had been serving a life sentence. Holy shit, Jim said. I was so close to him I touched him. Jim felt bad for not having cuffed him the day they first met. Jim hated cop killers. Both the good guys and the bad guys understood. You don't kill a cop. To do so was a cardinal sin. Not only had this Giles guy killed a cop, but he had killed three other men in uniform. At the very top of the list of bad guys were cop killers. Sergeant MacDonald said, The problem is that we see this guy. We've got to arrest him on sight. There's no way, I mean, think about it, that we can play out a sting with him. 
Both Jim and Tom knew his argument had merit. If Giles got away when they had an opportunity to arrest him, the Mounties' careers would be on the line. Jim and Tom decided not to make an argument of it right now. They would work the case to see how it played out. Sergeant MacDonald explained that they believed Giles had connections to the Mafia, to the Bonanno crime family. This, of course, Jim and Tommy found endlessly interesting, having no idea that this would all lead back to Brooklyn, to Tommy Patera. Sergeant MacDonald agreed to help them with the understanding that if Giles showed up, he was theirs. Jim immediately turned on the charm. If anyone could convince Sergeant MacDonald to cooperate with them, let them play this out, trail Giles, and in the end arrest him, it was Jim. This all had to do with the fact that Jim was truly being sincere, wasn't playing anybody. He knew what he was doing, was a professional, and would, one way or another, get the job done. Jim, in this case, wanted to have his cake and eat it, too. When Jim, Tommy Geisel, and Maria left Mountie headquarters, they checked into a nearby motel. Now Maria called the phone number that Vincenzo had given her. She said she was looking for Vincenzo. She was told he wasn't there, that she should call back in an hour. When, an hour later, she phoned back and asked for Vincenzo, a man with a very gruff, gravelly voice answered. He identified himself as Vincenzo. She said she had come to Canada as per their agreement, was in Toronto with the goods. What? Toronto? he said incredulously. Yes, Toronto. What are you doing there? He told me to come here. I'm here. That's what he said. No, you were supposed to come to Montreal. No, he told me to come to Toronto. I No, he told me to come to Toronto. My God, the man with the gruff voice said. Look, I'll call you back. He hung up. This guy's crazy, Maria said. Jim, knowing that Maria was somewhat unhinged, knowing her perceptions were occasionally off base, asked, Maria, are you sure they said Toronto? He immediately accepted that Maria had somehow made a mistake. Jim, they said to come to Toronto. Jim was not about to argue with her. Look, Maria, you've just got to convince them to come here. It will make everything a lot easier, okay? Okay, she said. Before she called the number again, Jim spoke to Sergeant MacDonald. He explained that apparently the bad guys were in Montreal, not Toronto. Sergeant MacDonald said that opened up a whole Pandora's box of more trouble. Again, as per Jim's instructions, input, Maria called the number. Vincenzo answered. She explained that she had done what was asked of her, that the goods were in Toronto. He explained that did no good for anyone. Well? she said. My driver and I came up, the materials in the car. I had no idea I had to come here, and now I have to go there. That changes everything. I don't want to go. You want it? You come here. Look, Maria, I don't know who told you to go to Toronto, but that was a mistake. We're here. Our operation is here, he said in his gravelly voice. You need to come here. Maria, Jim and Tom discussed their going to Montreal, the different ramifications of the trip. In that it was a mistake for them to be in Toronto to begin with, Jim decided they ought to push for it. With that, Maria called back Vincenzo and said she'd drive the car to Montreal. He was grateful, said thank you, and hung up. Jim next called Sergeant MacDonald. Maria soon called Hector and yelled at him, saying he told her to go to Toronto and now they wanted her to go somewhere else. Hector denied that he ever said Toronto. It went back and forth for quite a while. Ultimately, Hector said he was going to Montreal and would figure everything out for her. He said he would arrive on a 7 p.m. flight. Sergeant MacDonald put Jim and Tom in contact with higher-ups in the narcotics division in Montreal. He explained briefly what was going down, and Jim, Tommy, Maria, and two Toronto Mounties were soon on their way to Montreal. The Mounties were there to make sure Jim and Tom got what they needed, cooperation and help, and that the surveillance on Hector was carried out correctly. Jim and Tom had decided to follow Hector to see where he went. They were certain Hector was the key, that he would bring them to Vincenzo 
and Giles. When they arrived at the airport, they hurried from the plane and were met by a dozen Mounties connected to the Narcotics Bureau. Each was dressed in plain clothes. Their boss was named Sergeant Martin. He was a tall, strong-looking man who had obviously been around the block several times. He was seasoned and well-versed in the workings of the criminal mind. Jim and Tom took an immediate liking to him. The feeling was mutual. Sergeant Martin explained that four surveillance teams were set up outside, that they had guys dressed as hard hats and blue-collar workers and women pushing baby carriages. Jim liked what he saw and heard. They found the gate from which Hector would be disembarking. There was a somewhat crowded bar nearby. Martin, Jim, and Tom made their way up to the bar and ordered beers. Jim quickly brought Sergeant Martin up to speed. Sergeant Martin reiterated what Sergeant MacDonald had said in Toronto. If they came upon Yves LaSalle, they had to arrest him. Jim, if we see him and we don't arrest him, we'll have to contend with that again. I couldn't handle that. He's a killer. He's proved this over and over. Jim nodded in agreement. He was able to see the gate from the bar. People were starting to disembark. Jim looked down the bar and quickly realized Eve was standing not three feet away from his elbow. Jim started motioning with his eyes to Sergeant Martin and Tom, but neither one of them was picking up his cues. He moved his eyebrows and his eyes, but they weren't getting it. Finally, he said in little more than a whisper, That's him. He's here, right next to me. That's him. As incredible and improbable as this was to believe, it was absolutely true. It was as if fate had picked up Yves LaSalle and put him down there. Jim wanted this to play out. He understood Sergeant Martin's sentiments, but he knew there was a lot at stake here. He knew there were bigger fish to fry. Jim and Sergeant Martin moved to the other side of a wide pillar. Jim reiterated his feelings. Sergeant Martin took a long, deep breath. He'd somehow known it would come to this, but he'd had no idea he would end up at a bar with Eve. Suffice it to say, Jim and Tom and a team of seasoned Mounties were given the green light to follow both Hector and Eve when they left the airport. More agents were brought in. The Mounties were taking this very seriously. Eve spotted Hector and walked up to him. They embraced and walked off together, having no idea how many eyes were intently watching them following them, clocking them, as flights were announced and the world went about its business. Outside, they got into E's yellow convertible and drove away. A dozen different unmarked cars carefully followed them. Eve and Hector seemed, to a degree, oblivious to the tale. Eve had become cocky, so sure of himself that he lost perspective on the fact that he was a much-wanted cop-killer. Eve pulled into a Marriott Hotel parking lot. Hector checked in. The two of them made their way into the hotel bar and began drinking in earnest. Unbeknownst to them, they were surrounded by seasoned, hard cops who knew the ropes. After an hour or so, Hector went upstairs by himself. Meanwhile, Eve got in the car and drove to an apartment house in downtown Montreal. Soon cop cars, staying at a discreet distance, surrounded the building. Before they allowed Eve to get away again, they'd kill him. Early the next morning, there was an extensive debriefing at the Montreal office of the Mounted Police. Succinctly, Jim ran down the case. It was clear they knew what they had to do. The plan they put together was that they would have Maria call the club and have the bad guys meet her at a Holiday Inn near the airport. She would tell them that she had the drugs secreted in her van. The police would rent the two rooms on either side of Maria's. They would bug Maria's room extensively. Anything that was said, they'd record. Anything that was done, they'd see. As per instructions, Maria again called the club. Vincenzo again answered. He was pleased Maria had seen reason and come to Montreal. She invited him to the hotel, as Jim had instructed her to do, where they would consummate the deal. Vincenzo readily agreed to come, having no idea of the trap that was patiently waiting for him. Sure enough, at the prescribed time, the bad guys showed up. Vincenzo, Eve, and Hector. As the agents and Mounties watched on monitors to the left and right of Maria's room, they saw a calm, cool Maria greet her guests as though they were long-lost friends. The bad guys were all smiling and seemed happy. 
Maria was the perfect hostess. Vincenzo called room service and ordered a very good bottle of scotch. They made toasts to future business they would do together. Salud, 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 they said, accompanied by the sound of clinking glasses. All chummy, all warm, they sat down. One big, happy family. Vincenzo explained that for him the coke business was new, that he had been in the heroin business previously. He said there was a lot of money to be made in heroin because the product could be cut so much. Doe-eyed, all innocent, Maria said she knew nothing about the heroin business. She had never even seen the drug, and she asked questions about it of Vincenzo. It was obvious that he had been dealing in heroin for many years. He said that he and his uncle had done very well with it. But, Maria said, How do you know if it's good? Well, I have a hot box, and I put it in and see if it melts. But you know what the real test is? When the nigger hits the floor, he said, tapping the arteries in his arm with two fingers. The man got a big laugh out of that. Maria didn't quite understand what he meant. She asked him to explain. When the dope is good, the nigger ODs. In other words, we find some niggers, and we give them the drugs, and we see what happens. Oh, that's clever, Maria said, subtly, encouragingly. Now, changing the conversation, this Vincenzo character told Maria that he would like to take twenty keys of the cocaine now. Excuse me? she asked. I want twenty kilos now, and I'll take the rest in a couple of days. That wasn't our agreement. Our agreement was that I'd bring the drugs here and get paid, that's it. Look, Maria, Vincenzo said, his eyebrows rising, getting angry. We gave you four hundred thousand already. When we get the drugs, we'll give you the rest of the money. There's no problem here. That's not what the deal was. This went back and forth a while. Vincenzo was getting angrier and angrier. Eve and Hector pretty much stayed quiet. The argument became so heated that Vincenzo called for a time out. The three men went downstairs to the bar. They talked among themselves for a little while before Eve and Hector got into their car and drove away, followed by six police cars. Vincenzo had two more drinks. This was early afternoon. As he drank, Jim again called his NYPD contact, Mike Spataro. Now he explained exactly what Vincenzo looked like, that he had an uncle who was connected. Mike said, let me think, let me think. Jim could hear him rustling through paper files. Suddenly Mike let out a whistle. Whew, I got it! I know who this is! Chapter 41 Spider's Web His name was Vinnie Lorre. He was an associate of the Gambino crime family. Coincidentally, quite amazingly so, his uncle was Frankie Tuminaro, who was murdered alongside Frank Ganji's father. His other uncle was named Angelo Tuminaro. Both were principals in the French Connection case. Angelo had been a fugitive for over twenty years now. Vinnie Loy had been indicted in the same case as Eddie Lino, Jean Gotti, Angelo Ruggiero, and John Carnelia, and fled while on bail. In that Eddie Lino was very close to Tommy Patera, Jim Hunt learned that Patera and the Bananos had supplied the Gambinos with heroin. This, Jim Hunt knew, clearly put Patera in the drama on the stage he was now watching. The Bananos and the Gambinos were close. The plot thickens, Jim thought. Jim knew what had to be done. He sat Maria down and looked her in the eye. Maria, I want you to get tough. I want you to yell and curse and show this Vincenzo guy no respect. You tell him you're not separating the drugs, and you tell him it's the whole load or nothing, you understand? See, si, I understand, she said, seeming to enjoy the role she was about to play, her face taking on a histrionic demeanor. Jim said, Tell them the drugs are sealed in a trap in the van you drove up in, and that you're not going to give them up until the deal is carried out. You tell them that when they show up with the money, you'll give them the van, and they can get the drugs. Okay, James, she said, resolute, confident in James's words, confident that he'd protect her. Word came that Vincenzo was on his way back. He seemed somewhat wobbly, came the report. No wonder, Jim thought, as he had been drinking since late morning. Everyone took his or her position. There was a knock on their door, and Maria opened it. Vincenzo walked in. 
He began with the same old rap. Maria interrupted him and said, Listen to me, you spaghetti-bending guinea motherfucker. I'm not doing it the way you said. I'm not doing anything that isn't what we agreed on. You give me the money, and I give you the van, and I'm not doing anything until that happens that way. You got it? Vincenzo Lore, a Gambino family associate, a killer, was obviously cowed by this fat, colorful Brazilian lady. When he began to protest, she let loose a string of obscenities and swore she would leave if they didn't live up to their end of the bargain. I ain't, she reiterated, breaking open this seal to give you twenty keys? That's bullshit. No one ever said I had to do that. Fuck that. I'm not doing it. My people know where I am, and we'll have a hit team come up here and wipe you the fuck off the map. She pulled her cantaloupe-sized tit and violently shook it at him, saying, Here's my tit. Why don't you grow some balls? They looked at each other long and hard. Jim Hunt was ready to burst through the door for fear Vinnie would attack her. Everyone was tense. Vincenzo brought his hand to his forehead as if he had a sudden headache, obviously shocked by the appearance of her head-sized breast menacingly pointed at him like some kind of bazooka. Maria had a pair of balls, and they both knew it. I gotta go. I gotta do some thinking, he said, rubbing his forehead. He got up and left. Jim Hunt entered Maria's room and gave her a big bear hug. You were marvelous! Fantastic! Brilliant! The best performance I've ever seen anyone give! They all hugged her and shook her hand. All ten cynical Canadian cops, and Tommy Geisel, too. She had been nominated for an Oscar, and she won hands down. Now Hector and Eve the cop killer were under 24-hour surveillance. The Canadian authorities would not let these men out of their sight come hell or high water. Later that day, a very interesting turn of events came about, illustrating just how deep La Cosa Nostra had their razor talons in the Canadian underworld. The authorities followed Vincenzo Lori to a popular diner. When he went inside, he met with Guy Miro, who was a major French-Canadian drug dealer. If there was a capo de tutti capi in Canada, his name was Guy Miro. He was heavy in the drugs and deeply attached to the Bonanno family. Things were really heating up now, beginning to bubble. Vinnie and Guy Moreau sat for an hour, and Vinnie did most of the talking. Guy listened intently. He seemed to be agreeing with what Vinnie was saying. The meeting broke up. Vinnie went one way, and Guy went another. Maria soon received a phone call from Vinnie. He told her that they would do it just like she wanted, that everything could be taken care of the following day. V-Day was here. Early that morning, Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel were at Mounty headquarters. In that they were guests, and there, only because of the goodwill of the Canadian authorities, they could only make suggestions. A task force was rapidly put together. There was no reason to believe that Vinnie Lari was lying. The fact that Vinnie had met with Guy told them all, without a shadow of a doubt, that Guy would be putting up money to facilitate the deal. They laid down how the bust would happen on a map of the area surrounding the hotel. There would be over a dozen police vehicles, twenty-five police personnel, and additionally, helicopters would hover overhead. Later that morning, crime boss Guy Miro left his house, went to a second home, and retrieved two suitcases, placed them in the trunk of his car, and drove on. There were no clouds in the Canadian sky. The sun shone. An unusually large flock of Canadian geese passed low overhead. Guy Moreau went back to the diner and, lo and behold, met with Vinnie Lare. Miro put the suitcases directly into the trunk of Vinnie's car. In the suitcases, they all knew, was the balance of the money, some one point six million dollars Canadian. Soon, Eve and Hector showed up at the diner. There was another man with them, a man no one could ID. It would later be revealed that it was Gilles Mallet, a particularly tough old-school Montreal gangster. Tension was in the air, a nervous kind of static. Cops checked their guns. They had every reason in the world to believe that Eve would immediately start shooting when he saw the detectives. They were sure he'd go down in a hail of bullets before being captured. It was a warm, muggy day. Rubbery waves of heat rose from the ground. 
As the bad guys made their way over to the hotel, surveillance cars were following them, switching places as they went. They, the bad guys, seemed to be oblivious to what was happening. They pulled into the hotel parking lot. The Mounties had a parked minivan ready with Florida plates, thanks to an agent who had recently been transferred from Florida. Vinnie Laurie went upstairs first by himself. He knocked on the door, and Maria let him in. He wasn't that friendly. You've been a very bad senor, a very bad senor. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing, but I'm bringing the money up here, and you can hold it until my guys get the van. If everything is okay, you can keep it, and we go. Okay, she said. You've been a very bad senor, he said again, half-jokingly, and went downstairs to get the others and the money. Quickly, Jim entered the room. Look, Maria, when we go to make a move, I'm going to call you on the phone, and then you go to the bathroom. When the phone rings, pick it up, talk to me a second, and then go straight to the bathroom. Got it? Got it, James, she said. Jim Hunt left. Maria stood there, tough and jaded, cynical and street smart. Within minutes, Vinnie returned, the other three in tow. They put down the bags of money. Smiling, Maria told them they were doing the right thing, complimented them, and gave them the keys to the van. She said, We had the material stashed in the chassis and welded over. All you have to do is open the seal and you'll have it. Eve, Hector, and the third man left to retrieve the coke. Vinny stayed behind. Calm and self-assured, his guac sticking out of his waistband, Jim Hunt knew it was time to act. He called Maria's room. The others got ready, drew their guns, put themselves in the right frame of mind. They knew Vinnie Lorre was a dangerous man, that he had killed people, that he had a lot to lose. They all wanted to go home that day to their wives and families, and none of them were about to let this mafioso miscreant take them down. Maria, Jim said into the phone, go to the bathroom. Okay, okay, Jaime, she said, and hung up. She excused herself and went to the restroom. As soon as she was out of the room, out of harm's way, the hard-jawed Mounties, Jim and Tom, burst into the room. Vinny Lorre barely had time to blink his eyes, let alone to react. Within split seconds, he was up in the air and slammed to the ground and handcuffed. His rights were red. Jim said, What's your name? Vinny Mancino. That's bullshit, Jim said. The game's up. Your Vincenzo Lore and your boys Cornelia and Gotti each got fifty years today. Vinny's face was the color of the underside of a flounder, pale and bloodless. He knew he could not argue and didn't try. Outside, Eve, Hector, and Canadian gangster Gilles Mallette moved toward the car. The day was very hot. They were totally unaware. As Eve opened the trunk of the vehicle, suddenly, out of nowhere, an army of police surrounded them, were on top of them, demanding they put down their weapons and get on the ground. Neither Eve nor the other two had any time to react. They were hit with such lightning speed. It was over. The bad guys had lost. No blood had been spilled. The job done, it was time to go back to New York, to Gravesend. It was time to tighten the screws on the Patera case. Chapter 42 one 900 fuck me Over the underworld jungle drums of La Cosa Nostra, word quickly spread from Montreal to Brooklyn, Graves and Bensonhurst and Diker Heights that Vincent Lorry had been busted. The Canadian godfather, Guy Miro, took it on the lamb and disappeared with the wind. Some two million dollars was lost. It didn't take long for the Bonanno family to also hear the news, which soon passed to Tommy Patera. It was the kind of bust he dreaded. It involved organized crime figures, obviously good police work, infiltration, duplicity, informers, and wiretaps. It, too, involved the loss of a lot of money. Patera knew, felt in his bones, that it also involved a rat. In his mind it always boiled down to rats. Oh, how he hated rats! The thought of them made his skin crawl. He resolved to run his crew tightly. He'd be more watchful, wary, and on guard of everybody around him. He would trust nobody, he vowed. 
Patera felt that Frank Ganji was becoming a concern. He felt that Ganji was good people. He knew the womb he came from. He knew that Ganji's blood was mafioso, but what worried him about Ganji was his drug use, his drinking. He would talk to him. He would straighten him out. Meanwhile, Patera applied good, sound business sense to the money he was making. He had this dream of building a spectacular, fantastic, palatial home for himself, and to that end he had bought a townhouse in a nice residential area of Brooklyn known as Bay Ridge. It was on Ovington Avenue. From the corner it was a stone's throw from the Narrows and the Verrazano Bridge, the bridge that connected Brooklyn to Patera's cemetery. It was a three-story limestone property. He had the building completely gutted and was going to renovate it from the beams on up. He bought the best of everything for his home. He had marble brought in from Carrara, Italy. Patera planned to buy more property that he could rent and make money off. After the bust of Vincent Lorry and Yves LaSalle in Canada, Jim Hunt and Tom Geisel's reputation grew by leaps and bounds. They had brought down particularly bad, heinous fugitives, one a cop killer, one a made man, in addition to Guy Miro, the bad guy in Canada. They had also managed to recover two million dollars in cash. What was also startling and unusual was that they had managed to do all this in a matter of days. No long, drawn-out listening to wiretaps, no endless surveillance. Now, on the ground again in Brooklyn, Hunt and Geisel were back to the raw basics. They wanted Patera. They focused their energy on Patera. Whatever they asked for, whatever they wanted, was quickly given to them. A task force of some thirteen agents would soon be trailing Patera. Patera sensed their presence. Once in a while he spotted a pair of the agents, but for the most part they stayed out of sight. He had no idea from where they hailed, but he knew they were cops. He smelled the smoke, but he didn't see the fire that was slowly surrounding him, slowly enveloping him. By listening carefully to the jungle drums resonating through LCN, the DEA had come to believe that Patera was not only selling large amounts of narcotics, but that he was killing people at random on a regular basis and chopping up their bodies for ready disposal. Because of Patera's intimate involvement with LCN, the DEA decided to bring in the FBI. Normally, the DEA does not involve other agencies. They want to work cases the way they see them. They didn't want to argue or debate or fight over jurisdictional issues, and most importantly, the most important, who got the limelight. Likewise, Jim Hunt thought it would be a good idea to bring in the NYPD's organized crime unit. Perhaps more than any other governmental agency, they knew exactly what was going on in each family, who was who, what role everyone played. In that the task force now had two other agencies working hand-in-hand hand with the DEA, a virtual army was looking to nail Tommy Patera to the cross. However, even with all this manpower, even with all the technical assistance, it was very hard to put together an airtight case against Patera. Stymied, they watched Patera meet with Frankie Lino, Anthony Spiro, and other members of the upper echelon of the Bonanno family and go on walk and talks around Gravesend, speaking softly, Tommy most often covering his mouth as he spoke, making it impossible to record what he was saying. As one agent put it, the fucking guy looks like he saw us playing a harmonica. The weak link. Jim kept wondering about the weak link. Judy Hamowitz, of course, would be helpful, but a good lawyer could minimize the impact she had on the case. They needed more. They wanted blood, bodies, large amounts of cocaine in Patera's hands. Chapter 43 He's a Real Bad Dude Shlomo Mendelssohn, also known as Sammy, was your basic, low-life, drug-dealing, hustling, wannabe gangster. He was hooked up with the Israeli drug cartel that operated, for the most part, out of a slew of different lofts they owned in the West Thirties in Manhattan in the Flower District. He was tall, with high cheekbones, a strong jawline, and a thick head of straight black hair. He was so good-looking that he could have readily been a model or a leading man. 
He had stupidly gotten busted selling several ounces of cocaine to an undercover DEA agent and was now stewing in jail, pacing mad at the world. Jail wasn't for him. He'd find a way to get out of this trouble. He'd be clever, not like all the other fools around him. Shlomo Mendelssohn would find a way to get out of this mess. Shlomo was one of those people on the outside of the war on drugs, an on-again, off-again player who apparently never heard, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. What? He racked his brain. Could he give up? Who could he give up to get out of jail? His mind kept going back to one person, and one person only, the worst criminal he knew of. The Israelis he knew were drug dealers and weren't even in the same category as the person he was thinking of. He paced his cell like a caged rat. He knew if he could get his freedom, he'd ultimately be able to leave the country, go back to Israel, and there he would be insulated and protected. He was a Jew. The Jews protected their own. In Israel, he would blend in, become one of many. Having made up his mind that he would become an informer, he reached out to law enforcement. What Shlomo knew, what Shlomo had to say, was passed along and ended up on the desk of Jim Hunt. Hunt and federal prosecutor David Shapiro went to visit Shlomo in the Metropolitan Correction Center, MCC. David Shapiro was a thin, athletic man who stood about 5'9", a magna cum laude graduate of the State University of New York at Buffalo. He was thorough, likable, and had a profound understanding of the law and all its intricate nuances and shadings. Shapiro was regarded by Hunt and Geisel and most other agents and prosecutors as the best trial attorney in the Eastern District of New York. Neither Jim nor David Shapiro was impressed with Shlomo. Often, Jim came into contact with people who had gotten themselves into trouble and were now offering up information. Often they were, in plain English, full of shit. So whenever Jim met a person in prison looking to give up something, he was wary, skeptical. Doubtful, Jim Hunt listened to what Shlomo had to say. I know a real important guy in the Mafia who kills people. He's also a big drug dealer. I'll tell you everything I know. I'll testify in court. But I want to go home. I want to go back to Israel. If you do that for me, I'll give you this guy. Jim stared at him, and he stared back. Shlomo added conspiratorially as though he knew where the Holy Grail was hidden. He buries people. He kills them, cuts them up, and then buries them. Alarms went off inside Jim's head. Red lights began spinning. What's his name? Jim asked. Oh, ho, ho. you've got to first guarantee me. Hold on a minute. Nobody can guarantee you anything. If what you say is true, if you help us from the beginning to the end, we can recommend that you'll get a good deal. We can recommend that you be extradited to Israel. We don't make guarantees. Shlomo thought this over. He stared at the two government men. Resolutely, Jim stared back. He was not playing poker. What he said was true. His name is Tommy Peter, Shlomo said, and Jim felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Jim knew cases were frequently broken by information coming from the most unlikely of places, suddenly falling from the sky. Just the fact that Shlomo knew Patera's name was very interesting. Jim already knew that people in Patera's crew, Patera himself, were dealing with the Israeli mafia, buying drugs from them. They, both the DEA and the U.S. Justice Department, were interested. They reached out to Shlomo's attorneys, and a tentative deal was struck. Shlomo was allowed out of MCC, placed in the Federal Witness Protection Program. During debriefings, he told members of Group 33, Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel, what he knew about Tommy Patera. He said he had been in the home of Musa Alian when drug transactions went down, during which Patera bought big amounts of cocaine from Alian. He said, more importantly, more shockingly, that he was there when Tommy Patera killed Talal Siksik. Patera not only killed him, he said, but he then put the body in the bathtub, got undressed, stepped into the bathtub naked, and methodically cut the body into pieces. Sick fucking stuff! I never saw a thing like it, he said, shaking his head in sincere dismay.
These words fit together like the last pieces of an intricate puzzle. Not only did Jim believe what Shlomo had just said, but it so fit the modus operandi of Patera that Jim suddenly realized he was sitting with a man who had actually seen Patera cut a body into six pieces. This was not only shocking and eye-opening, but it might very well be the weak link, the Achilles heel they had been looking for. With his intelligent, icy blue-green eyes, Jim stared at Shlomo. He believed every word Shlomo said. Jim was an astute judge of character, especially characters coming from the street. He was so perceptive and adept at reading people, informers, that he could tell the truth from bullshit as readily as a lie detector. Jim had heard through the jungle grapevine that ran throughout all of Brooklyn that Patera was, in fact, cutting up people he killed. So, you were there, Jim asked. I was there, Shlomo confessed. Most horrible fucking thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And he did it with such ease. It didn't bother him at all. It was like he was just taking a, a shower. Step by step, I want you to tell me everything you saw, Jim said. And Shlomo ran down the whole evening he spent at Six Six House. When Shlomo finished, Jim said, This place you went to bury the body. Where was it? Staten Island, Shlomo said, fear of Patera creasing his brow, tightening the mini-muscles on his handsome face as he went on to explain how they wrapped Talal Siksik in plastic and put him in suitcases and brought him out to some desolate place in Staten Island. Like in the forest, Shlomo said. You think he could bring us to this place? Jim asked. I could sure try, Shlomo said. Chapter 44 Day Trip It was a hot day in late July. The humidity was ninety percent. There were no clouds to offer any reprieve from the searing July sun. Jim Hunt, Tommy Geisel, and Shlomo Mendelssohn were on a field trip of the most macabre, morbid kind. They were in search of a body farm, a mafia burial ground. Under the best of circumstances, had Shlomo known Staten Island, been reasonably familiar with it, he still would have had a hard time finding the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. When he had been there previously, it was nighttime. When he had been there before, adrenaline had been filling his body, and he wasn't paying attention to exactly how they got there and where they went. He had disconcerting, horrible images seared into his brain as though they had been branded but they were a series of disjointed images that had neither rhyme nor reason. That whole day, Jim and Tommy drove Shlomo all over Staten Island. They checked out most every forest, the places that would be good for burying a body. The more they looked, the more frustrated, anxious, and out of sorts Shlomo became. He had only seen Staten Island at one time. To him it was a foreign and distant place. He had no point of reference, did not know east from west or south from north. Both Jim and Tommy were becoming restless, tired. Though they didn't think Shlomo was lying, fabricating, looking to get himself out of trouble, they were disappointed by his lack of understanding of the area. At one point he said, Maybe, maybe it was in New Jersey, which really frustrated the two agents. It not only frustrated them, but it pissed them off. Be that as it may, all Shlomo did was lead them up one blind alley after another that whole day and night. However, just because Shlomo couldn't find this burial ground didn't mean it wasn't there, both Jim and Tommy believed. Hearing about the burial ground and seeing the fear that lived inside Shlomo motivated and drove the two agents on. They would not rest until Patera was nailed to the wall with long, sharp spikes. Luck it seemed that Tommy Patera of Gravesend, Brooklyn, had an inordinate amount of luck. He had been getting away with all kinds of crimes, murder, dismemberment. Jim Hunt and Tom Geisel were going to make sure that Patera's luck changed. Chapter 45 The Rock of Gibraltar Joe Dish Senatore was a career criminal. He had spent over thirty years of his life in jail, was an original tough guy. As a young man, 
He had been the head of the Persico gang in South Brooklyn, known as the South Brooklyn Boys. He was also Genovese Capo Joe Jinx's driver. He knew every mafioso in Brooklyn. People liked him. People respected him. He was old school, tough. Now Joe Dish was in the fall of life. He was graying, round-shouldered, not the energetic, tough dynamo he had once been, though Joe Dish still did what he was best at, impersonating a cop, a New York City detective. He had badges, he had guns, he had the walk, the talk. He began working with Patera's gang in 1988. Several times over the years, he had managed to get Patera's crew into the homes of drug dealers. He was so good that when they did one score, Patero was so pleased that he gave him a gold Rolex watch, which had been stolen from the victim. This is for you, for me. It's personal. It means something, Patera said, showing a rare, giving side. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tommy. Don't ever sell it. Of course not, Joe Dish said. Joe Dish did not like Patera. He felt he threw his weight around, bully-like. He knew that Patera cut up people in tubs. He had heard that Patera had killed a girl and cut her up. This flew against Mafia protocol. It was something a psychopath out of a B-horror movie would do, not a man of respect. The thought of doing something like that was anathema to him. Still, he'd keep his personal feelings to himself, inside. Over the years, in his life of crime, he had dealt with every type of unsavory character. He'd smile and nod when he saw Tommy, but inside he felt disdain, not warmth, not friendship, no kind of netherworld bond. The beginning of the end came when Patero went to Joe Dish to get him to help set up Willie Boy Johnson. Willie Boy Johnson and Joe Dish went back. They were good friends. There was a genuine bond between the two men. No way was he about to set up Johnson for the likes of Patera. When Joe Dish refused to help Patera, said no, there was a sea change between the two. Joe Dish believed it was just a matter of time before Patera killed him. The fact that he said no to such an important hit involving Eddie Lino and John Gotti himself was a death sentence. Number one, he had insulted Patera by saying no. Number two, he knew that when Willie Boy Johnson went down, it would be Patera's doing. As if that weren't enough, Joe had also refused to help in the rip-off of the cash stash house in Howard Beach, the murder of the two female counters. Perhaps, in days gone by, Joe Dish could have gone to somebody connected who would speak on his behalf, but the truly connected people Joe had known were either dead or in jail. He was now on the far fringes of organized crime, an old-timer who had outlived a culture that had fallen by the wayside. As it turned out, Joe Dish was not the old-time tough guy people perceived him to be. He had actually been a police informer for quite a few years. He was one of those individuals who adroitly played both sides of the fence. He had been sharing information with ATF Special Agent Billy Fredericks periodically, giving him information about crimes he was involved in, about crimes he knew of. Essentially, what Joe Dish was doing was playing both ends against the middle. This was another reason why he decided to tell all, tell what he knew about not only Patera's crew, but Patera himself. He was the man Jim Hunt, Tom Geisel, and Group 33 had been looking for, the door that would open into the world of Tommy Karate Patera. He'd become the crack in the Rock of Gibraltar that was the visage Tommy Patera offered to the world. In Joe Dish's mind, he was striking first. In Joe Dish's mind, he would prevail over Patera because he had the sense to pull the trigger first. Joe Dish's idea, however, of pulling the trigger had nothing to do with a gun. There was no way in hell he would try to kill Patera with a gun or knife or bomb. The only way he could get to Patera, he knew, was through law enforcement, by turning the tables. Joe Dish called his contact and friend Billy Fredericks and asked for a meeting. Billy Fredericks was a good friend of Jim Hunt's. They had worked together on several cases. He was a Vietnam vet, a robust man with black hair and a twitch in his right eye. He was the type of man who was naturally fearless. He didn't like people in the Mafia. 
He thought they were backstabbing punks. He had little respect for them. Fact is that all he had for them was animus. When he heard what Joe Dish had to say, he immediately called Jim Hunt. He knew Jim Hunt had been working on the Patera task force. When Jim Hunt received the call at DEA headquarters, he said he'd be happy to meet with Joe Dish. In fact, he had seen Joe Dish at the Just Us bar and knew who he was. They met in the parking lot of a shopping center in Staten Island. Jim got into Billy Fredericks's car. Joe Dish was in the back. Introductions were made. They shook hands. Shoppers passed on the left and right. Joe Dish began to tell his story. It was an interesting tale that immediately drew Jim Hunt in, but there wasn't the kind of proof, solid and irrefutable, that would hold up in a court of law. The crimes Joe Dish described were, as such, minor. They wanted Patera for more, for murder. They wanted him for heavy-duty drug dealing. What Joe Dish was offering up was neither of those things. Joe Dish would, however, Jim Hunt knew, be a good witness, surely bolster the case against Patera. When Jim asked Joe Dish what crimes he was convicted of, there was a long list involving all sorts of larcenies, forgeries, etc. You ever commit a murder? Jim Hunt asked, and Joe Dish told him that he had been just recently involved in a killing. He said it was a long, convoluted story, but it involved him and another guy named Jack McInerney going to rip off the partner of someone who owed them money. This individual's name was David Braun, and he ended up resisting, escaping from his bindings, and running out of the door of his house. Joe's partner, Jack McInerney, shot him several times as he ran. I felt terrible about it. I didn't want the kid to die. It was just one of those things, one of those spur-of-the-moment things. I only went there to get what was due me. I swear, I never thought about killing him, Joe Dish said. This, Jim Hunt knew, could put a damper on Joe Dish's viability as a witness, but he had seen far worse characters used successfully, quite brilliantly, to put mafiosi away. Immediately, Jim Hunt asked Joe Dish if he'd wear a wire in order to get Tommy Patera to start incriminating himself in different crimes. Joe Dish said Tommy was paranoid, suspicious of everyone. But I'll try. Over the coming days and weeks and months, Joe Dish tried to get Patera on tape talking about crime, but to no avail. It got to the point where he didn't want to be around Patera, because he felt that at any moment he, Patera, would pull a gun out and kill him. However, with the guidance of Jim and Tommy Geisel, Joe Dish was wired up and let loose on all the many players in Patera's mob. Dish had the gift of gab, was a consummate actor, a born con man. He was completely above reproach. Without much effort at all, Joe Dish managed to get Lorenzo Modica, the man who killed the two Colombians, Manny Maya, Frank Martini, Michael Cassis, and Patera associate Jimmy February, among others, talking freely and openly and incriminatingly about their crimes. More importantly, Joe Dish got them to talk about the role Patera played in a laundry list of crimes, murders and rip-offs and drug dealing. Chapter 46 The Meat Wagon It is amazingly difficult for the government to bug the car of a citizen. Even if that citizen is a notorious bad guy, even if that citizen is a mafioso killer, even if that citizen is a major drug dealer. Contrary to common belief, the government does not have unlimited power to eavesdrop on the American people. There are mandates, protocols, stringent rules and regulations that must be followed. Jim and Tom and Group 33 were intent upon adding to the growing amount of evidence piling up against Patera, Shlomo Mendelssohn, and Joe Dish Senatore. They wanted to get a bug in the car that he recently started driving, a black 1984 Oldsmobile. With the help of Justice Department attorney David Shapiro, papers were drawn up to get a listening device planted in the Oldsmobile. The affidavit was over an inch thick, and laid out the reasons why the government wanted the bug. In this case, what Shlomo Mendelssohn and Joe Dish had told the government and what they had learned via other informants was reason enough to demand the right to install a listening device. Using the VIN number of the Oldsmobile, 
which Patera had dubbed the Meat Wagon, and Group 33 had started calling it as a result. Jim went to the dealer who sold the car and was able to, with the help of court papers, get a duplicate of its key. Their plan was to take the car to a place where a listening device could be cleverly installed and return it from where they had taken it. On the night they were going to pull this off, a half-dozen agents were involved. They were tracking Patera from early evening to well after midnight, hoping he'd park the car and finally go to sleep. While he slept, they would quickly do what needed to be done. Patera was in his bar, the Just Us bar, the agents patiently waiting outside in an unmarked van and in Jim's black Cadillac. Hour after hour passed, and Patera did not come outside. Finally, near four o'clock in the morning, he exited with a couple of cronies in tow, and they continued to talk outside. Agent Dave Torresinta thought Patero was so pale that he truly looked like a vampire. Torresinta was, in a sense, typical of DEA agents, and that he had been in law enforcement in Dover, New Hampshire, but wanted more. He wanted to be part of the war on drugs, go up against the most cunning and dangerous criminals in the country. Like all the members of the Patera Task Force, Dave was highly dedicated, highly motivated, would not rest until he knew the job was done and done well. It was Dave who was taking most of the clandestine photographs of Patera and the Bonanno people. Dave and the others watched Patera grab the lower rungs of a fire escape and effortlessly do chins. He was obviously in good shape, they noted. Finally, near dawn, Patera left Avenue S, parked his car near where he lived, and went upstairs as Brooklynites headed to work, went from one end of the borough to the other. Moving swiftly, the DEA agents absconded with the car, parking a government car in its place. They took it to the tech people nearby, and a bug was installed. They returned the Oldsmobile to the spot where Patera parked it. A job, they thought, well done. Unfortunately, however, the bug malfunctioned, and all their efforts were for naught. It seemed Patera's luck was still, to a degree, intact. Chapter 47 Lion's Share both Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel knew that Manny Mayo was a drug dealer, that he worked with Patera. They were still looking for concrete proof, evidence, a way to turn Mayo against Patera. It was Joe Dish who revealed to Hunt and Geisel just how tight Manny and Patera were, tight enough that Manny Mayo and his garage could be used to undo Patera. This was the garage where people from all the different crime families brought their cars to be detailed, cleaned up after a murder. Manny was an average size man with short hair, dark skin, and was muscular. He was friends with a very successful active pot dealer named Michael Harrigan from Ozone Park, Queens. Harrigan had an excellent grass contact in Texas. He and his associates would actually fly down, buy suitcases, fill them up with hundreds of pounds of pot, and audaciously check the luggage on flights bound back to New York, according to Joe Dish. In that this was many years before 9-11 and law enforcement were acting like wide-eyed innocents, it was an easy task to fly hundreds of pounds of marijuana from Texas to New York on domestic flights. Foreign flights, however, were another issue altogether. The luggage coming in from Italy, Turkey, Afghanistan was, as a matter of course, checked for narcotics. Be that as it may, luggage on domestic flights was not scrutinized as such. Like this, Mike Harrigan and his associates were able to bring large amounts of grass in from Texas as though it were something as innocent and innocuous as clothing. They were making a fortune, hundreds of thousands of dollars every month. Harrigan had been working under the umbrella of John Gotti, Jr., the son of John Gotti, Sr. People in the know say that John Gotti, Jr. did not have the street acumen that his father did, in that this business between John Gotti, Jr. and his associates was a narcotics operation this was all off the books. It had to be. Mike Harrigan did not like Gotti Jr. or any of his people. He felt they were all over the top, loud and vulgar, in-your-face gangsters. He felt that dealing with them, being associated with them, would eventually cause trouble. The trouble began when Michael Harrigan's ill feelings toward Gotti Jr. and company spilled over. He didn't want to be involved with them anymore. He vehemently complained to Manny Mayo. 
Maya immediately suggested that they go to Tommy Patera, that Patera would welcome him with open arms, that Patera would protect him, that Patera wasn't afraid of anybody, least of all John Gotti, Jr. With that, Maya set up a sit-down between himself, Patera, and Michael Harrigan. Patera well knew the fortune that could be made with a good pot business. He knew, too, that because it involved drugs, he could freely co-opt the enterprise away from John Gotti, Jr. with little problem. There would not be any kind of sit-down regarding this matter, particularly in light of the fact that John Gotti, Sr. could not come to bat for his son over a matter that involved pot. Patera played his cards with potent indifference to Gotti and company. Everyone knew, Patera knew, that he was a killer. He was not just the man of respect, not just made, he was an assassin. He was the man who shot down Willie Boy Johnson. He was the man who cut up what was left of his enemies and adversaries and cleverly disposed of them somewhere out in the wilds of Staten Island and Long Island. Now he'd be happy to be in a pissing contest with John Gotti, Jr. Michael Harrigan was between a rock and a hard place. He was pleased to be away from Gotti and his associates, pleased to be working with Patera now, but John Gotti, Jr. was naturally irritated and angry. Gotti, Jr. felt he was being disrespected, was losing a lot of money. He felt, too, that something he set up and nurtured was arbitrarily, unfairly, being taken away from him. Who the fuck does this Patera think he is, were words heard frequently coming out of John Jr.'s mouth. John Jr. could not go to his father about this, as Patera knew. What he could do was demand a sit-down with Tommy Patera. This sit-down would be like a quivering chihuahua sitting down with a muscular Doberman pincher. The Doberman was Patera. At the sit-down, John Gotti Jr. showed up with an Albanian associate, named Johnny Alita. Patera had Michael Harrigan with him. Harrigan was there because he had a vested interest in the outcome. Elita was an unknown guy who had no legitimate right to be there. Patera immediately let his feelings be known. He didn't want Elita there. Offhandedly, somewhat facetiously, Gotti bragged that Elita had killed six people. Patera disdainfully snorted that he had killed over sixty people in a way of qualifying him justifying his presence. Because both John Gotti Jr. and Patera were made, Patera had every right to demand that Alita leave, to throw Alita the fuck out the door, which is exactly what he did. Patera knew that no matter how you cut it, he had the upper hand, provided that he stayed within the confines and dictates of mafia protocol. He could not, as an example, slap John Jr. He could not curse at him. He had to treat him with respect. That certainly did not hold true for Johnny Alita. When Patera sat down and settled himself, calmed down somewhat, he told Gotti Jr. that Michael Harrigan now worked for him, that he was with him, and that John Jr. could go tell his father if he wanted. Patera had outmaneuvered him with ease. Like this, the matter was resolved in favor of Patera, and thus the pot business was wholly his. He came, he saw, he conquered. Naturally enough, Patera turned to Billy Bright to unload the pot. Bright had been selling weight of marijuana for many years. With Bright's connections, all the pot they brought up from Texas was quickly sold, turned into hard, cold cash. Patera, Billy Bright, and Michael Harrigan made money hand over fist. Of course, no matter how you cut it, Patera always got the lion's share. Everything was going smoothly, with the precision of a fine Swiss watch, until Greg Ryder, a particularly loud and vulgar associate of Gotti Jr., came to Michael Harrigan and began making waves. Greg Ryder was a muscular tough guy who wore gold chains and drove a souped-up red Corvette. He felt that a good thing had been taken away from him unfairly, that something he developed with Michael and Gotti Jr. and Alita had been usurped, suddenly gone with the wind. He went and found Michael and said, Look, what you're doing here is very unfair. I know you're with Patera now. Everyone knows who Patera is. Everyone is afraid of him. But there's a basic right and wrong, and what you're doing here is wrong. This was our thing, man. We made it happen. Michael, we're friends. How could you do this? Writer's words fell on deaf ears. 
No matter how you cut it, Harrigan could not go back to the way things were. Patera had his sharp talons deep into their business, and there would be no turning back. Harrigan well knew that if he betrayed Patera, if he lied to him, he'd be dead. He, like everyone else, had heard about Patera's burial ground, that he cut people up, that he got naked and got into tubs with people and cut off their arms and legs and heads. No, Michael Harrigan would not in any shape, manner, or form undermine Patera's role in their pot business. Though Greg Ryder did not say anything overtly offensive to Michael Harrigan, he had opened the Pandora's box that would release something ugly and dreadful. The following evening, Michael Harrigan sought out Tommy Patera and found him at the Just Us. They went outside and walked along Avenue S. As they walked, DEA agents surreptitiously observed them, took pictures of them. Michael explained to Patera that Greg Reiter had come to see him, had said that what he was doing was unfair. With that, Patera said, Why don't you do this? Set up a meeting with him, and I'll come. Okay, Harrigan replied, unsure where this would go, apprehensive. After all, Greg Reiter had a right to be unhappy. Not believing Patera would cause Greg any harm, that he was just going to set him straight, perhaps warn him, Michael reached out to Greg and said he would like to talk to him further. They agreed to meet in a parking lot in Nassau County, Long Island. It was after 11 p.m. when they finally met. There were few people about. It was a cold night. Chilled winds with long, bony fingers tore through the wide-open expanse of the parking lot unchallenged, unbridled, mean. When Patera arrived, he had Billy Bright with him. Bright was there as a backup gun for Patera. In that Bright was a pot dealer, partners with Patera in the pot business, he had a vested interest in what was about to occur. Patera patiently, calmly explained to Michael that Greg Ryder had to go, that sooner or later he'd become a problem, that right now was the time to nip it in the bud. Considering the amount of money involved, that it was millions of dollars, Michael Harrigan knew Patera was right. Greg could very well, as the next step, look to kill both Michael and Patera. Patera said, When he pulls up, just act normal. Just act normal. Leave it all up to me. And with that, Greg drove into the parking lot, ensconced in his red Corvette, comfortable and confident, and pulled up to where Mike Harrigan and Bright and Patera were standing. Serious-faced, he pulled to a stop and began to get out of the car. With shocking speed, Patera moved toward him, raised a sawed-off shotgun that seemed to come out of nowhere, as if by magic, and fired. The shotgun sounded like a cannon, a thunderous roar. The double-aught buck blew much of Ryder's face, neck, and collarbone into oblivion. What was left of his face was a sorrowful sight. With what was left of his countenance, he looked at Michael Harrigan and said in a weak voice, with blood bubbling from his mouth, most of his teeth missing, I thought we were friends. If we were friends, Michael Harrigan said, I wouldn't need him. As he said this, he pointed to Patera, as though he was some kind of robotic killing machine, not a human being. Ryder's body was placed in the trunk of Harrigan's car. There were two shovels there already. Patera, Bright, and Harrigan drove to a wildlife sanctuary in Nassau County, another location that Patera used to get rid of bodies. By the time they arrived, it was close to one in the morning. A cold, frigid March wind tore through bramble and bush and trees. The branches looked like bare arthritic fingers quivering and shaking in the winds hurrying off the nearby Atlantic. Because it was March, digging was hard and arduous, though with the three of them, each a strong, powerful man, the hole was done and the body was dumped inside of it. They covered the hole, patted the ground down carefully, and left. Michael Harrigan would never forget how quickly and with what ease Patera had taken Greg Ryder's life. He had never seen anything like it. Not even in a movie had he seen the likes of Tommy Karate Patera in action. Though he was clearly associated with Patera, a business partner of Patera's, he had come to loathe him. Over and over again he had heard stories of how Patera killed people who one day were his friends, one day were his partners, and the next day they were dead as a doornail, murdered by Patera. He well knew that Patera had killed Phyllis Birdie, 
had cut her into six pieces and buried her. He also knew about Patera's private cemetery on Staten Island. Slowly, Harrigan began to distance himself from Patera. Whatever money he could earn via Patera was not worth the creeps Patera gave him, was not worth the nightmares. It didn't take long for Patera to sense and realize that Harrigan was putting space between the two of them. Patera sent out word that he wanted to meet with Harrigan, to no avail. Without notice, Patera showed up at the Canarsie beauty parlor where Harrigan's wife, Anna, worked. She was an attractive brunette who knew nothing about the world of crime her husband was involved in. However, she knew Patera had met him in passing several times. Patera asked Anna about her husband, why he stopped coming around, why he didn't return phone calls. He seemed out of sorts, morose. Anna did not have the answers to Patera's questions. Not knowing any better, not being a part of that world, she called up her husband, got him on the phone, and handed it over to Patera. Patera asked Harrigan where he'd been, why he'd stopped coming around. Harrigan said he'd been busy, that his mother hadn't been feeling well, that he'd come to Brooklyn to see him ASAP. With that, polite and smiling, Patera thanked Anna and left the shop, Anna still on the phone with her husband. Why the hell did you do that? Why'd you put me on the phone with him? Why? Did I do something wrong? Yes, you did something wrong. I'm not returning the guy's calls because I don't want to talk to him. He seems so... He seemed lonely, like he has no friends. Anna, he has no friends because he killed them all, Harrigan said, with an intensity and sincerity that unsettled his wife. Michael Harrigan did not like Patera going around his wife. Fact is, he hated it. Patera had no fucking right to bother Anna. But what, what could he do about it? Nothing, if he wanted to stay alive, he knew. Though he didn't quite know it yet, Michael Harrigan's days were numbered. Chapter 48 DUI The thin line between nightmares while sleeping and nightmares while awake, for Frank Ganji, had become blurred indistinguishable. Tall and thin and beak-faced, Ganji was inexorably, inevitably, speeding toward a granite wall. The murder of Phyllis Birdie and how Patera had cut her up in front of him, the smell of her blood, the purple, rancid odor of her exposed organs, had never left him, particularly the sight of her head on the edge of the tub, her hair stiff with drying blood, her lips askew, frozen, in a perpetual scream. One eye had been open, and the eyeball stared off to the left, unseeing and unknowing. The images stayed inside his brain and soul, and had grown and grown like a particularly vicious malignant cancer, becoming more and more grotesque, to the point that he felt as if he were living in a nightmare, a Coney Island house of horrors that, for him, had become a tangible reality. Frank Ganji had never been cut out for the life. He didn't have the heart, fortitude, necessary calluses. True, he had come from the streets, knew the streets, but he was not cut out to be a true mafioso, like his father, his cousins, and uncles. The only way Frank was able to get through the day, the night, was with the help of cocaine and alcohol. They became his best friends. The alcohol he used to come down, to be able to sleep, he was now drinking an average of two bottles of whiskey a day. He lost track of how much coke he was doing. On the night of April 10, 1990, as Joe Dish tried, with Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel encouraging him, advising him, to find a way to set up Tommy Patera unsuccessfully, Frank Ganji was in his car driving on Bay 50th Street, stoned out of his mind. More than high on coke, he was drunk. In that Frank was comfortable around women, and women were comfortable around him, he was often in the company of different females, as well as the woman with whom he was living, Sophia. This night was no exception. He had two guidettes with him. One talked like Rocky Balboa, and the other like a Brooklyn dock worker. This night, Ganji was so stoned he was weaving back and forth as he went. His driving was so bad, erratic, and sloppy, that it was patently obvious to anyone who saw him that he was drunk. 
When he went through a red light at Bay 50th and Cropsey, a squad car was suddenly behind him, red lights spinning. Two cops were soon beside him, asking for his license and registration, unfriendly, unhappy, obviously aware that he was inebriated. They made him get out of the car. He reeked of alcohol. He tried to talk his way out of a ticket. He offered them money. Before he knew it, he was under arrest, handcuffed, and in the back of a police car headed toward the 60th precinct near Coney Island. He was booked and put in a stinking, graffiti-covered holding pen. When Ganji was again confronted with the hardcore reality of steel bars, the smells and sights of jail, something in him began to change, morph, slowly evolve. He paced back and forth. He hated his life. He hated what he had become. He hated what had happened to Phyllis Birdie. I could have stopped it. I could have done something. Instead, what I did is I brought him to her. There, in the bullpen at Coney Island, Frank Ganji made up his mind to make a life change. He was going to purge himself, wholly and irreversibly. The detective who arrested him for the Gouvernero murder, Billy Tomasulo, had been kind and professional. Ganji now reached out to him, asked the desk sergeant to call Detective Tomasulo. He said he had a lot to say, and he had to talk to Detective Tomasulo. At first, the desk sergeant took it lightly. Yeah, okay, I'll see what I can do, he said dismissively. No, I'm serious. This is about murders, about terrible murders, about people being cut up. Get him here, Ganji said. Ganji's demeanor, the imperativeness of his words, the urgency of his tone, told the desk sergeant that something serious was afoot. He walked away, began making phone calls. NYPD Detective Billy Tomasulo was a hard-boiled cop from the mean streets of Brooklyn. He was smart, tough, though he was always a gentleman, courteous and polite. When he first arrested Ganji in connection with the murder of Gouvernero, he was fair. He treated him so fairly that Ganji came away liking him even though he had locked him up. Tomasulo had pretty much seen it all. Murders, rapes, mutilations, you name it, he saw it, experienced it, was a part of it. This being said, Billy Tomasulo was not ready for what was about to come out of Frank Ganji's mouth. By the time Tomasulo reached the cell Ganji was being kept in, Ganji had sobered up quite a bit. He was more resolute than ever about what he was going to do. When Ganji said the name Tommy Patera, Tomasulo immediately knew whom he was talking about. He, like most everyone else in law enforcement, had his ear to the ground and had heard about Patera and what he'd been doing. His interest was piqued. He was tired had had a long day, but suddenly was wide awake. In that Ganji was a consummate storyteller with a very good memory for details, times, names, places, he painted a thorough picture of what Patera was about, not only of the crimes he had committed, but ones Ganji had committed with him. Ganji was readily admitting to murder and the role he played in the killing of Phyllis Birdie. Of course, Detective Tomasulo knew about Phyllis Birdie, her family had been in the Coney Island precinct numerous times over the last several years. He was so familiar with her case, her disappearance, that he had a clear picture of what she looked like in his mind from the photographs the family had given him. Ganji became visibly unhinged when he talked about Phyllis. The tough guy exterior melted away. He began to cry. His hands shook. He stared off into the distance, seeing images so horrible his mind tried to deny them push them away, bury them deeper than they already were buried. An impossibility. Ganji was branded for life. He told Detective Tomasulo about the night Phyllis died, meeting at the after-hours club, going to his house, blowing coke and partying, running out of coke. He explained that he had called Musa Alian and that he and Phyllis had headed into the city for more drugs. There they began to smoke cocaine, and minutes quickly slipped into hours. Time, when high on cocaine, moves with shocking celerity. He explained how Patera called, how he answered the phone, how Patera came rushing over with Richie David and Kojak Jatino. Ganji said, When Patera walked in, he said, Where is she? I indicated the bedroom. 
He walked into the room carrying a gun with a silencer on it, opened the door, and shot her a couple of times. Then he took her in the bathtub and got his knives and things, and he slowly cut her up. As Ganji spoke, he chain-smoked. His hands shook more and more as though he was freezing. He unsuccessfully fought back tears. He went on to describe how Phyllis's head was left on the edge of the tub, how the lifeless eye stared at him. This is all too much for me. This is something I never wanted to get involved in or see. This guy is a fucking monster. A fucking monster, Ganji repeated, as though talking to himself, again seeing the horror before him. Now, at this point, other detectives were there, quietly listening to Ganji's cathartic cleansing of his soul, purging himself of his guilt. Now he described the killings of Talal Siksik, Marek Kucharski, and Joey Balzano, how he had gone out to the burial site in Staten Island and buried Marek Kucharski at the behest of Patera. Did you find it? Detective Tomasulo asked. Did you find it again? Yeah. Yeah, I could find it again, Ganji said. Detective Tomasulo knew this was big. He had known the DEA and FBI were trailing Patera, that they were very interested in him, though they were having difficulty securing viable evidence that would hold up in a court of law, substantial and irreversible. Detective Tomasulo would have bet his house that Ganji was telling the truth. Every nuance, the way his face moved, the tears in his eyes, all spoke of truth. Detective Tomasulo knew what he had to do next, and that was contact Jim Hunt and the DEA. He went to a phone, took out Jim Hunt's card, and dialed his number. Thus, the crack in the Rock of Gibraltar widened a bit more. Jim answered the phone. Boy, do I have news for you, Jim, Detective Tomasulo said. Chapter 49 Revelations when Jim Hunt heard that Patera confidant Frank Ganji was telling all, spilling the beans, crying as he did so, he was elated. This is what he, Tommy Geisel, and David Shapiro had been waiting for. This is what some of the agents involved in the task force had been praying for. They all knew Ganji was not only close to Patera, but involved with Patera on numerous levels. They had seen him go in and out of the Just Us, they had seen him in Patera's company many times over. They knew he had lived with Judy Hamowitz for a while. They had often seen him riding around Gravesend and Bensonhurst and Coney Island and Diker Heights. Mafiadom. They also knew who his uncle, father, and cousins were. Hunt and Shapiro got in the car and sped over to the 60th precinct in Coney Island. Ganji was in sorry shape. He was pale with dark circles under his eyes. His hair was a mess. He was smoking a cigarette and coughing all the while. A strange odor came from him. It was not B.O. It was something else. Open-minded, willing to let Ganji talk to his heart's content, Hunt and Shapiro and Detective Tomasulo sat down in a quiet corner of the squad room and listened as he systematically and succinctly laid it out. What he had to say had been bottled up so long that he was like a pressure cooker. Words poured out of him. Names, dates, times, places, sights, sounds in a kinetic, well-informed stream of crimes and murders and larcenies. Again, he talked about the murder of Phyllis Birdie. He then discussed in detail the other killings he had been a part of, privy to, committed himself. Of all the things that Ganji spoke about, what interested the agents the most, unquestionably, was Patera's burial grounds. Ganji said that he knew where the one in Staten Island was. This was the one Jim had been looking for with Israeli drug dealer Shlomo almost a year earlier. Ganji went on to say, however, that he believed there were more burial grounds than the one he knew of, that there was one out on the flatlands in Brooklyn and another on Long Island in Nassau County. Wanting to see if Ganji would put his money where his mouth was, if he was really telling the truth, Jim asked for him to take them, take them all, to the bird sanctuary. Yeah, I'll take you, Ganji said, more relaxed, now a man with a mission. Under the auspices of the Federal Prosecutor's Office, 
the DEA took physical control of Frank Ganji. They next hustled him out to a hotel near LaGuardia Airport. He was on the verge of being placed in the Federal Witness Protection Program. At the hotel, as per agreements between the DEA and the Brooklyn DA's office, Frank Ganji began to be thoroughly debriefed by the government. The Brooklyn DA's office got involved because Ganji had first spoken to NYPD detectives. Over and over again, he reiterated about how truly, honestly dangerous Tommy Patera was. They, the DEA, Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel, promised they'd put him in the witness protection program. My concern, Ganji said, is my family, Sophia, the kids, you gotta protect them. We will, Jim said, I promise you. Ganji had every right in the world to be worried about his wife, Sophia. After Ganji had been gone several days, Tommy Patera became concerned. He kept calling Ganji without response. He sent people to Ganji's house to no avail. Patera's concern grew. Word spread around the Patera camp that Ganji might have turned. Others said that he had been murdered and dumped somewhere. People all over Gravesend and Bensonhurst scratched their heads and wondered where Frank Ganji was. On the morning of May 7th, Ganji's common-law wife, Sophia Abia, was in a diner on Cropsey Avenue. Earlier, a mutual friend of hers and Frank's, Patty Skifo, had called the house and asked Sophia to meet at the Shorehaven Luncheonette. Patty Girl was also intimately close to Tommy Patera. As much as Frank could love anyone, considering his alcohol and drug abuse, he loved Sophia Abia. He had made her children his children, though he had not officially adopted them. At the time of his arrest, he had several different apartments that he used to stash drugs and bed other women, but for the most part he lived with Sophia. Theirs was a strange relationship because of his drug abuse. He didn't come home for days at a time. When he did come home, he was in sorry shape. With him, life was a roller coaster, but Sophia loved him for better or worse and was dedicated to him. Sophia had once been a vivacious, attractive woman, but the trials and tribulations of life as she had known it, of being married to Frank Ganji, had taken a toll on her. She was now overweight, worn and weathered beyond her years. The luncheonette was crowded. Sophia and Patty Girl took a table toward the back of the place. As they began eating, the door opened, and in walked Tommy Patera all gloom and doom. He moved straight to their table. Without being invited, he sat down. Sophia's stomach knotted. She paled somewhat. Like most everyone in Brooklyn, Sophia was frightened of Tommy. Immediately, Patera asked about Ganji. Had she heard from him? Did she know where he was? When was the last time she spoke to him? Sophia, knowing what was in the wind, knowing Frank was talking to the government, cooperating with law enforcement, said she had not heard from him in quite a while, that the last she heard from him he was going to California. "'California?' Patera asked, incredulous, his icy cold blue-gray eyes cutting into her. "'Yes, California,' she repeated. She ate a bit of her lunch, thinking that Patty Girl had set her up, thinking that Patty Girl had put her in a precarious situation. At that moment, Patera was paged. He used a payphone in the luncheonette, he came back to the table and asked more questions about Ganji, and without rhyme or reason, began discussing the pros and cons of the Federal Witness Protection Program, particularly disconcerting for Sophia. He seemed to know exactly what was going on. This unsettled and frightened Sophia even more. He said, Is Frank in the Witness Protection Program? Do you know? I don't know. I know what I told you, she said. Patera soon got up, went outside, and quickly returned with the always foreboding, menacing Kojak, thick and muscular, bold, with the face of an angry pit bull. He, Patera, now introduced Kojak to Sophia, saying she was Ganji's wife. Sophia wasn't sure why Patera was doing this, but she didn't like any of it. It frightened her. She wanted to get away from them. Patera and Kojak soon left as abruptly as they had come. Sophia didn't want to be in Patty's company anymore. 
She called for the check. Patty insisted on paying it. Did you set me up, Patty? How do you mean? Patty asked. You know exactly how I mean, Sophia said. And with that, Sophia turned, worried for her children, worried for herself, worried for Frank Ganji. She went straight home, concerned about being followed. At the house, Sophia reached out to the office of the DEA. Her fear, what had happened, was immediately passed on to Frank. Immediately, Ganji complained to Jim Hunt. Soon after, heavily armed DEA agents picked up Sophia and the children and brought them to the hotel to be with Frank. Jim was a hardcore, seasoned cop, not a social worker, but he came to believe that Ganji was more or less a man who had been in the wrong place at the wrong time and had gotten caught up in his surroundings. Jim came to view Ganji as essentially a nice guy who made bad decisions. He believed he was not a stone-cold killer. He knew that he had a conscience, remorse. For the most part, Frank and Sophia had an on-again, off-again relationship. He had been caught up in a merry-go-round of cocaine and alcohol and women. Now that he was sober, he was himself. Sober, he wanted to be near his family. Sober, he wanted to be with his wife. Sober, Frank Ganji was a different man. He was soft-spoken, reasonable, willing to listen. He felt like he had gotten a 2,000-pound load off his shoulders by purging himself. Now Frank Ganji was becoming who he really was. Slowly, he was becoming the man he should have been. Tommy Patera was not a stupid man. As well as being particularly observant, street-smart, and well-read, he had developed and ultimately honed a sixth sense as sharp as any scalpel. Now this sixth sense, as well as all his other senses, told him that there was trouble in the wind, that Frank Ganji had become an informer. He turned over in his mind what to do, how to combat this rat. Naturally enough, he thought about abducting Sophia. Ultimately, for now, he decided against that. He put out word to all his people to find Frank Ganji, to kill Frank Ganji. It was not just the Bonanno family that would heed this call. It was all the members in all the families, as well as the associates of each of the families. Soon, Several thousand men were looking for Ganji, were sniffing the air, were listening to the drums that demanded Ganji's head be brought to Patera on a silver platter. Back at DEA headquarters, sitting at a large, oval-shaped table, black and white photographs of Patera's surveillance on pinboards to the right of the table, which included many soldiers and capos in the Bonanno family, photos of Overstreets and Just Us, group. 33 strategized with the help of federal prosecutor David Shapiro. They discussed when to pick up Patera. Before they moved, they wanted to make sure all their ducks were in a row, eyes dotted, T's crossed. They wanted to verify what Ganji had said. In short, they were intent upon putting together a rock-solid case. Toward that end, David Shapiro, smart and cagey, a man who knew his way around a courtroom as well as his own desk, put together a war plan. What they all agreed on was to keep Patera off guard. That is, not let him get wind of the law enforcement firestorm slowly enveloping him. Shapiro and the agents discussed going out to the sanctuary in great detail. They knew that once they did that, Patera would find out and be on guard, get rid of evidence, perhaps even go on the lam. Everyone there knew the Bananos were deeply entrenched in Canada, had numerous contacts in Canada, and Bonanno star Tommy Patera could very well disappear into the wide expanses between the Canadian borders, get lost among its various peoples, cultures, languages. This was a very realistic concern. After all, they had just picked up Bonanno fugitive Vincenzo Lori in Canada. Bonanno boss Carmine Galante had lived in Canada for many years while he set up the Sicilian-Canadian-U.S. heroin conduits. As the days went on and the DEA put together an airtight case against a seemingly unknowing, unaware Patera, the crack in the Rock of Gibraltar grew deeper and wider. Patera knew Frank Ganji's drinking, his drug abuse, made him a large neon deficit 
Again, he demanded of his people, find fucking Ganji, to no avail. It was as though Ganji had been swallowed up by the earth, sucked into a pit of quicksand. Now that the DEA had a full picture of who Patero was, names and places and times, who, what, when, where, and why, the ghoul he was, they kept a very close watch on him. They would not let him get away. Over the years, numerous mafiosi had taken it on the lamb when the time came for them to face the music. They were wealthy. They were fearless. They were, for the most part, the type of men who would readily go to a foreign place and make a new life for themselves. As the evidence the DEA, NYPD, and FBI mounted against Patera was put together, as the wheels of justice methodically turned, as the pros and cons of different witnesses and pieces of evidence were debated, it was decided that it was time to get Patera. It was time to act. By now it was June 3, 1990. They couldn't take the chance of him fleeing, disappearing into the wilds of Canada, its sophisticated urban cities or secretive streets and avenues, or the hills and farms of Sicily. No, it was time to act. It was time to cut off Tommy Patera's legs. That morning, Patera had volunteered to drive his girlfriend Barbara to visit her son. Apparently, the boy had not taken any of Patera's many lectures seriously. He had gotten arrested for attempted murder and was now sitting forlorn and angry in the Brooklyn House of Detention on Atlantic Avenue. For Tommy Karate Patera, the clock was ticking. When he left his house that morning, he had no idea that there were some fifteen heavily armed law enforcement professionals trailing him, watching him, getting ready to pounce. It had been a long, drawn-out case, and they were all glad it was finally coming to fruition, especially Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel and Group 33. It was decided that Jim and Tommy would actually put the cuffs on Patera, bring him down. After all, they had initiated the case. It was a hot day. The skies over Brooklyn were blue and unblemished. It was so warm that Jim and Tommy Geisel were forced to keep the air conditioner on in the car. Both Jim and Tommy had been waiting for this moment for many months now. They had come to hate Patera, what he did, what he represented, who he was. After Patera dropped Barbara off, he headed east on Atlantic Avenue. This part of Atlantic Avenue had become a Middle Eastern enclave. Here there were crowded Middle Eastern restaurants and sweet-smelling food shops on both sides of the busy street. The task force decided to move. It was time to break open the Rock of Gibraltar. Patera was stuck in traffic. Car horns sounded. People walking the streets did so listlessly and slowly. Jim and Tommy pulled their car up just behind Patera. They had decided when the moment came to arrest him, they would bang the back of his car, get out with lightning speed, guns drawn, their badges clearly visible, hanging from chains around their necks. When there was a bus in front of Patera, and he was boxed in, they made their move. Hunt accelerated, bang, and rear-ended Patera's car. Surprised, caught off guard, Patera, believing a hit was about to take place, thinking he was going to get murdered, ducked, looking to avoid bullets, slamming himself down onto the car seats. With shocking speed, Jim Hunt burst from his car and ran to the driver's side of Patera's car. The door was locked. Jim could not open it. Meanwhile, big, powerful Tommy Geisel pulled open the passenger door with such force he nearly tore it off its hinges. Jim Hunt vaulted over the hood of the car as though he were a champion gymnast. As he hit the ground, he grabbed Patera. Though both Jim and Tommy had shouted, Police! Police! Patera was still not sure if it was a hit or if these were really cops. He resisted. Tommy tried to get him to lie down on his stomach, to cuff him. Because he resisted, Tommy pushed him so hard that Patera's face slammed into the hot black tar street, giving him a broken nose and two large black eyes, injuries that would be clearly visible in Patera's mugshot taken later that day. Hunt put the cuffs on him and read him his rights. Patera was thrown into the back of Jim and Tommy's unmarked car. Sirens blaring, red lights spinning, they headed toward Manhattan, DEA headquarters on West 57th Street. What, Patera wondered over and over again, 
do they have against me? But Terra hated having been arrested. In the world that he came from, being busted was failure. Getting arrested was for miscreants and wannabes, certainly not for the likes of him. A man with his street acumen, wherewithal, a man who could readily see trouble coming from a mile away. Immediately he suspected Ganji, but had no proof yet that Ganji was the cause of it. When he got over the initial shock of the arrest, his mind began to work defensively. Seething inside, Patera thought about good criminal attorneys, the best ones available, how to get out of this. He thought about making whoever the witness was disappear. He would fight this. He would win this. As he was being driven to DEA headquarters, he stared with disdain at Tommy Geisel and Jim Hunt. He had no idea of Jim Hunt's family history in law enforcement, that Jim Hunt Sr. had arrested Carmine Galante, the Chin, and, too, Vito Genovese. But none of that mattered to him. Hunt was a cop, and he represented all that Patera disdained. Patera thought of cops as bullies with badges. Respect? He would never show these people respect. Outwardly, Patera appeared friendly, made light of the arrest, acted as though Jim and Tommy were just doing a day's work, nothing more, little less. He, Patera, was an omnipotent power. He'd beat them through his iron will, his guile, his power over life and death. At DEA headquarters, he was fingerprinted and photographed and put in the holding cell. Agents Dave Torresinta and Timmy McDonald tried to make small talk with him. Initially, he was tight-lipped, but after a while, he said that he was not going to talk about the case in any way. They said that they understood he had been given his Miranda rights and had nothing to say. He, in turn, said that he'd be willing to talk about things in general to pass the time. At one point, Patera said to Agent Dave Torresinta, Hey, why don't you guys write my story and we will split profits on the movie rights? I'll provide all the gory details laughing as he said it, amused. For a streetwise mafioso, Patera was talkative. He had gotten over the initial shock of being arrested, the earthquake of it, and his mood had lightened somewhat. Offhandedly, he spoke about the Mossberg and Ithaca shotguns, how they easily take a human head clean off if you shoot right above the collarbone. As a matter of course, correct procedure, Jim Hunt brought Prosecutor David Shapiro down to meet Patera. Standing outside the cell, Jim introduced the two. Are you going to be my prosecutor? Patera asked. Yes, yes, I am. I have absolutely nothing to say to you. Fine. No problem, I understand. But if I did talk to you, what would you want to talk about? Patera asked, being all cagey. Well, what about Willie Boyd Johnson? Ah, there's a rat for you, Patera said, clapping his hands, smiling. He went on to say, regarding Willie Boyd Johnson, Remember the guy who ran over Gotti's son? Willie Boyd did that for Gotti. Cut him up in three pieces. <laughs> Gotti would kill me if he knew I was talking to you guys like this. Don't get me wrong. Gotti is a gentleman and a man of honor. And Willie Boyd... It's dead. What's the difference? Patera again withdrew into himself, became tight-lipped. Shapiro asked him another question or two about Johnson, but Patera had nothing more to say. His attention moved to the small-screen television. Jim and Shapiro soon left. Jim had assigned agents Dave Torresinta and Timmy McDonald to watch Patera round the clock. They did not feel he was a suicide risk, but he might talk. He might have more to say that could help them and hurt him. Several hours later, during that night, Patera, surprisingly, began to talk about Phyllis Birdie. He asked Dave Torresinta if he had heard of Birdie. Nope, I'm not familiar with that name, the agent said. Patera continued. Wherever Phyllis is, she can come back to the city. I won't bother her. She didn't do the right thing by my wife, though. She gave my wife drugs that made her overdose and die. She knew my wife had overdosed, and she didn't take her to a hospital or anything. It's like if someone's riding in your car and you have an accident. If that person gets hurt, you take them to a doctor. 
Faust didn't even do that. He said this with a candid disdain that surprised them. Both the agents were startled that he had talked about Bertie. He seemed to be trying to use some kind of reverse psychology. He brought her up before anyone else did, as though he was an innocent babe in the woods. It seemed, at face value, he was being sly. At least, trying to be. The following day was again hot and humid. People all over New York City went about their business. The rat race that is New York City didn't miss a beat because of the arrest of Tommy Patera. After a particularly good night's sleep, Jim Hunt went straight to the holding pen where Patera was being kept since he arrived at the EA headquarters. Though he truly doubted it, Jim was going to see if Patera would be willing to cooperate, tell what he knew, expose the inner workings of the Bonanno clan and their narcotics operation. Hey, you never know. From what he had heard so far, Patera hated rats, hated informers. He had heard about Patera's not allowing anyone in his crew to don mustaches because they looked like whiskers, and only rats had whiskers. When Jim arrived, he asked Patera if he'd like some breakfast. He said sure. Patera said he'd be willing to talk about anything but information regarding the case. It seemed, Jim thought, that he wanted to come across as the right guy, as approachable. An agent named Barber returned with an Egg McMuffin. Patera opened the bag and smiled. How did you guys know that I like these? You been following me? We've got warrants for your houses, Jim said. Yeah, I figured that. How are you going to get in? Break in if we have to, Jim said. Patera offered to show him which keys belonged to which locks on his key ring. He didn't want the agents breaking down the doors of his homes, he said. Look, when you guys go to the house on Ovington, tell them to be careful about the floor. I dug up the basement to make the ceilings higher, and we were doing work on the roof, and it's not so stable. I wouldn't want to see any of your guys hurt. Okay, Jim said, surprised by his seemingly sincere concern. It was in sharp contrast to the monster he knew Patera to be. Jim soon went back upstairs to his desk and called the guys in the field. He wanted to let them know that he had keys to the properties at 342 Ovington Avenue and 3030 Emmons Avenue. John McKenna, the agent at the scene, replied, <laughs> It's too late. We already broke into 3030. The apartment Patera had shared with Celeste at 3030 Emmons Avenue was, for the most part, empty but in a large closet they found Celeste's panties and bras neatly laid out with little signs that labeled each. Favorite panties. Favorite bra. Fucking weird, one of the agents would later comment. Patera had been paying rent on it because he didn't want to give the apartment up, lose the memories he shared. Plus, he had heard that the building would go co-op and he wanted to get an insider's price. When agents executed the warrant at his address at 2355 East 12th Street, they found a trove of interesting, incriminating evidence. Books, hundreds of them, related to martial arts. Books on how to kill, how to maim, surveillance and police interrogation tactics, and also, quite tellingly, books on how to dismember bodies. Titles included Man Trapping, Kill or Get Killed, getting started in the illicit drug business, and torture, interrogation, and execution by infamous French revolutionary figure Maximilien Robespierre. This book was of particular note, for it was obvious that Patera had read it with great interest. The pages were dog-eared and well-worn. Motivated and spurred on by these findings, the agents found every type of knife imaginable. Samurai swords, bayonets, stilettos, ice picks, razor-sharp hunting knives. There, too, was an impressive collection of shotguns, and there were different parts of pistols, automatics, and revolvers. None of these parts made a whole gun, however, and, therefore, Patera was not charged with illegal possession of handguns. The shotguns were legal in New York State. Patera's working guns, it would later be revealed, were in a duffel bag in the ceiling of Billy Bright's house off Bath Avenue. Here there was a wide assortment of over sixty autos and pistols. The DEA did get a warrant to search Bright's home, but
but since Frank Ganji had disappeared, Katera had the guns in Bright's house removed to an unknown location. Most incriminating of all, most unsettling of all, were the autopsy kits they found in Patera's home. These contained razor-sharp scalpels, small handheld saws, some for large bones, some for smaller bones. There were also hack knives for cutting through sinew and tendon. They found a safe and were able to break into it. Inside they found jewelry which, as it turned out, belonged to various murdered people. There were watches and rings, necklaces and earrings, and gold chains. Included in this cache of jewelry was Saul Stern's wedding band. Interestingly, they found women's jewelry there, too. Again, in a classic sense, these items could very well have been perceived, thought of, as trophies, totems. There, too, were funeral cards. Funeral cards that would turn out to belong to victims of Pateras, according to Jim Hunt, this, the government agents felt, was morbid, macabre, unsettling. They didn't find anything at Patera's house on Ovington Avenue. Agents discovered that it was essentially a construction site. There were slabs of expensive marble, beautiful Italian tiles. It seemed Patera had big plans to turn this building into an upscale townhouse, a place to be proud of. The DEA, in conjunction with the Justice Department, would move to confiscate the house as a result of criminal enterprise. All during that day, the 4th of June, 25 other Patera associates were arrested, including Vincent Kojak Gettino, Thomas Carbone, Lorenzo Modica, Manny Maya, Michael Cassis, Frank Martini, Luis Mena, Angelo Favara, and Richie David. The agents offered them deals. Anyone willing to cooperate would be treated with leniency. This had become the standard operating procedure for the government. Federal prosecutors, the United States Justice Department, had learned to manipulate and pit one defendant against the other, thus ensuring they would get the bigger of the two fish. They used Sammy the Bull Gravano to nail John Gotti and some 36 other mafiosi, though Gravano never testified against anyone in his own crew. They used Phil Leonetti in Philadelphia to convict several busloads of wise guys and send them packing off to jail, all grumbling, all fit to be tied, all swearing murder and mayhem, revenge. They would use, shockingly so, Mafia royalty Joe Masseria to unhinge the Bonanno family. Now the person they wanted the most, the person they were focused on, was Tommy Karate Patera. The debriefings began. The questioning of Patera's people was long and tedious. With Patera and his gang safely behind bars, Jim Hunt and his people decided it was time to see if they could find the bodies, Patera's victims, the graveyard. Finding the bodies would be the coup de grace. Finding the bodies would put everything into perspective. When Ganji's partner, Billy Bright, got wind of what was happening, he took off. Billy was adept at leaving Brooklyn quickly and adapting to new surroundings. He had been on the lam several times before. Because the bust caused such media attention, Billy Bright ended up on America's Most Wanted. With his distinctive looks, dark hair, and large eyes, he was recognized and identified and quickly arrested in Las Vegas. Unlike some, including his childhood friend Frank Ganji, Bright refused to cooperate with the feds. He would, down the road, plead guilty to the murders of Solomon Stern and Richard Leone, which took place at Overstreet's, as well as to drug conspiracy, and would serve a seventeen-year sentence. Had he gone to trial, he would surely have been given a much stiffer sentence. At face value, one would think that the story of Billy Bright was now over, said and done, but that proved not to be true. Incorrectly believing that Billy Bright had murdered his son Greg, Mark Reiter wanted revenge, wanted blood. No matter how you cut it, he felt his son had been unjustly and unfairly killed. Though Greg's body would never be found, his father, Mark, knew he was dead. Greg, his brother Michael, and his father were all close. No way in hell would Greg stay away for so long and not contact his father or brother. The first to feel the wrath of the writers was Michael Harrigan. Michael and Mark Ryder knew that Greg was going to meet Michael Harrigan that evening, 
and they never heard from him again. Michael Ryder stalked Mike Harrigan, and when Harrigan went to use a public phone outside of a grocery store in Howard Beach, Queens, an unknown, nameless, faceless killer walked up behind him and blew the back of his head off. The writers were pleased that Michael Harrigan was gone, but they were not satiated. They believed that Billy Bright had killed Greg Ryder, and Mark Ryder, coincidentally housed in the same federal facility as Bright, took out a murder contract on Billy Bright's life. He turned to the lethal, deadly Aryan Brotherhood, paid them $5,000, numbering the days Billy Bright had left on this planet. Billy felt all his troubles were behind him, and that he could walk around the facility with a clear head, unaware, innocently, a year after he had been sent to the United States Penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia, Billy Bright was making his way across the common yard when two Aryan killers approached him, one from behind and one from up front. Each of these men was a three-time loser with a life sentence who would never see freedom again. They had nothing to lose. Billy Bright, innocent of the murder of Greg Ryder, was suddenly and viciously attacked from the rear and the front. Each of the muscular, animalistic killers had homemade shivs, long metal blades sharp as razors pointed as pins. Billy was repeatedly stabbed in the back, in his chest, mercilessly until he was dead. These two Aryans were like bone-cracking, hysterically laughing hyenas, pets of the grim reaper himself. Like this, Billy Bright's life came to an end. Part 4. Traumas and Trials Chapter 50. The William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge It was now time for the task force to look for bodies in earnest, to find Patera's private burial ground. It was June 6, 1990. A caravan of cars left for Staten Island. In these cars were stoic, hard-boiled, seasoned, cynical NYPD organized crime detectives, DEA, and FBI agents. In that the Patera case had been a multi-agency effort, Jim Hunt was obligated to involve all the different agencies on this day. Frank Ganji was in a light-colored Plymouth with black wall tires with Jim, Mike Agrifolio, and Tommy Geisel. Because Ganji had only been to the burial site at night, it was difficult to find the bird sanctuary. But now he'd been sober for weeks, had his head screwed on his shoulders properly, and with a little luck he managed to find the right turns and the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. They all got out of their cars. The sky was clear that day. The sun shone strongly. The sound of birds came from many directions at once. The agents and NYPD detectives faced a wall of deep green, the smell of flowers and summer foliage coming to them. You sure this is it? Jim asked Ganji. Um, pretty sure, Ganji said, looking at the forest spread out before them, shaking his head in the affirmative. Everyone there that June day donned disposable white jumpsuits. They wore these so as not to contaminate the crime scene in any way. Anxious, Curious, they moved as one into the forest, tall and gangly Frank Ganji leading the way. A gaggle of residential crows made a lot of noise. They were annoying, distracting. All that day the task force, with Frank Ganji's directives, looked for bodies, searched the ground for some indication that a body was buried here or there. Curiously, they sniffed the air. They scrutinized the ground for some sign that human beings were buried in this dirt, in this ground, in this desolate place. That first day, they had no luck. Even the second day, upon their return, they came up with nothing. Zilch, a big zero. They brought in happy-to-please, tail-wagging cadaver dogs, pretty certain they'd do the trick. The dogs weren't able to find any cadavers. The cops began thinking that there weren't any bodies. The third day, they brought a man who had a machine that supposedly could find bodies. That proved to be a wash also. It was on the third day that the task force began using four-foot metal probes with a T-shaped handle to probe the ground. Working in assigned grids, walking in straight lines shoulder to shoulder, they probed the ground looking for cadavers. No luck. They discussed, prompted by Agent David Torresinta, using the telephone poles with street lamps as a starting point. Torresinta's reasoning was that 
Patera might have used the ambient light from the pool to make his way into the foliage at night. Thus, he said, the bodies could be buried perpendicular to the pools. It was a good hypothesis, but in reality, Patera had used flashlights to guide the way. It was on the fourth day, with the help of NYPD Detective Bobby Pavone and the old-fashioned metal probe, that they hit pay dirt. The day was coming to an end. Long shadows appeared. Birds chirped insistently. The task force had just finished taking a break. Bobby Pavone was sitting on the stump of a tree. When it was time to get back to work, as he made his way to the task force line, he absently probed the ground and struck something odd. He called out to his colleagues. I, I've got something! Hey, over here! I've got something! It was decided for the sake of expediency and proper protocol that they would wait until the next day. They would reach out to the medical examiner's office and use the light of a new day to continue their ghoulish task. That night, there were no celebrations, no toasts, no back-padding. Feeling whole and accomplished that many months of hard work had panned out, Jim Hunt, the quintessential professional, went to sleep quickly, woke up when it was still dark, and headed from his home in Jersey back out to Staten Island. As he drove across the elegant expanse of the Goffles Bridge, as a fiery dawn lit up the eastern horizon, Hunt wondered how many mafiosi besides Patera had crossed this very bridge, this very way, for the purpose of getting rid of bodies. Chapter 51 Cheap Suitcases Using oval-shaped, long-handled shovels, the agents slowly, carefully uncovered the object Bobby had found. In the nascent, all-telling light of June 9th, the task force regarded a large, checkered suitcase, the cheap kind that you could buy on 14th Street, the kind that people filled with jeans and camera equipment, contraband, to bring back to their third-world countries. The agents gingerly lifted the suitcase out of the hole. Everything about it seemed normal, except for the horrific smell that issued from it. Unmistakably, the stink of human death they all knew. The medical examiner's office had been contacted. An M.E. and a morgue wagon had been dispatched by the New York City mortuary on 1st Avenue and 30th Street. As the gloved hand of the medical examiner struggled with the rusted zipper, slowly opening the case, the smell became worse and worse still. Surrounding the suitcase in a neat circle stood the members of the task force, engaged and curious, quiet and solemn, as though in a church engrossed in prayer, so very pleased that their efforts had worked out. Because of the thick summer foliage, they stood in a solemn, dappled light. They were looking at what was left of Marek Kacharsky. Off to the left, the crows returned and incessantly cawed, distracting everyone, annoying everyone. Wish I had my shotgun, one of the agents mumbled. This was the boxer with the rugs, whom Patera, Ganji, and Musa Alian had murdered in Musa's loft. By pure happenstance, he was found first. Kucharski had been put in the ground some thirty-four months earlier. In the suitcase were his severed head, trunk, arms, and legs, wrapped in one of his nice oriental rugs, the rugs he had died for. In that he'd been in the ground now for so long, the flesh had dried and shriveled up. The once thick muscular arms were mere remnants of what they had been. Now they were brown and wrinkled, parchment-like, and the bones were clearly visible. Now that they had struck pay dirt, that they knew bodies were truly here, a newfound energy, a pump of high-grade adrenaline, affected the task force. They again made lines and again started probing the ground, invigorated by the hard-core, horrible, homicidal reality of Marek's body. It didn't take long for more bodies to be found off to the left, off to the right, all some thirty steps from the road. They seemed dispersed without rhyme or reason. Here, there, and everywhere, the only placement they had in common was the distance from the road. The roar of jet engines from planes passed overhead. The fifth body found at the sanctuary was that of a woman. It was Phyllis Birdie. Finally, Phyllis had been found. Phyllis would have justice. Phyllis, of course, was the main reason Frank Ganji had turned on Patera. She had been cut into six neat pieces. 
Now, as her remnants were filmed by the task force for evidence, as Jim Hunt described who she was and what had happened to her to the camera, there were only five pieces in the suitcase, two arms, two legs, and a torso. In that she had died almost three years earlier, her breasts were shrunken, barely discernible. Even though the flesh was as dry as a raisin, bullet holes in her chest between her shrunken breasts were still visible. Though Phyllis Birdie was barely recognizable as a female, a woman, the fact that she was a woman had a clear effect on all the detectives and agents that day. She could have been any one of their daughters or sisters they all knew. She was helpless and defenseless, and the thought of her in the hands of Tommy Patera was unsettling and disconcerting, and affected them in a way the bodies of the men did not. Silently, privately, a few of the men there that day said prayers for Phyllis. Next, Saul Stern and Richie Leone, the two men who were tortured and killed at Patera's Club, Overstreet, were found. As the body of Saul Stern was laid out in the field by the medical examiner, it was obvious that he had shat in his pants, no doubt because he was terrified, they all knew. This little observation, insight, gave all the agents and medical examiners, forensic people, pause. They had come to despise Patera. They had come to view his crimes as being particularly frightful and heinous. They now realized he had a mean-spirited, sadistic audacity that they grew to loathe. He killed at will, tortured, stole from people, sold drugs, and on top of everything he was a woman-killer. They worked cohesively, as silently as though they were in a mortuary. The branches and leaves that canopied the area where they worked gave the whole scene the ambiance of a funeral parlor, a funeral parlor designed, built, and decorated by nature herself. Even though there had been no official announcement yet to the media, reporters got wind of chopped-up bodies, a mafia burial ground. As though vultures zeroing in on the smell of carrion, curious, nosy reporters showed up at the dig. The streets leading to the spot had been cordoned off with yellow police tape, and reporters learned little. However, over the ensuing hours and days, press releases were given out, and detailed feature stories appeared in all the major New York papers. Newsday ran a two-page feature story. All the local television stations covered the event extensively. Tommy Patera was suddenly famous. Infamous. At the autopsy, in the medical examiner's office in Manhattan, Phyllis Birdie's remains were laid out on a gleaming aluminum table. Giant fluorescent lights illuminated what was left of her. As her chest cavity was cut open and peeled back, the medical examiner noted for the autopsy report that she had been shot with glazer rounds, bullets that contained small BB-like pellets that caused horrific wounds inside her chest. The medical examiner noted with interest that all the cuts severing the limbs from the torso were neat and precise, professional-looking. He would later comment that whoever did this had experience. Whoever did this knew what he was doing. Chapter 52 The Execution of Tommy Karate Patera All the officials who worked the Patera case, were involved in the task force, were involved in Patera's prosecution, wanted him to die. If ever, Federal Prosecutor Elisa Liang said, someone deserved the death penalty, it's Tommy Patera. Elisa Liang was a small, soft-spoken, attractive Asian woman who was an excellent prosecutor, very good at her job. She, like everyone else involved in the case, was appalled not only by what Patera had done, the ABCs of what he'd done, but by the fact that he'd done it with such aplomb, the fact that he could be so blatant about it outraged everybody. Here was a criminal who acted like he had a God-given right to kill. Regardless of what anyone's feelings were, more importantly, there was a federal statute known as the Drug Kingpin Law that would clearly make Tommy Patera eligible for the death penalty. As lawyers in the Justice Department put together a case against Patera, they scrutinized the viability, mulled over the realities of a death sentence case. They came to the conclusion that Patera's crimes warranted the death penalty, and legally he could be given a death sentence based upon the nature of the crimes. Due to date conflicts, however, 
The only charges that carried a death sentence were the murders of Richard Leone and Saul Stern, which had taken place in Patera's club. It was announced by U.S. Attorney Andrew Maloney that the United States Justice Department would officially be seeking the death penalty for Tommy Patera. When Patera heard the news, told to him by his lawyer, he said, with a smirk on his face, Bring on the fire and squat. At the Justice Department, Patera had become the focal point of everyone's energies. They felt he was one of the most heinous criminals they'd had to prosecute in modern times. No resources were spared. Any overtime necessary was quickly allocated. All the manpower needed to build the prosecution case properly was provided with alacrity. To further the government's quest to execute Patera, DEA and FBI agents again began, in earnest, talking to co-defendants in the case, looking for people willing to turn, looking for people to become informers. They already had Frank Ganji and Joe Dish aboard. Judy Hamowitz also readily agreed to cooperate. As it happened, very little loyalty was shown to Patera. Just about everyone arrested agreed to cooperate. The ones who didn't were Vincent Kojak Giatino, Billy Bright. Billy Bright's case had not been adjudicated yet. He had not yet been placed in a federal prison. And Richie David. When Jim Hunt spoke to Richie, Jim said, Look, Richie, this guy is a first-rate scumbag. You don't owe him anything. There's no doubt about that. Why, in God's name, do you want to go down with him? Richie responded, Look, I understand that. But you don't understand. This guy's insane. Sooner or later, he will get me. Sooner or later, I know he will. And with that, Richie David decided to plead guilty to a laundry list of charges and take the heavy sentence recommended by the government. Kojak decided he would take his chances at trial. He would not testify against Patera. A shroud descended over Gravesend, Brooklyn. Any innocence the neighborhood had once possessed was now lost with the revelations of what Tommy Patera had done, how brazenly he had done it, what he had done to Phyllis Birdie, that he had cut her up in six pieces, that her head was never found. Gravesend would never be the same, thanks to Patera. In the mafia hangouts throughout Gravesend, Bensonhurst, Coney Island, and Diker Heights, mob guys discussed Tommy Patera. For them, what Patera had done was all about business. What he had done to Phyllis Birdie, though, was something else. The killing of a woman, the killing of a woman that way, all cut up like that, was something out of the ordinary even for them, beyond the pale even for them. However, they discussed in detail how Patera had warned Phyllis to stay away from Celeste over and over again, how Phyllis wouldn't listen to reason. In the end, they decided Phyllis had gotten what she deserved. The next big question they discussed among themselves, as though they were an assembly at the U.N. debating important world issues, was whether or not Patera had turned. They knew that most of the people he had working for him became rats. This did not bode well for Patera. It was a given that he, Patera, would be able to offer up his boss and even the head of the Bonanno family. Would Tommy Patera... Talk. Would Tommy Patera divulge the secrets he knew about the inner workings of La Cosa Nostra? Details, names and places, who killed whom, when, where and why, and the Bonanno family's extensive dealing in narcotics? Those were the questions they asked themselves in organized crime clubs throughout Mafiadom as they sipped strong espresso laced with homemade anisette, smoked cigars, discussed all the different aspects of all the different businesses they had their well-manicured fingers in. Chapter 53 Tight-Lipped Patera Authorities did try to get Patera to talk, tried to get him to share what he knew about the inner workings of the Bonanno family, the Mafia. In the world that Tommy Patera came from, being a rat was the lowest form of life, anathema. He felt that way in a very real, cultural sense, but he also felt in his heart and in his soul that betraying colleagues, partners in crimes, was the worst sin of all. Patera hated rapists and child molesters, but for him, rats were even lower on the totem pole of criminals. No, 
he wouldn't talk, he resolved with all his being. No matter what they did to him, he would not talk. He would, quite literally, die before cooperating with cops. The arrest behind him, Patera prepared for war. He'd find the best attorneys. He'd put on the best defense he could. But the case the government put together against him was voluminous, airtight, monumental. There were not only many live, hands-on witnesses, but there were also tapes and drugs that Jim and Tommy Geisel had bought from Angelo Favara and Judy Hamowitz. As Group 33 always knew, Judy Hamowitz would turn the moment she was given the opportunity, and turn she did. She, like the others, would cooperate wholly and fully, truthfully and sincerely. Patera hired sharp criminal attorney Matthew Mari, and the battle between Tommy Patera and the federal government began in earnest. A no-holds-barred street fight. No quarter given, no quarter asked. Chapter 54 The United States of America versus Patera Thomas Patera was tried in a well-lit courtroom at the Brooklyn Federal Courthouse located at Cadman Plaza beginning on May 6, 1992. It is a modern-looking, austere building and silently tells interested observers that serious business goes on here. In truth, America's worst enemies are tried at Cadman Plaza. A jury was chosen. Opening statements were made and battle lines delineated, weapons loaded and cocked. Esteemed criminal attorneys Matthew Mari, Cheryl McKell, and David Runke, hired as a death penalty expert, sat on the left with Patera between them. Patera seemed bemused, as though the trial, the seriousness of it, was all about somebody else, not him. Patera had gained weight from the jail's starch-oriented diet, and his hair had receded, but otherwise he seemed fit and ready to do battle. On the other side of the courtroom sat the prosecution team, Elisa Liang and David Shapiro, amazingly well prepared, anxious to get this trial started, so very ready to put Tommy Patera away for life, or, better yet, put him to death. Execute him. ASAC Jim Hunt would also be an intricate part of the prosecution team. Anything the prosecution team needed, he would facilitate, manage, appropriate. The prosecution team made Jim Hunt their first witness. He was easy-moving, sure of himself, names and dates as familiar to him as the fingers on his right hand. With great detail, federal prosecutor David Shapiro used Hunt's amazing memory to paint a portrait of Patera's crimes for the jury. The bailiff called the court to order. Jim Hunt was asked to take the stand. He was dutifully sworn in. Federal Judge Reno Raji would be presiding over the trial. This was one tough jurist. She had sat on the bench during many organized crime proceedings. Nothing cowed her, nothing frightened her. She was highly respected by both prosecutors and defense lawyers. Judge Raji had straight, shoulder-length brown hair, a somewhat severe triangular face with high cheekbones, and particularly intelligent, piercing brown eyes. She was nominated to the bench at the tender age of 35 by President Ronald Reagan. Prior to becoming a judge, she was a highly respected prosecutor with stints as the Chief of Narcotics and Chief of Special Prosecution. Jim Hunt would later explain, She's the best jurist I ever worked in front of. With David Shapiro guiding Jim Hunt, little by little, in simple detail, the case was laid out for the jury. Anyone watching the direct examination was stunned by the amount of details Hunt had in his head. He never referred to notes. It all came from his uncanny memory. It was obvious, too, that the jury's attention was caught and held by his testimony. Any of the jurors who thought this would be a boring, time-consuming pain in the ass were soon enraptured by the case. Chopped up bodies being found in Staten Island, huge amounts of drugs being passed from hand to hand. It was, in reality, more like some Martin Scorsese movie than real life. But this was real life, and the jurors and spectators and press were all wide-eyed and hypnotized, mesmerized by Jim Hunt's words. When Jim Hunt finished his testimony and slowly stepped from the stand, you could hear a pin drop. Methodically, 
David Shapiro called witness after witness. One after the other, a colorful rogues gallery took the stand and, in no uncertain terms, pointed their fingers at Patera and told what they knew. Billy Fredericks, Frank Ganji, Judy Hamowitz, Andrew Michiata, Luis Mena, Billy Thomas Sulo, Joe Dish Senatore, family members of Patera's victims, and a long list of forensic and technical experts took the stand to bolster and clarify the evidence presented to the jury. As each witness took the stand and was sworn in and testified, the crack in the Rock of Gibraltar grew and grew. As Tommy Patera sat there, watching witness after witness indict him, point at him, he glared back with the deadly indifference, cold countenance of a white shark. Regardless of the dirty looks Patera gave the witnesses, however, he could do nothing to mitigate the damage their words did. With each witness, the words coming out of their mouths, long, pointed, shiny nails were being hammered into Patera's coffin. When Frank Ganji, tall and thin and sure of himself, took the stand, Patera was visibly angry. He moved uncomfortably in his chair. He doodled on a pad, his mouth twisted into a snarl. Ganji turned out to be an excellent witness. He was sincere and matter-of-fact. He was so sincere, wrapped up in the words he spoke, that he began to cry there on the stand. All the jurors were moved. Jim thought Ganji was one of the best witnesses he had ever seen. Patera hated Ganji. He felt he had been nothing but kind to Ganji, a friend to him, that he had tried to help Ganji out, and here he was telling all like some schoolyard cry-baby punk. At one point, during a break, as Ganji passed Patera at the defense table, Patera taunted him by saying, Are you going to cry again? Ganji knew, had accepted that his life had been forever altered, that by doing what he had done, his fortunes had been irreversibly changed. In fact, when Ganji testified about the murder of Phyllis Birdie, when he talked about Patera shooting her and getting in the tub with her, cutting her up, putting her head on the edge of the tub, he again started to cry. If he was acting, it was an extraordinary performance, certainly worthy of an Oscar. The jury was visibly shaken, not only by Frank Ganji's heartfelt testimony, tears, description of that night, Phyllis being cut up, but by the sight of the photos of the exhumed bodies. This would unsettle the most hardcore war veteran, let alone the John Q. citizens of whom the jury was made up. You hear about such things in the papers, see them in horror movies, but the reality that these things happened in real life, people being murdered and cut up, people being buried in bird sanctuaries in the dead of night, was truly the things that nightmares were made of, unsettling, shocking. Afterward, some of the jurors admitted to having nightmares on a regular basis because of the testimony the crime scene photos, the gravesite photos of this horror film they unwittingly found themselves cast in. Never, not once, did Patera show any emotion, any sign of remorse, empathy, or sympathy. He may as well have been made of stone, a statue with black hair, a wide white brow, and those chilling icy blue eyes of his taking it all in, bored, indifferent, even hostile. As the prosecution presented its case, the defense cross-examined each of their witnesses expertly and thoroughly, though they managed to do little to dent the wall of guilt the prosecution had slowly and expertly built around Patera. They managed, to a degree, to undermine Ganji's testimony when they had him admit to drug and alcohol abuse, to trying to kill himself, to lying repeatedly in order to manipulate the system. They managed to portray Ganji as the murdering, three-time loser he really was. But no matter how many holes they shot in his character and veracity, the photographs of Phyllis Birdie cut up, the photographs of Phyllis Birdie while she was alive, spoke volumes and null and voided any of Ganji's many vices. At one point in time, the prosecutor put on the stand Phyllis Birdie's sister Antonina, Tony, and she said how, when her sister had gone missing, she went to the Just Us bar and asked Patera where her sister was, and he said, I hear she's prostituting herself in Coney Island. 
knowing full well that he had not only killed her, but cut her up and buried her in the bird sanctuary on Staten Island. Antonina was one of the few people who showed no hesitation, no fear, when she pointed at Patera and said what she knew. All her words were laced with venom and hatred. When she looked at Patera, her stare had the malevolence of a razor-sharp knife. All 470 pieces of evidence presented, 143 photos shown, all 66 witnesses having testified, direct and cross-finished, the two sides made their closing arguments succinctly and well, and the case was left to the jury. The evidence and dozens of witnesses overwhelmingly pointed toward Patera's guilt. The government's case was so strong and well put together that Patera's attorneys put up little defense. The best they could do, they knew, was to try to save Patera from the death sentence. Interestingly, during the defense's closing argument, Patera's attorneys called Frank Ganji a pimp and a parasite. Chapter 55 Yea or Nay It took six days for the jury to find Patera guilty on eighteen out of the nineteen counts he was charged with. He was convicted of those eighteen charges on June 25, 1992. He was not charged with the murder of Greg Reiter because Reiter's body had never been found, and the only witness to the murder, Michael Harrigan, had been killed. The one charge they found him innocent of was the murder of Willie Boy Johnson. The jury apparently felt that because there were no witnesses and only subjective suggestion that they should give Patera the benefit of the doubt. However, they convicted him of killing Marek Gucharski, Phyllis Birdie, Joey Balzano, Solomon Stern, Richard Leone, and Talal Siksik. The prosecution, both David Shapiro and Elisa Liang, as well as Jim Hunt and Tommy Geisel, all believed the jury made a large error regarding Johnson, but they still felt they had hit a home run. Eighteen out of nineteen was excellent, reason to celebrate. No matter how you cut it, Patera was off the streets. Now came the most important, essential part of the prosecution, the penalty phase, whether or not Patera got the death sentence. If he was given the death sentence, he would be the first man convicted under the drug kingpin law in New York, and only the second in the country. It would be a milestone. Now the jury was given the delicate, very difficult task of determining, one, if the death sentence was warranted, and two, if it should be given to Patera. Both sides succinctly made their arguments. Family members were called to testify to Patera's character. Patera's aunt, sister-in-law, and two cousins all said, what a good son, brother, cousin, friend Patera was. Judge Raji charged the jury with their task, according to the strict guidelines of the law, according to the guidelines set up by the government to meet the criteria for death. As the jury slowly filed out of the courtroom, looking at Patera, some in fear, some with hostility, as if he were a dangerous animal caged in a zoo, Patera turned to Jim Hunt, who was sitting behind him, and said, I bet you they don't have the balls to kill me. We'll see, Jim said. The deliberation for the death sentence took less time than the one for the guilty verdict. The jury was made up of six men and six women, all good American citizens who abided by the rules and regulations of society, who wanted to contribute what they could. They were civilians. They were, as Patera would put it, squares. As such, the killing of a man for them, any man, was a very difficult task to decide. If they all knew they did give him the death sentence, it would be as though their fingers pulled the trigger of the gun that killed this man. Many, particularly God-fearing people, think of the death sentence as something barbaric, unfair, meted out in a way that flies against logic and reason, fairness and the rule of law. Apparently, this jury was a godsend for Tommy Patera, for they refused to vote in favor of the death penalty. They debated heatedly, Ultimately, ten were for the death penalty, two against. They argued for four and a half hours. They shouted at one another. When they were finally finished with their deliberations and returned to the courtroom, that number was the same. As the four women read the sentence, 
obviously shaken up, tears rolling from her eyes, emotionally embroiled in what was happening, Patera turned and, addressing his own attorney directly, Jim Hunt and David Shapiro indirectly, said, They didn't have the balls to kill me, in his high-pitched voice, a voice that might very well have been the beginning of the end for Tommy Patera, a voice that put him at odds with society and all those around him as far back as he could remember. Still, regardless of his voice, the painful barbs and abuse, slings and arrows he suffered because of it, Judge Raji gave Tommy Patera of Gravesend, Brooklyn, seven life sentences in addition to four terms of twenty years' imprisonment and five terms of ten years' imprisonment. No matter how you cut it, Patera would spend the rest of his days behind bars in a steel cage. True to his beliefs, he never tried to make a deal with the government for any kind of leniency. Patera remained loyal to La Cosa Nostra culture and mindset, to his pledge of omerta to the Bonanno family. After the sentencing, two burly guards handcuffed Patera's ankles and wrists, taking small, stilted steps, walking slowly toward his destiny, Tommy Patera had his shoulders back, his head high, and his thin-lipped mouth shut tight. Epilogue As of this writing, Tommy Patera is being held at Allenwood Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. He is a voracious reader with very eclectic taste. He particularly likes books of epic proportions involving war and famous battles, martial arts, and killing. All those in his family come to visit him. He receives mail and books from friends and family. Today, Jim Hunt is working as the assistant special agent in charge at the DEA's New York office on 10th Avenue. He's as physically fit as ever. When possible, when he can get away from the busy office, he heads down to Florida, where he enjoys playing golf. Today, Frank Ganji is still in the witness protection program. He is miserable. His family has completely disowned him. He still has a drinking problem and smokes two packs of cigarettes a day. When, years after it happened, he talks about Phyllis Birdie, he still cries. He is a man without a country, without a home, regretful. Tommy Geisel retired from the DEA and is CEO of Sunbank Corporation. He very much enjoyed his career and equally enjoys his current work and the colorful bounty that life has afforded him. Bruce Travers has undergone 14 operations to restore his face. Today, for the most part, he looks fine. He still works for the DEA and is presently the head of their office in the United Kingdom. He is happily married and has three children. After he quit the U.S. Justice Department, David Shapiro was immediately hired by Boys Schiller and Flexner Law Firm in San Francisco, one of the best law firms in the country. Attorney David Boys would argue on behalf of Al Gore to continue the presidential vote in Florida in the 2000 election. After the Patera trial, Judy Hamowitz also entered the witness protection program and disappeared. Joe Dish also disappeared into the witness protection program. This concludes The Butcher, Anatomy of a Mafia Psychopath. Please visit our website, www.tantor.com, for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers, or call toll-free 877-7-TANTOR to request a catalog.